Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of UCTV Alive for Kids. Today we are going to be joined by Shasta Henry, who is doing her PhD at UTAS, which is like a really long report that you write over many, many years. And some of you may know Shasta, she came on the show last year. Um, so she's also, uh, she calls herself Bug Girl, which basically means she is an entomologist. Uh, can I throw over to you, Shasta, and can you let me know <laughs> if, if I'm saying everything correctly? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be seen by all of you again. We can't see you, but I know that you can see us. I am Shasta, the bug girl. Uh, so I study insects. I am doing my PhD at the moment on Tasmanian insects. I've got some great questions from one of the schools watching about what I've been up to and I have been actually working on giving this cockroach a name. Oh wow. Previously unknown to science, although known to lots of other people. Uh, so we collaborated with the Tasmanian Aboriginal Language Centre, oh, the people amazing. who are writing and recording Palo Akani. And so this is Polyzosteria yingina. And yingina is a Tasmanian indigenous word for the Great Lake in the Central Highlands where this cockroach is found. Now you might be pleased to know that this is a very enlarged photo and this isn't the actual size of the cockroach. <laughs> It's oh. actually about that big. Oh, it also looks very different to most cockroaches that I've seen before. Maybe it's just because it's so big. Maybe because it's so big, but you're probably recognising, I think I taught these guys last year, uh, insects all have the same set of ingredients. Six legs, mm -hmm. uh, two eyes, mm -hmm. two antenna, and usually four wings. But you'll see this cockroach would normally have wings uh, that fold over its back and this one doesn't have any it just runs yes. around on the ground lots of insects are adapted to live in different habitats and up in the alpine where it's quite cold flight is very uh, energy intensive wow and so these ones don't bother with that they just run around on the ground in the sunshine instead that's amazing so what else are you going to talk to us about today Shasta? so today i wanted to share a few uh insect stories if we roll to the start of the powerpoint presentation Awesome. Uh, I wanted to talk about insect mainstay pollination. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also going to talk about um, how Australia got prickly pear cactus, and that story actually involves two different kinds of insects, wow. one at the start and one at the end. Uh, we're going to wrap up with talking about insect inspired uh, technology specifically, but I'm going to be showing you how each of these subjects involves insects as technology in some way. Fantastic. And I believe that we are going to kick things off by doing a bit of an activity that yes. you can do in your classroom as well. Yes. So, um, if you're, you know, if you're at home listening in, if you're at school listening in, um, this is something where we'd, we we will get you to put your hand up. So, put your hand up if you like chocolate. I like chocolate. Yeah, yeah, I like chocolate too. Yeah. Now it's my turn. So I want people to keep their hand up if they also like biting flies like mosquitoes. Ooh, I wonder how many hands are up. I can't, I, there might be a few, but I doubt there would be. Mm. Um, what about, put your hand up if you like mango. Do you like mangoes? I like mangoes. Keep your hand up if you also like wasps. Oh, I wonder if there's anyone, <laughs> who knows? No one likes my topic as much as your topic, Tess. <laughs> <laughs> put your hand up if you like cheese. Keep your hand up if you like bees. And I can see as well, some people are raising their hand on the yeah. Zoom chat as well. Yeah. If you do like bees, have you ever been stung by a bee? I catch insects as part of my job. So I've been stung by bees and ants quite a number of times. And I know that it's not very much fun. But the point is, if you like chocolate, then you need biting flies like mosquitoes. And if you like mangoes and lots and lots of other fruits then you need flying insects like wasps and if you like cheese then you absolutely need bees because all of these insects 
are pollinators. Okay. They're responsible for flying between flowers and carrying genetic material, part A, and putting it in part B, which pollinates flowers and creates the fruits and the nuts that we are uh, all love to eat. And in the case of bees and milk, they pollinate the alfalfa that the cows eat to make milk. So that's how insects wow. are involved in creating one in three of every bite of food that you've ever eaten. Here's a little illustration. These are the flowers on the chocolate plant. And they are incredibly small. And so while there's a great diversity of bees in the world, there is a lot more flies, and flies are often a lot smaller. Again, this is a very enlarged picture of the biting midge that pollinates the chocolate plant. This is what it would actually look like. And this is the mango flower. Uh, it's actually a lot of little flowers along a long stem and when these get pollinated they turn into mango fruits. And along with wasps there is a whole bunch of flies which pollinate mango flowers as well. And so even if you don't like flies, hopefully you can see that they're absolutely necessary in creating a lot of the food that we eat. They fly around just like we know bees do, they feed on the nectar in the flowers and by doing that they carry pollen on their bodies to other flowers which helps create food. Now here is a couple of bees that we we'll commonly find in Australia. In the background you can see is a normal honeybee and honeybees have been a great piece of technology because they live in hives and so we're able to gather a whole bunch of bees. You can even move them around. In uh, America and in Australia it's common to pack up hives and drive them across the country because honeybees do such a great job of pollination. We actually have to employ them like seasonal workers <laughs> to pollinate our different crops. But they're not the only bees and they're not the only pollinators in Australia. This smaller bee in the front of the picture is called a Banksia bee. It's got a little yellow face mask on, mm. helps me recognize it and know what its species name is. And this is a native bee. Now they're less useful as a piece of technology because they don't live in hives, they actually live solitarily. And Australia, just like many other countries, has hundreds and hundreds of different species of native bees. Mm. Now these do play a role in our pollination. In fact, one of the things I think is the funniest is that honeybees don't like native bees, mm. but where you have a mix in a, in a crop, uh, the, the honeybees will actually fly away to avoid where the native bees are foraging and so they actually do a better job of taking pollen to more flowers by flying around to avoid the native bees. And so having a mix of both of these in our environments is actually uh, really important to improving pollination services. Now bees, flies, wasps, butterflies, uh, not the only pollinators in our environments. Uh, beetles also mm. visit flowers. All of these animals are attracted by the nectar, the sweet treat that the flowers offer, along with honey eaters. But there are also flowers that only open at night and they actually get pollinated by animals like bats really? or um, the nighttime equivalent of a butterfly, a moth, also have the very long, uh, it's called a horstellum, it's the tongue uh, that comes out and can go down very very long tubular flowers. Some flowers in fact evolved so specifically to be pollinated by moths that they can't be pollinated by anything else. We'll talk about that in another second. So, uh, for instance, in ecosystems like deserts, where it's really, really hot and dry, the flowers would get dried out by the sun if they opened during the day. So they open at night time and attract these nighttime pollinators. That's amazing. And like I said, that's how insects are implicated, are involved in producing one out of every three bites of food you've 
ever eaten. Practically every ingredient in a burrito uh, <laughs> is thanks to insects in one way or another. In this way, insects are actually providing a service, um, a technological service, you might like to think of it as, to the tune of between 200 and $500 billion a year. And we haven't created any drone or any piece of machinery that could replace this $500 billion service that insects are providing to humans, helping create our food, by feeding themselves. And so keeping pollinators healthy and populations uh, high in the environment is really important. That's why people are so interested and concerned about bee populations. And losing pollinators and losing species isn't impossible. In fact, it's happened. This is the Alua plant and it lives on cliffs mm. in Hawaii. It's one of those native flower species that was used to create lays, uh, flower necklaces, and so it's part of uh, the kind of cultural traditional history of Hawaii. And you can see it's got a very, very, very long flower tube and it could only be pollinated by this and this is the, called the Fabulous Green Sphinx moth. Wow. Curled up underneath its chin you can't see it has a very 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 long tongue which is designed to get down the tube of the alua flowers and it gets pollen on its face at the same time. Now rats arrived in Hawaii along with uh, colonizing people and the rats ate the moths because moths are full of fat and protein and nutrients. Mm. But the alua flower plant started to go extinct because it wasn't creating seeds because it wasn't getting pollinated. And so today the plant only persists because scientists with paintbrushes are actually taking over the role of that moth and pollinating them. So wow. I can put hands up again. Who thinks it would be a great job to live in Hawaii and to work pollinating alua plants with a paintbrush? <laughs> That is a job that somebody has to do at the moment because we lost the insect species that was evolved, co-evolved to uh, do that job. So that is how uh, insects are involved in our food production and how they function, I see, as a piece of technology providing that service to people and the cost involved in, in having to take that job over mm. if we lose those insects. So we can take some questions at this point in time and uh, if teachers wanted there's a uh, teachers or adults or, or students uh, I thought of a little um, experiment that you could do when it's sunny maybe not today but another day you can study how flowers attract insects by putting different pieces of colored maybe paper or plates out somewhere sunny where the insects can see them and you could count how many insects land on a bright color versus a dull colour. Hello everyone, welcome back. There were so many questions that came through during the break. Um, we've actually got a lot to answer. Mm. So um, I'm just going to scroll up to this question about the Banksia. So in during the break, um, there are so many questions here. I'm just trying to find it. Um, uh, oh, there it is. We just went off screen. Are uh, Banksia bees a type of masked bee? Yes. From, from Logan yes. at Blackman's Bay Primary the, School. The, the yellow patch on the face, uh, Logan, is the, the mask. And so the Banksia bee isn't the only kind of masked bee. Masked bee is kind of like a, a higher level uh, description of a few bees that have uh, patches on their face and are closely related. Um, and then did we have? someone asked about what happens to insects during heavy rain. So on a day like today in Tasmania when it is rainy insects are all still out there in the environment. Uh, they often just stay in the same place that they would go to at night time when it is cold. Insects are solar powered. They rely on the sun's energy a lot for a lot of their own energy instead of uh, turning food energy into body heat like people do. So they are often just in their, in their beds. Sometimes it'll okay. be under a leaf. Bumblebees will sometimes sleep inside of flowers, which wow. is 
unbelievably cute uh, and a lot of our native bees uh, dig little tunnels that they live in just like a tiny hive wow. for one a little little bachelor hive amazing uh, so they can be in little tunnels in the soil in the ground wow. or some of our bees are called reed bees and they'll actually live in hollow stems what about um, with all the rain that's been happening everywhere around Australia at the moment? Uh -huh. I've been seeing some videos of spiders climbing into people's houses um, right. because of the heavy rain to escape that. Is yep. that something that some insects do? Yeah, I mean, we, we're familiar with insects that uh, come into our houses because we've got things like water and mm. uh, lots of tasty crumbs uh, and but also because we've got dry protected places. I actually lived in a teepee in New South Wales for a while uh, and it was impossible to keep the ants from moving in under the carpet because it was a dry secure kind of um, temperature regulated space. So absolutely insects are designed in a world that is just full of resources like trees and rocks and high ground and our houses yes. just look exactly the same they're they're making um, tiny little insect choices about where is a good place to be and our houses are dry and secure and sturdy wow um like we were saying before there have been so many questions that came through during the break we also had um one school scotch oakburn uh, scotch oakburn year three emailed in some questions thank you so much for sending them through um there are lots of great questions here. Um, I know that Shasta's going to talk a little bit about some of these questions later, but maybe if you uh, wanted to answer the question, Shasta, of why did you, uh, why did you, and when did you start being an entomologist? Absolutely. Well, I think some of the students will be pleased to hear that my being an entomologist and my love of insects uh, started exactly where they are now, uh, in their classrooms as young people. I was interested in uh, the animals that I could find in my backyard. I spent lots of time looking into uh, rock pools at the beach where my grandmother lived in Bridport. Uh, and so they are in exactly the same position that I was. The start of my entomological knowledge started with the things that I learned in school and the things that I looked at in my backyard. Wow. And some of the things that I still use in my science now, the things that I learned back then, how to recognize butterflies, you know, what things are pollinators. Mm. Um, so we all started in the same place. I loved insects from a really young age, which isn't to say that you then have to have a direct uh, translation. I actually worked in outdoor education for um, a few years before I even started university. That's why I was living in a tent in New <laughs> South Wales. Uh, and so I had a couple of totally different jobs before yeah. I started studying and talking about insects. Diff in this way. Different but maybe not so different if you were living outdoors and doing outdoor education you would have been coming across lots of insects and lots of bugs. Yes I definitely have found links from uh, the things that I used to do to the things that I do now as well. Yeah. Um, should we answer one more question? Shasta? Absolutely. Okay um, so we also have a question here uh, about what would happen if all the bees in the world mm. became extinct. So that's from Amy. So what would happen if they became extinct? All the bees in the world and not just the honeybees. We would be in serious trouble uh, because as we said, bees are not the only pollinator. There are other insects that might rise up and take some of that responsibility. But bees are definitely some of our best pollinators uh, because they're very messy and they're very hairy uh, so they get lots and lots of pollen on them and they and they have a really high pollination mm -hmm. rate mm -hmm. over things like flies um, ants visit flowers but they're so clean that they don't actually do any pollination so if all the bees in the world died all of the hundreds of species of um, honeybee mm -hmm. and all of the native bee species in all the different countries in the world yeah. we'd be in deep trouble no more, no more mangoes. Wow. Uh, no more, no more chocolate. So what can we do to stop that from happening, Shasta? Great things that people can do at home is to plant native flowers. Mm -hmm. That is a great way to support, particularly 
our native bee species. Tasmania, our native bee species are all very small and so having native flowers which are smaller means that honeybees and bumblebees can't kind of get in and raid the larder mm. uh, and so that nectar is just reserved specifically for our um, native bee species and you get pretty flowers in your garden and you get to see all of the beautiful tiny little native bees turn up. Fantastic. So plant native flowers in your garden or in pots on your balcony. Yep. Super simple thing to do. Yep. Um, I think we're still having some sound issues and um, you might be, your mic I think is working okay though Shasta. So did you want to continue with your presentation? Absolutely. We've got other things to talk about. So uh, let's, let's rock and or roll on the PowerPoint. So I was talking about uh, cactuses, cactuses being pollinated by bats and moths. And that reminded me of a, another interesting insect story. So this is the prickly pear cactus. They're native to South America. You can actually eat the fruits and this is the fruit that grows after the, uh, the flower is pollinated by a moth or a bat. Uh, at night time and this is a type of insect that lives on the prickly pear cactus this is called cochineal and it is kind of like an aphid it's a specialized insect uh, you can see it also has no wings and in fact it also has no other features it's got very very small legs um, very very simplified to just do one job which is latch on like a leech to the prickly pear cactus pad and suck the juices out of the cactus uh, and they protect themselves with this powdery coating and so you can kind of see them blown up their, their, little, their little butts poking out uh, and what they look like, um, they're quite small. And this is what they look like if you squash one. And now I want to ask you what, how you think those, uh, those cochineal insects are related to the pictures that are coming up on the screen. And so they're not pollinators, they don't pollinate and give us chocolate, and they're not sweet, so they're not in candy. They don't give us the milk that makes yogurt. Sushi? <laughs> Cochineal insects actually create red food coloring. That's what all of these objects have in common. They all have squished up and boiled and refined and dried out and ground up bug parts. Wow. To create red food coloring. So that's not blood on that finger. That wasn't blood. Oh, I'd never even thought of that. <laughs> of course, pricking yourself on a cactus. Yes. No, it's, it wasn't blood. That was a squashed cochineal insect. And they have the same kind of red coloring, carminic acid, uh, which creates the red coloring in the fruit. And so if you've ever heard these words, carmine, crimson lake, natural red four, E120, this is what the food industry means by no artificial colours. That is a natural food colourant which comes from the cochineal insect. Wow. Now, this is very old knowledge. This, uh, has been, this, this insect has been used to create red food colouring and red clothing colouring in South America for thousands of years. And so... This is what a cactus farm looks like, either out in a field or uh, in a kind of in a shed set up. Um, you can grow them, they're a succulent, so they're quite easy to grow. And then you sort of farm the insects that live on the cactus pads and you can harvest them for red food coloring. Now, a country that has a similar uh, sort of daytime sunshine temperature to uh, South America or the, the region of South America where the cactuses are native is Australia and so somebody brought prickly pear cactuses to Australia to attempt to establish this very lucrative red food coloring industry. Mm -hmm. 
Now, sadly, the cochineal insects didn't like it in Australia and the red food colouring industry flopped and fell over. But the cactuses did like it in Australia. And so this was a newspaper clipping uh, of diggers coming home after World War I. So this is 1919 and you can already see in this very grainy mm. photo patches of prickly pear cactus spreading across the landscape. They overtook something like 50 million hectares of uh, Queensland and New South Wales. Like I said, those cactuses are very easy to grow. Mm. One pad drops off, it will put down roots into the soil and it just spread and it got everywhere. It was very, very <laughs> intense. And if you've ever heard a person say, yep, it's totally cactus uh, to mean that something is broken down or damaged beyond repair. It's a literal translation from that whole back paddock is cactus. It's full of cactus. It can't be used anymore. That's where that phrase came from. I was excited to find out this piece of the puzzle. Totally cactus. And so how did we get from here, mm. 1919, groves of cactus, uh, well, we found another insect to solve the problem. Deploying insects like pieces of targeted technology using what could be a pest like a pesticide. And so these orange and black caterpillars that you can see here, these are a moth caterpillar and this species has the best name. They're called Cl Cactoblastus cactorum. <sighs> That is their species name. Now these are also from South America and they have co-evolved to feed specifically on cactus, um, cactus plants, cactus pads. Uh, there's a lot of cactus in South America and so an insect evolved to just feed on them. And so the cactus came out of its natural ecosystem, didn't have any of these predators and the cactus ran rampant. We did lots and lots of tests and discovered that these caterpillars, these Cactoblastus caterpillars, will only eat prickly pear cactuses, which Australia doesn't have of any of natively. And mm -hmm. so these insects were imported as a kind of like targeted uh, drone technology to attack the cactus. Uh, they eat them, uh, they'll tunnel inside and out mm. and they will eat them to the extent that they actually have no infrastructure oh. left and so the cactuses collapse they aren't able to put down roots anymore and eventually all of that uh, area of New South Wales and Queensland that was covered in cactus was actually completely reclaimed. This is the Cactoblastus Moth Memorial Hall, <laughs> which I love. Uh, there is a little bronze statue to the Cactoblastus Moth up in that country as well, uh, acknowledging what an incredible piece of technology just taking this insect and its natural uh, behavior uh, and applying it kind of like a medicine or a band-aid or a pesticide and um, and so we were able to undo the mistake that we'd made by introducing cactus by mm. introducing a cactus predator uh, but then when all the cactuses are gone the cactoblastus moths and caterpillars have nothing to feed on and so they just die out as well and you've got no more problem anymore. Wow, that's amazing. So I, uh, yeah, I love stories like this where you've got an insect problem and then you have an insect solution as well. So another, uh, we can take, oh, we won't uh, do more questions until the end because I know we're having um, trouble with Tess's microphone, but I did think another class activity you could do at home or uh, in groups in your classrooms, wherever you are, uh, you could think about the insects that you know of and see can you think of any other types of natural technology. I heard of one on the news, there's a type of bacteria that eat oil and so they send these bacteria to where oil spills have taken place to help in the cleanup. A little tiny piece of targeted technology, natural technology, 
or the way that you feed your worm farm or your compost bin uh, your kitchen scraps and they through their natural um, behaviors of feeding they turn it into compost that you can then use as soil to grow more plants so those kinds of things sit down have a bit of a brainstorm and see what other kinds of natural targeted technology uh, you already know about and haven't thought about like this before now I have one more story to tell so we've talked about uh, insects as um, being used as technology how they pollinate our plants how they can be used to eradicate pests but this is some actual insects actually inspiring human made technology and dragonflies are in a lot of these stories dragonflies are a really remarkable insect uh, in and of themselves for instance they've inspired uh, drone flight technology because dragonflies can move each of their wings they've got sets of muscles mm. that move each wing individually which is why dragonflies can zig and zag and fly with such precision and so when we were learning to uh, develop drones, uh, we looked at these real insect attributes and have tried to copy them into our tiniest little robots. But there was another piece of natural technology uh, in dragonflies and it's the texture of their wings. They were known for a long time to be antibacterial. Dragonfly wings never get attacked and damaged by bacteria. And it wasn't until reasonably recently that we discovered why. And it's this thing here called nanopillars. This is a very, very, very highly uh, magnified view of the surface of a dragonfly's wings. And it has these nanopillars and uh, this is on the surface of dragonfly wings and also on cicada wings. Mm. And what it apparently does, bacteria are everywhere. They, they live everywhere, they belong everywhere, uh, but to protect their wings from um, being damaged, dragonfly wings and cicada wings, um, the bacteria get on these nano pillars and as they try to move the bacteria actually get stuck and tears themselves apart and then they're not able to function and so they aren't able to do any of their nasty bacterial work on the wings of these insects. So humans have taken this as a piece of inspiration for creating technology and you can actually um, create like a man-made version of this surface and you can coat it onto things like glass, mm -hmm. onto titanium, onto aluminium and you do that. Has anybody uh, ever grown one of these kind of crystal trees? Uh, if you haven't seen one of these before it comes as a little cardboard uh, tree and uh, you pour magic fluid into the bottom it soaks up the cardboard and that fluid is super saturated with these um, crystal forming salts and as they dry out the crystals grow out on that surface and so people are discovering how to grow these nano pillars in the same way dragonfly wings have and grow them on different surfaces. Now, if you wanted to create an antibacterial surface, a structurally antibacterial, no need to spray chemicals, uh, no need to kind of um, wipe things down, what would you put it on? You could put it on the handrails at your schools, all of the doorknobs, all of the chairs, all of your pens and pencils. You could dip it into this uh, super saturated uh, liquid that would grow this imperceptible nanoparticle skin over the surface uh, and then you would have a naturally antibacterial handrails. Really interesting application I discovered is that you can grow it on uh, titanium implants. Is that under our question panel? Can they see it? Yes. yes. Excellent. 
you can see a different thing to what I can see. I just wanted to make sure that you can see what you need to see, which is, uh, this is a joint, this is a drawing of a, uh, a hip joint and they are usually bathed in um, antibacterial solution before they are put into people's bodies and even still bacteria are so strong and so good at what they do that infections can still occur and of course that's, um, that's a bad thing for the person who's getting the joint replacement but we can actually now dip these titanium joints into the solution and grow a nano pillar surface on it and therefore it has uh, less bacteria on it going into the body and is naturally protected i think that is mm. super cool it's really but cool. i made myself a personal promise that we would circle back to chocolate in the end we started with chocolate and we're going to finish with chocolate shasta how could we possibly get back to chocolate after being nano particle bathing salt solutions and don't worry i will get us there uh nano pillars on dragonfly wings aren't the only kinds of nano pillars that we are aware of there is also a thing in nature called structural color and Normally a, a red shirt is red because the cochineal dye is absorbing uh, all of the blue light and only sending back the red light. That is why you get these orangey reddy colours with normal pigments. But with structural colour, if we zoom in and zoom in and zoom in on an iridescent butterfly wing, what we find down there is these uh, tiny little Christmas trees. They don't actually absorb light. What they do is bounce light. And they bounce it off in all of these different directions. Some of that light interferes with itself. And that's how uh, nature has created iridescent um, reflective colours. So now if we apply that to 3D printing, um, you can create a microstructure on the inside of a chocolate mold. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can create that microstructure on the inside of literally anything that you want. Uh, but if you put it on the inside of a chocolate mold, you pour your chocolate in and you'll get a naturally iridescent coloured chocolate film so that's not a sticker it isn't a pigment it's not created with a chemical it is structural colour which has been 3d printed into the chocolate mold and comes out on the surface wow. of the chocolate so this is taking inspiration from nature turning it into the kinds of technologies that we as human beings need now the surface of a chocolate not super important but what is interesting what's really valuable about this knowledge is that to create structural color you only need to create that specialized surface you don't have to squish any cochineal bugs you don't have to introduce cactus to a continent that it doesn't belong on uh, you don't need any waters you don't need any chemicals and so this is a very resource um, conservative kind of technology for us to be creating and it's all inspired by uh, the wonders of the insect world and uh, I think that is really um, special and cool. So I had another idea for you at home. I thought you could sit down and have a little brainstorm, um, think about some of the insects that you know of or any other kind of animal or plant. Uh, and what does that plant or animal have that you want? What kind of technology as, a, uh, as an awesome Iron Man kind of scientist do you want to create? I thought maybe you could make a set of robot legs that go on the outside that would give you the jumping power of a grasshopper and you will be an unstoppably good basketball player in future. Do you think that's uh, a worthy pursuit? What other kinds of insect behaviours do you want to build into a piece of technology for yourself? So that is the end of my PowerPoint presentation. We'll see maybe if we can take some questions. I think people still can't hear Tess. It's and I've used up all of our time anyway. I think I will harvest your questions from the notice board and uh, I will write out some answers because I think your questions are great and uh, I will send them back to the Peter Underwood Centre and people can um, see all of the answers to all of these questions um, in some different class time. 
That's amazing, Shasta. Thank you so much for offering to, to do that, answer some of those questions in your own time. Thank you so much for everyone for tuning in. I'm really sorry about the sound issues that we've had today. This is actually our last episode for the term, so we'll be back again in June. Uh, we've got a lot of really interesting speakers lined up. Uh, we'll email out some more information uh, to everybody who's on our mailing list. But thank you so much, Shasta. Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of UCTV Alive for Kids. It's really good to have your company this week. I'm Dr. Louise Grimmer from the University of Tasmania and I am the new host of the show. I work at the business school at the university and I teach and research in marketing and advertising and retailing. And last year I was lucky enough to be a guest on the program and now I've come back as the new host of the show. So welcome and I'm really excited to be here. Now this week we've got a fabulous topic that I'm really interested in and I'm sure you will be too. And our topic this week is bees wax, oh, try and say that quickly, bees wax wraps and sustainability. And I'm really excited to welcome our guest today who is Marie Backer. Welcome to the show Marie. Thanks so much for coming in to talk to us about this yeah. really important topic of sustainability. Hi, Hi Louise. Hi everyone. Marie, you work at Environment Protection Authority Tasmania and you're really interested in reducing the impact of waste on the environment and particularly the impact of waste on marine animals. And you're going to share with us today lots of tips about how we can reduce, reuse and recycle our waste. Now I know that you're really passionate about this topic. How did you become so interested in it? Um, I realised I grew up with um, a mum who had grown up during the war, the Second World War, that's a very, very long time ago. <laughs> and if she was still alive, she'd be about 90 now. But um, her upbringing was uh, on a farm, and actually the Germans invaded Holland, where she lived, and the Dutch are also known for being very frugal. So growing up, there wasn't much food, there wasn't much around, they had to optimise everything they had. And I realise now that I'm a grown up that that did have an influence on me. So we just automatically just save things, reuse things. We didn't throw much food out. We eat what was in the fridge. You know, we, we just use what there was. So it's something that's really been a lifelong passion yeah. of yours. Yeah. And, and now you've actually got a job where you can sort of mm. put this, this passion every day. So you work at Environment Protection Authority Tasmania. Yes. What sorts of things do you do in this job every day? Um, I just want to add one more thing because my brother used to take me bushwalking and that created a love of the environment. So the, the kind of frugality, the saving things and also loving nature kind of fit together for me. So that meant a job in the environmental area, which I love. So at work, I work for EPA Tasmania and we're basically like the environment cops for the state, okay? So there are people there that can, um, if there's an oil spill, they try and find out who it is and have it cleaned up. They look after the big factories and make sure they don't waste, uh, they don't waste too much or pollute. Um, we try to make sure there's clean air and clean water. Um, and where I fit in, we have this goal, which is sustainable use of resources. So um, yeah, that fits the kind of recycling and so on. And I work in the policy area and we're doing exciting work at the moment, making laws and regulations and um, policies which are really like broad sort of dreams for reducing waste and so on. So it's basically an office job and um, being here today is the fun part. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and also I write resources for teachers, so I'll do a little plug now. I've done quite a few resources that look a little bit like this teacher's. So you can teach children about waste. And I've got five, ranging from kinder to grade five. So that helps teachers 
teacher about waste. Oh, fantastic. So I spend a lot of my time writing these things for teachers because I can't go to every school. No, so that's why something yeah. like this is so fantastic, yeah, isn't it? I noticed there's like 10 schools today. So hello. Yes, <laughs> hello everyone. Yeah. So, and today is exciting too because we're actually going to do something practical. Yes. You're going to do something practical. Yes. So um, you're going to actually show us in a moment how we can make uh, something that can help us reduce plastic waste. Yes. And while we do sort of our practical things, I'm going to talk to you about how we can reduce waste mm. and, and the sorts of things that, that everyone can do. So um, let's start off by just with this sort of overall question. Why is it so important that all of us try to reduce our waste? Well, everyone's heard about climate change now. And when we put waste in landfill, it creates uh, a gas. Sometimes um, we think all gases are smelly, but this is a, a quiet little non-smelly gas called methane. And methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas, which means that um, it's a lot more, even more powerful, 21 times more powerful than carbon dioxide uh, as an impact on um, the, the air. And that inf influences our climate, which will bring about drought, bushfire, and horrible things like that. So wow. um, if we're putting rubbish in the tip, it creates the methane, which affects the climate. Okay. So avoiding that is good. Um, uh, tips can cause other smelly gases mm. and flies and seagulls and sometimes seagulls uh, if a tip's near an airport can affect um, aeroplanes that fly by mm. so There's all of these sort no of aeroplane flow on effects. to fly into a seagull no that's tragic no. Um, also groundwater contamination so we don't see what's under the ground but there's a whole river system under the ground and if we're not managing our waste properly and we're trying to do that a lot more, a lot better these days. But old tips in particular leach out water into the groundwater. So when it rains on the rubbish, if there's not um, a modern landfill like these days, um, it can go into the groundwater. And down the road, people might be taking that groundwater mm. for their farm or their mm. crops or even for drinking. Mm. So tips are bad. There's another reason, isn't there? Oh, we're if we put, I don't know, if I'm at this pair of scissors, everything that goes into making that pair of scissors, all the energy, everything that goes into making that, all the mining, and yeah, it's just a big thing to make something. Mm. And if we just throw it away, we've kind of lost, it's hard to imagine mm. that, but we've lost the energy that went into mm. making that. And then we'd have to burn more fossil fuels or whatever to make a new pair of scissors. So why do we need to throw that one away? And I learned the other day that a tonne of concrete is equivalent to the energy that would be required to fuel an ordinary house for a whole year. So wow. if we waste concrete, we're wasting a lot of energy. Right. So there's um, another reason. Well, oh, 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 it, oh, now tips are filling up. And who wants to put your hand up if you want to live next to a tip? Not no. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so look, let's keep chatting yes. while we start to make the special thing that you're going to show us how to make today. Yes. So uh, Marie is going to, uh, we're going to change our camera angle. There we go. And hopefully you can see, uh, yes, you can, what Marie is doing here. Now, Marie, tell us what you're doing first and then we'll keep chatting about yeah. this important topic. Well, we're going to make, it is hard to say fast, <laughs> it's very hard. beeswax wraps. Beeswax wraps. And beeswax wraps are an alternative to using glad or cling wrap, like for your sandwiches or your muffin or your apple. You can take something, some food to school or to work in a beeswax wrap and reduce, yeah, the use of plastic. And it's fabric. I can also show you what it's made of in a minute. But for now, I'll just cut out some fabric while mm. we're chatting. So you can use sort of any kind of fabric that oh, you've got? Yeah, oh, no, not woolen fabric or acrylic because it's going to be heated okay so, so you it's don't want to put cotton, cotton yeah fabric. cotton fabric yeah. yeah and please don't go and buy cotton fabric because a lot of people have this sort of stuff at home so it's, it's just a light cotton you could use some tea towels you could reuse some tea towels you could thin fabric um is not thinnish is good a tea towel is quite thick that's true and it will take up a lot of the the wax that we're going oh, to Oh, okay. Using. So just thin so cotton fabric this, is best. This yeah. will all make sense in a little while. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just start cutting. Yeah. And sometimes it's really good to have a pattern that's got squares in it. 
because then you don't have to muck around with the ruler or whatever. And I've got some Christmas stuff here which has got lines on it which helps me. Or you can have a ruler um, to make one the size that you like. I also like to optimise what I've got. That means if I've got a nice piece I'll use as much of it as I can to make a reasonable size one. You know if I've got tiny little off cuts I think oh I can make a small one out of that. <laughs> so yeah. So you can make them in different sizes because you're obviously yes. going to be using them to wrap up different sized things aren't you? Yeah so yeah. I might have um, a pair which when I put in my bag without a wrapper gets <laughs> squashed all over my books. It's terrible. <laughs> so I like to wrap a pair in the beeswax wrap or a muffin or you might have some crackers mm. or you know if you somewhere where you're allowed to have nuts and sultanas you can make a little pouch oh yes what a great idea out of the beeswax yeah. wrap so it's food safe um in my opinion you can do more work on that but a lot of people are using them yeah fabulous. i wouldn't put meat in them i'll we'll okay. talk about that later yeah, yeah. so marie's just going to cut out some material and show us so you need to get it sort of i guess quite as straight as you can yeah. when you're cutting it uh, these scissors i borrowed from a friend they're not as sharp as i thought that's all right. While you're cutting, I'm going yeah. to ask you some questions. Okay. Because <laughs> we, we've got some fabulous things to talk about. So, Marie, uh, how much... I, I, you might have mentioned this, but I, my brain has gone a bit fuzzy. How much waste do we actually generate per person every year? Oh, we make about um, 1.5 tonnes per person per year. That's a huge amount. It's huge. Um, in Tasmania, we compost and recycle about 34% of that. And is that good sort of on average across Australia um, or could we do a lot better? No, not really. Mm. In rural areas it's kind of mm, understandable. But Victoria, for example, have a 75% recycling and composting rate. Oh, we've so got a bit of catching up to do We've got some then. catching up to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's, We're getting there. What sorts of things, um, you know, do we sort of, I guess, end up in the tip? What, what, what are we wasting? What's the sort of waste that we're, mm. we're getting rid of? Um, this, what we're left with is about a tonne of waste per person per annum, which if you um, saw that, on it would fill the back of a ute. Wow. I, I haven't answered your question because I haven't No, that's okay. The, I didn't answer <laughs> the last one properly. It's, it's, you know, this by this by this, and there's 500,000 people in Tasmania. Wow. So if you had... The back of a ute times 500,000 every year and we all live to, oh, the children might know how old your oldest grandparent is, maybe 80. So if we're 80 times half a tonne mm. of, of, of 80 times a tonne into the tip, that's a lot of people. A that's lot a of lot of people. And, yeah, and it's um, toys, books, oh gosh, tables. Bikes, bikes bottles, bikes, cans. Bottles, cans, plates. All sorts of concrete, things. Concrete. Um, building materials that, you know, are left over from a building site, cardboard boxes, offcuts from factories. There's so All much. sorts of things. Now, I'm just keeping my eye on the time here, ah. Marie, because we've been chatting so much. We'll, we'll cut this one and um, we might just uh, get our other piece of equipment ready to make our special beeswax wrap. Gosh. Time the time flying. flies when you're having fun time flies. and talking about interesting things. Yes, goodness me. So we're just cutting, just cutting off the the edges there to make yeah. it nice and straight. And maybe for the purpose of this, if we're in a little bit of a hurry, it won't be perfect square. No, that's this, all right. This would be good for wrapping on top of something on a bowl in the fridge. That's what I was going to ask you. Wrap. You can use them. Uh, you don't have to wrap things in them, can you? You can actually use no. them on, on a bowl. You could put them on top of container. a cake. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. So. That's great. All right. Let's pretend that was perfect. It looks perfect to me. <laughs> there we go. There's our material. <laughs> yes. And... We are going to just bring over our frying pan. So this itself was from an op shop. Um, if you wanted to get it tagged and tested, that would be safe. Meaning that um, 
you know, some electrical things, you might want to make sure they're, mm. they're safe. But I know this one is. Some families might already have one of these sorts yeah. of frying pans at home. I, I had one of these when I was growing up. And you don't really want to use it for anything else. They're so sticky. Yep. So find an old one. Yep. Um, Good tip. Safe. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've already made a little batch before, and I'm realising that we're running out of time. But the recipe is, and we'll put this on the um, information later after the show, one cup of beeswax. Oh, and yeah. where do you get that from? Uh, if you're in Hobart, it's from Gould's Pharmacy. Okay, yeah. Or if you know a beekeeper, yes. that is ideal. So um, uh, I, I won't make it up, but that's beeswax from a beekeeper or a store. Yeah. Maybe an eco store. And... A quarter of a cup of fine resin. Oh. Now that's the sticky part. If you make these wax wraps without any stickiness, oh. it doesn't stick to your things. So that's resin. And where yeah. where, do, where can you get resin? Again, in Goulds. In Goulds. Or maybe on okay. the internet. So yeah. Goulds Pharmacy, for those of you who are in Hobart, that's in uh, Liverpool, Liverpool Street, Street in the city. Yeah. yeah. And two tablespoons of jojoba oil. Jojoba oh. is... Um, I think it's, uh, well, anyway, I'm not sure where, except, but it's not like in the peanut family. No, okay, so peanut free, nut free. Yeah, it's yeah nut peanut free. free. Yeah. So that's the expensive part. Jojoba is spelt J O J O. That's it. Yes, that's right. Jojoba. Yes. Jojoba. Jojoba. And I'm assuming that has come from Gould's Pharmacy as well. Yeah, all those things <laughs> have. Um, you might want to make sure you have a window open at home when you're doing this because you don't want your fire alarm to go off. However, you might attract bees. Some, like we did oh, wow. it at, um, outside at St Mary's College on lunchtime and we had about three bees. Oh, come. how nice. Because it's, hun- it's like honey. Yeah. And we just gently say, goodbye bees. Goodbye. So, so you can goodbye. see the, the mixture is um, melting nicely in the fry pan. Yeah. What temperature have you got that oh, on? Oh, really low. Really low. Really okay, low. so it's a it's sort of low, low, slow burn. Low, or slow. Sl- slow uh, melt. Um, and also, I have... A little bit of protection for the table or the carpet. Oh, that's a good idea because it might. To get it yeah. Yes. Yes. Now over here, I have fondue forks. <laughs> They're really sharp Fabulous. forks. And let's make one now. Oh, that's great because you don't want to put your fingers yeah. in there, do you? So I, I get the fluff off by doing this. <laughs> Someone will have to vacuum after this. <laughs> <laughs> and I pop it in. There are different ways to make this. Some people make them in an oven. Some people make them oh, look at it. A, a, a George Foreman sort of grill thing. Yeah. I just make sure it's all immersed. And I've got my own little funny little technique. I, well, lucky I made a batch up before. Um, see how it looks like it's wet? Yes. That's what we want. Yes. So you've got yeah. to get every, every little bit of it covered in the yeah. mixture. Yeah. It's like cooking. Yeah. And yeah, there's lots of other ways to reduce waste. We've, we've sort of got lots of ideas, like bringing yeah. a key cup. Yes, when key you get cup. Coffee. Yes. What um, other things? Um, you can take your own bag to the shop. Yes. You could actually make your own shopping bags. Maybe we could do this on another show out of old t-shirts. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. That's fun, yeah. So that's the, reusing. The other big one that I've noticed a lot of people doing is um, not using plastic straws. Yeah, so... Saying no to plastic pla- straws. Saying no to straws. I mean, we have this reusable one at home, which is pretty crazy. Oh, it's yes. hard to... Hard to clean. clean. <laughs> Just use it for water. Yeah, you can get a stainless steel straw. And yes, a little, they're, little they're little becoming brush. a lot more popular, aren't they? If you need a straw. Like, not many people really, really actually need no, straws. No, that's right. Like, why bother? Anyway, I'm going to drag this up. So that's not been in there for very long, has it? No, no. Um, it does... When you're making this, it does take a little while for the... When you've got the resin for that resin to melt and it gets very sticky. So just imagine that I had waited 10 minutes yes, for yes. this to be ready. But do keep it on low. Or what I first used to use was a slow cooker. So anyway, we're dragging it up the sides and because I'm frugal, I make it all drip. That's yeah, so it. that you can, I was just going to say, you so could make probably more. make another one. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's I, great. So you're just trying to get all the drips off. Trying to get all the drips yep. off. And voila. And do you have to hang it hang it up to dry? No, no. And in a school setting, what I do is have a queue of kids 
and I say, um, here, this one's for you, hold this. Hold it's this, not hot. yep. It's not wow. hot. This is just hand hot at the moment. And if we had a line of kids, I'd have some newspaper on the floor and say, hold that. Next. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's almost ready, once it's sort of cooled down a little bit, it's almost ready to use. Yeah. You Fantastic. Use it now. Oh, I've got a few streaky marks, and then you know it's handmade. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and you can fold this. And how many times could you use that? Oh, um, maybe a hundred. Don't oh. run it under the hot towel wow. because the wax will melt. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't put meat. I don't put. So no I meat or, or then you can't those really, sorts of products. People who really love yeah to make sure they're food safe you and wouldn't, you wouldn't put meat in. And if you're washing it under the tap with cold water, just a little bit of mm. detergent and to just clean lukewarm. it? No, just lukewarm water. Just lukewarm but water. If, I mean, if you've only had fruit in there Doesn't or really need, crackers yeah. or a muffin, yeah. you just, just brush it off. Brush it off. Oh, that's wonderful. Wipe it. Um, I, I don't know if there's people who would find that unacceptable, but I've never got sick of No, <laughs> no. And just think of all the um, plastic um, that you're saving by using just one of yeah. those beeswax wraps. Yeah. If you can use it 100 times, that's incredible. Yeah. Wow. So imagine that's your fruit. You just wrap it up. It's very sticky. Oh, look at that. Yeah, well, that's quite a large <laughs> one for a piece of fruit. But it's sticky. That's it fantastic. Doesn't, it doesn't come off. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, and Marie, just before we go to our little break where um, schools that are watching can think about their questions that they have for Marie, you have brought in a little game or a little activity that uh, would be great if we could have a look at too. Yes. So we might just um, move that, that frying pan. Yeah, it gets us to think about how um, biodegradable things are. Yes, um, that's great. We'll pop that on the. Yes. We'll swap over. So, so what have you got there, Marie? Just an assortment of random things. I'm not promoting any particular. No. Brand <laughs> Forget, of the yep. Forget the brands. Forget the brands. So we've got a can. Plastic bag. It's actually a litter bag <laughs> from the 70s. Oh yes. A oh, bit of old fabric. Plastic bottle. Some stuff from the beach that I found. Oh Some yes. Rope. It's yes. A fuzzy bit of rope. Uh, a beans can. Beans can, a piece of wood, and we'll just say a plastic bag. Okay, so what the challenge is um, at school or wherever you are is to think about how these decompose in the ocean. Everyone's heard about plastic in the ocean. Oh, I've got two plastic bags. Um, and how terrible that is for seabirds and sea life mm. and seals, playful seals that get caught up in rope and all those tragic things that mean that animals perish because of our accidentally getting rubbish into mm. the ocean. And that can be from your picnic or from, you know, even at school you're having play lunch and then it, it's a windy day and it goes down the creek mm. and then the creek flows into the sea. And, and it ends up in the, in the ocean. ends up in the ocean. Anyway, so we're thinking about what decomposes the quickest. So... Um, I'm not sure how to do this right now, <laughs> but have a think, mm. or maybe in the five minute break, yeah. what would decompose the quickest. Um, and which would take the longest. Oh, maybe mm. if that's the time to think about it yeah. in that break. Yeah. And then so I'll in that break, you. have a, yes, have a think about these items that Marie's put on the screen and think about which one will decompose fastest and perhaps which is the really, really bad culprit. And, and put them in order. Oh, and think about putting them in order. Okay, good. Yeah. And when we come back, you, you can you can put them in order and, and show us. Yeah. And um, so we might um, go for a five-minute break now and have a think about some questions that you've got for Marie and have a think about um, this challenge here that we're posing for you. So we'll, we'll see you in about five minutes. So this end of the... Welcome back, everybody. Um, we've got some questions that have come in. That's fantastic. And what we're going to do first, before we get to the questions, is I'm going to very quickly see if I can solve this challenge. So you would have had a go uh, in the break, but I'm going to um, see if I can try and work out which of these things will uh, degrade the fastest I'm going to go. Is that right? I'll do the, well, the fastest first. Up one end. All right, so I think um, the fabric 
is my first so thing. I'll put that there. Okay. Um, then I'm going to say the wood. Now it's going to get tricky for me. Um, oh, they're all, they all look um, quite terrible. Uh, maybe the string from the sea. Then I'm going to say the can. The steel can? <laughs> yep. Now I'm really in trouble. Um, I'm going to say the, um, oh, the, the drinking can. Eh, I really don't know. The plastic bag and then the plastic bottle. So right. I wonder if you're, yeah. if, if what you, you came up with is similar. Uh, that's very hard uh, to do. How did I go, mm. Marie? Well, um, I have to look at my notes. <laughs> um, the wool sock, that's in the right place. Yes. One to five years to decompose in the ocean. Wow. Then, um, oh, I haven't got a list for wood, but I would, I would definitely say that was next. Oh, good. I'm doing well. Um, let's talk about this later. <laughs> <laughs> the steel can, the tin, some people call it a tin can, 50 years to decompose <gasps> in the ocean. Oh, goodness. Um, then the aluminium can, and you can talk later about why it is that way. Or shall I tell everyone, Louise? Mm. Well, the steel rusts. Oh. The aluminium doesn't rust. Oh. So we have 50 years and we have 200 to 500 <sighs> years. Then there's a bit of conjecture because plastic hasn't been around for very long mm. in our lifetime. Like a plastic is only really 100, 200 years old in our, our knowledge of plastic. Mm. Um, but according to my thing, the plastic bottle will take 450 years. The plastic bag will take 500 years. Oh, my goodness. And the fishing line, if it, well... Oh, fish, yes, if that's what, yeah. If it was fishing line, yeah. say, would take 600 years. But um, personally, basically, I reckon just hundreds of years. Wow. In essence, because we haven't known about plastic for mm. very long and we haven't studied that long. But that's the, the feeling that plastic takes a really, really, really long time to decompose. Good gracious. I, I feel very, um, that's very eye-opening, isn't it? Yeah, to think about the, yeah. the, how long those things take yeah. to decompose. Let's, ha let's do a couple of um, quick questions, Marie. Uh, we've got a, uh, a question from um, Amy, and Amy asks, how much rubbish kills turtles each year? Amy, a long time ago, people used to say that 100,000 animals a year were perishing in the ocean. And I think that's a total underestimation of animals that are killed in the ocean. There's a lot that we don't see mm. and a lot of plastic um, coming from our rivers and our stormwater drains. Um, I don't know if anyone's added up specifically how many turtles mm. are killed and if they have, I'm not sure exactly. But suffice to say that um, stuff like this or... I don't know if you've seen a picture of turtles. They think this is a jellyfish. Yes. Like the animals are Because it floats silly. in the water, doesn't That's it? That's what they mm. know. They think, oh, that looks mm. like a lovely jellyfish. Mm. And then a turtle will swallow that or part of it. And unlike other animals, even if a vet finds the turtle, they can't cut them open. Like mm. you could cut us over mm. a little bit. And, and try and get things out. Yeah. Mm. But a turtle will definitely perish even if a human finds it. Birds, um, uh, Dr. Jennifer Lavers does a lot of work yes. on birds. Yes. She's based at UTAS. Yes. And Professor uh, Dr. Heidi Alman worked in Midway Atoll, which is halfway between Japan and America. And they, 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 they were clean, looking at all the rubbish that washed up there. Yeah, they? They, they, there was a lot of rubbish. Mm. That, because of the way the ocean currents mm. work, Midway Atoll, this tiny little island, yeah. it happened to be... Um, two things, an American base, so she got to stay there, a Navy base, and this beautiful haven for albatross. But the albatross mm. would see toothbrushes and cigarette mm. lighters and mm. think that they were squid and perish from, yeah. And seabirds, they, well, albatross, um, to feed their babies in the nest, they basically throw up. Yeah. So they go flying around mm. and then to bring food home to their baby in the nest they basically vomit mm. but the little chick's sitting there and that's just getting more and more in their tummy 
and it fills up their tummy. Yeah. So they can't get more other food and, and they can't get rid of it out the other end. Mm. So they basically die, most likely, from um, plastic ingestion. From plastic waste. So we have to do everything we can to try and you know reduce yeah. all of the stuff that's ending up in the ocean. A couple of other quick questions. Um, oh, we probably said the acronym. Arias has asked, where does Marie work? Full it's, name. <laughs> yes. um, I work for EPA Tasmania, which is an abbreviation of the organisation that supports the Environment Protection Authority. There we go, Environment Protection Authority Tasmania. Yeah. And Arias has got another question, which uh, we're going to do. So uh, Arias asks, could, could you give me a list of the ingredients for the beeswax wrap, please? Yes. We will do that. We'll yeah. post it on the um, Underwood Centre website on the Facebook on on Facebook we'll put up um, the ingredients for those beeswax wraps there Amy has a question how many things can we use in the wax paper wrap so I'm thinking about your question um, I'm not sure if you mean what kinds of things can we use wraps for like we can wrap bread or carrots or a cake or, or mm. whatever almost um, anything really yeah. I mean if you had a small wrap the only thing you could put in there is a small thing, um, and you can make a little parcel actually. Yes, you probably look that wrap it up somewhere. like a soft taco. <laughs> yeah, yes, like, a, like an envelope. And yes, it's like so an envelope. Sticky. Yes, yeah. So how many things we could fit in? I think you might mean what type of things. I'm not yeah. sure. How, um, mate, we'll, we'll think about all sorts of things you can put yeah. in there, really, oh, yeah. except meat. I yeah, think Marie I just was saying. Put meat or fish because you meat can't, or fish. Yeah. You can't really sterilise it. Yes. By hot water. Yeah. And don't put them in the dishwasher either. What about dairy products? Would they um, be all right? I, put, I use cheese. Cheese. I wrap yep. cheese in it. So as a food storage thing, I use wraps not only when I go out and about. Yes. Yep. To store things in the refrigerator and yes. and those sorts yep. of things. Um, I've got a question for you, Marie. Um, I have heard that the container refund scheme is going to be mm. introduced in Tasmania. Now, we had this uh, where I grew up in South Australia uh, for years. Um, what is it and when are we going to have it here in Tasmania? Yes. Well, there's, um, it's a scheme where you can take back your beverage containers like cans, cans yep. and bottles things that you'd normally consume away from home, drink containers, yep. drink containers, and you'll get 10 cents back for each of those. So you'll be able to go to a depot or maybe some kind of store or maybe even to a reverse vending machine Yes. where you pop the container in and you get 10 cents back as an incentive to get people to recycle mm. and especially to reduce litter. Yes, it's, a fa a it's fantastic in the litter stream. Yeah, so if we, so I think what happens is you pay a little bit more money, for, like yes. the 10 cents gets added on to the price of the, the drink, yes. um, but then you get the 10 cents back when you recycle the bottle. A, a lot of children when I was growing up used to make their pocket money this way. You would go into the supermarket and, and take back all of your um, glass bottles and plastic bottles and cans yeah, and things. Yeah. And when, when do you think we're going to have it oh, here in Tasmania? Uh, the end of next year. The oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so cause... schools would be able to really mm -hmm. sort of try and collect a lot of containers and raise money mm -hmm. that way. That would yeah. be fantastic. We can't start collecting yet because we're not charging the money that attracts the 10 cents. Oh, it's hard to explain. Yeah, so it'll when start. When it comes in, you can start. Yeah. And um, it could be a fundraiser for the school. They do that in New South Wales. It's called Return and Earn. Oh, that's but great. I don't know if we'll have that name, but... But yeah. we might have a similar thing. That's yeah. something that's yeah. really interesting. I think that'll be a real game changer also. Because we don't want litter and we don't want these going down the stormwater into no, the ocean. No, no. It, it's all part of the same story. And Marie, talking about plastic, you know, a lot of uh, the plastic we use um, is single use or disposable plastic, uh, but there are some things that we use that you've said are not oh. not all bad. Well, you um, know, I'm, so you've got some things yeah. here, haven't you? I mean, I've got the keep cup, which um, is plastic. It's plastic, <laughs> um, and plastic itself is not necessarily evil. Like we're sitting at a table that's plastic, which is more durable, arguably, than a wooden one. Mm. Like. My car is a lot lighter weight because it has plastic, plastic in it. Plastic in it. Therefore, mm. I use less fuel. There's a lot to think. But about 36% of our plastic is disposable. So it's, it's what we call so, single-use plastic. So that's yeah. the stuff that we really need to be yeah. recycling or, or even trying to reduce our, yeah. our use. Yeah, mm. we can. We can reduce straws. Um, 
takeaway cups. Um, instead of going to the supermarket and getting a bag for your um, veggies, you could take on a reusable oh, one like yes, this. Yes, that's make a good idea. Yourself. So little things like that. Um, they can make a big difference, can't yeah, they? Yeah, we can have, um, you can take your own bag to the shop. This one's interesting because that's a campaign that Brisbane City Council ran. Every time you go for a walk, pick up, 50, uh, pick up two pieces of rubbish oh, wow. a week or something. So every year you'd pick up 104 pieces of rubbish. That's a good... Oh, so that's why it's called so 104, 104 or more. more. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. I mean, you could use that as a shopping bag. Yes. Um, or if you go for a walk, pick up some rubbish. Yeah. Uh, so plastic doesn't end up in the sea. And what we haven't talked about is sometimes the sea animals get tangled in the rubbish. Yes. So they can either, one, um, accidentally eat it and it fills their tummy... Or they get all tangled like a seal, it's really playful. I've seen pictures. Mm. And mm. they don't have scissors or no. you know, the capability to get it off. Yes, that's right. So they, they can't hunt the same, they starve, or they can't swim away from the predator. So it's it's it's, it's really so important. yeah really important. And, and Marie, we we talk about um, some things being biodegradable, and mm. I think a lot of people think, oh well, I, I will buy this because it's biodegradable. Mm. Um, is that going to solve the problem? Well, it's really tricky because some things are almost like pretend biodegradable, mm. <laughs> or they're partly biodegradable, and they don't biodegrade as fast as we want. And the notion that something is biodegradable, well, um, it used to be that it decomposed in 21 days oh so that's what it but, sort of I meant mean, but if that mm. ended up in the water mm. and it was day 15 it would still hurt an animal that, okay that's a good so, point yeah um some things that are biodegradable are less biodegradable than um, we'd hope um but now the government and even the packaging industry itself was fantastic it's it's coming up with an australian standard um, 4736 <laughs> which means that it really does compost and biodegrade ah, okay. so um, look out for that if you're shopping and if you can think of that um, best to avoid plastic if you can full stop Yes. and um, it's a minefield because if you had something that was partly biodegradable say it was a bottle that was partly biodegradable and you added it to the recycling scheme and you made a new bottle out of that, but part of it was biodegradable. That won't contain your drink. Ah. So actually, it would be better to make sure it was either recyclable or totally biodegradable, not, not mixed ah, up. Not mixed up. Mm. I see, yeah. I see. Yeah. And um, I'm just seeing if we had any more questions come in here. I think, no, oh, I've got, I have control here. Let me just see if there are any more that have come in there. I have uh, just wanted to ask you to finish off because we're almost out of time. Um, you mentioned earlier that you've developed some resources for teachers. Yes. And there is a website. And I'm wondering, first of all, if you might just show that to us again and then I mm. can mention the website. And we can put that website up on the Facebook um, page as yes. well. So, Marie, you've got... Are that there for different grades that you've developed those yes. resources? So I've got... Um, I brought one in, but... There's one for kinder to grade one on sort of general waste issues. The grade two one is about litter. The grade three one is about paper. Grade four, plastic. And grade five, just released, is about food waste. Oh, they sound so fabulous. So there are many, many, many pages and there are um, many activities. I love hands-on stuff. Oh, that's great. We'll have to have you, activities. we'll definitely have to have you yeah. back. Yeah. Um, I'll just, I will tell you that website, but we'll put it up on the Facebook page. It's www.epa.tas.gov.au forward slash waste dash education. But as I said, we'll put that up on the Facebook account. Yeah. Well, Marie, um, it has been fabulous to have That's you on the show. Thank, Thank you, you so much for, for coming in and sharing all of this fantastic information, but also this really practical idea about how we can make a wrap. And look, I got the wrap. And <laughs> I can tell you, it smells like honey. It smells beautiful. Yeah. So it's not only a, a fantastic thing to use, but it's a lovely thing to use as well. Thank you so much, you, Marie. Yeah, it was fun. That was Marie Backer, who was our special guest this week. Now, um, just a note, for those of you who might be watching this as a recording from the Children's University portal, you might like to write a reflection about what you've seen today. 
And now next time on the program, we have got some special guests who are coming in and they're both called Gina and they're coming in from Hydro Tasmania. So just keep your eye out for uh, what that um, topic is going to be. Um, and that's going to be in two weeks time on Wednesday, the 16th of June. And that's all from me. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode and I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure you did. I have learned a lot um, and I'm going to go off and get that recipe and make my own beeswax wraps and we will see you next time. Bye everyone. Take care. Hello everyone and thank you so much for tuning into another episode of UCTV Alive for Kids. I'm Dr Louise Grimmer. I work in the business school at the University of Tasmania and this week I'm really excited to welcome our special guest and his name is Mark Sheldon and he's from University College at the University of Tasmania. Welcome to the show Mark. Thanks for having me, Louise. It's, it's great to be here. Really exciting. I'm very excited about your presentation today. You're going to be talking to us about using technology to bring imagination to life. And specifically, we're going to look at 3D printing, which is really a new topic for me. And I guess I, I'm assuming for some of our audience as well. Before we get underway with your presentation, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at University College? Absolutely. So I'm a lecturer in the Associate Degree of Equipment Design and Technology. We're based in Burnie, so we have a facility uh, in South Burnie uh, where we do lots of amazing things, and you'll see some of those examples today. Uh, so, yeah, University College is, uh, I suppose, an arm of the, of the university that focuses on experiential learning, of project-based learning. So our students work really closely with industry to, to come up with really cool projects and, and to solve a lot of problems. Well, I think we should get underway with your presentation. And while Mark is presenting, you could be thinking about some of the questions that you want to ask Mark. We'll have the break as we usually do after about 20 or 25 minutes of presenting. So think about your questions. And remember, when you're posting them on the chat facility, um, if you can put which school you're from and your name, that would be fantastic. So Mark, I'm going to hand over to you to give your presentation. Thanks, Louise. So I've got a few slides that we can we can go through now. Uh, so, yeah, as I said, we're, we're talking about using technology to bring imagination to life. There's been a lot of changes uh, over the last generation, I suppose, uh, in technology and what it gives us the capacity to do. And those things are only uh, rapidly expanding day by day. So we're very fortunate uh, in, in the course that we deliver to enable our students to develop the skills that will, will will enable them to be the inventors and the creators of the future. So our equipment design and technology course is all about them designing and making really cool stuff. They're kind of like crazy inventors, Louise, <laughs> is, is pretty much how it works. It sounds like too much fun. It, it is too much fun, to be <laughs> honest. Most days we do have a, have a lot of fun. So I'm going to give a heap of examples of that today and talk a bit about, um, you know, just where things might be headed, especially in relation to 3D printing. Just, just trying to get the slides to work, which is always a great way to start, Louise, talking about technology, not getting a PowerPoint slide to work, isn't it? That's it is fantastic. good. It is good to talk about technology and then have a technological problem. That's right. That's right. Um, just talk amongst yourselves for a moment. So, th so 3D printers, essentially how a 3D printer works, uh, it's you take a digital file uh, and you create uh, an object using a digital file. There's lots of different software that you can use uh, to design your, your pieces of equipment. Um, and then the 3D printer is, is a fantastic machine. There we go. So there we go. We've got, <laughs> excellent. We've got our technical glitch <laughs> sorted out. So 3D printing is a process of making three-dimensional solid objects from a digital file. And the object's created by laying down successive layers of material, one on top of the other. So what I've got here is uh, what's called 3D printer filament. So this filament, oh, I'll see if I can hold it. 
<laughs> That's okay. We'll hold it up to the camera there. So the 3D printing filament goes into the 3D printing machine and we'll see a video of that in a second. And it gets really hot and then layer upon layer, it creates your design. So that's pretty much how 3D printers work. So here's a, a really quick example. Uh, and just while this is playing, so this is a bit oh, wow. of a time lapse. So this is in ultra super fast mode, Louise. <laughs> um, but you'll see the, the 3D printer, the head there going from one place to another, laying down really fast. Uh, different layers of material to create an object. So the challenge here for you, Louise, is to figure out exactly what's being made. Well, there. I did see it flash up <laughs> just at the beginning, uh, but I'm not going to say anything just yet. Okay. Or do you want me to oh, say what yeah, I think go it on, is? Have a guess. Is it a green version, a very bright green version of the Eiffel Tower? I think that's exactly <gasps> what it is. And so uh, you've obviously had to do a lot of work inputting information into a computer to get it to do all of those movements. That's right. So we'll, we'll look at some of the software that you use a bit later on in the presentation, but you do have to create your design uh, first and foremost, and then that design is sent by the computer to the 3D printer to tell it layer by layer. So that, that process is actually called slicing. So what it does, it takes your three-dimensional design and then uses software to slice that. So it knows in each and every layer what it has to do in order to create and build up, as you'll see the building start to come together now. Uh, your 3D object. So it goes one on top of the other, kind of like if you're building a house using Lego bricks and you went around the side oh, and you slowly yeah. build up higher yeah. and higher. As so you it's went. just layer upon layer upon layer. That's right. And, and Mark, how long would that have taken if we weren't showing it so quickly? My guess for that one would be somewhere in the vicinity of about eight hours. I oh, reckon. so quite a long time. So we've really sped that up. We have sped yeah. that up quite <laughs> significantly, yeah. So 3D printing does take a long time. That's one of the that's one of the challenges with 3D printing, but, but it does enable you to make, you know, extraordinary shapes that you couldn't make with any other fabrication technique. It's very intricate, isn't it? Because the design of the Eiffel Tower, of course, is quite complicated. That's and right. to be able to print that is really quite amazing. It's not like you're just printing sort of a fairly basic solid object, which you can do. That's right. That's actually very detailed and amazing. Exactly. So uh, 3D printing fits into the additive manufacturing um, family of, of manufacturing techniques. So additive manufacturing means you add material to create an object. Most traditional manufacturing is actually subtractive manufacturing. So you, you're carving and taking away. Wow. So if you had a, a set of tools and you were trying to carve that out of a piece of wood, for instance, that would take an extraordinary amount of skill and, and a heck of a lot longer than, than the amount of time it would and take. You'd be taking, and you'd be taking things out of the wood to That's create right. that instead of making it, Correct. adding it in. That's right, oh. yeah. So that's the main difference. So it's additive manufacturing. You'll sometimes hear 3D printing referred to as well. So it's um, got a lot of capacity to change the world. Uh, I, I think that the main thing that 3D printing gives us the capacity to do is it enables everyone to be able to produce their own goods. So it used to be that in the old days with manufacturing, these are the sorts of people that used to... Do, we use toys as an example, Louise. So I just typed in toy inventor into the internet and these were the sort of guys that came up. And they probably had amazing jobs, probably very lucky. So there's very few people that would do the design of the toys and they would have, you know, the most amazing job in the world, Connect testing four. different toys. Connect Four, <laughs> absolutely. And some other, some other sort of popular toys there. And that's how it used to be done. One person would do the design and then we would create big, long processing lines where we made hundreds, thousands, millions of the toys. So that's kind of good yeah. if everyone liked exactly the same thing. <laughs> if everyone liked the design that the, uh, that the inventors came up with, then that was a wonderful thing. But I think that the awesome part of 3D printing now is that we don't have to rely on other people to come up with our designs for us. We can create our own designs. And we can 3D print them either at school or in the home. And as 3D printers become cheaper and cheaper and, and more and more accessible, they'll start to appear in homes all over the world. So rather than just be consumers of products where we go and buy a lot of different things that are, that are made in these, these processing lines, we'll be able to be inventors and creators. Everyone will have the opportunity to make their own items. We might see um, 
on that previous slide, we might see some women inventors. Absolutely. Some girls and women inventors, that would be, because anyone can do it, right? And more importantly, mm -hmm. I think, Louise, if we're talking about toys, maybe some kids would be cool. Exactly. Too, <laughs> so I, That's th right. I think it does, it gives capacity to anyone anywhere in the world to, to be creative and to come up with their products. There are some other challenges that this old um, type of manufacturing used to present as well. So mass production, where we used to make the same thing hundreds and thousands and millions of them, cause lots of pollution, mm -hmm. um, which is a challenge. And pollution uh, through a lot of the transport. So you'll see the icons down the bottom there. If you think about it, if we have to make all of those products on the other side of the world, we've got to ship them to wherever we're purchasing them. So here in Australia, it, it, it causes a lot of pollution, just the transport in, in the fuel and the resources required to move those products. The other problem with mass production is a lot of the jobs that were involved in mass production are now being carried out by automation and by robots. So in the future, those jobs might not necessarily exist as well. So there's been a really big shift in manufacturing and 3D printing is, is playing a really big part in that shift. So it sounds like there's lots of negatives to, negatives to that, but what 3D printing means that, that we can do is that we can make stuff at home. So we don't mm. have to worry about the transportation and the pollution that that will cause. It will mean that we don't have to worry about um, robots taking our jobs because if no one's doing those mass production jobs, that's not such a big issue. Mm. And we can only create the products that we need mm. because I'm sure you can imagine if you created a million of a toy and a lot of those toys didn't sell, that's a lot of, that's mm. a lot of toys that end up in landfill. Mm. Whereas this way with 3D printers, we're only creating what we need. And sort of um, what we call bespoke things. So things that you've designed because you want to play with that particular toy. Absolutely. So it's something that you've created. So it's one special thing often, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So it's, and, or as we move beyond toys and start to think about what other sort of products 3D printers can make, mm. it's products that can solve really bespoke, as you mentioned, mm. solutions to problems. So if people have got little problems and we'll show you some projects in a minute we can come up with solutions that perfectly fit that problem and we can design those ourselves, which is fantastic, and not be reliant upon what we might be able to find on, on the shelves in a store or online as well. Mm -hmm. So the only limit now is your imagination. It used <laughs> to be that you had to, you know, go and study and, and hope that you would get one of those toy inventor jobs, um, but now you can start to do the designs your own and you can start to 3D print things in your own house. To give you another example of, of how that's, changing the world, Louise, I think something that, that a lot of the viewers might be familiar with is the way that, um, that TV has changed over the years. So I actually very frighteningly did a bit of a, a Google search of what was on TV when I was in grade five the <laughs> other day, which is a little while ago. Um, and the first thing that, that, you know, really quickly came back to mind was there was only three channels when mm. I was a kid, three channels to watch. Um, no internet uh, to, to search okay. things like YouTube. And those channels only had kids programming in certain times of the day. So you could watch cartoons for about an hour and a half in the morning and then about an hour and a half in the afternoon and then on Saturday mornings and that was it. Yep, that was it. That was it. And if you didn't like some of those cartoons and you had to fight with your three sisters about <laughs> which ones you wanted to watch, that was a real challenge. Uh, of course now, and, and if we think about how 3D printing might change where everyone can be a creator of products, the way that TV is changing, a lot of kids now, that they can make their own stuff, put it on YouTube mm -hmm. and to watch what other kids are making, which is a fantastic thing. I'm not suggesting we should be sitting there watching TV all day, Louise, but it does give us the opportunity to use our imaginations and our creativity to create content that's mm -hmm. really relevant to us, things that we're excited about as kids or even as we move into adulthood, the things that we're excited about we can create and we can watch. We're not relying upon other people um, choosing what we do and what we mm. buy and, and what we make as well, which is, which is really cool, a really amazing shift. So some examples of that, these are some of the projects that our students have worked on uh, in the OEM and Tessa's going to bring over some of these products for me. The first <laughs> one is quite big. <laughs> there we go. Oh, look at that. So this is a, 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 a surfboard created for surfing on, on wake behind ski boats. So somewhere between a wakeboard and a skimboard, um, which is, as you can see, so this is a really big thing. It's the first thing you notice. And you'll see the little, the honeycomb shape, the hexagon yes. in the middle there. That was just <laughs> to make everyone feel a bit woozy. <laughs> the honeycomb shape in the middle is the part that's been 3D printed. 
And that's done in sections on our little 3D printer at the, at the facility in the OEM. And then they're all pieced together and fiberglassed over to create one board, which is quite an amazing thing. And then on the back, we've got little 3D printed fins as well. And what about the black um, the bits black on the front? Are they 3D printed No, too? that's actually just rubber that's stuck on. Oh, so that's stuck for your feet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. It, absolutely. It's, it's a really awesome example. So if we can just jump back to those slides for a second. I'll show you that in action. So our students, when we do our designs, there's a process that we go through. We use a thing called design thinking. So it's it's one thing to come up with your design, but you've got to test your designs as well to see if they work. That's another really fun part of the design thinking process. So you'll see in the first little picture there, and now there's a little video. This is Keenan. So this is actually the student that designed the piece of equipment. This is him testing it out. Don't judge him too much on his ability to, to wake surf. Oh, I'm More on his that. 3D printing, but it's pretty good. He's, done, he's doing pretty well. <laughs> but you'll see in a second he's about to drop his rope and he's going to see if it really tests. So that's pretty amazing to think that from a tiny bit of filament, mm. strands and strands of filament, you can, 3D, you can design and 3D print a board that will enable you to do that, which is pretty awesome really when you think about it. The, the picture in the middle there is another project that our student worked on. The other thing that we, we really like to do is, is focus on problem solving. So this was a... Um, this was a project that was brought to us by the Tasmania Police. And this is actually a guard for one of their drones. And you'll see on the end here that that actual it broke off from their drone. So they needed to put a, a, a guard on the end of their drone. So this is where the propeller would normally be for the drone. So they needed our students to design something that was really quick and easy to put on. Because obviously in an emergency situation, the police need to be able to put on these drone guards really quickly and set up their drones to help in rescue operations. And it also needed to be really light and really strong. Because the reason that this arm actually broke is that it was down in a mine uh, and they flew it into a wall when they were doing a bit of reconnaissance uh, after a, um, a mine collapse. So they wanted something that if the drone did happen to bump into a wall, that they could fly it out without losing that footage and without losing their drone. So it was a really great project for our students to work on, and you'll see them there in the photo if we just flip back to the, to the picture there, talking to the police officers and finding out about their requirements um, so we could understand better what they needed uh, from, from the design. So 3D printing enables you to print really specific things to solve really specific problems. And Mark, just before you go to the, the next yeah. one, just you were telling me something interesting about this um, drone piece. It's got something added to it. Absolutely. So mm. to, to make it strong but to keep it light, this has actually got carbon fibre laid mm. through it, which is an incredibly strong material. So we've got a 3D printer uh, called a Mark Forged X7, which is like an industrial super strength printer. And the Mark Forged uh, enables us to inlay materials like carbon fibre or Kevlar. Kevlar. We could even make... A bulletproof vest. Yes, yeah. So it's box. really, really strong, but it's light. Extremely light. So this is about a third of the weight of the um, of the piece that, that the police could buy commercially. So they could go online and buy something to suit their drone, but it was about three times as heavy. Wow. So the, the number one thing with drones is you want to keep things as light as light, possible yes. so they don't flatten the battery. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it was really cool. Uh, another example of, of that problem solving was the face shields. At the start of COVID, um, you might have seen some of this uh, on the news. There, there was lots yes. of people 3D printing face shields around the world. And that was a really great example of the collaborative effort of people with 3D printers at home or at schools or at universities like we did. Um, they all got together and, and came up with a design that they could send out by email, by computer, so everyone had the oh. same design. Oh, and right. we could easily print uh, face shields to um, to help provide uh, equipment for people in the, the, the medical health industry, which was fantastic at, at really short notice uh, on the northwest. So Australia. someone came up with that design mm -hmm. and it can just be sent to anyone who's doing 3D printing, the same design, and then you all just print from that design. Absolutely. You can receive an email and have something printing within two minutes and from anywhere in the world. Yep. And so, Mark, the bit that, that you guys printed is the sort of solid bit. And then That's right. uh, t tell everyone what the, the shield bit is. So so the shield bit, we, it was actually hard to get our hands on material really quickly. So this is actually... Uh, an A3 laminator patch that we laminated <laughs> together. So we spent a lot of time uh, on the laminator over the couple of weeks because we started out thinking we might need a couple of dozen 
That's just right. as a bit of a process. Yes, tell everyone how many you were you were requested to make. Yeah, so it started out as an idea we wanted to give the students a bit of a problem solving thing to see how quickly we could print the, the face shields. And then at about the same time that week, um, COVID really took off in the northwest of Tasmania where we are at Burnie. And we went to local hospitals and they said, yeah, look, if you guys could sort out a couple of thousand, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> so we had to uh, change our design pretty quickly. And we got it down from about three and a half hours per face shield to about four minutes. Wow. Mm. That's incredible. And I mean, that's a really great example of 3D printing really helping out in an emergency. That's right. It? Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, so a couple of other projects. Um, <laughs> These ones are a bit of fun that I thought I might bring in because I know <laughs> I that, love this that, that fashion's very important here Absolutely, the absolutely. So this is my 3D printed tie, oh, which is wonderful, isn't it's it? It's amazing. It really suits me. I really do think you should actually wear it. All right, I will, if I can get this clip to work and, yeah, and hopefully not break it. <laughs> so again, this is, I, when my students gave a presentation, I gave them a hard time. I said they had to wear a suit and tie when they <laughs> gave their presentations. So one of them was kind enough to, to 3D that's print me a tie. amazing. So I'm sure it's going to hit, you know, fashion runways in Paris. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and this little device here, it's a bit hard to see, but that's actually my big head on a very small <laughs> scale. So we have a, a 3D scanner as well. So you can do the designs or you can just use 3D scanners to, um, to input designs into your computer and then 3D print your own head and sit it on your desk as a friendly reminder of, of how big your head is all day, <laughs> which, is, which is a wonderful that's thing. That's incredible. And the last big example that, I, that I'll give oh, to you. yes, this, this is, is a great one. This is one gets excited about, yeah. Yep. I'll move these out of the way. So this is our 3D printed tank. So every part of this, except for the little bolts that you can see there and the camera that sits in it, is actually 3D printed. So the tank took about 240 hours to print um, and it's remote controlled. So I'll just lift the lid off here. Oh, wow, look at all the components. All the components in there. So all 3D printed. So anything that's not metal was... was 3D printed. That's right, yep. So, again, bringing imagination to life. Yeah. This was something a student wanted to work on. They love remote control um, things and they thought, oh, I would love to make a tank. Couldn't buy one, so they thought, we'll 3D print one. <laughs> and they came up with a nifty device. This is a 360-degree 300, uh, camera. So we can now drive the tank anywhere and get 360-degree footage of, of wherever it's driving to. It's amazing. Yeah, which and, is... And Mark, cool. tell everyone um, what sort of... Like, this has an application in space, for example. What were you saying about, you know, the different sizes of 3D printers and how they can be used in different yeah. areas, Absolutely. like space? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a great example, Louise. I think if you think about being on a spaceship, you can't have a lot of spare parts because there's not many places to store it. But if you've got a 3D printer and you can send those files digitally, and you'll see in the top right-hand corner there, there's a picture of a little 3D printer part floating around in space, you can print anything that breaks, but only print what you need. So 3D printing is going to be a really important part of, of any efforts humans have moving into space. Some other really cool examples there, in the top left hander is a foodini. So that's a, a food 3D printer that the university has, uh, which I did test when, when they had it uh, on display at, at Agfest. What Okay, silly question from me. What mm. do you feed into the foodini to make the food? So you can use <laughs> basically any any food product that can be liquefied. So in that instance, they've got tempered chocolate. So they're oh. making a little chocolate. But you could make pasta or... Oh, so you can make it into a great lollies. pattern and, and that would be Amazing an patterns. interesting way to perhaps sell different kinds of food. That's right, yeah. So if you think about maybe decorations on cakes yes, and things like of course. that. And then you can print out four different foods at once so you can make all sorts of stuff. Willy Wonka. Sort Absolutely, of stuff. Willy Wonka. Yep, but with, without the need for the Oompa Loompas. Exactly. Unfortunately. Oh, that's yeah. a bit sad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some other examples there. That's a 3D printed house. Wow. In the bottom left hand corner, which is pretty crazy. So that's obviously a 3D printer on a massive scale. And a really amazing story the, the one in the bottom right hand corner, that was that's an, uh, an inventor in Phillip Island in, in South Gippsland in Victoria. He used recycled bottle tops to create um, artificial limbs for people using his 3D printer, which is a really cool example of being able to use wow. recycled material, but also being able to make really bespoke parts perfectly fit one person, and in that instance, a little girl that, that, that got a new hand. That, wow, that that's, well, that's really incredible. Cool. So um, that house on the left-hand side, mm -hmm. is that made from the plastic... Filament. That's probably made from uh, some form of concrete. Or something so a bit stronger. Something yeah. a bit stronger. I hope. <laughs> but you never know. You never know. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. 
Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Yep. Well, Mark, I've got so many questions, but I'm hoping that our viewers have got lots of questions awesome. too. So I think what we should do is go for our five minute break and you all come up with some questions for Mark. And when you're posting them, don't forget to put which school you're from and your name. And so we'll see you back here in five minutes. Fantastic. Well, welcome back everyone. And I can see that you've all been really busy with some fabulous questions. And so I'm going to take control of the mouse on my screen here. And Mark, are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Okay. So the first question that we've got, oh, this is an interesting one. Now this is from Lillian and she's from St. Joseph's in Queenstown. And Lillian says, if you wanted to get a 3D printer, wouldn't it still pollute the earth because you use transport to get it here? Good question. Lillian. Excellent question, Lillian. Mm -hmm. And good to see that you're thinking about the impact that, that that transport has. So yeah, I think you're right. Certainly, if you want to transport it the first time, that would cause a bit of pollution. Um, but I suppose that would then outweigh, if you use that 3D printer for the next five years to 3D print a thousand things that didn't need transport, then it would probably negate that. The other really cool thing that you can do with 3D printers, once you had one, is that you can potentially 3D print a second, third, fourth 3D printer. So <laughs> you could have a whole gang of 3D printers in Queenstown that were printed from the first one. So, yep, you there would be... You can 3D print your own 3D printer. You absolutely can. Yep, that's something that can be done. So thank you, Lillian. That's a good question, Lillian. Um, now, we have another question from St. Joseph's at Queenstown. They've been busy. This is from Lilia. And she says, does it take a long time to build flowers? Oh, you could you could 3, 3D print flowers. Absolutely, yeah. 3D printers are really good at, at intricate designs. So flowers would, would certainly fall into that category. The answer to the question, I suppose, depends on how big a bunch of flowers you want. So if you wanted a, a little flower about this size, about the size of my remote, that would probably take about an hour, I would say, maybe an hour and a half. So it depends on how big a bunch you wanted so if it was for Mother's Day, it'd probably take 10 hours. You need to prepare. Yes. <laughs> so you've got enough time. Um, now, another question from St. Joseph's in Queenstown. Uh, Freya, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Where do you get a 3D printer from? That is a fabulous question. So, look, there, there are shops that you can buy 3D printers from. There's, there's specialty stores, electronic shops that you can get them from. But most of the stuff, uh, most of the equipment and the materials that you buy, uh, you get online. Uh, so 3D printers range from anywhere from, you can get a really good 3D printer now uh, for about $700, which is a lot of money, but if, if you think about how much you might be able to do mm. with it, you can get a really good one that'll, that'll be able to make, you, know, you can print all sorts of really cool stuff, like this was printed on a $700 printer, um, and that tank actually was printed on a, on a $700 printer on a Sidewinder. Um, right up to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on, on what you want to print, but mostly online. So they've probably come down in price quite a lot over the years because I know $700 sounds like a lot of money, but really for a 3D printer, that's probably a lot cheaper than they were when the technology first was introduced. Most definitely. And and the the, um, the products that you use to print with have also come down pretty significantly as well. So it's like any technology, it takes time, but things gradually come down mm. and down. And, and if someone doesn't ask you about the filament, I'll ask you about the filament. Yeah. But let's go to some more questions. We've got a homeschool family in South Hobart, and they ask, how would you get a 3D printed house? How much money would it cost? That's an excellent question. So a 3D printed house is basically done by a really large scaled up 3D printer, like a big robotic arm that would pour out something like, something like concrete. But you could use a range of different materials, I'm assuming. And that would work on a six axis robotic arm. So it can move in a range in six different directions. Yeah. Uh, and it would just go round and round and round and gradually build that house up layer by layer by layer. How much it would cost? Probably a fair bit at the moment with that equipment being pretty rare, I think. But once that equipment becomes cheaper to, to get access to, then I would suggest it would be much in the long term, you know, down the track, 20 years from now, I think it'll be a, a much more cost efficient way 
for us to build houses, most definitely. But I at the moment, pretty dear. I think, sorry, Mark, I, I think that house is beautiful that you showed. I think it's a beautiful house. It is I beautiful. would live in that house. Um, and from the same um, family in South Hobart, is it possible to print pasta? And what would it be made from? Yeah, I, I'm assuming <laughs> it would be. Uh, it, basically any liquefied food. So I reckon you could get, yeah, the raw ingredients for pasta, mm. which would be, you can make some really intricate little ravioli. It'd be pretty awesome. Yes, it would. Imagine going to a restaurant and they said, Madam, our pasta is has been 3D printed. Only a matter of time. <laughs> we will charge you double. Um, okay, here is another question from St. Joseph's Queenstown, uh, and it's from Taryn. Mm -hmm. How did they print? Oh, how did they print the house? Okay, sorry, we've already answered that one. Sorry, Taryn. No um, from Macy from St. Joseph's Queenstown. How long did it take to build oh, the surfboard? Yeah. The wake slash surfboard. So I think question. that was done in about 10 sections. And each of those sections, I think, would have been probably the best part of 20 hours. So I, I'm, I'm guessing, um, and now I know my students are going to be watching a recording of this, and they'll, <laughs> they'll correct me on this, but I reckon probably a couple of hundred hours of actual printing, I think. So yeah. qu quite a long time for something quite like that. Quite a long time, mm. absolutely. But look, the thing with 3D printers, you can just run them overnight. You can sit them in the corner of the room. You don't have to keep yeah, them You don't off. have to do anything while look, it's it's printing away. I mean, if we not. if we had the video, we could see that the Eiffel Tower is, is, is probably right. finished by That's now. That's right, yeah. Um, oh, here's a good one. Uh, this is, again, from a homeschool family. Could you print a gingerbread house and furnishings? What a cool idea. Mm. Absolutely, you could. Yeah, gingerbread house, I think, would be amazing use for that for Danny. In fact, when I spoke to the operator of that machine at Agfest, that was something she was very keen to explore. So, yeah, I yeah. think um, I think you certainly could, and you could certainly do really cool decoration with you it. Could. That's for sure. With it. I know that you can use um, icing sugar and things like that with it as well. That would be good for someone like me who can never make gingerbread houses That's successfully. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Ada from St Joseph's, Queenstown. How long does it take to build a 3D printer? Oh, well, I know the answer for a couple of our students who built one a uh, year before last was about a term. Oh, so, so a long time. <laughs> yeah, so a long time. Um, so there's lots of different, obviously, uh, mechanical components to go into that. And also you've got to understand the electronics and the programming. But it's a fantastic project. But you can certainly do it, but I suppose it depends on... On, on your skill levels with all of those different things, but it would give you a great understanding of, of different bits of technology, that's for mm. sure. Keep those questions coming in. We've got a, a couple more here, but it's not too late to post a question. I'm seeing them as they as they come up as you're posting them in. Here's one from Jack W from St Joseph's Queenstown. How long would it take to make a scale of the Eiffel Tower? Well, I guess depending how big it is, but what about that one that you were if showing in the video? Well, for the one in the video, I reckon probably uh, maybe 15 hours. But if, if, if Jack wants to build oh, one... Oh, actual an actual scale... <laughs> Well, look, Jack, I would suggest it would take about as long as it would take me to swim to France to, uh, to go and see the Eiffel Tower, I reckon. Mm. Can you imagine if you did erect another Eiffel Tower next door to the original Eiffel Tower and it was that bright green plastic Eiffel Tower? I or, mean, I think that would be a tourist attraction too, don't you? Or, or gingerbread. Or, or gingerbread. Mm. That would be cool. <laughs> Just not if it rains. That's right. Um, <laughs> Okay, St. Joseph's, Queenstown, you are flying the flag today for questions. Here's one from Nash. How long would it, oh, how long would it take to build a 3D house? I, mm. would, I would suggest a few weeks, uh, and it would depend on how thick the layers are. One of the things you can do, even with our small-scale 3D printers, is determine how thick you want the layers. So the thinner you've got your layer, and you can change all these settings on the software, the longer it takes, but the more detail you get. So with the buildings, I would assume that the layers would be quite thick, but they could probably change that. So it depends on how fine and how intricate your uh, your pattern is, and that, that answer sort of stays the same for anything that you're 3D printing. But uh, quite a few weeks, I would think, Nash, yeah. I've got a few questions for you. Well, I've got lots of questions, mm. but one of the questions I had, Mark, was, um, you know, you mentioned that you can have uh, the plastic filament or you can have concrete or other materials. Do you have to have a different... 3D printing machine for the different kinds of material that you're feeding into it? Yeah, so look, at normal 3D printers, the, the ones that we use and the ones that you might find in some of the primary schools, there's a small range of different um, plastics that you can use. Yeah. Um, so it depends on your printer. Filament. Yeah, so different Sorry. sorts of filament. And different filament does, does different things. So one of our students, for instance, uh, worked on a project um, 
at last term for Grange Resources. So Grange Resources are a mining company in Tasmania, and they've got a, a facility at Port Ladder up on the northwest coast, a, a jetty that goes right out into the ocean. So we needed to build a weather station for the Port Ladder uh, jetty. And uh, what we had to do, because that's in a really horrible place so far as weather goes, we had to make sure that was really weather resistant, salt resistant, wind resistant, sun resistant. So they had to use a very special type of plastic. So there's different plastics for different purposes. Right. But if you wanted to build like the house, for instance, mm. something out or food, um, then yeah, you would absolutely need a, a have different a different sort machine. Of yeah, that's um, right. and that that's a good question that's just come in from Amy. Uh, could you make chocolate pasta? I reckon, I reckon you could, Amy, and I'm all in on that. <laughs> I reckon we should make that a thing. Um, Mark, just getting back to the filament, mm -hmm. can I just lean over and grab that Certainly. filament? So uh, I guess just my questions were a little bit about recycling. Yes. Um, you mentioned that someone had used some recycled bottle tops when they were making something. Is this filament recycled already? That particular one isn't, but, you, but absolutely there's more and more effort now going into using yeah. recycled materials for filament and bottle tops yeah. are a very good and common example of that so we collect bottle tops from around the university yes. and we're going to actually build a machine that, that chops those bottle tops up oh. and then uh, melts them down so we can turn that into filament so we can use recycled material in a new way to create new products because i think you know one of the things that we have to be mindful of with with any sort of manufacturing any sort of fabrication that we're doing mm. uh, is, is the environmental impact. Mm. And, and 3D printers have the capacity that we can use lots of plastic and that can be detrimental to the environment. Yeah. But we've also got some really cool opportunities to make sure that we're doing that in an environmentally sustainable way and we can start to use a lot of the plastic that you'll see around on the planet and, and, yeah. and turn it into completely new ideas and designs. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, very important. I was just thinking if, if you could do 3D printing, you know, in the future with all recycled materials that yep. would just be incredible wouldn't it absolutely yeah so that the um the prosthetic arm that you saw in in the slide before yep. that was done out of out of fully recycled materials wow. which is really cool what about um so say that fantastic um what are we calling it the, the machine oh, um, the machine the, i'm calling yeah. it a tractor the, the but tank the tank yep. sorry the tank um can that be recycled do you yeah, know what so I mean? Like, can the components be recycled? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So if you can chop and melt things down, you can absolutely do that, yeah. Um, and, yeah, so you can you can recycle anything that you 3D print. So any spare filament we can use as well. Yeah. So th the other thing that, that we uh, just wanted to touch on really quickly, if we could jump back to those slides for a second, Stuart, is a couple of things that the students might uh, want to have a look at that they can do for free. Um, oh, yeah. in order to develop their skills. So there's, there's a couple of really good skills that you can develop uh, in order to become a 3D printing expert. And, and these are things that you can access now. So the first one is uh, the central to all 3D prints is the actual computer-aided design itself. So that's the file, the picture that you create, the 3D picture that you create on a computer that we then send to the 3D printer to print. And the software that we use for that is a thing called Tinkercad. And that's freely available. So that's something that I would certainly recommend. Mm. The second thing is not necessarily related to 3D printing, but certainly, you know, as, as I've shown with the, the projects that the students work on, a really key component to all of this is those problem-solving skills. And one of the things that you can do for free with stuff that you've got lying around the house or lying around the classroom is to make Rube Goldberg machines. So I'll give you a quick example of both of those. You might have seen a Rube Goldberg machine before, but you might not necessarily know what it's called. So Rube Goldberg machines, basically you just use all sorts of crazy random items to make what is essentially a useless machine. Oh, yes. So they're chain reaction machines where one thing leads to another, leads to another, and you can use, as you can see there, there's tools from the shed, an umbrella, some ping pong balls, mm -hmm. some toys that you might have in the cupboard. You can use toilet rolls, fishing line, basketballs bits of wood that you might find in the shed. Now, this looks like a lot of fun, but there's actually a lot of different skills that you can use um, that will develop your skills as an engineer uh, by making Rube Goldberg machines because you're solving little problems and you, you're learning to use things in different ways. So it's a really good thing that you can do at home. School holidays coming up might be something fun to try at home. Well, they don't make too much mess. You might drive your parents <laughs> crazy. Um, but that's a Rube Goldberg machine. And the second one I just wanted to show you quickly, this is Tinkercad. So this is a time-lapse of Tinkercad. 
So this is a software application that's developed by a company called Autodesk. Now all of the professional standard um, computer-aided design that we do at the facility and certainly a lot of the stuff that gets carried out in industry uses Autodesk products. And this is a bit of software that they've designed especially for kids. Um, so this is something that, that can start your journey with, with 3D design. Um, so you can start really simple or you can do, I think they're making in this video, in this example, uh, a droid, an R2-D2 model. So that's something that you might want to try over the holidays as well that you can get on, on your computer too. Well, Mark, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, that's unfortunately all we've got time for today, but I would like to ask you if you will come back and visit us again on UCTV Alive for Kids. And I think you were telling me earlier you might come back and be able to talk about VR. We could do some stuff on VR yeah. and, and AR I'd as love well. you yeah, to come back. Will you cool. come back? I'll, I'll be a pleasure. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Now, just a note, if you've been watching uh, this as a recording from the Children's University, you might like to uh, write a reflection on what you've seen today. And there's been so much amazing uh, things that we've learned today with Mark. Now, we're going to, you're going to have some school holidays, so we'll all have a little break while uh, you're on holidays and your teachers have a, a well-earned break as well. So we're going to see you back on UCTV Alive for Kids on Wednesday the 28th of July at 9.15, again, as we usually are. And just keep an eye on our Facebook page to find out who our guest is going to be on that day. And don't forget that you can follow UCT TV Alive for Kids on Twitter and check out the Facebook page regularly as well. That's all from me. Thanks so much for tuning in and see you next time. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of UCTV Alive for Kids. I'm your host Dr Louise Grimmer from the University of Tasmania and I'm really excited for this episode because we're welcoming back a presenter who came on a few weeks ago and talked to us about making beeswax wraps and that person is of course Marie Backer from EPA Tasmania. Welcome back to the show Marie. Hi Louise. Thank you so much for coming Hi. back in. Which way am I heading? Oh, yes. <laughs> Come this way. Oh, Come I'd like closer. To go on the <laughs> there we are. That's better. Oh, that um, funny. Look, welcome Hello. back to the show and thanks so much for coming on again. We're going to be talking about paper crafts today. Yes. And it's going to be a very practical session again, which is a lot of fun. We're going to learn how to make some paper crafts. Now, we exactly. are having a small technical difficulty with our audio, it's a little bit out of sync. So I hope you'll bear with us. But let's get underway, Marie. What are we going to do today? Mm, I'm just thinking we might have to speak slowly or something funny <laughs> to make the sound sync with our lips. But let's try not to make it too distracting. Um, today we're going to have a conversation about paper. And um, we're going to make some handmade paper. Oh, that's wonderful. So, of course, um, you know, we'll... We'll talk about why as we go along. Mm. I've got lots because, of questions for yes. you. As you know, I'm all about reducing, reusing and recycling. And where I work, that's a big topic at the moment, about reducing waste, reducing waste to landfill. Before we get into mm. all of these practical things that we're going to do, how much waste do we actually make each year? Mm. Uh, Tasmanians make about 750,000 tonnes of waste per annum. So with a population of about 500,000, that's a lot. That's a lot, lot of, of waste, waste, isn't it? Is it about one tonne per person per yeah, year? Yeah, because we recycle and compost about 43%. So if we do our numbers, maybe we all generate uh, around three quarters of a tonne. Gee, person. that's a lot, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and that comes from um, when there's a building and they have construction waste, which could some of it could be recycled, by the way. Um, and uh, commercial and industrial waste, like lots of cardboard in shops mm. like in the landfill, and offcuts from factories, and of course what we generate in the home. We generate a lot of food waste, by the way. A lot of food That's, waste and a lot of packaging waste, I was thinking uh, too. A lot of packaging, mm. a lot of plastic, a lot of glass, um, you know, and of course we have things that are made up of all sorts of things, like 
our toys might, might have plastic mm. in them and fabric and metal and those sorts of things when they break are really hard to recycle. To recycle. Yeah. And because we're talking about paper and cardboard today, how much of the waste that we generate is actually paper and cardboard? Uh, it's about 223 kilos per oh. person. Gosh, that's a lot. Yeah. Wow. So I don't know if you get a few students together and imagine how much, how many students might make 220 yeah. kilos. Like about I'm three quite, or four students, do you think? Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, I'm quite a big, tall adult and it would be about three of me. Yeah, gee. So, so that's yeah, a lot. lot. So so you're going to show us some, some ways today to make our own paper and to make yeah. fun things with paper and yeah. to think about how we might use or reuse some of the paper we already have. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, shall we get underway? Yeah, and, and um, we can keep chatting about mm. other things too. I'm a bit hot. I'll take my jumper off. It's a bit warm in here after all. Um, so, yeah, we generate a lot of paper. So we talked about, oh, here we are again. Off the <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Oh, look, that's yeah, good. We'll yeah, just, great. We'll just make and do. There we go. Um, we use paper we use, I mean, we can all brainstorm, think about all the different paper we use, um, cardboard, packaging, tissue, tissues, packaging, yeah. um, paper so towels, half off the screen, half on, paper towels, um, wrapping paper, wrapping, uh, lots of cardboard, cereal, bo oh, cereal cardboard, boxes, cereal yep. boxes, um, all sorts of things, and office paper, and um, of course, we can think about how paper is made and how paper was made in the past. So in the past, people made paper out of linen. Oh, yes. Um, there's something about the black, the plague. Uh, people, I think there was a lot of clothes left after people died. Oh, yeah, cotton <laughs> rags and things. A lot of clothes were made of linen. Yes. Yep. So um, what happens is people were able to pull apart that and make beautiful paper out of linen. And that's why a lot of our paper... From books from 100 years ago are still okay because mm. they were made from linen. Such high quality, beautiful, good paper. Beautiful quality. Yes. But um, there's only so much flax in the world and people decided to make paper from trees. Yes, they did. Um, and that yeah. has some issues, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we can all think about what kinds of animals live in the trees and how if we cut down a lot of trees, we're going to lose those animals. So we can have a brainstorm about that. Some kids put up their hand and say wombats but not really um <laughs> birds possums you know on the, or the insects that the birds eat flying foxes koalas um, koalas not not in tassie mm. nor flying foxes but um yeah and even smaller smaller things like caterpillars and yeah and ants and yeah and all so sorts of insects that's kind of like for many um organisms that's the base of their kind of well that's their habitat so if we cut down trees there's less habitat for those animals. Mm. And if we use a lot of paper, we have to cut down more trees. So that's why I'm here. That's so, it. <laughs> <laughs> so if we're recycling, we're obviously saving the trees. Yes, that's right. So and, and the more trees we have, the better for the environment for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Oh, there's... there's more oxygen. Yeah. What else? Yeah. What else? Um, Think about what, what trees are good for, mm. people who are watching. So, all yeah. the good things. And we'll, we'll talk yeah. about those things. We can talk about those. Yeah. Yeah. So let's have um, a look and see. You've got look. lots of bits of interesting equipment here. Yes, I have a tub, and it's probably hard for you to get perspective, but this is a tub, uh, a plastic tub. We talked about plastic last time. This is very useful plastic. We use it a lot. <laughs> and I put some warm water in here, um, and it's probably about four centimetres tall, full of water. And I'd made up this pulp, which I'll show you what happens, how to do that. I got, the other day, Monday it was, I got some shredded paper from the office. And if you didn't have a shredder and you wanted to do this at home, you could just literally just get office paper, which is used on both sides. Mm, yes, of course. Well, you use it both <laughs> sides. And you can rip it up into tiny pieces. And then I put that in my bucket, a big bucket, and I put um, boiling water on. So if you're doing this at home, of course... Um, be careful with boiling water and I left that overnight okay and it became <laughs> it looked like this this wet uh, pulpy mm. stuff 
So that's the shredded paper that was soaked in hot water. If you didn't have a blender or anything, you can put that in a pillowcase and macerate it and until it becomes like a pulp. So um, to precipitate that or make it go further, and to make it easier, because we have such things as electricity, um, I put it in a blender. Ah, so just a blender so, from the kitchen. Yeah, yep. okay. Um, that's all right. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So I got some of that wet stuff that I just showed you. Yeah. Uh, a bit of water out. I'll get and you put wet. some water in the blender as well. Oh, I you? put some water yep. in the blender and a handful of that, and that will become my pulp. And now it's about to get very noisy. Oh, now we're going to turn the blender on. I'll move the blender <laughs> over to here for now. So get some help with this, this bit at home. Yeah. Or you can use um, a bucket with a paint stirrer. Oh, it. right. Yeah, and just so that, and sort of that stuff mush it. in this bucket, um, you can get the, the power drill and a paint stirrer, but not many <sighs> people have a paint stirrer to, to do inside that bucket. Yeah. So, yeah, as I said, I took some of this and I put it in here. Right. Now we're going to make a loud noise, everybody. Make a loud noise. We turn, turn the blender, blender on. on. So not very much pulp for the amount of. Uh, water. okay. So just half half water and then mm, yeah. Yeah, half water, one handful. Yep. You don't want it very thick. Yep. Ready, set, go. That's probably enough. And. Like oh, it's like a porridge or something, it's like isn't a porridge. it? Yep. Oh, I've done it again. If I keep going off the screen. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> there we yeah. go. It's like a porridge. And so you don't want to do go, it too, Ugh. and you don't want it too fine, obviously. Oh, you can make it fine. Or well, what's really nice is sometimes when you get little bits of paper left in it that uh, accidentally haven't got mulched. See the bit on the end of my ring finger? Yes, yep. And sometimes it's got letters on it. Oh, so when you end up making the paper, paper it's got a little it's got little letters on yeah. it. Yeah. So um, I had already put some in my thing, but that's the um, mother culture, if you like, what you need to add to the water. Now it's like a very thin soup, extremely thin soup, and it's nice and warm. And if I was teaching. I'd probably make some up before we have the conversation about the trees and everything else. Yeah. Because it's nice for it to sit in the warm water and get more fluffy and get softer. Oh, yes, it does get fluffy, doesn't it, the yeah. longer it sits so in the So if I just blend it and chuck it in, it might not be quite so ready. But I'm also terribly nervous because it's always a bit of an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to put my That's the fun away. of it, Marie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm on the screen, off the screen, it's... Ah, now, if we go back to there, yeah. So what I've got here, um, over here, is a, a towel and wet newspaper. I think it being wet it helps. And I've got what I call a couching cloth, which could be just like a chuck super wipe or whatever. Originally, these things were from. Just the dust covers from the operation rooms in the hospital. Oh. <laughs> so they're not hospital waste, classically. They're just um, cloths. Cloths, so th ra a rather thin cloth. Yeah, yeah. like a... Um, yeah, like a yeah, chucks. <laughs> like a chucks yeah. super white, like yeah. a kitchen cloth. So, or a nappy. I've got other ones there, nappy liners. Oh, yes. People had yep. um, cloth nappies. Yep. So I'm going to put this on my wet newspaper. So you've just wet the newspaper just sort of, it's not yeah. sopping is it? It's just no, sort of just a bit damp. Yep. And now here we go. We have a mould and a decal. Oh. Now these are quite big. I've misplaced oh. my other ones. So I get mixed up. I think that's the decal and it's got fine mesh on top and um, beautiful wooden thing and this is probably centuries old this technology. Mm. And this thing fits snugly over the top, and it's called the mould. And I think that means that it moulds the right shape. So uh, it's important to have the wire stuff on the top. Not like that. Mm, yeah, you want yeah. the wire 
on the top. Do you want the flat surface? Yep. Yeah. And then we put our mould on. And I'll give my stuff in the bath a little swish around. <laughs> and then I'm going to go deep sea diving. I'm going to go down like that and stay Ooh. around the bottom for a while. I'm not, I'm not putting my thumbs on top. And I'm going to give it a little swish. Yeah. And I'm going to come up. Oh, it's terribly oh. thin. <laughs> um, and I can see that it's too thin because it's sort of holes. You can see the wire. Yeah, I need to add more porridge. Yeah. So back we go. <laughs> and the way to get it back in is to go tap, tap. So it is a little bit experimenting required. No, that's good that that happened because you can show what to yep. do if, if it doesn't quite work. So put yep. in more porridge in, more porridge. make it a bit thicker. I made up some the other day, so I put that in. <laughs> I guess it's a bit of a, a fine art to try and work out exactly how thick to get your yeah. porridge. Yeah, and some kids go, can I put it in? And everyone in the class puts some in. And then it's too thick. It and then it's too <laughs> thick. But then you can make a thicker card. Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. There are different thicknesses, yeah. obviously. Yeah. And while that's sort of warming Agitated. up, if you like, <laughs> I'll show you something that someone made. It was just a little... So you can use that pulp to make paper mache things. Um, that way. There we go. Oh, oh look at sorry, that. everyone. <laughs> I'll get this right one day. It's very counterintuitive, everyone, what we're doing, because like we see the opposite of what you see. Yeah. <laughs> so this is how they make paper mache things in... Um, I think they make them in India and they coat them with beautiful lacquer and stuff. It's oh, basically just that pulp. That's lovely little bowl. And I bowl. put that in a cup, a yeah. plastic soft cup, and then it came out and it had, we'd had food dye in it, so I don't know. Or you could, what you could do is make paper or something like this with seeds in it. Oh, nice. And then you can plant that thing. Yes, great. In the garden. Yep. Not weed seeds. No, but, no, um, flower seeds. Flower seeds. Yeah. So that could be like a little, um, a little, um, what they call it, a little bomb. That's great. And that would be a good present for people too. Yeah, yeah, a seed, seed bomb. Mm, seed bomb. But the paper mache is how it holds it all together. Holds it together. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, that's I've got great. Um, a sample of what a friend made as a sample of paper, handmade oh, paper. So you can add colours to it. Wow. Um, food dye doesn't work very well. But you can add to this um, mix in here, you can add dye or um, petals or leaves or um, tissue paper. Tissue oh, paper yes. leaves a lot of colour. For the colour. Yeah. And you can make patterns. So can Look make at that. Patterns That's really clever. And swirls and things. Yeah. Um, and you can also decorate this later, which I'll show you. Now I'm going to go back again. Gee, I hope go diving works. again. Go diving <laughs> again. So I'll give it a little swish. Figure of eight, if you like. <laughs> And go deep sea diving again. <laughs> and I'm going to give it a wiggle, draw it up again, mm, and take this off. That looks better. Looks better. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to apologise ahead of time. I'm not used to making such big ones, but I've misplaced all my gear. <laughs> I think I've lent it to a school and I can't remember who. So if you're out there and you've got my gear, let me know. <laughs> Please return so, Marie's gear. Tap, tap. And you'll notice I've got like an old raincoat on the table and things. Um, what I love to do if, with schools is to do it on the veranda outside. Oh yes, you know, because it's, so it's a bit nice. wet, isn't it? It's a yeah. it's a it's a good it's a mucky wet, craft. Yeah, you can get like you get your arms oh. wet, you get your everything wet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to come over here. Remember, this is my couching cloth, and I'm that's right. Yep, hold on my, the newspaper. Hold yes. my breath. Uh, you can just stand it up. Fingers really crossed, matter. everyone. It doesn't fall off. <laughs> Put that down there. Press it. Oh, you can see the water coming. Yeah. Coming through. And then slowly peel back. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> this is the magic of live television. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Slowly peel back. Come on. Go back again. And in theory, nope, it's not coming off. I think my nope. It works every other time I do it. I tell you. But 
science in action, isn't it? It is. Yep. Nope. Not working. Not working today. I'm going to go back again. We'll try again. Courage. We'll try and we can keep talking while we're doing this. We'll keep talking. Yeah. I was going to ask you um, how we can think about some of those ways that we can reuse paper. I know where I work um, at the university, we've taken some really big steps to try and reduce our paper use Ooh. through trying to print on double sides for paper when we have to and perhaps trying not to print things out and try to take our laptops or our devices to meetings or for teaching and things yeah. so that we're not printing out so much paper. Um, what are some of the... Other oh, I know something that I was going to mention. I get toilet paper from a company that wraps it in really nice paper mm. and I've actually reused that paper to wrap <laughs> yeah. up gifts because yes. it's... It, <laughs> It's really nice paper and, um, you know, it's black and white and there's different patterns and, and yeah. I've wrapped up lots of um, small yeah. presents in that paper. I've also reused a big calendar sheet that I have on my, oh. um, in my office that is a big, every month has big black and white letters and you can tear off the paper and I've wrapped up presents and they look amazing with oh. black and white paper. So there's lots of ways you can reuse things, aren't there? Yeah. Maybe... Uh, people watching can think about some of the the um, other sorts of paper you could use for wrapping up presents because there's no need to really go and buy wrapping paper. You can reuse wrapping paper that people have given yeah. you as well. My friend teased me because I every Christmas it's pretty much the same paper yeah. for a few years. <laughs> well, I think that's great. The other thing is um, there are some cultures that wrap up presents in cloth, the Japanese, for example. Oh, yeah. Um, and I've often wrapped up presents in brand new tea towels. So you give someone a tea towel as well as... Yeah. You know, the present. So yeah, you know, I'm, going um, there with your... what we'll do after this, hopefully this works this time, <laughs> is we can show I can show you how to make things out of old calendars. Oh yes. We'll make gift bags out of old calendars. Oh great. And I've got a whole assortment of things to show you. Oh my goodness, let's hope this one works. I'm not used to my big There's a lot of pressure when you have to do it live as well, yeah. I think. <laughs> Oh, there it is. Yay! So, it worked. watch, everyone. I did the same thing. I just needed a bit more pulp. And sporadically also, we also <gasps> add a bit more... Um, we add a bit more warm water as the day goes on because this whole batch of oh, soup gets, gets cold. cold. Yeah. So, you know, if it's another class group that's coming through and you're doing it at school, just duck out and get another jug of water. So you've got to keep carefully. it warm. Yes. Keep the water warm. So what I could do... Louise, do you want me to move that? Yep. Let's put this down. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put this for you. There we go. Just here. And um, what I can do now is dry my hands a little bit. And in the classroom setting, I will huh, add a few of these things over <laughs> now that it's not a wet place. It sort of gets a bit tricky here. What I can do with my bit of used envelope is cut a little piece of paper and I can write I'll write Louise on this <laughs> I'll give it to her sorry over here I keep moving off the screen That's so right. there's the person's name okay so this piece of paper even though that looks a bit funny over here we end up compacting it with more and more of the same couching oh. cloths paper couching cloths paper oh right so you might put a hundred on top by the end of the day oh, so you just keep doing what you so did yeah even though that looks lumpy and bumpy yeah it'll get squashed yeah okay <laughs> yeah yeah so then I can decorate this potentially um, I just have some fabric that happens to look like a leaf because I was sewing the other night and I had some off cuts um, I can decorate this piece of paper, but only with very thin things. Oh. It's very fine. Maybe I'll make some clouds up there. Or what have you got there? Some cotton? Just some cotton that oh. was left over. I'll just make a random thing right yeah. now. <laughs> I um, saw you had some nice rosemary or something. Oh, no, well, yeah, whatever that was. No, not very, rosemary. Bit very thinner. fine things. That's it. You can use a, a leaf. This is, looks a bit like a gum leaf. If you had a very thick piece of paper, you could put the gum leaf on 
And if the paper didn't break, you could take that off later and there would be an impression. Oh, yes. Like a coin has an impression, you know. Oh, great. Like a fossil. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm putting um, some decorative things on. You don't have to. You don't have to at all. It makes it look very interesting, though. Yeah. So then, then I decide I'm finished. Oh, you can use thread. Beautiful. I've got some beautiful embroidery thread. I could do bits of that. Um, Good so for using I'm, up um, bits and pieces that yeah. are left over too, isn't it? Yeah. And it's also possible to use a bit of um, lace or doily. Oh, look. And you could put I that on. I know where you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, oh, later, lovely. if it's not too hard, if it doesn't break the paper itself, you can peel that off and you've got, again, oh, the impression. Wow. So there's lovely things you can do. Okay, that's so great. Then, to be polite, I'm going to get my next couching cloth. I'm so glad it worked, Louise. Oh, so that am I. How terrified I was. Um, and you did very on. well under pressure. Because for the next person, that's the that's oh, polite. So then so the next person they've comes. They've gone and dipped and they've come out and they've gone, oh, my hands are full. Um, mm -mm. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's nice. I that's, see what you're saying. You're putting the cloth yeah. on so that the next person who comes along doesn't have to do yeah, that. Can, that's great. Yeah. Um, there's another trick you can do. Um, if, say, for example, that piece of paper was really thin, or you wanted to do this, um, you could put something, some wool or something. While you're while you're doing that, Maria, I'm just going to um, say to everyone because we've got such great things going on here. I'm going to ask you to send in your questions to us as we're talking. So we might not have a little break yet. So think about some questions that you've got for Marie and you can send them in on the chat and uh, we'll see them come in as they come in and Marie and I will keep going because there's yeah. so many great things that she's got yeah. for us today. Yeah. So normally I'd finish that piece of paper and I'd put that on. Alternatively, I could keep going with this, put something fat there. Oh yes. And so that's then, a bit of cloth, that's a bit of um, wool that you've got there, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And then I could go and put another piece of paper on top of that, so that oh. is effectively sandwiched between two bits of paper. Oh, so you wouldn't put the cloth on; you would then go back into the pulp and do it again and, and pop it on yeah, top. Yeah. So you can. Oh, so you'd see it through you can the have paper. A sausage, in, like imagine yeah. the fat wool. You can sausage that inside it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So you'd have and quite a thick piece of paper, wouldn't you? You would then? have a thick yep. piece of paper. Yeah. If this is too thin, you could go back in and dip it again. Wow. You could have done that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Sense. But essentially, that's, you know, what you do. And so, Marie, when the, um, I might be going ahead a little bit, but when the paper dries, you will know if that doily is oh. going to come off or not, won't you? It will just yeah, drop off decide. or you peel it off. Or if I want to use it again, I'll peel it off. Yeah. And then I'll show, um, while we're talking about what happens afterwards, this piece of paper will be Louise's and then I'll make one that says Tess and then I'll make <laughs> one that says Stuart and then one that says Marie and I'll put I'll have a big stack yeah and I'll put something heavy on top a board maybe a big board and a couple of bricks or something for one or two days and outside probably because it'll squeeze the water will squeeze out yep so put something heavy on it for a few days to compress it. Days. Mm. And then, lo and behold, we peel these off and that thing <laughs> will hang up um, on the line and we'll put some peg, clothes pegs ah. and that will dry for a day or so in the wind and um, it will have Louise written on it and we can take the little label off that says Louise. Oh, okay. But if you're making yep. one for everyone in the class, there's no debate then about who's is who. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if there are lots of people having a go. Yeah, so you have to make a plain one. At least you have. Yeah, you know. And, and then um, you can take your little name tag off. So you're compressing it for a few days first. Yes. And then it's got to hang for a little while on the yeah, on the clothesline or the in the line. or in the classroom or wherever yeah, it might yeah. be. So you have to hang them like that. Yeah. yeah. If that fell off, and I'm lucky it didn't today, um, then it's probably too wet to hang. Oh right. 
Maria, I've got a question that's come in for you. Yeah. Let's do them live. Well, the whole thing's live. But what is that big rectangular thing you use to make the paper sheet from the wet shredded paper? Oh. So I think the... The decal. Yes. And and where, the decal. And where would you get one of these from? I know that's a um, lovely old one, but where, where yeah, did we get something I, like that? Possibly um, if the people are in Hobart... Um, Teros, possibly, the eco store. So Teros is um, just down from where we are, actually, here yeah, on Elizabeth, Elizabeth Street, Street in Midtown in, yeah. in Hobart. Um, I was given this, so I'm not sure. They used to sell them at the Wilderness Society, but we don't. I don't think there's a shop anymore. Maybe online. online. So Alternatively, there's some other ideas. Um, this oh. is an embroidery oh, hoop. Oh, yes. Right. So you can get one of those from um, a haberdashers or from Spotlight. Yeah. So that's effectively the um, decal. You can see I have used it before. <laughs> and I put some mesh on the top. Got bits of paper falling off. And then the embroidery hoop um, is keeping it as oh, a frame. That's a good idea. Yeah. Oh. So for those of you who are not that's familiar, the embroidery hoop comes with two uh, wooden circles. And a little, you can tighten it with a screw. And then Marie's just added the, the mesh. Yeah. So when you buy the hoop, it doesn't come with the mesh. You have to add the, the mesh to the hoop. Yeah. Oh, then you could use, I suppose that becomes your um, decal. And then another hoop that is the same circumference could be your mould. Because you have yeah. to have those two pieces, don't you? You have to have that. Yeah. that I mean, you could dip that in straight away. And come out with a yep. bit of pulp. And then you turn it over and and do what you, you yeah. did with the bigger and one. And then you yep. do this. I don't want to get the floor all wet here. But imagine <laughs> I dipped in and I got my pulp. Uh, I could try it here. Wait a minute. Oh. I'll just give it a whirl. So imagine you had your pulp on there. I don't want to turn the blender on while my hand's in there. No, I was and just then thinking that. Another experiment. Here we go. Flip. Um, press, press, press. There we are. Ah. Oh. A little piece of paper. So you, you could conceivably use something like that. Or when people are yeah. frying food, you get something like this with a handle and it's a mesh. Oh, yes. Yeah. You could use one of those. Oh. So if you weren't worried about the, the perimeter on the yeah. side... The actual um, shape, you could, yeah. Oh, now here's a question from yeah. Sonia. And Sonia says, where could you purchase a decal in Burnie? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, the old paper mill, the handmade paper centre. But I believe it might be closed now. Oh. I'm sure um, they would have them. I mean, they're the experts in Tasmania in yes, making paper. You they have made ah, wallaby poo. Paper, oh, yes. Roo poo. There's a lot of poo paper in the world, isn't there? Yes. There's sheep poo paper. I yeah. saw a program once, yeah. and they have made beautiful paper out of yes. poo. Yes, so people make paper out of linen. Um, That's real recycling, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the Bernie people used to make them out of denim and flannelette sheets. Oh, wow. Flannel or so pyjamas. All sorts of beautiful, things. Beautiful, beautiful paper. Yeah. Sonia, I was just thinking but, um, where, where you are in Bernie, maybe a couple of the um, antique stores. Uh, there's a big store in Devonport. Um, that I like to go to, they might you might be able to pick up you know an older decal in mm. one of those stores. But I guess in Bernie it might be online yeah, shopping. Yeah, might be online. Or shopping. you could you could pick up maybe an embroidery hoop um, online. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a bit tricky, isn't it? Because they're quite a specialised tool, aren't they? Sorry, I'm, I've lost my little bit of wool. I'm going to show you the principle of. Um, Sandwiching one oh, thing yes. in between. Yep. There and then you can see the colour will come through. Possibly. And the texture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if you, at this stage, and you put tissue paper on, you've decorated with tissue paper, yeah. it will bleed into the next person's one. Oh. So if they don't like your colour, <laughs> bad luck. <laughs> There's going to be trouble. But here we have, I call it a little worm. So we put, <laughs> imagine we'd made a beautiful thing, put that there, yep. press it down. Press, press, press. Eventually, when that comes out, you'll see the impression of that, that cotton that I had inside that wool. Oh, great. And then, to be polite, oh, and these are moistened. 
Yes, yeah, so they've got to be wet, don't they? Yeah. So I had a bucket over here with some couching cloths ready. And Marie, that's going to be squeeze. a thicker piece of paper, obviously, because that's got yeah. quite a bit of pulp, hasn't it? Yeah, that's got a bit of pulp in it. You could make um, Christmas tree decorations out of something that size, couldn't you? Yeah. Maybe if you had something and you put it put inside it. it. Mm. Yeah. With this one, um, I would have had a cup or something um, and I'd maybe put a bit of olive oil in it. Oh, so it comes so off. so when this dried, yeah. and then I put it under the wood heater, yeah. when this dried, it would have popped out. Uh, that. That's a good question I had for you. Um, so if you do something thick like that little bowl that you just showed us, yeah. do you have to do extra drying than just leaving it to dry? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Does it yeah. need to be sort of, you said you had it by the fire, it needs mm. a little, because it's so thick, does it yeah. really need a bit of extra help to dry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't leave it out in the weather right now. Yeah. It needs longer. Um, there's another possibility, and um, I had a treat the other day, a little bit of chocolate bar. You could put very um, fine little bits of foil. Some people put glitter. You know, you we don't make... use glitter anymore, do we? No, or we try people, not to use people glitter. Don't like it. No, it's not good for the no. environment. So that's reusing and recycling. That's a that's Again. real reusing. Chopping and up your um, oh, chocolate my, wrapper. My friend at work has made paper out of lemon peel. Really? Yes. So what, you collect all of the peel and then pulp She's it? She's dried it somehow. I'm not sure. So, wow. yeah, people have been making paper for centuries. And it's a very interesting... Um, oh, my kids are at the Stone School. They call it a main lesson. They do a whole lesson on printing and paper and the history of writing. Wow. So, you know, we used to write with quills. And, yes. And typewriters and yes. the whole thing and calligraphy and beautiful... Um, it's a lovely whole inquiry. I yes. Think. And originally paper, well, the Chinese did a lot to make paper available and accessible. And mm. I think that helped the world have access to books and mm. reading. It's very difficult if you're in Egypt to carry around a big tablet well, that's right. with hieroglyphs that's on it right. <laughs> and go off to school like that. Yeah, paper so really has changed our lives, hasn't it? Has. it? I mean, and now uh, it's computers, but paper really did have a huge impact on the world and education yeah. and and I guess if you're making um, you know you see beautiful homemade paper for writing letters which is mm. a lovely thing to do and to receive you need to be careful about what pen you use don't you because sometimes pens can the paper is very porous isn't it it, it, it mm. soaks up ink so you sort of have to choose yeah. the 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 pen that you might be using quite carefully and you don't want to rip the paper either that's the other thing I've found when I've mm. written on handmade paper you have to be quite gentle if you're writing yeah. a letter if I was really good at this I would have made very fine beautiful paper what um, I'm not an expert what we could end up doing with this paper that says Louise is sticking that onto another piece of card Oh, yes. And in the card, say Happy Mother's Day. That'd be lovely. Yeah. That's so, a good idea, yeah. yeah. So you put it onto a, a just a, a recycled card. But yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and make a beautiful so, card. What a great idea. Yeah, so all the cards that you make could actually be made from recycled paper. Yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, you could put seeds in that paper, like calistamine or beautiful native mm. or something, or poppies or whatever, plant that thing. Yeah. In the ground. In the ground. The other thing That's is, I mean, that looks yeah. a little bit like a, a nice artwork to me. You could actually <laughs> give that to somebody as a yeah. as a picture. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. Um, now, have we got any more questions that have come in? No, we haven't. No questions from anybody? It's not too late. Not too late to send in a question. And while we're waiting if there are any more questions... If you um, put these leaves into the double paper, will they show? Would they show through? Oh, like sandwiched? Yes. Um, you you might see it, but they go brown. Oh, okay. <laughs> like I've got some um, rose petals here, which I could have put on. Um, like pot puri. Yeah. For those of you who um, know what pot puri is, I've, <laughs> I um, hmm. they go brown when when they get all wet with the paper petals. Um, possibly they give a nice bit of texture, don't they? Yeah, I, I had this actually for soap making. But um, this, if we add it, I think we should experiment. It might go brown. 
it might stay. Uh, but you asked about making an impression. We could put that in, sandwich it, and maybe it, it wouldn't go brown and bleed colour because... Um, it will be sandwiched. It's an experiment. It's it a is. Science it, there's experiment. A lots of different things you can do. Yeah. And and sort of just as we're finishing off, Marie, with this one that had the swirl, do you know how they achieved that swirl? I think she's made a batch of paper, this, this done a swirl, and then add, put, made, put some colour in the, some other and then added that. Oh, so, so she's sort of she's gone, gone like twice. that. She might have gone like this. Because it's really pretty. Yeah, she might have um, gone... On the decal. Oh, my, my pup is very runny here. <laughs> um, something like this. You know, gone round. Ah, okay. And then dyed and then, it. Ah, and then flattened it. Yeah. I, I left this outside. I thought, maybe it's not so bad. It's got some soil in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then she might have got the red and then done the, the flip thing. Here's a question, Marie, while you're doing that. Yes. This has come in from Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Can you use the wet shredded paper as paper mache? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Oh, and, great question. Um, you can put PVA glue in, like white glue, craft glue, yes. in to make the paper mache a lot stronger. Oh. Yeah, so that doesn't have any white glue in it. It's a very humble little thing. But to add white glue... It makes it um, not very toxic. I wouldn't eat out of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, makes it stronger. It's stronger and mm. a little bit shiny. Yes. I, I had my and son made um, a little paper mache bowl at school and it, it looked like that. It was blue on the inside and it had a little rim of sort of silver or something, but they definitely put, put the glue in. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. So it's another thing you can do with the paper. Yeah. Oh, I'm having fun over here, patting yeah. my paper. Um, oh, I got, that's all right. We yes, have some I think... other craft to do, but we probably don't have time. No, you know, we, you'll that. have to come back on again. Oh, I will. Yes. And all right. Um, and I might have one more question. Let me just have a look here. Ah, will we be making gift bags today? <gasps> oh. Sonia asks. Oh. oh. We've run out of Should time. I try and do it quickly? We've got five minutes, have we? Should we try and do it quickly? All right. I'll quickly All right. put these we'll do things an express. away. Let me express. see if I can help you. Um, Move all of these out of the way. If you can pass the, the calendar in the red bag. Sorry, everyone. Going off the screen. There's a calendar. No, that's not. Oh, well, I think of it. Here's my teaching manual, <laughs> which has got paper making instructions in it. So we can put that on the link. Um, I'll hold that for you. You hold that. Yep. yep. Oh, that's great. So that's we the really um, the teaching manual about waste, and this one's about food waste, and they're yep. all available on the. Um, we'll put we'll put a link up for that on our yep. Facebook page. So. There it is there. Should we have the down camera? Yeah. Imagine my table was really clean. <laughs> uh, this is from the, uh, oh gosh, from <laughs> the weather calendar. I'm going to cut the bottom. Actually, you don't have to. So I, I look at what's on the weather calendar and I think, oh, I might like the rainbow on the front. So I'll flip it round and I can send instructions. Hold it over. And then imagine I had my glue stick waiting. I would glue this line here. So I've effectively made a little tunnel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've made a little cylinder, if you can see that. Then I'm going to about. Um, Two thirds of, oh, a quarter to two thirds of the way up, I'm going to fold it like this. It's all a little bit awkward because calendars are all different shapes and sizes, but if you get the principle, and then I'll do what I call the frog. <laughs> so I'm going to squash that like that. Uh, yep. Yeah. Clever. Yeah. 
And then I go just beyond the middle crease to there and to here. And again, imagine I had some glue or some sticky tape. And that's basically it. But oh, that's clever. So that's how you get the bottom. Yeah, if so I had, it stands up. If I had glued it all, it would be nice yeah. and easy to... That's um, such a good way of using um, yeah. calendars and, and other bits so of... That's an old calendar. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So... <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And then you could sort of put a hole um, in the top and tie a, a ribbon or... Yeah, you could put, you could put um, some for the whole punch and make on a nice it if you thing. wanted to. So that's basically... I'm sorry, if I had glued it, it would be more robust. But it stands up yeah. So that's much the by trick. Itself. The trick is that little frog bit that you just did, yeah. Marie. Yeah, yeah. And I've got water all over it and because everything's been wet here. Oh, that's great. So, yeah. Another oh. tip I could have said was at the beginning to fold over the top. So it's got a nice rim. Oh, so it's got a nice, yep, yeah, egg on it. So if we've yeah. got a minute left, I'll do it yeah. fast motion, right? <laughs> so no it pressure. Over, make a cylinder. Fold it up, then the frog, <laughs> then da 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 da, and you would sticky tape there, yep, and, or glue or there. Glue, oh, yep. and the nice thing is to hook that over. So now, oh yes, yep. Bag. yep, that's great. Yeah, trust me, it does stand up by itself. Oh, that's a wonderful way of reusing <laughs> yes. calendar pages and, 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 and other things that you'll have. Look, thank you, thank you, Sonia, for reminding us about making yeah. um, gift bags we nearly forgot. Mm. Well, Marie, that's all we've got time for. Doesn't yes. the time go so yes, quickly? Really thank you so much for coming in today again. It was lovely. It was, that yeah. was wonderful. I hope thank everyone's you. going to be getting enthused about making their own paper and yeah. thinking about how you can recycle things. Now, just a note, as usual, if you're watching this as a recording from the Children's University portal, you might like to write a reflection about what we've talked about today. Now, next time on UCTV Alive for Kids, I'm really excited to welcome uh, Professor Greta Peckle. And uh, Professor Peckle works at IMAS, which is part of the university. And it's the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies or Science. I've got I've studies. got one of the studies, thank you. And she's going to come in and do a fabulous presentation called Squids and Other Suckers. So that's next time on UCTV Live for Kids, but that's all we've got time for today. See you next time. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of UCTV Alive for Kids. It's great to have your company again. I'm Dr Louise Grimmer from the Tasmanian School of Business and Economics at the University of Tasmania. And today I'm really excited to welcome our special guest and that person is Professor Greta Petzl from the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. That's a mouthful, isn't it? it welcome is, to the show, yeah. Greta. Thank you very much for having me I'm on. Really words. excited to have you um, here with us today. Now, you're going to be, uh, you're a climate and marine ecologist, and today you're going to present to us about squids and other suckers. That's my favourite title for one of our programs so far. Before we start, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at IMAS and how you got interested in science? Okay, well, I was always one of those kids that liked um, walking along the beach and picking up different animals and looking at different critters and thinking, well, how does this lay its eggs and how does where, where does it eat and where's its butt and, you know, all sorts of different <laughs> questions about animals. And uh, so I was always interested in the natural world and we'd go down to the beach once a year with mum and dad and mum would always shriek if we ended up in the water past our knees and I'd think, what is so scary that's in the water? Uh, and got quite interested. But then when I was a teenager growing up in Glenorchy, we didn't really know any scientists or even really any other people that had gone to uni other than the teacher and the doctor and it didn't really 
occur to me that you could be a scientist. That Ooh. dawned on me later on and, and I worked for a couple of years and then went to uni at the University of Tasmania and did a science degree and it all blossomed from there. And your interest, hence your interest in things in the water, yes, which we're going to hear yes. about today. Well, before Greta gets underway with her PowerPoint presentation, just a reminder that we'll have the five minute break at the end of the presentation. And that's time for you to get your questions into the chat function. So think about your questions as Greta is giving her presentation. And if you can put your name and which school you're from, that would be wonderful. So I can read that out when I read your question as well. Shall we get underway, Greta? All right, let's do it. Take it away. Okay. So, squids and other suckers. Um, we'll start off, though, with an acknowledgement to country. So we're on Nipaluna land um, that was is still occupied by the Muanina people, and they have cared for sea country um, for many, many thousands of years and have got a really extraordinary knowledge um, of our marine environment. So I always like to pay respects to the Muanina people because they know an awful lot about the kinds of things that I'll be talking to you about today as well. So we'll be talking about squids and their relatives. So that's called cephalopods. So cephalopods are octopus, um, cuttlefish and squid. And there's over 650 different species of squid, octopus and cuttlefish. That's wow, a lot, that isn't is a place? huge number and I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge number That's of amazing. them. amazing. They are found only in marine systems, so only in salty water systems, but they're found everywhere throughout the oceans. And they come from the mollusk group of animals, so soft-bodied animals, so snails and barnacles and clams and worms and those kinds of, of animals. And cephalopod literally means head foot. So if you think of a snail, a snail's got that really muscular foot on it. In a cephalopod, that muscular foot is what's turned into the arms. So cephalopod comes from the word, the Greek word, head feet. So octopus are the ones that um, are more blobby and they crawl around on the ocean floor. They can swim as well, but most of the time they're crawling along the ocean floor. Squid are usually the group of cephalopods that are really good swimmers. So these are the fast, you know, elite mm. athlete <laughs> versions of the cephalopod, um, really fast swimmers. And cuttlefish are more designed for hovering and for really delicate, fine kind of movements in and out of rocks and, and um, caves and nooks and crannies in the ocean. So they all kind of have a slightly different sort of habitat that they specialise in. Greta, um, some people say that octopus or octopi, mm. whatever the terminology yeah. for a group of octopuses, octopuses, are very clever. Is that oh, true? they are all very clever, mm. and I will get to that oh, in a good. slide. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. No, they're called. They're sometimes called the pinnacle of invertebrate evolution because they're such smart mm. um, critters. So, if we look at the anatomy of cephalopods, they've got that sac-like body that's called the mantle. They've got their head, um, and they've got arms that come off and then two big long feeding tentacles. So squid have got um, feeding tentacles as well and octopus have only got arms. Now the difference between arms and tentacles is that arms have got suckers all the way along them and tentacles have are just um, muscular tubes and then they've got suckers right on the very end of them. Um, but you can see that they've got their, their head with the arms coming off the head. So it's like if I had a ring of arms coming off the top <laughs> of my head, the head and then the squid body, and they've got a funnel just under their neck that they can shoot water out at high speed, which is how they oh. jet around. Oh. So they'll suck in water, seal their mantle cavity, and then shoot the water out of their funnel, and then that's how they can swim backwards really, really wow. fast. And just the fins sort of direct, the help fin, direct The them? fins, they can also swim with fins, but it, you're right, they use that as a directional kind of rudder, wow. like on a canoe where you've got a got a, a rudder for your direction. And two eyes? Two eyes, yep. <laughs> but there are lots of really weird things about cephalopods. So they have three hearts. Wow. They've got a big main heart like we do. But then they've got a heart at the base of each of their gills as well that pumps blood around. 
They can breathe through their skin as well as their gills, so they can extract a bit of oxygen out of the environment um, via their skin. They can use a smoke screen to get out of danger. So all cephalopods have got an ink sac in their body oh, yep. and they can use that in different ways. One is they can just squirt it all over an animal that's trying to um, capture them, for example, and clog up the animal's um, you know, gills or breathing with this murky jelly kind of um, ink. Or they can go, they can use it as a smoke screen. So the animal might be a dark colour and then it'll make its body go completely white and then shoot out a black blob of ink and then move off really quickly in the other direction. And the fish or whoever's trying to eat it goes, gets, you know, fixated on a black creature and then all of a sudden there's a black blob of ink. So it gets so distracted. Sort of like a chameleon almost yes. if it changes its oh, colour that I've way. Got, I've, got, I've got some slides oh. on that too. And, and Greta, is the ink different colours between those three main cephalopods that you showed us? Or are they... No, all... they all have a black it's ink. It's black. Yeah. It is black ink. Yeah. But their, the skin of a cephalopod can be different colours and I'll show you why in a minute. So we've just talked about how they move by jet propulsion. They've got a beak like oh. a parrot. And I've got a picture of one of those coming up. Um, and they can regenerate their oh. arms or tentacles. So if one accidentally gets nipped off by well, that's a fish, handy. yep, they just grow another one. They're pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. So this is this um, shows a section through the body of a cephalopod, kind of if you think of it cut through the middle like that. And why I wanted to show you this was you can see the head of the animal with the arms coming off and its big eyes. And then you can see something that is, is its stomach. And if you think about it, the squid's food, when it eats it, passes through its brain before it gets <laughs> to its stomach. So remember I showed you before, it's got like its ring of arms um, coming off the top of its head. Its mouth is here. Oh. And so the food literally has to go through the brain to get to the stomach. That must be here. why they're so clever. <laughs> Depending it's, on what it's you eat. very weird. Um, and that's why they've got this beak like a parrot, so wow. they can smush the food up really small because it's literally got to go through, their, through brain. their brain. And so their brains are shaped like a donut because the food's literally got to go through it in a tube. That's amazing. It's weird, isn't it? Very. <laughs> yeah. But you mentioned cool. that they were smart, and they mm. are really smart. So octopus can use tools. They can recognise individual people. Mm. They are the Houdinis mm. of the marine environment, um, and they play with toys. So we've had octopus in tanks when we've been studying different aspects of them, and they will escape. Um, <laughs> you've got to distract them when you're trying to... Um, like remove bits out of their tank of like food that they haven't eaten. Um, we've got to distract them on one side with like a a um, net or something so that we can sneak in and get the take the food bits out because they just like to come and play and and have uh, lots of fun. They can squeeze octo octopuses can squeeze through tiny, oh, tiny areas, can't they? I've seen yes. some video. The limit on the space, the size of the space they can squeeze through is the size of their beak. Right, because that's yeah. the hard bit that can't yes, really squish. Yes, that's the only hard bit in their body. So in Gee. an octopus, say if you had an octopus about this kind of, like basketball size, yeah. the beak would probably be about that big. So they could really get through kind of size. a hole. Yeah, they could that's get through hard. something that was mm. probably a little bit bigger than maybe a 50 cent piece. <sighs> that's yeah. incredible. I tell you, there's kooky, there's more coming. <laughs> All right. So lots of marine animals hatch out um, looking like something entirely different to what they end up as an adult, so yeah. they metamorphose at some point. Cephalopods hatch out as little functional adults, like their body plan com is completely developed. And what you've seen in this video here um, is, is, a, is a little cuttlefish using its butt. It's got a special, a special enzyme on its butt, and it keeps hitting the back of the egg sac with that enzyme that dissolves the egg sac and then eventually it backs out. So that's how they get out of their... their um, that's highly eggs. unusual, isn't it? It is unusual, yeah. 
they've got really short lifespans. So most squid, for example, and most octopus live for only about one or two years. That's not very long at all, really, is it? No. <laughs> and I bet you're wondering, Louise, how we know that. I, I am wondering. Yeah. Please I can, tell I us. Tell you, I can tell you why that is. <laughs> So squids have got ear bones called statoliths and when we take out the statolith and polish it up and look at it under a microscope, there's one ring laid in that ear bone for each day that they're alive. Oh so goodness. most of my PhD, when I went to university to become a marine biologist, most of my three-year study project was looking down a microscope, <laughs> counting these little rings. <laughs> That's dedication. <laughs> it is. Um, and through that, you know, we figured out this is from a southern calamari, a species we have around here in Tasmania, and this one was from a male and it was 226 days old. So, Greta, that's a little bit like, you know, when you cut down a tree and exactly you look at the, the rings like in that. a tree. It's yes. very simple, but such a short lifespan. Yeah, really short. They grow like nothing else and that's because they eat ferociously. <laughs> so we'll, we'll have a look at what else we've got here. So this is some suckers from its arm and each one of those suckers has got independent nerve control and they can actually smell through their suckers. So that's why you'll see videos of octopus creeping around and touching things with their oh, arms. They're literally smelling, smelling the environment. Yeah. Wow. What else have we got? Ooh, the skin. So the skin of cephalopods. This is a close-up of, of squid skin, and each one of those cells is called a chromatophore. And chromatophores are full of um, different coloured dye, or melanin is, is the compound that's in there. And you can see there, there's those um, black, black chromatophores. They can shrink all those down so you only see tiny dots and then you'll see all the red chromatophores. Or they might shrink all the red chromatophores and only show the black ones so the animal will look black. Or they can shrink all the chromatophores and seem completely um, pale or, or white. So this is how cephalopods can change the, the colour color, of yeah. their skin. So that's what they do when they're trying to hide from a predator. Yes, yeah. and I've got a fantastic video to show you about right. that. But they use all these patterns all over their body to communicate with each other, mm -hmm. um, to hide, and they can also change the texture of their skin. So they can make their skin look all lumpy and, you know, like, like they're hiding in, in a, in a seagrass oh, or right. an algae yep. or something yep. like that. But let's have a look. This is my favourite cephalopod video <laughs> in the world. So you'll see, um, and I'll show this in slow motion as well. So we can see blobby bit of seagrass, algae there, algae, not seagrass. Can you see a cephalopod? Oh, see? And it oh comes out. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, and you wouldn't have known that no, was there, uh, would you? It would be quite and a we'll, shock if you were filming that and yep, all of a sudden. Yep. This is what, so when we're out sort of diving and, you know, walking around looking at, different, you know, in, in um, marine environments, you, you sometimes just won't see them, but they'll be wow. there. Now, this is it showing showing you in reverse, the camouflage. Oh, yes. So, look, you can, you'll see it changes its colour and then it changes the texture on its skin oh, yes. and then it's almost invisible. Do you know, so, I thought it looked like it was shrinking, but it's not. It's no, actually it's just, just changing the way it looks. I thought it was sort of shrinking the back. environment. It's pretty wow. cool, isn't it? that is really cool. All right. So, I bet you're wondering what is the biggest squid we have in Tasmanian waters. I am. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Please. All right. Please Lots tell of us. people <laughs> might say the giant squid. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But they might not be right. So, you, you would have heard of the giant squid. Um, and you would have seen these, you know, pictures from, um, you know, different books and things. And we actually think that's a bit of fake news. We don't think that there's, you know, giant squid out there that are attacking Bringing down and, pirate ships. No, and... <laughs> no, no. We think there might have been a little bit of a made-up fantasy there. But you can see that giant squid there, and that's pretty giant, isn't it? It is really giant. 
We oh. have something called the Colossal the, Squid. Well, that's better than giant. I mean, and I'm, I'm wondering, <laughs> you know, there's, there's so much that we don't know about our deep ocean and I'm wondering what are they going to call the next one that they yeah, find? Exactly. What's, what's bigger than colossal? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but that's pretty colossal, Look isn't it? Look at the it? size yeah. of it. And, I mean, really, these are found in the southern ocean, so south of Tasmania, not really in Tasmanian waters, but they're certainly um, around in the ocean. Now, both the colossal squid and the giant squid are found in... In super deep waters so they are not things that anybody's ever gonna see but people often have the discussion over who is the biggest <laughs> the giant squid or the colossal squid now the giant squid might be a little bit longer if you pull out its tentacles and yeah. stretch them out but the colossal squid is actually um, much heavier and you can see that it's got a totally different body shape it's a much bulkier yes. kind of the fin. squid. Yeah, yeah, the fin especially is really different. Yeah, the giant it? squid's the, you know, tall, skinny sort of supermodel version and the colossal squid's the, you know, beefy, <laughs> the beefy one. Um, but they are the largest two invertebrates in, in the, the world. world. Yeah. Wow, and they're down They're south down from deep, Tasmania. very, 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 very deep. Gee. So if you look at, I like this picture because it kind of oh, shows yes. um, these two squid's uh, in comparison to one of, you know, that big red bus that cruises around yes. um, Battery Point in yep. Salamanca. And you can see the body is kind of, I don't know, about half as long. Then you've got the head and then lots of really long, um, the really long tentacles that, that stick out as well. So they're, they're quite big. Now, if we look at the colossal squid, that's called Mazonkatuthus hamiltoni. I love that name. <laughs> Say that really quickly five times. <laughs> yeah. Its body is is pretty brown. They live, you know, 2,000 metres below the surface of the ocean. They're eaten by sperm whales. They're about 500 kilos, so about half a tonne in size. And their eyes are about the size of a school ruler across. So about yep. 30 centimetres yep. across? Oh, my, I was saying they were a metre. Oh, yeah. no, they're, <laughs> like, they're 30 centimetres. That? Wow, yes. that's still a very big that's eye. That's a huge eye, isn't it? Um, and and this it's is the largest eye of any animal. Any animal in the world. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Gee. And obviously they have, cephalopods have such big eyes because they're smart. You know, they're absorbing a lot of information about yeah. the environment um, and they have really big brains as well because they're doing a lot with the information that they get. So they're looking and they're smelling and touching yeah. and tr and sensing yeah. predators, I assume, yes. and, and, and food, obviously, yes. as well. Yep, yep. Wow. they are really smart. Wow. So this shows the – this is like a downward look at the, oh, mouth, the mouth of a colossal squid. You can see the big arms coming yep. around that. Yep. And then that white um, – muscular bit in the middle is where the beak goes and this is what the beak of a colossal squid looks like so that top so picture has like got the a, beak on it the, the top picture of the beaks in that in little there. muscular oh, right. sac yep. there um, and then they could pull that white skin back and show the beak oh, if they wanted wow, yeah look at the so beak. it's a it's a the beak's a pretty sturdy looking thing we'll look at giant squid now yes so this is archaeotuthis yep. ducks another very cool scientific name very um, Archaeotuthis is Greek for chief squid. Uh, and female squid are around twice the size of Ooh. males. Uh, that's very common actually in All cephalopods right. that the females are the larger ones. Um, and in sharks too, which is why that Ooh. shark song really annoys me. Baby shark, it's biologically inaccurate. <laughs> Mummy shark is bigger than daddy shark. Remember that anyway. anyway. <laughs> I, 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 I digress. It needs to be revised. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> But the giant squid, even though it's so huge, its eggs are only about one millimetre big. So they grow from this one millimetre thing to into those giant squids um, in, in a couple of years. I know you might be going to answer this in the future, but I'll just ask it while I remember. How many eggs would they lay? Oh, they like tens of thousands or hundreds oh, of thousands. Oh, because they're eggs. only one millimetre, I yes, guess you can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, animals tend to either have a small number of pretty big yeah. eggs and offspring or large numbers mm. of like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands mm. of, of, of eggs. The giant squid was only filmed live for the first time in 2006. Wow. And I was, and actually that was at a conference here in Hobart that, that we hosted a separate really? conference here in Hobart. Um, and that film was shown for the first time to wow. all the cephalopod researchers in the world. How exciting! In two thousand and six, yeah. So there's still so much to discover about you know, creatures in the world and our oceans and 
we, we, we know more about the moon than we do the deepest parts of the of the ocean, which is means there's lots left to, to yes. discover. Now, as I mentioned earlier, both the giant squid and the colossal squid live in really, mm. really, really, really deep waters. Mm. So they're never, ever where people are. In fact, there's no reason <laughs> to be frightened or worried about any kind of cephalopod at all except the blue ring octopus. Oh, yes. I remember when I was growing up as a child, always yes. being told about the blue ring octopus. Yeah, so you go mm. looking in rock pools and mm. picking up things and having a look around, but if you see an octopus, you just put it back down. Because the thing about blue ringed octopus is that it won't you it won't have the blue rings. It'll just look like a plain little octopus unless it's about to bite you, and then it shows you the. Oh, so it the gives blue you a nice rings. little warning. Then yeah, That's it kind literally of it. is the mm. warning. It literally <laughs> is the warning. So the oh. bite is completely painless. You yes. won't feel it because it's a neuro venom. Um, so it sort of gives you a little bit of pain relief and then bites you. <laughs> um, but kind. these, these um, blue ring octopus are hiding in crevices and shells and, you know, thing, things like that. So, you, you know, there's no need to kind of panic or worry. Like if you see one, you just go, whoops, and mm. stick it back down because mm. they are not, no cephalopods are aggressive at all. They mm. will just keep away from you if they, if they see you. But I just thought I'd, I'd mention this one because, mm. you know, sometimes people mm. don't know. They think it's a little white octopus or whatever. Um, but they're yeah. If you if you see small octopus in in inshore areas, you keep you away. Don't pick them up. You can watch them because they're not going to jump out and hurt you or anything. <laughs> but you just it's a it's it's a look and don't touch. So I just thought I'd mm. I'd mention no, that. That's one. good. That's a good advice. Yeah, <laughs> very good advice. Yeah. Some other cephalopods that we have in Tasmania include the arrow squid, the southern calamari, which is what I've done most of my work on for about two decades oh, wow. now. There's a Maori octopus and there's another one called a pale octopus. So these are the larger kinds of cephalopods and species that we see um, in and around the coastal areas around Tassie. And we've got a new one turning oh. up as well called the gloomy, <laughs> gloomy. octopus. Gloomy? Oh, yeah. how did that octopus get such a sad know. name? I think it looks pretty happy there, but when yes. you see them... Um, sometimes they've got these big white sort of um, circles around their eyes and oh. they can look a bit... A little bit down in the dumps. Greta, who gets to name species? Who named? Who chose I the name don't Gloomy? Know who called that one the Gloomy Octopus. That's a that's a pretty I big job, know. isn't it, to yeah. come up with the name for so a taxonomists species? are the groups of scientists that study um, what what constitutes a species and all the different characteristics of species. And I don't know a lot about the naming mm. of you know new animals. Um, that are discovered. discovered yes, uh, but it's a very yeah, there's a very sort of rigorous process on, yes. on how you. So go it doesn't just that. get named after the person who discovered it. No, and I mean gloomy mm. octopus aren't new new. They were living um, in New South Wales and Victoria. Yeah, but they've turned up in Tasmania just in the last ten years or so as our waters have gotten warmer. Uh, yes. Mm. Mm. So you could ask me a question. I will. I'm going to ask you a question about that. Can I do it now? (laughs) You you can do it. (laughs) This is a question that some of you might have been thinking about, but I'm going to hop in and say, so Greta, you know, as the world is getting warmer and our waters are getting warmer, um, what's happening with that in Tasmania where we live and I guess more generally as well? What happens as the water is warming? So we, you know, there was a new report out yesterday sort of showing how much temperature change we've had all over the planet. And most plants and animals have really defined temperature ranges that they're comfortable living in, just mm. like, you know, we do. We all have a temperature range that we that we like. Um, and so what happens with plants and animals is that they live in their preferred temperature environment. And then as it warms up, it opens up new areas that might have been too cold before. And so for us here in the southern hemisphere, that means more um, available habitat down south. So um, a plant or, or an animal in the ocean that might have liked, say, 12, 12 degrees in the water, um, as the water further south hits that 12 degree temperature, it'll sort of slowly start moving down the coast and surviving better. and Sort of migrating yes. south. Yes, yeah. so we have mm. plants and animals in the northern hemisphere are moving further and further north and plants and animals mm. in the southern hemisphere are moving further and further south. So there's this big redistribution of what plants and animals live where as our oceans warm, as our planet warms Mm. up. 
Yeah. That's very important, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. And that's something that I might even be able to come and talk to you about another yes, time. Yes, because that that's was, your area. That's that one is, of that's your areas my, of, of yeah, research. So I started interest. off working on, on um, squid and, and octopus, mm. uh, doing mainly field work, swimming and diving and fishing and all that kind mm. of stuff, looking at um, how quickly they grow, how they spawn, where they lay eggs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then sort of moved into working on climate change because I think that's pretty important that we understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. So these are the species that we have um, here in Tasmania, the main sort of um, big ones that people might catch if they go out fishing. But these are two of my favourites as well, so I thought I would mention these as well. Pretty. <laughs> One is Euprimna tasmanica, or the southern dumpling, dumpling squid. squid. <laughs> this would be the cutest little squid. It's really I pretty. Think. Yeah, I know. Colours it's beautiful, are gorgeous. Isn't it? This, one, this wow. does something pretty kooky too, which I'll tell you in a minute. And the other one is the southern pygmy squid or Idiosepius notoides. And that's also very funky. The Idiosepius is about the size of your small fingernail. I was going to say, is it really adult. small? Yeah, yeah, because it's called a pygmy. Yes, yeah. yeah. So in Tasmanian waters, we kind of have some, some of the largest species, mm. so giant squid, and some of the smallest species <laughs> in the world or Idiosepius. Now, I'm going to tell you one cool thing about each of these. There's lots of cool things, obviously, but we have to be selective at the time. <laughs> We've got lots of questions coming in, I can see, <laughs> which is great. great. Yeah. Um, so the dumpling squid is nocturnal. It only comes out at night. And in the day, it uses, it puts mucus all over itself and makes this, like, sandy coat so that you can't see it. You just, it sort of hides, buries, kind of partially buries in the sand, puts this sandy mucus coat over the top so that no one can see it. They're very That's hard clever. to find. That's clever, yeah. isn't it? But they'll come out at night. night time. And then the, the pygmy squid or idiosepius, idiosepius have an adhesive gland on their back. So they literally suck to different things. They attach wow. themselves via their wow. sticky back to kelp and um, seagrass and things like that. And it just means they can just they literally can just hang there and hang not, there, use, yeah. not use any uh, energy up while they're, they're attached to the, to the habitat. Wow. Yeah. Do you know what I thought we might do? Because we've got so many questions coming in, we could actually start answering some questions instead of having the five-minute break and people can still post their questions because yeah. there's a lot coming in, Greta. Oh, that's good. Well, so let's see. Let's see. Your, to yes, go, I want to so. see because I was going I was, to ask you about field work. Yeah, well, I, mm. I just wanted to show this slide to show the kinds of things that a marine biologist would do um, to discover more about plants and animals in, in, in the ocean. And so you can see one picture there. We've got our setup in the laboratory at IMAS, or the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies. And that's where we had um, octopus in there and we were feeding them and trying to see how much they needed to eat, how quickly they grew, um, the timing of when they had babies, when they spawned, what kind, you know, the growth rates of, of their mm. babies, all that kind of stuff to try and better understand um, their biology but we also do lots of field work and that bottom picture there is some colleagues of mine um, counting squid eggs so we would oh. we would do lots of um, dive surveys normally the eggs would be in in the ocean obviously we would leave them there but every now and again we'd measure how many eggs are in different sized mops yeah um, and then we would put them back and they survive um, just fine yeah so we would look at at um at how quickly they grow. Southern calamari is the species that I've done most work on and that we've probably done most work here in Tasmania. And they have this really complex um, behaviour. You'll see them on shallow inshore seagrass beds all along the coast in Tasmania. The males and females form temporary pairs and they do this elaborate um, colour displays and, and dancing with each other before they mate. And the males have all different kinds of strategies that they do to impress the lady squid. <laughs> Sometimes they form pairs, there's really big bull males, and there's little sneaker males as well that put on the colour displays of females so that they can get up close to the pairs of, pairs of squid, the male-female pair, and they just mate quickly with the female while no one's looking and the male doesn't, doesn't uh, bat an eyelid because... He thinks it's another female, but it's not. Um, and then they go away. So they do some really interesting behaviour. And I thought we could just oh, finish yes, up a with a video of them spawning under the water. So this is a female and she's laying one strand of eggs. Each one of those white finger-like things have got about sort of five to seven eggs in it. 
um, and she la lays one strand at a time. Wow. So the male gives her a sperm packet and the female yeah. can store that for up to sort of four or five months and just use that to fertilise the eggs when she feels like it. Well, that sounds like a very good way or, to run things. Yeah. <laughs> or they can... Uh, this one actually has got the male guarding her um, above there oh. and so they probably have just mated and she's spawning... Uh, she's um, fertilising the eggs as she's laying them. But if males are in short supply, they can just store that uh, sperm and fertilise wow. the eggs when they feel like it. So as part of your field work, you obviously dive down and you spend a lot of time yes. watching the squid. Yes, yep. we would, yeah. yeah. So we really try and understand um, how quickly animals are growing, where and when they're spawning, um, what kinds of habitats they need to spawn in so that we can um, use a lot of complicated maths to put all that into into um, sort of statistical models to try and understand what kinds of um, growth rates these populations have and then how much fishing can occur on these animals to still leave enough of them there to have a really healthy population. Mm. That's wonderful. Well, look, should we go to questions? Sure. Let's, let's yep, go to let's questions, I think, because right. this has been fabulous and all the questions I've got are probably going to be asked by people. So... Let me just bring these up here. Okay. Ooh. So, Greta, first question. This is from St Paul's Grade 2 class. Yeah. What is the biggest type of squid? The biggest type. So the mm. biggest type of squid, oh, it would be a toss-up between that colossal squid or the giant yeah. squid, and it depends on what you mean by biggest. Mm. If you mean longest, mm. it's probably the giant squid by the time it stretch out its tentacles. If you mean... Um, heaviest, then it probably is that colossal, colossal squid. squid. Yes. Here's um, now this one is an anonymous question, which is mm. totally fine. How many suckers do octopi have? Oh, all different kinds of numbers, and actually, it's one of the characteristics that a taxonomist might use to differentiate between different species. Ah. So sometimes. Mm. Um, species might be a little bit tricky to tell apart and they'll often go to suck accounts on the on the arms to, well, this one has 48, therefore it must be <laughs> this species and this one has 200 suckers, so it might be another species. So it just varies. Yeah, it varies. It species. really varies a lot. But it's it's at least kind of, you know, 20-ish and up to hundreds on mm. each arm. I yeah. think the coolest thing that I've learned is that they smell through the suckers. That's we, amazing. smelling through your hands. That would be kind of gross. Oh, it would it? be horrible. Yeah. Oh, I don't think I'd like that. <laughs> Me neither. Mm. What is the hardest part about being a scientist? Oh. The mm. hardest part. Well, there's oh. lots of things I love about mm. being a scientist. Mm. So I love going to work and doing all sorts of different things mm. every day. And being a marine biologist means I can look at something in the ocean and go, I wonder why that is, and then go figure it out. So that's kind of cool. That is cool. There's lots of cool things. Mm. The hardest bit probably would be um, that, you know, we, do, we deal with some complicated things. So, you know, mm. you it's, it's helpful if you want to be a scientist to be good at maths and good at computers mm. and things like that. Um, and I think um, it's a job where we've got to be pretty productive all the time. Mm. So we publish research articles um, and we've got to apply for our own funding. So when you become a scientist, nobody gives you a big magic pot of <laughs> money that you get to go and buy all your cool equipment and things with. We've constantly got to apply for um, more funding and so we write a lot of grant applications and I think that would actually be the hardest thing is writing um, all these these grant applications and you might get like one in ten so the hard actually That's the hard. hardest thing about being a scientist is getting used to rejection <laughs> so we will often put yep. we'll draft really exciting projects and put them into the funder um, and then we might not get the money but you just get up and you do it again and, yeah. And the reason for that is because there are so many other groups of scientists exactly. who are putting in for money yes. as well. Yeah. All like, worthy it's, projects. It's limited, limited, mm, limited funds. Yeah. Here's another question, an anonymous question. How long has it been since the gloomy octopus was discovered? Ooh, 2005 or 2006. Oh, it's quite new then, isn't it? Yes. Wow. So 
um, we started getting reports of the gloomy octopus through a project I run called REDMAP, which is the Range Extension Database and Mapping Project. And people that are fishing and diving all around um, Tasmania or Australia, mm. actually, can take a photo of something that they see that's unusual and they send it into the website. And we then get scientists to check that out. This is sort of like citizen science. It is a citizen mm. science project. That's right. So anyone could be involved. Yeah. But when we got these photos of the gloomy octopus, we didn't know if they were new, new to Tasmania mm. or if just they were just new to us and no one had um, reported them before. So I got a PhD student called Jorge Ramos from um, Mexico. He came to Tasmania to study and he did a PhD or a three-year research project looking at the genetics of the gloomy octopus. Um, and he was able to show through the genetic study that that was actually a recent rapid um, range extension or, or movement into Tasmania. That's great. Mm. Good question. Um, now, here is one from someone who is homeschooled in Margate, Nadal. Does the octopus see in colour? Ooh, I don't actually know. It would be hard to tell, I, really, I guess. Yeah, unless I, I actually can't remember. Um, I know they see different things to us, so what an octopus sees might might not be quite exactly the same as what, what we see. Um, yeah, I can't, I don't know. We, That's we'll another find thing out. About being a scientist, <laughs> you, actually, is yeah, we don't you can, you can remember all the things. I'm sure somebody <laughs> knows, but I don't know. We could find that out. Good question. Uh, Ber Bernie Primary School, which octopus is the smallest? There's also a little octopus called a pygmy octopus, and I think it's roughly the same size as the pygmy squid. Oh, so so it's tiny. Yeah, about, about the size of like a thumbnail or something. Oh, that's like really that. tiny. Yeah. They're oh, so wow. Huge. Imagine They're seeing really those. Cute. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to keep going with these fabulous questions. Bernie Primary School again. Where in the ocean are their habitats? Okay, so we use the word habitat to mean pretty much anything in the ocean. Oh. And so if we're, we could say, you know, if it's just a big long pile of sand, then that's a sandy habitat. Um, if it's just the sort of murky depths of the, of the ocean and it's just the water, you know, the water, we would call that the water column habitat. Um, or we might have a coral reef habitat oh. or a... Um, seagrass habitat or an algae habitat. It's literally just the word that we use to mean what that environment type mm. looks like that, that animals prefer. Here's another question from Nadal again in Margate. We talked about the squid's eye, yeah. but how big is the octopus's eye? I guess it depends on the size of the octopus. It, does it, it all depends on the size of the animal, but octopus also have very large eyes and very large brains mm. for the size of their body. So if we were squid, Louise, <laughs> if we were squid, our eyes would probably be about that big. Oh, c compared with our yeah. current size. Yes, yes. About our heads would be yeah, bigger right. as well. <laughs> oh, just <laughs> but, to make you have our really, really be... big brains, wouldn't yes. that be? Yes. <laughs> would be a lot of fun. Yeah. So it all depends on the size of the, of, the, of the octopus. The biggest octopus, I think, is called the Pacific Giant Octopus, and they live around Alaska and around America. Oh. Um, and I think they're around 30 or 40 kilos. All right. Yeah. Heavy. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. quite a few so, bags of potatoes. Yeah, yep. it's, it's quite, quite heavy. <laughs> it's quite yeah. heavy. Do you know, that was good that you just said that, Greta, because that was the question that had come from Treehouse Academy. What is the biggest octopus? Hmm. Here is a question from Luke and Kate, who are homeschooled. Where do the giant squid lay their tiny eggs? Do they just float in the ocean or get laid on the deep sea floor? Awesome question. Good question. So there's, we know very little information about how giant squid reproduce. In fact, I think there's only been one... Uh, so very occasionally they get caught on deep sea fishing gear. Mm. And I think there's only one mature squid with eggs that they've found, um, fem female squid. Mm. And I don't think they've seen many egg masses in the, in the wild. So they've yeah. found, they've they have caught little giant little babies yeah. that they've been able to use genetics to confirm it is baby giant squid. 
um, but they don't know how what the how the eggs come out and what it kind of looks like. It's most likely um, produced in a big circular gelatinous mass with thousands and thousands of little eggs all stuck together in it and that floats in the water column. That's how a lot of deep sea squid spawn, but we don't know. No, because it's so deep down, it's yeah. hard to, to investigate, yes, isn't it? there's very little information known about most creatures that live in the deep in ocean. In the deep ocean. Mm. Now we've got five more minutes, so we'll squeeze in a, a few more questions. Okay, here. rapid fire. Oh, Let's rapid go. fire. Delarine Primary School. Does the female giant squid eat or attack the smaller male squid? Squids are cannibals. I was going to ask you that. Are they? <laughs> yep. So they so, eat each other. Um, oh, they will. I think they prefer to eat, you know, fish and um, crabs and <laughs> other things like that. So they mm. only eat protein sources. So they only mm. eat other animals. Um, but if they can't find another fish or a crab or something like that, they will start looking at each other oh, like, I sad. think you look quite yummy. <laughs> yeah, so they, they will eat each other, yes. Yeah, good question. Uh, East Derwent Primary, uh, grade three and four, I think. Uh, how long does it take for an arm to grow back? Good we question. We don't know. No. Yeah. Too hard to, to yes. watch, I suppose. Well, maybe. I think it would probably mean scientists would have to chop their arms off and watch how quickly they grow back and we kind of don't want to yeah, do that. Yeah, we don't that. want to do yeah. that, do we? Yes. But um, probably pretty quickly because they only live for a short short time. time. That's Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah. Now, Bernie Primary School, I just want to say kudos to you because you have got a lot of questions here. So I'm just trying to go to a couple of All other right. schools. So apologies, Bernie Primary School. Delaray Primary School. What is a predator of the giant or colossal squid? Good sperm question. Sperm whale. Sperm whale. Mm. Mm. Sperm whale. Yes, so they often catch sperm whales with scars on them oh. from the squids. Oh, yeah. really? If a giant squid is, is um, you know, trying to defend itself from a sperm whale, they've got – each one of the suckers has got little toothed rings in it, and so the – that you'll get these little ringed um, scars on the sperm oh, whale. I've seen that before. Yes. Is that what that is? Yes. Oh. And if they get attacked by a colossal squid or they're tr a colossal squid's trying to fight back from a sperm yeah. whale, a colossal squid has hooks in their suckers oh. and they'll they'll have big scratchy marks up their body. Oh, my God. I wondered what those circles were. Right, we've got time for one more question. And there are so many questions here, Greta. So I'm sorry, everyone, if I missed out on reading your question. Linda's Farm North Primary School, Year 5 and 6. Where do you go diving to find these octopus and squid? Anywhere. <laughs> you could find them in any... Um, part of the ocean but my favorite place is the east coast of Tasmania so Frasenay, Coles Bay is where I've done oh, most of my yeah. diving work so the videos that I just showed with the southern calamari spawning yeah. swimming around and laying eggs that is in really shallow water in Hazards Bay which is just off um, Coles Bay there. And you were telling me just before we came on air that you've taken your children with you into the field. That's right. My mm. kids have always come out in the field with me. So they've been um, recording sort of different things as we catch them out of the ocean. They've fed animals in tanks with me. Um, they've helped me sort of um, beach sane to catch fish to feed Oh. Um, octopus and, and squids in tanks and yeah, well, that's great you're training them up as research office. assistants yep well look everyone that's all we have time for we could we've got so many questions I we could have we should have gone Louise. for an, another yeah. hour yes um, but Greta, very thank you the questions. thank you so much for coming on today that's that right. was just absolutely fascinating thank and you I very much for having me I think all the questions are testament to your presentation now next week is science week so this is a big week for you next oh, week Greta yeah, absolutely um, but it's a big week here at UCTV Alive for Kids because we have got a program every day for you next week at nine o'clock in the morning so you can register to watch these programs either by visiting the our Facebook page or having a look at the Underwood Centre website. There's a special section there for UCTV Alive for Kids. So hop on and register for those programs for next week. So that's every day next week for Science Week at 9 o'clock in the morning. And as I said, that's all we've got time for. So thanks so much for tuning in, everyone, and we'll see you next time.
And welcome everybody. I hope you are bright-eyed and chirpy. Welcome to National Science Week and of course welcome to STEM Alive for Kids. How are you doing? You doing good on this lovely Monday morning? I hope you are. I'd just like to quickly thank, of course, the Department of Education and the Peter Underwood Centre for making this possible. Thank you guys so much. But most importantly, and I think you want to get stuck into it this morning, do you know how energy is made? What is energy? Is food edible? And how does energy relate to food? Well, I'm glad you asked these questions because this morning we have a very special guest with us, a very special one indeed. We have one associate professor, Evan Franklin from the University of Tasmania's School of Engineering. Hi, Evan. How are you? Good morning. Very well. Thank you. So apparently, apparently you study energy. Is that correct? I do. I love energy. I'm always thinking about energy and I study energy at work and I talk about energy at home. <laughs> you sound like you're a high energy person as well. I like to be. <laughs> now, you know, it's pretty early in the day, Evan, and uh, mm. I haven't had anything to eat yet. Apparently you might be cooking us uh, something special today. <laughs> well, yes, I've brought in my breakfast and the reason I've done this is, um, do your mum and dad ever tell you kids that you've got to eat a good healthy breakfast and they say you need it because you'll need all of the energy for the day, they probably don't give you a coffee. And so this is the sort of breakfast I would normally start with, maybe some fruit, a bowl of oats, and most days that gives me enough energy to get to work and get through till lunchtime. But mum and dad were right. You do need a lot of energy to do stuff. And so on some mornings, I'll have this breakfast and then I might have some toast as well. Mm. Definitely a banana. There's lots of energy there. And another bowl of breakfast, perhaps another bowl of oats here. Sometimes even an egg and maybe another apple. Mm. And the reason I have all of that is if we can just put those slides up for me. Beautiful. Is some mornings, I'll get out on my bike mm. and I know that if I'm going to ride up lots of hills, ride to work, ride for a couple of hours maybe even, wow. that I'm going to need a lot of energy. Mm. So there's a lot of energy in food, mum and dad were right, but that's only one form of energy and that's actually not the form of energy that I normally um, work with and study at oh. work. Um, so you asked the question, mm. Sam, what is energy? It's what a really is good question. Energy? Yeah. What is energy? What is energy? We know that there's energy in food, mm. but what is energy? Well, energy is something that can do work. And work's a funny word we use in engineering and physics. It means the ability to make something move or heat up or shine brightly with light. And they're all forms of energy. Um, and energy comes in lots of different forms that we're familiar with and we use every day and I'm going to show you a few. So it's not the kind of work where the little electrons put on a little suit and tie, grab a suitcase every morning and head into the office kind of thing. <laughs> not quite. Here's oh. some images with a lot of energy. So these are wow. some explosions. Um, lots and lots of energy in an explosion. <laughs> A big, massive waterfall, water rushing over. You can almost hear it, can't you? There's a, so much energy in that water that's rushing over that waterfall. Wow. Lightning. That's very cool. Yeah, this is a really cool photo. Yeah. That, there's so much energy in that lightning, but only mm. for a very short amount of time. Mm. And one that I missed, actually, I'm going to go back to. We got a new puppy at home, <laughs> and there's so much energy in a little puppy bouncing around. <laughs> but... This is all energy that is very hard for us to use. And in society, we need a lot of energy. And I'm gonna talk about in a moment why we use all that energy and how much of it we use. But we found a way to use energy more effectively. Okay. So here, this is energy that you would be familiar with. At home, we've got a fireplace. That's how we heat our house up. And so wood contains energy much the same as food does, mm. but we can burn it and make heat, and that's a different form of energy. And so we've converted stored energy in mm. wood to heat. Interesting, interesting. Ooh. So it's kind of like if you, we can burn fire, wood for fuel, we also sort of burn food for energy sort of kind of thing. Exactly. We absorb it. In right. fact, we sometimes have a choice of whether we 
make food for eating mm. to turn into energy that we can use or use it for energy, for example, for driving cars. And I'll come back to that at the end. Yeah, it's a car can eat it instead. A car can eat, <laughs> eat your breakfast. <laughs> um, here's another form of energy that we use a lot of, and that's oil or mm. petrol. And you can see um, it coming out of a um, hose on the mm. right, but then we use that in cars and aeroplanes. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the energy that we use in the world comes from this form of energy, mm. and then a lot comes from this. This is coal. If you burn coal, you get a lot of energy out because it contains a lot of potential energy, we call it. Okay. Why is it called potential energy? I'm going to come to that. I'm going Ooh. to come back to the egg and show you. Oh, you know exciting. I mean? Potential yeah. energy, yeah. yeah. Because one of the things with energy is it comes in lots of different forms, but mm. it's only useful if we can convert it from one form to another form. And here, you can see here we've got water flowing out of a pipe. It's mm. a bit like that waterfall, but now we're controlling where the water goes. And one of these pictures here shows a big dam, and at the bottom of that dam is a large power station that converts that moving water mm. um, into electricity. And that's a form of energy that we use a lot of um, in our everyday lives. So is that because the water is so heavy as it, like, pushes down under its own weight in the dam, it goes through a little a little fan kind of thing like a pipe at the bottom and it comes out? Exactly, right. yeah. It turns the potential energy, which is the water sitting up high, mm. I'll come back mm. to that with the egg, into kinetic energy, ah. which is when something's moving really fast, spins around a turbine. <laughs> I'm doing kinetic energy, come on. <laughs> yeah. And turns it into electrical energy. Wow. So, this is actually a really important thing about energy. You can't make energy from nothing and mm. you can't make energy disappear. And I think it's time for the egg. Oh, that's exciting. Well, it sounds like we better go to our top down handy dandy camera. Yeah, I got, there's one more form of energy that you see here, which is wind, which is, can be a really annoying type of energy. But also, if you can convert it to electricity with wind turbines, it can mm. be really useful. So let's look at our egg here. Mm. Looks tasty. This is from one of my chooks at home, actually. Oh. Nice speckled egg. Um, at the moment, it doesn't seem like it's got much energy. Mm. But I'm going to do some work. That okay. is, I'm going to lift it all the way up here. Mm -hmm. It's not all that far, but it did take a bit of energy, a few, right. maybe a few bits of oats that I needed. Yeah. Now it's got potential energy because mm. if I drop it, it can gain speed. And mm. speed, when it gains speed, is kinetic energy. So I can convert mm. potential energy to kinetic energy oh. when I drop it. Should I drop it, Sam? Oh, yeah, all right, let's 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 see what that potential energy can do. It's gonna turn into kinetic energy and then it's going to do something else. And I want you Ooh. to be really quiet and okay. listen because you might hear the form of energy that it turns into. <laughs> Smash. <laughs> and you saw it speed up mm. very quickly, hard to see it. Then it went smash and it made noise. The energy we put into it from my oats, turned into potential energy. I dropped it, mm -hmm. it sped up and got turned into kinetic energy, and then it hit the desk and it actually got turned into that, that energy got turned into noise. That's mm. a form of energy. Wow. And also some heat, although not much, it's not a hot egg anymore. <laughs> um, so we've converted energy from one form to another. And that's what happens in everyday life all the time we change energy from one form to another into a form that we can use it. And now I want to have a look, if we can go back to those slides, at some of the ways that we need this energy. Okay. That's a really big egg. That's a big egg. This is actually another form of energy that we can, or we get a lot of, and I'm going to mm. come back to this, um, and we can convert it into electricity as well. Ooh. But what do we use energy for? Well, in the city, there's all sorts of energy being used. Look at all the lights, mm. cars, buses moving around. They're all using energy in some form. At home, when you're cooking dinner or breakfast, if you have an egg like I sometimes do, <laughs> not raw, by the way, I like to cook it, we use heat. That's a form of energy that we use. Mm. We all love playing on our iPads or iPhones or devices or watching TV, um, that's a form of energy. We need electricity. It might, in, in Tasmania, at your house, it might have come from that power station that we showed, the big dam. Oh, so that dam was here in Tasmania, was it? That was here in Tasmania. It's oh, a really yeah. 
as an energy geek, I love yeah. going and visiting that dam. <laughs> Look at all these lights on in the city buildings. Mm. Really busy city. Lots and lots of energy being produced for that city. Getting around, moving. Cars, bikes, trains, aeroplanes, ships, they're all using energy. And here's a great example mm. of... Well, this train, you can see the way it's shaped, is designed to go super, super fast. Mm. So sometimes it's called a bullet train. Wow. Or That's in, why it has a long nose there. It's got a long nose yeah. because it's really aerodynamic. Mm. But the energy that it's um, converting from is electrical energy. You can just make out the wires above it, so it's converting electricity into mechanical or mm. rotation on the wheels, and then it's converting to kinetic energy with that train whizzing along. Wow. at high speed so converting energy and we use so much energy every day in factories we use energy to make things in fact in most countries maybe a quarter or a third of all the energy we use is going into making things manufacturing mm. things making drinks and cars and clothes and all of the things that we need um, every day in our life that looks like there's some delicious apple juice there. It does look like delicious apple juice. <laughs> <laughs> so energy is in the apple juice as well. Well, the energy was in this apple, mm -hmm. which I either chose to eat, mm -hmm. and I, I can see you eyeing it off. I know you I haven't know. had breakfast, Sam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's looking mighty good. Looking mighty or <laughs> it could be in that apple juice. Mm. Um, but also it takes energy to put the apple juice into the bottle and to make the bottle energy everywhere in our lives and I want to show you now how much energy we actually use mm. in the world and talk about um, how much energy we've got available so mm. I'm going to start with I've got a bunch of different balls okay I'm not sure what the best probably the top down the top camera, camera I think would be the best one so here's a little ball you can see the size of it in my fingers mm -hmm. Oop. Just get, oh, get into the middle of the camera there. This yeah. ball represents the total amount of energy mm. that the whole world uses every year. Wow. So it's actually a huge amount of energy, but yeah. I've condensed it down into a little tiny ball. So just remember this size, and I'll keep this ball here. Now, that's the total amount of energy every single year that the world uses. I bought in a tiny little coriander seed. It's very hard now, to see. Small that's the amount of energy that we use in Australia. Wow. So small. I can't really uh, hold that one very easily. <laughs> so that's how much energy we use. What about the amount of energy that we have got available to use? Mm. And this is now becoming a really important question for the whole world to answer. How much energy do we need? How much energy do we, energy do we have? And where do we choose to get it from? So I've got some other ones in here to show you. Ooh. Let's start with... Um, let's start with oil. Okay. So the oil that we use to put petrol into our cars. This ball represents the total wow. amount of oil that there is in the planet that we could dig up. But it's, it's bigger than the other one. It's bigger than the other one, but you imagine how many times can mm. we put this little ball into here? Wow. I don't know, maybe 30, 40 times, maybe not even that many, <laughs> before we'd use up all of the oil. Mm. So there's quite a lot of oil, but this is the amount. Once we've used it up, it's gone. Oh, wow. There's a similar amount of gas. So you saw that cooking, mm -hmm. the hot plate with the cooking of the egg. Mm -hmm. That's using gas. Okay. That's about the same amount of gas. So mm -hmm. we could, again, we could use that for maybe 20 or so years if we used that for all of our energy, mm -hmm. and then it's gone. Okay. Coal, you saw that truck that I showed I you? I did, yes. This is the amount of coal that we've got. Wow. Well, I haven't mastered this camera, have I? This is the amount of coal that we've got. Wow. Quite a lot. That's we could, fair bit. We could use that coal for quite a number of years before mm. we run out. But once we use it, it's gone. Mm. But the other thing that the world has found out, mm. and I think everyone's realised now, is if you burn all of that coal mm. and all of that oil and all of that gas, it creates carbon dioxide. And that does some pretty bad things to the temperature of the planet. Mm. That's science that's now being proven. And so people are starting to look at other forms of energy that don't do that. 
Okay. Here's one that you don't hear much about in Australia, mm. and we're not going to talk about much today because it's a really complex one to talk about. <laughs> but if we used all of the nuclear fuel, mm. so that's taking fuel that contains huge amounts of energy and small amounts of special material, yeah. radioactive material, this is the total amount that we've got mm. in the world. So we could use that for a little while, but mm. then it's, again, it's gone. Mm. So then we start to think about energy like some of those ones we showed you before, like wind and water and solar. Wow. Those ones aren't energy that's within the Earth's crust that you dig up mm. and then it's gone. Those are ones that we have every year, time and time again. They're called renewable energy. The first one I'm going to show you is water, because we've got a lot of water in Tasmania. Mm. In fact, in the last 24 hours, <laughs> <laughs> I got very wet Me, yeah. outside. That's just There's potential of, energy stored on you. It ready is to potential go. energy. It's a bit like that egg. The mm. water that's on the ground now or in the lakes or in the ocean, mm. the sun is going to lift up. It's then going to rain into those dams, so it's higher up, and then it'll run through... Wow that turbine and make electricity, and then it'll be lifted up again. It goes round and round. It's renewable energy. There's quite a lot of it, but if we took all of the known... I'm going to have to move those other balls out of the way here. Hang on a minute. Crowding out my image. If we used all of the known lakes, mm. rivers, that we could dam up mm. and turn into hydro or water electricity, this is how much we could make a year. Wow. Not quite enough, is it? But there's still quite a lot. Mm. Yeah. But then you've got to be really careful about where you want to build those lakes because sometimes you might have a, a town or a city there or maybe you've got a beautiful forest that you don't want to remove. Mm. But that's hydro. <laughs> Goodbye, hydro. <laughs> Goodbye, hydro. <laughs> then we look at wind. Mm. This is the amount of wind energy that we could make electricity mm. every year if we put wind turbines, and I had that picture yeah. on that one slide, wind yeah. turbines, on every land mass wow. that makes sense. <laughs> Not everywhere, but in places that are windy. So there's quite a lot of wind. Mm, mm. We can make this much energy every year, which is more than we use in total. Wow. But that would be a lot of wind turbines. That would be a lot. And I guess to make that turbine, we would have to use maybe some of the other things, like the coal and the... And the fuel and all that as well. That's true. That's true. Although once you make enough wind turbines, you mm. can use those wind turbines to make more wind turbines. Because ah. you do need energy to make all of that material. Mm. Okay, so that's there's one that I'm missing, isn't there? Mm. I think My favourite energy, actually. Ooh. We didn't see much of this yesterday. We haven't seen much of it today. <laughs> but solar. All right. This is the How much solar is there? If we put solar panels... <laughs> if we put solar panels on... Um, every bit of available land, this is the amount of energy <laughs> we would make <laughs> from... Hey, we, we got to, I'll, I'll, I'll go, go, there we go. Okay, okay, I'm in the corner. There we go. That is a lot of, There's a lot lot. of energy. There you go. There's so much energy. This is how much energy That's that. lands yeah. on the wow. earth, on the land masses where people can build solar panels every year. It's way, way oh, more. I've got to, hang on, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to show. Yeah. Hey, kids, what do you think about this? So this is how much. That is the amount of solar energy that we have. Holy moly. Look, I just got to do a quick comparison. So, so this one's the amount of energy that we use, the small blue ball. This is, this is the amount available with solar. That's a lot. There's a lot. That's so, a lot. Hang on, I really, can't. So <laughs> we use a lot of energy, um, a lot of energy for lots of different things, and it's good. And we have to choose where we get all of that energy from. And more and more, people are getting it from solar <laughs> and from wind. Mm -hmm. But still, we have to choose where we want to get it from. Mm. Um, and I think in future, there's going to be even more of this. Now, there's a big problem with solar, which mm. everyone knows. The last couple of days, there hasn't been much sun. Mm. At night time, there's not much sun. And so then you need some other way to store that energy. Mm. Um, mm. And there's a few different types of energy storage that we use. Remember, we can convert energy from one form to another. Mm. So do you remember I said for hydro, which is where the water goes up with the sun, gets yeah. lifted up, then rains into the rivers and lakes, and then goes down through the pipes 
yep. through the turbine, the spinny fan thing. Let's we can all spin we in school. Spin. Let's go, guys. Come on, here we go. We're spinning. And makes electricity. Yeah. Well, we can actually take lots of solar if we have mm. a huge amount of it, which we do, mm. and we can make that water go back up the hill. Now it oh, takes wow. energy to make it go back up the hill. In mm. the same way, it took me energy to lift my egg from here up to the top camera. Mm. It takes energy to lift water from the bottom up to the top of a hill. Mm. And we can do that and store that energy and then use it later. Mm. Um, and then the other technology that everyone knows about is probably batteries. If you've got your a mm. device like a tablet at home or a laptop or at school, you know that you have to plug it in to charge it up. Mm. Um, mm. And we can use those same batteries to store energy and then use it later when we need it. Interesting. So is the reason that we send the water up the hill using the solar spinning the turbine so that we can then use gravity to let it under its own weight to push through back down so is gravity a kind of energy gravity is a way of describing potential energy ah. yeah if you've got um if you've got a gravity field which we have on earth and you move something against it so lift something up against the way that it wants to go from gravity then you're putting energy into it. Mm. So yeah, you're absolutely right. right. Um, it's a way of storing energy via gravitational fields. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm. Um, so we use a lot of energy. We can get energy from lots of different sources. We can convert it from one form to another form of energy. Mm. And um, I started with food and I wanted to show you another picture. All right. Go to our slide. Oh, here we Ooh. go. And I wanted to ask you now, is that food or is it energy? Hmm. Well, what do you guys think at home? Do you think it's food or do you think it's energy? I like corn. I like to eat corn off the cob. I especially love the way corn is turned into corn chips. Oh, yes. I don't know how they do that, but it's fantastic. It requires energy though. It requires energy to do it. Go. <laughs> so we normally think of this as food. But next time you're at the petrol station with your mum or dad or your brother or sister mm. and they're filling up the car with petrol, have a look at the options. There's usually three or four different options for filling up your tank with petrol. Mm. One of them is usually green and it says plus or E10 or plus 10% ethanol. Okay. That one has got mostly petrol. Mm like the one I showed you before, that picture I showed you before of it coming into that big tank, that mm -hmm. yellow sort of oil. Filling up all the stuff. Filling up, yeah. yeah. But 10% of that, so a small fraction of that, is made up of ethanol, mm. which is something that we produce from either corn, usually, or mm. sugar. Mm. So we've decided we'll take big fields full of food, mm. and they could be food, or we could turn them into a form of energy that we can then use, we can then burn um, in a car engine. Mm. And so now you can buy petrol that has some of that ethanol, which is something that you can grow and grow mm. again. But there's a big question about whether that's the best thing to do, mm. given that there's a lot of people in the planet and a lot of people need a lot of food. Mm. Should we grow food for food or should we use some of that for energy? And I actually don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I don't think anyone really does yet. Mm. Um, it's just all part of that big question of how do we get enough energy to use for all the things we need it for while still having enough food. <laughs> well, it's very interesting, isn't it? You know, if you grow something and it's edible, but then you put it into the car and the car eats it and you don't get to you eat don't it get to instead, eat it. Yeah. that's it. And it takes energy to do both things and then... You know, the energy that comes out of it, it's very interesting. It is. That's why I really like studying energy. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's what you can do at school. At the moment, you can ask yourselves and have a discussion about maybe what would be better for corn, to use it as fuel or to use it as food. And don't put a corn cob in your parents' petrol engine. <laughs> You won't be very popular. Won't be very popular at all. <laughs> You'll be doing jobs around the house for 20 years <laughs> just to pay that off. So I think we were going to take a break, but I just wanted to show you mm. a couple of images. This is two different cities in the world because okay. we've talked about energy and how we use it. But one thing that's really interesting is some people use a lot more energy than other people. Mm. And we might, I think, be leaving you with an activity that you can do after this show today.
to sort of look at how different it is from one country to another. This is a very famous intersection. I think it's Shibuya intersection in Japan yeah. and very, very busy. But look at all those bright lights and advertising and shops with flashy signs out the front. It's a city that uses a lot of energy and people there use a lot of energy. Mm. If you compare that against also a bustling, busy marketplace where people are buying and trading food and other goods, a lot less energy used. Mm. Um, and this is also a question that people are trying to answer. How much energy should we all use? Should we use unlimited amounts of energy or should we be thinking about the best way of using energy? Mm. I think that's a really incredibly big question, it isn't is. it? You know, how much energy do you need to use? How much energy do you guys use at home? How much energy are you using right now watching this? Hmm. Fascinating. It's fascinating stuff. Well, thank you very much, Evan. That's a, a lot to think about, isn't it? We're gonna have to we're gonna have to have some interesting questions, and those questions are gonna be provided by you. That's right, you. So we're gonna take a five-minute break, and in that time, come up with some questions you'd like to ask Evan about energy, food, who gets to use what, how much is made, and make sure that you mention in your question your first name and your school. That way we'll be able to give you a shout out at the same time. So, five minutes, we'll see you back then. Welcome back, welcome back. My, 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 we have uh, just a couple of questions. I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to get through all of them today because some of them are super fascinating That's and good very questions. interesting, absolutely. So, what do you think, Evan? Should we dive straight in? Let's do it. All right. So, very first question off the rank here is, how fast does a bullet train go? Oh, I love this. Uh, they go about 300 kilometers an hour, so maybe three times as quickly as you would in your car. Wow. And they are fantastic. I've been on one and you just, everything just whizzes by. It's incredible. So pretty much as fast as Sonic. As fast as what, Sonic. sorry? A Sonic. Don't worry, it's a video game <laughs> character. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> and, and so they're powered like... So you said the wires are above them, yep. but how do they get the energy into the train? It's not a very long extension cord, is there? <laughs> no. You, has anyone been to Melbourne? I'm sure you've probably been to Melbourne and seen the trams. They have mm. the, the thing over the top that runs against the wires. Mm -hmm. So it collects the electricity from the wires down into the engine or down into the motor of the train and that's it. Wow. Fascinating stuff, fascinating yeah. stuff. Uh, here's a good one from, uh, from uh, Kathleen, who's uh, currently being homeschooled. Hello, Kathleen. Hey, Kathleen. Uh, and she asks, what subjects do you need to study energy or get into perhaps engineering? Ah, well, this is an interesting thing. Energy covers so much territory now. So um, technical stuff like I do is engineering and you need to do maths and physics and maybe chemistry. Mm. Um, those types of subjects and then you can get into science or engineering and study energy but energy also is a big um, topic that's being discussed in social science mm. research um, so learning how to deal with energy for people how people mm. can use energy best politics energy is in everything at the moment but the type of energy we've talked about mostly it's science maths mm. um, those types of subjects fascinating fascinating uh, Meg from, uh, from Farn, she's in year six, hello Meg, hey, Meg. asks, hydrogen e energy, oh, yes. where are we up to in that research? So have we done our homework in hydrogen? What's happening? We are still doing our homework on hydrogen. Oh. I, I didn't mention that before as an energy source because mm. we talk about hydrogen energy, it's actually a way of storing or carrying energy. So one of the problems with electricity, for example, is you've got to have those wires to carry it somewhere. So that train needs to have wires where it is. Um, it's very hard to send it long, long distances or send it mm. across the sea. Um, whereas if you can store that energy um, in a form that you can transport, and mm. hydrogen is a great form for storing energy and transporting it, mm. then we can use it elsewhere. And 
So there's a lot of work being done on researching hydrogen energy. Mm. It's actually very easy to make. You take electricity, mm -hmm. you put it into water with some other things, mm -hmm. um, run electricity through the water, and it makes little bubbles of oxygen on mm -hmm. one side and little bu bubbles of hydrogen. You probably do the experiment in grade 9 or 10 at high school. Yeah. Um, then you capture that hydrogen. Now, obviously, it's a lot more sophisticated than that in a big hydrogen plant, but mm. that's... That's the new way of making hydrogen, and that take, takes a lot of energy to make the hydrogen. But then when you take the hydrogen and you put it into a what's called a fuel cell, mm. or if you burn it, then you combine it back with oxygen and you get electricity out. Mm. And you get a maybe 50, 60% of the electricity back wow. from what you put in. And so you can store and use that energy later. Fascinating. So yeah. it, it takes energy to make energy and it doesn't always mean that the energy that you store or make is actually bigger or greater than the energy you put into it in the first place. Yeah. In fact, people, scientists, engineers are always trying to find ways to make that process more efficient. Mm. But every single time you convert energy from one form to another, you don't quite get all of the energy. Mm. Even when I used... That my, my energy to lift the egg up to the top here, lift the egg up here, mm. um, the, I put a bit more energy into lifting it than the potential energy that it got. Mm. When mm. it fell, it had some air resistance, and so it didn't quite gain all of that energy as kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. And then when it smashed, some of most of that energy went to noise, but some of it went elsewhere. And so, like on me, <laughs> like on you, Sam. And so, yes, yeah, same with pumping water uphill, storing energy in a battery, creating hydrogen. We store some or most of that energy, mm. but there's not 100% of the energy. And there's a lot of research in trying to make that more and more efficient. Mm. And that makes it cheaper. And cheaper is good because people use more of that um, <laughs> source of energy or storage of energy. And if it's cheaper with the nicer renewable energy, that means it's... Uh it means that it's better overall for everybody. Yeah. And so with hydrogen, there's a lot of um, work being done at the moment to work out if we can have a lot of solar energy or wind energy. Mm. And when there's lots of sunshine in the day, convert that to hydrogen. Mm. And then later on, um, either at night or when we want to drive our car around or take an aeroplane or a ship somewhere, we convert that hydrogen energy or stored energy back into some form that we can use. Mm. Remember, energy is never made or destroyed. It's always just converted from one form to another. Basically, we just take energy and we just move it around the place wherever we need yeah, to move it. It's like that old story of the yeah. dollar coin, you know, that gets passed from uh, one yeah. person to another and just gets cycled all the way around. <laughs> hey, the uh, velocity of money, that's an energy of sorts, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. yes. Now, Lachlan from East Tamar Primary School asks... How much energy is produced each year in Australia, do you think? Do we, do we know? How, how would we find out how much energy is used? How maybe can pe you know, all the kids at home find out? Well, um, do you know what? what? Lachlan, that's an excellent question, and that's one which I've made an activity sheet for um, students if you want to do it, if your teachers would like to help you do it. That's pretty exciting. To find out that answer, to find out how much energy we use in all of Australia every mm. year, and therefore how much does each person use, and then to compare that against some other countries. So I could tell you the answer now. Mm. <gasps> but we won't but spoil I, it. I think that's your oh. work to do. <laughs> Excellent, you'll all be able to do that after, after this session. You'll be able to turn on all the lights, plug in all the hair irons, turn on all the toasters, <laughs> and your school will love it. I promise you that. So, But, but I will give you a hint. Um, mm. Well, not a hint. This won't help you at all. But this this toast, which mm. is looking, it's getting a bit cold now. I mean, but it's it still looking look delicious, isn't it? It Sam? does. There you go. Yeah. There's a piece for you as well. Oh, beautiful. There you go. <laughs> um, if you think about the amount of energy that every person uses every day, mm. um, imagine putting the toaster on, turning it on in the morning. Uh, forget the fact that the toaster would end up a burnt little crisp <laughs> bit of. Cardboard. It's become carbon. <laughs> it has. It's, it's like energy. Carbon. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually true. It would, um, the toaster would, if it was on all day, would be the sort of the amount of energy that your family would use on a typical day. Mm. But don't do that. Don't turn the toaster don't on do all that day. That's not a good idea. No, no, there you go. <laughs> but there you go. So 
Energy. So toast is energy. You heard it here, folks. Yep. First, there we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lachlan. All right. Now, this is, a, this is another interesting here. Uh, we have from... Ah, here we go. So Phoebe from Kempton Primary School asks... Hey, Phoebe. Is it dangerous to use too much energy? Mm. That's a really good question. Because um, I'm thinking, in one, there are two ways I think about this question. Number one is, if I go around and I grab one end of a, a big wire and then another end and I use myself as the middle, that's dangerous because I'll probably turn into the burnt toast <laughs> at will. the end of it. <laughs> but I guess the other kind of dangerous one is, if we use all those, all the coal and all the gas and things like we were talking about, that's sort of more broadly dangerous in a way, isn't it? Yeah, um, I think if we use unlimited amounts of energy, mm. then other things happen as well. So remember, every time you convert energy, it's not 100% efficient. Mm. And so you something else happens. Um, my egg dropped, I created some heat. Mm. If we just use huge amounts of energy, then we'll also create more and more heat. Mm. Um, if we burn, if we get our energy from burning coal and gas and oil, then we also produce um, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, which you've probably learnt about at school, and that heats up the planet. And so it's almost like a slow kind of dangerous. Mm. And actually the world has started to work this out in the last 20 or 30 years. They've gone, actually, hang on, we've been using more and more energy each year. and We still use more and more energy each year, but that's having some bad side effects. So let's think about whether we should or can do things that use a bit less energy. Mm. For mm. example, you could travel from Hobart, which is where we are, to Launceston in a car um, with one person mm. that uses a lot of energy, or you could travel with three people, if you all need to go, in a smaller car that uses a lot less energy. And really, all you needed to do was get from Hobart to Launceston. Um, so the amount of energy you use, you can kind of choose. Mm, mm. And we have a lot of choices and people are realising that, yeah, actually using a lot of energy in the long run is kind of like a slow type of dangerous. Mm, mm. And so we're starting to think about how we can change the way we use energy. That's interesting. And I guess it's kind of like a school bus when you're getting picked up to go to school. All the different students get on the bus, but there's still only one bus. And so yes. every student that sits on that bus even though it's using the same amount of fuel, it's more efficient because more people are travelling to the locations they need to get. Yep. Yeah, so for a bus is a really good example, mm. actually, because I, um, if you have about four or five people on a bus, um, that's the amount of people you need to use the same amount of energy as if all those four people took cars. Mm. So once you go more than four or five people on a bus, you're saving energy compared to if all those people drove. Um, and you can fit... I don't know, 40 or 50 or 60 people on a bus. So it's a really good, efficient use of energy, actually. And if you're a clown, you can fit 40, 50, 60 people in one car. In a little mini. <laughs> it's great. It's very efficient yeah. there. <laughs> Moving along. Ah, now here's a very, very fascinating one. So, so Yula, or Ula from Fan asks, do we use more energy each year? So once upon a time, we would have used very little energy, burning like sticks and so forth, you know, yes. for heat. But do we use more energy more and more? Like, is it going up? It is going up. And it's been going up since you might have heard of the Industrial Revolution. This is something which we could do a whole show on. I know. <laughs> it's a really interesting or whole series of shows. Mm. But a two or so hundred years ago, people discovered that they could harness energy and use it to make things and make things much more efficiently than doing it by hand. Mm. And so since then, we've just used more and more energy and still the world every year is using more energy. But I said just that last 10 or so years, um, people have realised that, hang on, maybe we can actually do more, make more things, but use the same or even less energy to do it. Mm. But mm. yeah, the answer is it's still going up, mm. um, but we're working on it. That's fascinating. That's very interesting. And and I guess it's still going up, but then like we saw from your from your slides, there are still some parts of the world in which not even one quarter of the energy that, you know, another place gets ever has any. You know, they have to yeah. they're resorted, they still need to use, you know, burning fuel, which is energy, 
yes. versus perhaps <laughs> other means. Yeah, and that market I showed was in India, and mm. India is a there's a huge population in India. They don't use much energy per person. It's quite mm. a small amount, and in fact, you'll see in villages they'll still be cooking on a little wood fire, and that's the only energy they use, mm. really. Um, but not using energy, any, any energy is not really a good thing either. Um, so a lot of villages, when they suddenly get some energy provided to them, some solar panels provided to them, they can now read at night. They can do homework at night. Fantastic. Um, they can Boo. Get, <laughs> They can get a bit more education. They mm. can make some things a bit more efficiently, have a bit more time to learn new things. And mm. so um, there's a certain amount of energy that, I think everyone needs to have and needs mm. to be able to access and use. But yeah, the variety is huge. And those countries like India, mm. the amount of energy that they are using each year is just going up hugely wow. and will do for a long time to come. Yeah. And, and does energy track with like the sort of quality of life that people have? So, so do we, if a person has what we would normally call a good quality of life, so they have lots of stuff, <coughs> say, yep. does that mean that they consume or they use more energy? They certainly do. There's a um, there's a lovely graph that I like using for some of my students at mm. university, which shows basically the amount of stuff that a country makes. And there's a term you might hear people mm. talk about on the radio called GDP. It's called gross domestic product. It's a really fancy term by politicians to say, what's the value? How, much, how many dollars worth of stuff does a country make each year? And if you plot the amount of stuff a country makes versus the amount of energy a country uses... It's almost like a straight line. So the more stuff you make, the more energy you use. Mm. Um, and that's the thing which countries are starting to realise just in the last 20 years. Actually, maybe we can make more stuff without using more energy. And I think that's a really good thing. I agree. Happening. Yeah. I agree. It's a fascinating part. And one interesting thing I've heard about in some areas they use, uh, in order to get gas, the energy of gas, they use anaerobic digesters. So like they have like this big, if you don't know what that is, we can talk about it another time. But basically yeah. imagine dumping all your rubbish into a pit and then you have a little pipe and all the gas comes up and then like it goes in the trough and then you can use it as like a sort of natural gas. Yeah. Basically it's like a big thing full of poo. Yes. <laughs> people have turned, people have made machines that turn poo. I think you're doing some poo making this week. Oh, no, we certainly <laughs> are. <laughs> that turn poo into yeah. gas and then burn that gas. Um, yeah, when are you doing that pool, I might have to come back and... Uh... Hey, look, we'll, we'll be able to get to that at the end of the show. <laughs> you, just, uh, you just wait right there. But uh, for the moment, we'll barrel ahead. Don't want to give too much away. So let's have a look here now. Here's a very interesting one. So Haley from Summerdale Primary asks, what other foods can we use as fuel? So we've seen corn, which we can turn into ethanol. Mm. Don't just put the corn straight into the car, though. It won't work. Unless it's popcorn, then maybe it'll just wreck your car and taste terrible. But are there any other kinds of any things that we would normally consider food that we can turn into, into fuel? Yeah, lollies. I'm afraid lollies. kids are going to have to give up lollies oh, from now on because lollies are very high in energy mm. and <laughs> your parents won't like this. They are. The problem is with lollies, the energy doesn't last for very long in your body. Mm. And so you've probably heard of this sugar rush you have a lot of sugar and you get really hyper. You've got lots yeah. of energy, but then you lose it really quickly. Mm. But anything that contains sugar, basically, we can turn into an energy yeah. that could be used to run a power station, to run a car, mm. um, run an aeroplane, if you had enough lollies. Um, yeah, and most foods contain sugar in some form or another. Some form or another. Um, it turns out that corn mm. um, and sugar, obviously, um, contain sugar in a way that's really easy to convert to to ethanol, the type of fuel ah, that we can put in our engine. That's fascinating. Yeah. So we could we could power the school bus with nothing but caramel. <laughs> you could. Um, the other thing you can use is fish and chip oil. So, you ah. know, if thinking about food. And mm. in fact, there are some vans who drive around. I don't know that they do that in Tasmania, but they'll drive around fish and chip shops and get their old oil mm. and then sell it or use it to drive. And there was someone very famous who drove around Australia um, and only filled up from fish and chip shops. He'd go and knock on the door and say, hello, have you finished with your fish and chip oil? Can I put it in my car? <laughs> um, apparently his car really smelt like a fish and chip shop. 
That's the that's the uh, that's the uh, aroma of experimenting in science. That's Absolutely. what it smells like. <laughs> science smells like an old fish and chip shop. <laughs> now here's an interesting one. So from this is uh, from one uh, Heather. So the plastic that is made from corn is it edible? Ah, <sighs> yes and no. Mm. I think um, it is mostly made from corn starch. Okay. Uh, it's wouldn't be very tasty, but it's also got some other chemicals added to make it a nice stable a stable plastic that will last long enough to hold the things that you buy from the shop and bring it home with, but then it degrades when you put it into landfill or into a compost bin. Mm. Um, you could eat it, but I'd recommend Vegemite on toast instead of that. <laughs> Now, we are unfortunately rapidly drawing to a close, so we're going to try to get through some more questions. But don't forget, we will answer every single one of your questions by, of course, by us, and we'll be sending it to you and your teachers uh, tomorrow. So don't worry, we're going to get through all of them. Hang tight. Uh, but, of course, unfortunately, Evan's energy is, is running out, so we need to plug him into a battery and then recharge him. So let's get, <laughs> before we skedaddle, let's get just a couple more interesting ones. So here's an interesting one from Luke uh, and Kate, who are being homeschooled, which is, are scientists still thinking of harnessing ocean wave power? Yes. So what kind of energy would that be? Is that kinetic? That's kinetic energy, yes. Mm. See, um, I'm learning. Well done. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't mention that one because it's quite a small resource compared to mm. compared to our our world's energy, but it's significant. Um, and in Tasmania, there's quite a lot of it. So any time that you've got waves, consistent waves, scientists and engineers have built devices that go in the sea and move around with the waves, and convert that movement, that kinetic energy, into electrical energy, so mm. electricity. And the other one is tides, which is also related to the ocean, of course. When the tide comes in, when the water level goes up around the shore and then goes out again, there's a certain amount of slow kinetic energy there that you can use. Not really very much in Tasmania, mm. um, but in some parts of the world where the tides move really quickly in through gaps in mm -hmm. um, landforms, then you can then you can use that. Or offshore in places like Bass Strait, where it, the tide actually rushes quite fast through mm. between the islands. Um, the problem with some of those forms of energy, or not problem, one of the challenges is the energy is being made out in the middle of the ocean or in the sea and you've got to get it back to land. But yeah, scientists and engineers are working on that and getting it more efficient and lower cost. And we might even see some of that around Tasmania in the next few years. There's some people wow. at the university working on it and trying to get a project up and running which would be really exciting mm, mm, mm. and just uh, as, a, as a quick quick aside and then you can tell us just tell us one more time about the exciting project or the exciting yeah. activity you have yeah what is geothermal energy what is that can yeah. we do can we do that in tasmania or it's just not possible that's uh, another one i didn't mention which i should have done but if you dig i love digging holes at the beach i've got to say dig dig, dig. but if you dig deep enough like two or three kilometers below the Earth's surface, mm. even in Tasmania, you start to get rock that's quite warm mm. because it's been capped by this layer of insulating Earth. It's got enough warmth that you can, if you can get some of that heat out, you can turn it into electrical energy or other form of energy that you can use, like heat. And that's known as geothermal. Mm. There's some in Tasmania. There's some in the middle of Australia. Um, there's some in New Zealand, if you've been there, where it's really close to the surface and you see the steam bubbling up. Um, <coughs> It's quite hard to get it out. You've got to dig deep holes, mm. put water in, and have hot water come out or steam come out. Oh, wow. Um, but people are doing some work on it. It's a good resource, just hard to get at. There you go. So we can't just go into the backyard and start digging and then go, yep, free energy for us. Not so easily. Not so energy. You can go and start digging, though. That's always good. <laughs> yeah, so, I did, oh, sorry. I did want to remind you, mm. though, um, kids, I... I think the teachers might have got an activity sheet, oh, which yes. is I'd like you to go and try and compare the amount of energy that's used per person mm. in Australia with a few other countries. So pick four countries, whatever you like, countries mm. you like the name of, ones you saw in the Olympics, maybe somewhere you've been or you've mm. got family that live. Um, and then I've got some instructions there on how you can look up how much energy they use 
and calculate how much energy per person. Um, I'd love to see them if you send them in. I'd have a look and we maybe can show some on Friday. I'm coming back in on Friday. And I'll even do one myself and share with you. Absolutely. Well, there you go. That sounds like an activity we can all do and then compare notes. Absolutely. And see how much energy I think, I think, Evan, that I use less energy than you do. Well, <laughs> we'll see. And on Friday, we're going to have a look at that, work out how much energy we use around the house. I'm going to turn Ooh. you all into energy sleuths. So I'd love to see you back on Friday. Exciting. Evan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been absolutely fantastic. And we look forward to seeing you again on Friday where we'll be able to recap and touch on uh, some of those activities that you've touched on and, and what we're going to be talking about on Friday with you. We're going to okay. start thinking about energy at a smaller level. So mm. energy that we use around the house. Mm. Yeah, we, and we're going to find out by the end of Friday, mm. I'm going to give you an activity and you're going to go home on the weekend and you'll be an energy sleuth. Ooh. And you'll go around and work out how much energy we're using in your house and where you use it and also where it comes from. Mm. And we're going to draw one of my favorite energy diagrams Ooh. ever. But oh. I'll keep that for Friday. I'm excited. I'm excited <laughs> for the diagram. There we go. Energy, where does it come from? And where does it go? Something, something, Cotton Eye Joe. Evan, thank you so much. <laughs> and pleasure. of course, thank you all for tuning in here again to STEM Alive for Kids. Don't forget, coming up this week, we have a whole bunch of other interesting things. And most specifically, we have our friend Shasta Henry coming in to talk about some insects, but also, as we might have given it away, poo. That's pretty exciting. So come in, tune in. And we will see you all once again tomorrow for STEM Alive for Kids. See you then. Hello and hello everybody and welcome to STEM Alive for Kids for National Science Week 2021. How's your week been? Looking forward to the weekend? Well, have we got something to finish your week off with a bit of a bang? Maybe charge it with a little bit of energy if you pick up what I'm saying. <laughs> Firstly, I'd just like to give a quick thank you, of course, to the Department of Education and the Peter Underwood Centre. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you making this absolutely one of our most successful shows and presentations that we've done for a very, very, very long while, or even perhaps ever. So it's a big thanks to you, that's right, you, and everyone else who's supported us. So this week we have, of course, for our last episode, alas, we do have a very special guest. You might remember him from earlier in the week. It is, of course, the wonderful, the spectacular Evan Franklin. Hello, Evan. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, Sam. Good morning, everyone. So, how have you? How's your week been? It's been pretty good. I've been energetic, mm -hmm. uh, doing lots of uh, busy things, and looking forward to this morning. Well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I'm glad. So, before we jump in, uh, because I believe you have a few activities that we're going to be trying to do today. Is that uh, correct? I do. I'm going to. I'm going to get students busy today. Oh, exciting! Well, before we do that, we'd just like to give a quick little. Uh, a little interesting video clip. So everyone, you'll remember for most of the week, we've been talking about insects and poo. Well, we have a great little clip. Uh, this clip is from uh, Kylie at St. Joseph's. So let's have a look. Uh, what did Kylie send us? She looked like she was loving that. That was, of course, eating one of the pre-prepared bugs. Remember, all week we know that bugs can be used as food and bugs have energy in them. They do. There you go. <laughs> and, of course, bugs take energy and, ah, oh, it's just energy all over the place. So, speaking of energy, of course, Evan is the expert on energy. So, Evan, what do you think? Do you want to get started? Yeah, let's get into it. Let's go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. 
Well, on Monday, we talked about energy and how energy is everywhere. We might go to our um, slides now yeah. if we could. And we had these photos and we talked about them. This is energy that's being used in the city and uh, all around the world. And it's in lights, in city buildings. It's in trains that go super fast and convert all that electrical energy to kinetic energy. Um, it's when we're cooking. It's watching TV. Uh, making stuff, and oh, I didn't put the apple juice bottles in there, but it's everything we make, everything we do uses energy. And we said, but some people use much more energy than others. And that's what we're going to look at today is mm. how much energy we use and where we use it around the house. But to start with, um, I did ask people if they wanted to go and think about how much energy is used in different countries. And so I did that myself during the week, and I'll share with you what I found. I found that in some countries we use a lot more energy than other countries and we talked about some of the reasons why and we'll do we'll look at that again um, just briefly now but let's have a look here's a I love these colorful column charts and I know <laughs> that that in grade five and six you've probably learned how to do these yourself you can do ones by hand or I'm a bit lazy and I use the computer to do mine for me <laughs> but I have bought my coloring pencils in today for something else Sam oh uh, but have a look at this. This is the amount of energy um, that every person uses on average in Australia. Mm -hmm. I chose Australia because obviously we live here. That's the big blue column. Mm. In Brazil, uh, I chose that because I was watching the soccer during the Olympics and the Brazilian soccer team, are, they're so clever, so skillful with the ball. <laughs> China, a big country near mm. us. France, ah, well, I chose France because I like the croissant and uh, all of the yummy <laughs> French food. Uh. Body of the culture. <laughs> exactly. Uh, India and Kenya, two countries, mm. one, both have a lot of people that live in them. And one of those photos I showed last week of the market in India, and I've got that again to remind you, shows you just how different the energy use is in some countries compared to others. Mm. And... Well, actually, I discovered, Sam, that mm. of all of the countries in the world, Australia uses more energy mm. per person than pretty much any other country in the world. Wow. And I was trying to think about why that would be. Mm. And you remember last week we showed, this is, of course, Japan. I didn't, um, I didn't put a chart up there for Japan, mm. but mm. this is a, a busy city, maybe like what you'd have in a Chinese city or a, a, a busy French city mm. or in Australia in the middle of... Um, perhaps not Hobart, I haven't seen it like that, but in the middle of Sydney or Melbourne where there's a lot of energy being used. Mm. Um, and this is that market that we showed you in India and you really can't see a lot of energy being used there at all, um, at least not that we can see in that photo. And mm. so that sort of gives you an indicator of why there's a big difference in the amount of energy that's used in some places compared to others. And then I thought about transport. We mm. use a lot of energy to get around in trains and buses and cars. But actually, the type of car that you use can influence how much energy your, your country uses and how much you use. Um, and so here on the left, there's a, a big car, a four-wheel drive, which we probably have quite a few of in Australia. Mm. Um, and a small car there on the right, which uses a lot less energy to move you from one place to another. Um, of course, when we hop in our car, we might want to cart loads of bricks around with us or something heavy and we might have to choose a car that will suit. But the choices that we make influence how much energy we use. Mm. And I, when I was looking at car pictures, I found a couple of other Ooh. more extreme versions, which I really like. So right. the one oh, on the wow. left here is um, uses a lot of energy. This is a monster truck. Um, <laughs> you probably don't need that to go down to the shops. And the one on the right, this is the cutest car I think I've ever seen. And Look at the number plate there, Sam. Ah, oh, P. 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 Very cute. I thought there's a nice link with food there as yeah. well. <laughs> um, imagine driving that car around. You would certainly have, well, either of those cars, you'd have everyone looking at you, but I can guarantee the one on the left would probably use three or four times as much energy compared to that little P oh. car on the right to get around. It would be perfect for dropping the kids off during peak hours at school, though. <laughs> it would be, wouldn't it? Which one? Oh, the, the monster truck. I'm going to go truck. the monster truck. There you what, go. What about you kids? Which one would you like to be dropped off outside school in? The monster <laughs> truck or the little pea car? Oh, I think I'd like the little pea car. <laughs> <laughs> so I want us to think today about energy that we use in our houses. And um, I'm going to take you through some photos from, from my morning. But before I do that, I want to... I want you to think about what you did this morning and what you did when you hopped up and how you might have used energy. Um, mm. 
Hmm. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious. So let's have a look. First off, here's me this morning. Um, oh, wow. You know, I don't do well in the morning. It takes me a while to wake up, as you can see there. The sun's rising and I'm slowly starting to wake up. And I think <laughs> I've got there now, Sam. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Glad to hear it. But we the have first, fire thing I, first thing I do is go and jump in the shower and I like a mm. nice hot shower in the morning. But that hot water... Remember we said heat is just one form of energy. Mm. That water wasn't hot when it came to my house. It came in the pipe and it was cold water. Mm. We've used energy to make it hot. We've converted, in my case, electrical energy that came in over some wires into heat or thermal energy. Mm. And I've used that to have a nice warm shower and, and I woke up a little bit. The next stop was my coffee machine. Ooh. And I know, Sam, you like a, a morning coffee as well. Ah, uh, you got me. And I had to get some milk out of the fridge to make my coffee. And mm. both of those use energy. Mm. The coffee machine uses energy to heat up the water to make my coffee or heat up my milk. The fridge is an interesting one. I really like fridges, not because mm. they contain lots of yummy food. And mm. you can see all the yummy food looks in my like fridge there. Fair bit. It looks pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, but I like fridges because they're a really interesting use of energy. The fridge mm. needs to be cold. And I don't know... If you've ever taken your hand and felt around the back of a fridge, it's quite warm. Hmm. What the fridge does is it actually moves energy from inside the fridge hmm. to outside the fridge. Interesting. It, in, sometimes we call it a heat pump. It pumps heat, hmm. which is a form of energy from inside the fridge because you want it to be cold. You don't want heat inside the fridge no. to outside the fridge. Hmm. Um, but it takes energy to pump that heat from inside to outside the fridge. And I'm going to come back to that technology because we can use that, and some of you would use that in your home already um, to move heat around to heat up your house or maybe mm. heat up hot water. So there's energy being used there. And in, in opposite sort of size, the coffee machine makes things hot and the refrigerator is making things cold. Yes, and wouldn't it be good if I could somehow combine the two and get the heat from the fridge out and into my coffee machine. You could have an iced coffee in the morning yeah. and you could have hot food. It'd be yeah. great. Yeah. Well, you know, actually there are some people working on technology that mm. would do that where you Ooh. heat up, you cool down your house in summer, mm. but at the same time you heat up the hot water that you need to have your shower in the morning and you just move energy from one spot to another. That's very cool. Well, yeah. It's like you said on Monday, we don't create energy. We just sort of move it from one spot to another. We don't create any energy in the world. We just move it around mm. and convert it from one form to another. Oh, sorry, I missed. Um, now, mm. some mornings, if you hop up really early, you need to turn the lights on, and lighting is another form of energy. And where does that energy come from? Well, for most, or for all houses in, in Tasmania, that energy comes over um, the wires into your house in the form of electrical energy, and then mm. we convert it to light energy. And maybe some of you remember mum or your dad or the adults in your house changing lights over mm. but probably a few years ago now from an old style of light that actually turned most of the energy into heat mm. which we didn't really want we wanted light um, but the technology is getting better and better so that maybe most of that energy now is turned into light and you can see a couple of different lights here on in my house mm. what other ways do i use energy in the morning well there's the kettle and the toaster. You know how I love a bit of toast and Vegemite mm. in the morning. Oh, kids. yes. Yeah. But that takes energy to heat up that toast and it takes energy to heat up that water if I'm going to make a nice cup of tea um, or have some hot water for, for making some porridge, perhaps. Mm. So energy. I'm using energy all the time. And then I headed in here. And how did I get in here? Well, I drove in and I drove a car. Mm. Um, this is one of our cars. We've got two cars, actually. Um, and I put petrol in that car, and that's a form of energy. And we convert that energy in the petrol into kinetic energy. So again, using more energy. Everything I do, it turns out, Sam, I'm mm. using energy. Wow. Yeah. I should have ridden my bike in, and then I would have, except I would have had to have had a, that really big breakfast that I had on Monday. So you would have still had to have energy. I would have to convert energy. it to other energy That's still. Right, exactly. Um, and then when I get home tonight, um, it's probably going to be a bit chilly. Mm. It's a nice day at the moment, but when I get home tonight, it's probably going to be a bit chilly, mm -hmm. and I'm going to want to heat up the house. And Ooh. everyone heats up their house maybe one of a few different ways. 
we have a wood fire and it's really nice. It heats up the house, it but green. yeah, but it takes energy to do that. Mm. Well, whoever, however you heat up your house, it's going to take energy. You've got to convert one form of energy into heat. And what we do is we convert energy that's stored, mm. hard to believe, but stored in wood. Mm. And actually, that reminds me, Sam, mm. we did get some wood delivered and I've got to spend oh. the weekend moving it into the woodshed. <laughs> and it's going to take a lot of energy to do that. So yeah. I better remember to have a big breakfast right. tomorrow morning if I'm going to do that. <laughs> so we use energy in lots and lots of different ways. And now what I want to do is, well, later I'm going to get you to think about how mm. you use energy in your house. And I've got a nice worksheet which I'll take you through, which okay. some of you might want to take home. Mm. Teachers, I'm looking at you, you might want to encourage your kids to do it and you might need to help them after the weekend to draw a nice pretty energy flow diagram. Mm. And the reason we do that is to understand where you use your energy and where that energy comes from. That really helps you make decisions about how I might do things differently mm. and what it might change in terms of how my energy is sourced or where mm. it comes from um, and how much I need to use. And so we're going to think firstly about where all that energy comes from. Mm. So in my house, thinking about the energy that I've just talked about using, a lot of it comes from electricity or comes in the form of electrical energy. Some of it you saw comes in the form of uh, wood, mm. which we usually refer to as, it's a word you might not have heard of, biomass. Mm. Um, but it's mass are we is like biomass? weight. Well, we are biomass. Oh. Yeah. Anything that's grown, that's living, um, and will contain energy, uh, wood, um, the corn. Do you remember the corn? I, I do. Yeah, yeah. And, and how it gets turned into ethanol. It can get turned into ethanol. You could turn wood into ethanol and put it in your petrol tank, yeah. but mm. it's pretty hard to do that. Mm. It's much more useful to burn it if you want to use the energy, but of course, um, there's a lot of discussion about whether you should use wood and where that wood actually comes from. Mm. Um, and then there's the petrol that goes into my petrol tank and that comes from a petrol station and that's dug up or pumped out of the ground, mm. but not in Tasmania, somewhere else and then delivered to us to Tasmania. Mm. Um, and the energy that comes into the house for most of my uses comes mm. over wires, okay. over power lines. And you've probably seen power lines like these ones on the left mm. in your street, perhaps. Mm. And you might have seen power lines like the ones on the right mm. when you drive around the countryside. Um, and those are big ones that take energy from big power stations mm. and deliver them to the city and to households. Wow. And then in Tasmania, there's really two places where that electrical energy comes from. And you might remember I showed you the picture of the dam. Mm. That's a dam in Tasmania which stores the water, mm. the water that's gone uphill or up into the sky from yeah. the sun, wow. evaporating the rivers and the lakes and the sea, mm. and then falling down into the lakes and rivers, and then being rushed down a tunnel, which mm. is shown in this picture there. Interesting through a turbine. That's the spinny thing that we talked about last mm, week, mm, Sam. Mm. And that makes then electricity. And that's all a bit of magic. Um, <laughs> it's something that I, that I study and I teach at universities. How do we make that electricity? Mm. And then it gets delivered to your house. And in Tasmania, the other way that we make a lot of energy and electrical energy is via wind turbines. Quite a few big wind farms. And this is, mm. we call it a, a wind farm mm. because it's like a farm full of wind turbines that makes energy rather than making wool or corn. Do you have to water them? <laughs> you don't have to water right. them. No. <laughs> no, they grow uh, very quickly all on their own. Wow, amazing. Nature is an amazing thing. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's energy in the house, mm. how we use it or where we use it, where it comes from. Mm. But there's one other form of energy that we've actually got on our house and I'm oh. going to show you now. Okay. And I've got a couple of... Examples, you can have one, Sam, if oh, you like, love to play one. with as well. We can go to the top-down camera. Maybe we should go to the top-down camera for this. This, what I'm showing you here, is a solar cell. And it's very thin. Mm. It's made of silicon, actually, which is what sand is made of. In fact, they take really nice pure sand and turn mm. it into silicon, and then they make solar cells. And this 
this is would be making electricity right now because mm. it's in a bit of light. Mm. When you put this in the sunshine mm. and you connect some wires up to these um, little silver, they're actually made of oh, silver, these little oh, silver yeah. strips, mm. then you get electricity out. And probably one in every seven or eight houses in mm. Tasmania has some of these solar panels on their roof. And I've got a picture now of the solar panels that are on my roof. Mm. And so some of that electrical energy is made by those solar panels that I use. Look at that. And some of you at home might have solar panels on your roof as well. Mm. So Can solar panels go on other things, not just houses? You can get solar panels on um, big buildings, mm. big warehouses. You can get solar panels on a farm. In fact, mm. where I showed you the wind farm before, we also, and I don't have a picture of it, but maybe you can go and look it up. If you look up solar farm. Solar farm. Yeah, it's a farm that makes mm. solar energy, makes electrical energy. <laughs> And it's just full and full of these solar panels, mm. hundreds and hundreds and thousands of them, wow. all st lined up together. You can put solar panels on cars, but they don't really produce enough energy to make the car run. Mm. But you might have solar panels on your roof, and if you've got an electric car, you might charge it up from those solar panels. Mm. Wow. And then you're not using petrol energy, you're using electrical energy that comes from solar. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. So. One thing that is really useful to think about then is how that energy gets converted from one form to another, where you use it and where it comes from. And mm. so now we're going to talk about this activity that I've made. Oh, yeah, which is nice. going to keep you pretty busy. <laughs> the, I told you last um, time on Monday that one of my favorite charts is called a Sankey diagram. It's mm. an energy flow diagram. And people use these all around the world to work out how much energy they're using and how much where that energy comes from and normally they might do it for a country or mm -hmm. for the whole world or for a state like Tasmania wow but we can actually do it for our own house mm. and I'm going to get you to do that yourself on the weekend if you want to um, I'll firstly show you what one of those energy diagram looks like and then I'll show you the activity that we've got to do and I'll go through it with you doing my house Ooh. And drawing a nice, colourful chart showing where the energy comes from and where it's used in my house. And then you can take it home and do it yourself. You might need to get your older brother or sister or your, your adult in your house to help you answer some of the questions, but you could do it yourself. Beautiful. So this one, it's a pretty wow. busy looking chart. This mm. is all of the energy for the whole world. Now, I'm going to just highlight a couple of the um, most important bits. Okay. On one side, on the... The right, as you're looking at it on mm. the screen, is where we use energy. Okay. And we either use energy in industry, that's making stuff, making those bottles of apple juice, making cars, mm. making all sorts of things, TVs. Um, or we use it for transport, which is getting around in cars and trains mm. and buses or aeroplanes. And then the other one that we use it in is buildings, which is what we showed you before, or what I showed you for my house, but also for offices and schools, everywhere where there's energy used within a building um, or workplace mm. or um, office. And then that's where the energy is used. And you can see all those complicated lines and squeals. Don't worry, it won't be that complicated for our house mm. um, and where it comes from. And the really interesting thing is mm. most of that energy in the world today comes from oil, mm and coal and gas, huge amounts of it. And then there's bioenergy. Remember, that's the wood mm. and other forms of energy, like the corn that can be used for energy. And renewables is actually a pretty small. Renewable energy is like what we have in Tasmania, hydropower mm. or water energy, wind energy or solar energy. That's a pretty small amount at the moment um, that's used, but I think Kids, as you grow up and when you start working and by the time you get to my age, this is going to change a lot. We're going to use a lot more renewable energy and a lot less of these other forms of energy because we know, we already talked about on Monday, mm. some of the side effects, the slow dangerous, if you like, of using so much of that, um, what we call fossil fuels. So it's pretty complicated, isn't it? It does <laughs> look mighty, mighty complex. We're going to do it for our house. All right. Um, 
I don't know how this is going to go, Sam, but we're going to try and do it for our house. Um, I've got a sheet for, for you, Sam, oh, and, um, and I've sent one to teachers. And I don't know how clearly we're going to be able to see it on this. Um, we'll go to top down. Top down camera, yeah, actually. Yeah, it'll, it'll be okay. Oh, we'll so we've got lots of sheets of paper. The first one, um, we don't need to look at. It's instructions. You need to look at it or your teacher will need mm. to look at it. The second one is one that's got lots and lots of boxes. And right. it's really hard to see that, isn't it? What I might need to do is put it up on something a bit higher. That's all right. We or, can do that. But what's the while, while we're finding out while we're finding a box? So yes. what? How does this work? So we tick the boxes one by one. Is that the idea? So we're going to circle boxes. Ah. We're going to look at each. There's five way, ways that we use energy in the household. Mm. There's transport. How you you got to school in the morning? Mm. How mum and dad get to work? Here we go. Work. Here we go. Box we prepared earlier. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Except it's. I'll I'll read them out to you. All right. Um. Unless we can put this down a bit lower. Yeah. You can Sorry, probably point is... with a pencil. But yeah. yeah. Um, we'll so I, I want to turn you into energy sleuths. All right. Oh, oh there we go. Live, are you? There we go. Perfect. Look at that. And the first thing we're going to look at is transport. And you go home mm. on the weekend, or you can probably do this now. Mm. The first one is how many cars do you have in your house? Okay. So in my house, I've got two cars. So I'm going to circle two. I'm going to circle zero. Zero? Yeah, so I guess I don't so circle any. Put there, did I? Yeah. Um, what size cars do you have? Well, both of our cars are, I've got small, medium, or large. Both of ours are medium, and so I'm going to join those up. And then this is one you'll probably almost certainly have to ask mm. one of the adults in your household, how far does each of those drive every year? Mm. And in our case, ours we probably drive five or six or 7,000 kilometers. That's a lot every year. So I'm gonna circle that one and I'll join that up with a line. Mm. And then finally, is your car electric? There aren't many yet, or mm. petrol. Ours is petrol, both of them are. And so I'm gonna join those up. Mm -hmm. And then what I'll need you to do is multiply the numbers that you circled. You can see there's a multiply sign here. Mm -hmm. Two times three, what's that? That's Six, six, six <laughs> times two, had to think about that one, is 12. And 12 times one is 12. And so I write 12 here. Now, I'm just thinking because I, even though I don't own a car, I have caught things like taxis and Ubers and stuff like that before. Yes. So maybe I would well, say, does that work in it? So if I go 5,000 kilometers a year. Yeah, you and could do one on petrol, small car. One, yeah, one small car. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then I go to small, let's just say small, there we go. And less than that, there we go. So that's two times one, which is two times one again. Is that correct? Yeah, that's so right. So that makes the, well, that makes it two. Two. The use of two. So there you go. In my household, we use 12 units of energy wow. for transport and every year. Mm. And you use two. Two. Mm. Big difference. Big difference. Mm. Mm, maybe I need to start thinking about uh, getting more Ubers and... Um, Oh, I think... Get rid of some of our cars. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Get get those bicycles going. <laughs> um, the next one yeah. is heating. Ah, yes. Now, in winter, every house in Tasmania mm. has to have some heat. Mm -hmm. Well, I think so. Yeah. So I didn't put a no heating at all no option. Heat. But how big is your house? Well, our house is medium, so I'm going to circle this one. Right. And... We have a wood fire. You saw the photos of that. We only turn it on in the evening. Put mm -hmm, it on. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting circling evening only, and I can join those up with a pencil line. Okay. And then the next question is, what sort of heater is used mm. in your house? And I've mostly used what's your main one. We use a wood fire. So I can join those up. Now, this is the trickiest calculation to do because we need to do three mm -hmm. times two is six again. Mm -hmm. Six times four, oh, I'm pretty sure you kids can do that, that's 24. But then I've got to divide by two for this one. All right. So 24, that's 12 again. So I use 12 and I put it in this spot here because it's wood, I use wood energy mm. or biomass for heating. All right, excellent. So what have I got here? I have, so my heating is small, which is two, 
and I usually turn it on the evening only, which is another two in my case. So that's two times two is four times three because it's electric, uh, which would make that 12, right? Yeah, and then divide go. by two. Divide seven. by two is six. Hang on, is it? Yes, it, it is. is. It is indeed. Well, Sam, last week, Sam, you said, I bet I use less energy than you, Evan. I think I you think might be right. I think you might be right. Big. I also use less of my brain as well if we were measuring that. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, how are we going for time? Because we could take a break and I could fill out the rest or we could do Maybe another one now. Maybe we should do that. Yeah, we'll, do we'll do that. So whilst, whilst Evan and I are struggling with the mathematics <laughs> of this, we will give you all an opportunity to have a brief break and also... Think about some questions you'd like to ask us. Send them to us and don't forget to make sure that you add your name and your school so that then we can give you a quick little shout out. That'd be fantastic. So we'll cut to a little short five minute break. Think about some questions. Yep, and then you can do top. Beautiful. <laughs> Welcome Oof. back, everyone. That was tough. Look at this. Look, we got all kinds of paper. I had to do maths. I haven't done maths for a very, very long time. But I think we've got an excellent result. And don't forget, if you haven't got the sheet with you today, it has been emailed out, so some of you may have received it. And if you haven't received it yet, you can always go to the Peter Underwood Facebook page, and it will be uploaded there. And Evan, do you have any other where other places that it might be put up? Uh, no, I think that's the best spot that's to the best put spot. it. Um, Beautiful. I'm Beautiful. very happy to have any sent to me or mm -hmm. questions you've got for me because, you know, as I said, I love this energy kind of business. That's his business. His business is the energy and, business. And Sam, I've got to say, mm. I love nothing more than a combination of maths and colouring in, which is why I've made this. And I've in that last five minutes, I've mm. very frantically worked up a sweat in doing my own house and you might be able to see that if we go to the top mm. camera. So this is what you'll end up with Ooh. for your house. But everyone's house will look different. And so mm. I'll just show you what this says to me. All right. This this on the right shows me how much energy I've used mm. or how much I do use every year. And you can see that actually my transport and my heating is quite a lot. Mm. I didn't realise it was going to be quite a such a big chunk. And then my hot water, that's a little bit. Mm. Um, that's because we've got one of those special heat pumps that pumps the heat from outside into the hot water tank. Ooh. We use quite a bit for cooking and cleaning. Um, that's all those big breakfasts I have, Sam. <laughs> You're a tall guy. Yeah. <laughs> and entertainment and lighting quite mm. a bit as well. But you can see where it comes from. This is where mm. it's really useful. So all of that transport, that brown is our mm. fossil fuels. That's the, remember the oil and coal mm. and gas yeah. that the world uses. So at least... You could say we're a fair way ahead of the rest of the world in that respect. Mm. Here's my biomass. It's quite a big chunk of energy mm. that I'm getting from that wood. And then all of this other energy, which I've colored in purple, come, comes in form of electrical energy. Mm. And that comes from power stations, but it's converted to electrical energy. All mm. energy that comes as electrical energy has to come from something else. Mm. And mm. in our case in Tasmania... It either comes from hydro or water energy mm. or wind. Mm. And I'll show you on the I've shown you on the calculation sheet once mm. you've worked you got your head around it, Sam, yeah, yeah. of how to calculate how much is from each. Mm. And then mm. in my case we've got that solar P V system, the, the, the solar really panels. Big chunk. Yeah. These on the top of our roof. And actually they're making up quite a big chunk of the energy that we mm. that we need, at least the electrical energy. Mm -hmm. Um and they're all converted to electrical energy and then go to these other uses. Now, mm. the thing that I really like this for is now that I've done this, this is the first time I've ever done it for my house, kids, by wow. the way. I've sort of thought about it, but I've never gone and, and done I've it. Done it. Yeah. Um, now I can look at it and go, well, I could, um, I could make a little bit more solar energy. I could put a few more solar cells on, on my roof, mm. but not too many because um, I've only got this little amount of hydro or water mm. and this little amount of wind energy that I currently use. Mm -hmm. Ah. And your roof's only so big as and well. And roof's only so big. But then I go, well, actually, maybe I could make some electricity, extra electricity, and turn hmm. some of this transport energy into electrical energy. If I get an electric car, that'll change things. Mm -hmm. Or maybe maybe I should use my wood fire less and 
um, have an electric heat pump like you do, Sam, at your house. Yes, it's true. It's and true. make more electricity. And I suppose using those bills. light bulbs, like energy efficient light bulbs or LEDs, having open natural light where possible, I suppose, if you have curtains that you open up in the morning and things like yeah. that. All these things, I yeah. guess, reduce... You, you can either bring in more energy or you can try to reduce the amount of energy you already use sort of thing because we can't... Yeah, absolutely. You can change things at either end of this. Mm. and um, mm. So, yeah, uh, I'll also, I think I might um, mm. s scan that and put it up on the, oh, yes. on the Peter Underwood Centre so you can have a look mm -hmm. and check out my energy and it will help you work out also how you do your own mm. um, chart. So that's an energy flow diagram. That's really useful. Mm. Maths, colour. What more could we ask for, Sam? I know. I mean, hey, that's what it's all about. It's all about understanding it. And just to correct me if I'm wrong, Evan, but is am I correct in thinking that the number, so 17 or 12, say, with your energy there, relates to the number of squares that you fill in vertically? Is yes, that correct? Yes. I, yes. Um, I didn't say that, but each little square, each little grid corresponds to one of these numbers. There you exactly. go. So quite um, easy wow. once you've worked out the numbers mm, mm, to mm. carefully colour it in. There you go. That's fascinating. Well, thank you, Evan. We're going to look for it. You can upload that and uh, post it on the Peter Underwood Facebook page. And if you at school also want to take a photo of yours, oh. and you can upload it as well to Facebook and just tag the Department of Education and Peter Underwood Centre on it, and we'll be able to share it around and show everybody. And who knows, maybe Pete, uh, Evan can give you a... A uh, nice little review of your energy oh. usage and make some tips. <laughs> I'd love to see some. It'd be great. It'd be fantastic. Now, what do you think? Should we make some uh, answer some questions? Let's. All righty. Let's do it. Let's jump on in. So, first off the ranks here, we have Haley from Summerdale Primary <coughs> who asks, what other ways can you uh, use to conserve energy? So, mm. we can use less energy. We can get more energy. But maybe what's something... What can something all our viewers do right now to save energy? Well, one of the best things you can do, you can see how much I use for transport, mm. is to walk or ride your bike mm. on short trips instead of taking the car. Mm. Or mm. Sam takes buses or maybe gets a taxi if he needs to occasionally. Mm -hmm. So public transport, that's a good way to reduce your energy use. Mm -hmm. um, in the house... Shorter showers, mm. I don't know what you kids are like, but sometimes you hop in the shower, I know my kids do, and they just want to stay there, it's nice and warm, but shorter showers means using less energy. Um, I would like to say watching TV a little bit less, but uh, mm. that's a tough one to try and sell to you guys, I reckon. Maybe it would be a bit <laughs> tough. Mind you, with the, the way technology is depending, sometimes, I guess, older technology, if you keep it, it's one of these interesting things, you keep it for longer, that means that it's not, they're not having to make more stuff so they don't use as much energy, but the thing, the item in question actually uses more energy itself. Yeah, that's, that becomes a really complicated mm. question to try and answer, but for example, mm. an older car will use less, uh, more energy than a newer car to travel from Hobart to Launceston, mm -hmm. but the amount of energy we saw in the manufacturing in the industries and factories, you need a lot of energy to make stuff. And mm. Sam, as you say, working out how much energy it takes to make that new car that you're gonna buy, mm. is it worth it, um, given that you use less energy each year? Mm. It's, mm. Yeah, we could, it's a complicated maths it. equation, but you can do it and you can work it out. I believe it, and I suppose it's like school buses for everyone at home who has a school bus, you know? More kids on the bus, lower energy per person, yes. even if the amount of fuel is, let's say, about maybe even a little bit more yep. than their parents driving them to and from school. Yeah, that's right. Remember, a bus with mm. four or five people on it is the same amount of energy being used as four or five people all driving cars. Mm. And so if you get 10 people on it, it's twice as good. Mm. Fascinating, fascinating. All right, barreling ahead. And don't forget, if we don't get to your question today, don't worry, because we will answer all the questions and we will send them out to your teachers. So everyone will get their question answered, even if we can't answer it live today. So let's have a look here. We have another one here from, uh, from Malu, from the Tasmanian, who's a Tasmanian homeschooler. Now, this is an interesting one, because this might be a bit, uh, bit complicated for this particular episode, but... How does the magnetic magnetic field actually work? 
and what sort of energy is it using? So how does magnetic energy used in everyday energy storage and production? Wow, yeah, that is an That's a big excellent one. question. It's a big one. Um, what I can tell you is that all of those generators I showed you, the hydro generator, which has the water running downhill and the turbine, and the wind generator, which has the big blades that go round and round, they all convert energy from mechanical energy into electrical energy, but they all convert it to magnetic energy first. Mm -hmm. So the way that a motor or a electrical generator works is it stores energy in the magnetic field and then converts it to electrical. And yeah, I think that one, you know what? Mm. Um, if you make it to university and come and teach, uh, or I teach you in some of my courses, I'll teach you exactly how. That's the main use of magnetic energy. The other one that's really interesting mm is some of these high-speed trains, um, I think there's one in Japan, there might be one in China. Have you ever heard of maglev? Mm -hmm. Really cool technology. That uses magnetic levitation, so the train hovers, if you like, above a train track, and it uses magnetic energy to store and transfer energy to the train to kinetic energy. Really mm. cool technology. Fascinating. I could do a whole show on that, I reckon, just about. Oh, I believe we could play with magnets. Something to keep in for next year, which is why everyone will have to tune in next year as well. Absolutely. Uh, and make sure if you want those shout-outs, make sure that you tag both the Peter Underwood Centre and, of course, Department of Education. And you can follow us uh, on, of course, Instagram at UCTV Alive for Kids and, of course, the Peter Underwood Centre. You can watch past episodes there. And we'll go back because I don't believe there's sound on that one. <laughs> but if you go to those links, you can always get more information as well. Don't forget, every fortnight UCTV uh, runs and it's a good program. So I'd recommend that one. So, Evan, let's uh, quickly do some a lightning round. What do you think? I think we've got okay. 60 seconds left on the clock. All Fantastic. Right, let's so let's go. Here we go. All right, lightning round. So, Rafi at Illawarra Primary School. Uh, is wondering about nuclear energy and why it wasn't included. Ah, mm. very good question. Huge amount of energy in the nuclear energy fuel. Mm -hmm. It's used elsewhere, not in Australia. Um, it's very expensive now, mm. and it's very hard to build a new plant. Um, and also, a lot of people don't want to have them in their neighbourhood. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And yet, sometimes some... Uh some fire alarms or fire uh, things still have little bits of radio, like radioactive stuff in them, do they? Uh, yes, it's still used in lots of small instruments. There you go, it's very interesting. Now, here's a good one. Uh, this is from uh, Wymere Primary School. This is from Philippa. Uh, in Tasmania, how many different types of energy do we make electricity from in Tasmania? Now, that's a very interesting one. Yeah, so in Tasmania, almost all from water. Mm or wind, we have a small amount where we burn gas and turn a turbine and make electricity, mm. but it's not used very often, and solar from people's rooftops. And they're basically the, the three ways that we generate electricity. That's Water, it. wind, and solar. There you go. That's very, that's very interesting. And that's... Tasmania's not like anywhere else in the world, in a way, where mm. we mostly, almost entirely renewable energy already. That's pretty cool. That's very cool. And hopefully we can get, you know, so renewable that we can export it and all kinds of fun stuff. Exactly, yep. That'd be exciting. And here we go. We'll finish on, we'll finish on this great little question here, which I think is extremely uh, important and will probably change the face of science forever, Evan. So here we go. Uh, Andrew from St. Joseph's uh, in Rose, uh, Rosebury asks, can you harvest energy from electric eels? <laughs> oh, 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 I'd love mm. to go snorkeling and find out. Yeah, I think they have small... They're amazing. They generate electricity and mm. light up, um, you know, and they can attack prey uh, with their electrical mm. pulses. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, let's get a big tank full of them and yep. see if we can harness them, shall we? There we go. So, Andrew, we're going to come to your school and we're going to go scuba diving and we'll bring you along and you can put the electrodes on the eels and we'll find out. That'll be exciting. <laughs> Evan, thank you once again for coming in today. My it's pleasure. been fantastic. And thank you for your activity as well. I look forward to filling this out a little bit later on. Uh, and I think it's really enlightening because it can really show you how much energy you do use and where you can maybe make some improvements or maybe where your whole family or perhaps school can even make some changes yeah. to make it more efficient. Yep. 
So yeah. it, it's just fun to compare as well. Mm. Different people, different houses. I mean, we have different size houses. We use mm. different amounts of energy. We can look and compare. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's science. It is. It's science. There you go. Evan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. And thank you, of course, everyone, our wonderful audience. Thank you for coming to the last episode of STEM Alive for Kids for this week, for National Science Week 2021, of course, brought to you by the Peter Underwood Centre and Department of Education. And thank you, most importantly, of course, to the viewer, to you. Hopefully you learned something this week about energy, about poo, about insects, and that you'll have a fantastic time taking all that you've learned and applying it. So, until next time, until next year, this is Sam signing off. Stay smart. Good morning, good morning everybody and welcome to STEM Alive for Kids for National Science Week 2021. Big shout out of course to the Department of Education and Peter Underwood Centre for making this possible and of course, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> welcome yes of course to STEM Alive for Kids. Today we've got a really, really interesting topic for you. So I hope you're all strapped in, buckled up and only using half your chair because that's how much of it you'll need. You'll be on the edge of it. Exciting! We have with us a special guest today. <coughs> Please allow me to present to you the wonderful Shasta Henry. Woo! Hello Shasta, how are you? Hi Sam. Hi everyone there in the classrooms. It is so exciting to be here to share my study subject Ooh. with you guys for National Science Week. And what, what, pray tell, Shasta from uh, the Tasmanian School of Biogeography, would that be? Can you guess? Ooh. Do you think the children know? I don't know. Hmm. I study hmm. insects. Oh. I study all the different kinds of insects. I do study in the geography department, which because I study how insects are building blocks mm. of ecosystems. So just like plants, 
uh, just like rocks, pieces of landscape, and the way that all living things fit together. Yeah. And the living things that I focus on are insects. I'm an entomologist. <gasps> Is that like the person who does x-rays? No. Oh, that's a different thing. No need to x-ray insects because their bones are on the outside. Ah, that makes sense. That <laughs> makes sense. There you go. So I believe you've uh, presented or going to present a very interesting little talk to us today. Is that right? Absolutely. So Ooh. the theme of all of National Science Week mm. is food. Mm -hmm. and so I'm going to be talking about insects and food mm. and insects as food. So you can eat insects. You can eat insects. Interesting. Interesting. Well, what do you think? Should we jump straight into it? I'm ready. If you're ready. Let's go. Whoa. What have we got here? So you can see a lot of insects here on my opening screen. These are all the kinds of insects that I study. Mm. Butterflies, beetles, wasps, ants. And these are all the different kinds of insects that are also food. <laughs> hey. But we're not going to start with eating insects. We oh. might start somewhere a little bit more normal. Mm. So what about some of these kinds of foods? How about mm. you there in the classroom? Put your hand up if you like mandarin oranges or orange juice. What about lemon-flavoured fizzy cordial or sweets? And how do you feel about bees? Because if you like these citrus fruits, mm. I can tell you that they are mm. brought to you thanks to bees. Our sponsor, Bees. Thank you very much, Bees, for supporting us in STEM Alive for Kids. Bees and lots of other flying types of insects drink nectar out of flowers. It's like a sweet cordial for insects. Mm. And when they land on the flower, they get part of the flower on them. It's called pollen. Then when they fly to another flower... They exchange pollen between flowers, and this is what turns a flower into a fruit. So mm. lots of the fruits that we eat are brought to us thanks to bees and other pollinating insects. So they fly from one flower to another and then cover themselves in pollen mm -hmm. and then take that pollen and swap it out and accidentally mix it up. Accidentally mix it up, and this oh. is how flowers turn into fruit. Mm. So this is a chocolate flower, mm. which sounds pretty good. Mm. And the fruit that it turns into is a bean, and it's mm. called the cocoa bean. Mm. And cocoa beans give us the brown chocolatey flavour that is in chocolate. Mm -hmm. These flowers are very small, only about one centimetre big or the size of a square of a piece of chocolate. And a honeybee is mm. too big to land on this flower. So we need an even smaller kind of flying insect. How mm. do you feel about mosquitoes, Sam? Oh, they're a very, very interesting creature, i got to say. As, are they as good as chocolate? I mean, oh, I do like chocolate, you know. So you have to leave some space in your heart for mosquitoes because it's a tiny flying insect like mm. a mosquito that pollinates the chocolate flower, turns into the cocoa bean and wow. gives us chocolate. So it's not just bees that do pollinating. It actually can be other insects as well. Lots of different types of insects. There are wow. so many different kinds of insects mm. and different types of insects in different parts of the world mm. uh, that they're involved in practically every part of our life. Wow. So they make the food that we eat. All of Ooh. these other kinds of foods as well are thanks to flying insect pollinators. Practically every ingredient in a taco, mm -hmm. strawberries, apple juice, and of course, honey, which comes straight from honeybees. That's fascinating. Look at that. So there's a lot of food that if we didn't have all these little pollinators and insects around for, we just wouldn't have it all. Yeah. 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 So our food itself comes from insects. Mm. But insects are also food for other animals. This is a Tasmanian microbat. It is oh. a super tiny little bat. We have a few different species in Tasmania. Mm. And because they are so small, they have to eat animals that are even smaller than they are. And that is insects. Mm. Also, this beautiful little bird Ooh. and lots of the tiny birds that live in Tasmania. This is called a silver eye. It's mm. one of my favorite. They fly around in big flocks and they land in trees, hop up and down and peck the insects off of the trees. Ooh. And you might have seen 
one Yay. of these before. This is a little metallic skink. And, of course, they are also very small and they have to eat things that are small enough to fit inside their mouth. And that is insects. Oh, wow. So we, all these animals also rely on insects, almost like we rely on the insects too. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And even some plants yeah. eat insects. Have you ever seen a Venus flytrap before? It's a type of plant that will close over an insect and digest it just like your stomach does. The one in red is called mm. a sundew. It's a type of Tasmanian carnivorous plant. It eats insects as well. Yeah. And why would a plant, or why would anyone want to eat an insect? Mm. Well, insects are animals. Just the same way that cows and pigs and chickens are animals. And so even though they are very different shapes, they have all the same building blocks that make up their bodies. When we eat the bodies of cows, we get energy and protein and nutrients. And when a plant eats a fly, they get protein and energy and nutrients. So it's nutrition, which is why mm. people would want to eat insects or plants would want to eat insects or a lizard would want to eat an insect vitamins minerals fats proteins these are the building blocks that build our bodies interesting interesting so you would be familiar with some of the animals on this chart mm -hmm. usually the vertebrates they are animals that have bones and on the other side of the chart, we have the other group of animals that have no bones. You've probably seen a worm before mm. or a snail. So birds have bones. Mm. Cows and cats and dogs and people are mammals and we all have bones. There are bones inside of us right now. And fish have bones. You have to be careful sometimes when you're eating fish because they can have bones that we can't chew up with our teeth. <laughs> And a worm is an animal that has no bones. So is a snail. And so mm. is an insect. Mm. Now we are familiar with more kinds of food animals from the animals that have bones side. Mm. If you get a whole roast chicken, you will find some of the bird bones inside of it. We take all of the bones out to grind um, hamburger patties make them nice and soft and of course fish fingers don't have bones in them anymore mm. either because it's far easier for us to eat food that is soft mm. you might have eaten some of the kinds of food from the animals with no bones side of the chart as well mm. crustaceans is another word for crabs mm. and crabs also means prawns and crayfish so lots of seafood are animals that have no bones. Mm. Has anyone who's listening ever eaten a prawn before? And it works exactly the same way for those animals that eat insects. Mm. Insects are a type of animal with no bones and they are good food in just the same way that all of these other kinds of foods are. Remember, it's full of nutrition and energy that helps our bodies grow. Mm. And so hopefully you're ready to hear me say that people can eat insects if they want to as well. Wow. Has anyone in your class eaten an insect before? You can put your hands up. It's all right. You can raise your hands if you want. We can see some pictures here. There's a person who's eating a uh, chocolatey insect bar mm -hmm. and the insects in that would be crispy and crunchy, just like rice bubble crisps. Mm. Or you can uh, toast them up, make them crispy and put savory seasoning on. Ooh. And they are a lot like chips. Mm. And I'm going to prove this to you oh, because how? I have some insects with me today that I'm going to eat. So I got these Ooh. at a shop mm -hmm. in America. It's not as easy to buy insects in Australia at the moment because it's not as normal here. But it's very normal to eat insects in other countries. Mm. In Thailand, children last night would have gone home after school and they put out cricket traps and they catch crickets overnight oh. while they're doing their homework mm. and then while they're sleeping. And when they get up 
in the morning they collect their cricket trap full of crickets and they take it to school give all of their crickets to their principal and their principal cooks them for school lunch and everyone has crickets together at lunchtime. Now you might never have heard of that before, mm. but it is very normal in lots of other countries. So Sam and I are going to eat a piece of these crickets. Oh boy. Now these ones aren't sweet. These ones have got savory flavors like chips. And just mm. in the same way that chips don't usually taste much like potato, they taste like flavoring. These mm. ones are going to taste like bacon and cheese. Ooh, do you like good. bacon and cheese, Sam? I must say I do like bacon and cheese. I have got a cricket here. You oh, can yeah, have a leg. I'm going to have a delicious, going to have a handful of handful of legs. I'm just going to go all out. Can I have all of them? You can have all be, of them. You be... need to chew them properly, though. All right. Okay, here we go. Let's give this a try. You know, this will give me a leg up. <laughs> <laughs> and it tastes mostly like the flavouring that yeah. is on the cricket. Bacon it's kind of got a, uh, it's sort of got a crispy kind of light, fluffy peanut almost sort of texture. Yeah, a little mm. bit like a peanut, a little bit like a rice crispy. Mm. We eat lots of foods every day that are quite a lot like insects, even though we haven't eaten insects before. Interesting. So maybe next time you get the chance, mm. you could uh, say yes to an insect. You can be just like those other children all over the world. You can have insects too. That does sound mighty, mighty, mighty tasty. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jester. So once we've once we've eaten all the insects, what what happens afterwards once we start digesting all the insects? Well, when we eat insects, just like any other type of food, they mm. go into our stomach mm. and they come out the other end as poo. Oh. And when we eat soft food and mm. we chew it up with our teeth, it goes into our stomach as little bits and it comes out the other end. Mm. Nice and nice and comfortable and easy. But mm. of course, this picture here, there's a whole chicken leg in that person's stomach. That's not <laughs> That's not how eating works, is it? They wouldn't put the bone in their stomach. That's too hard for you to digest and it wouldn't come out the other end. Oof. So we chew food up with our teeth and mm -hmm. turn it into small parts first. But as I said at the beginning, mm. insects don't have bones on the inside. Mm. They have their hard part of their body on the outside. And birds that do a lot of eating of insects don't have teeth to chew them up with. So we will actually often find pieces of insects in animal poo. Mm. And we can often identify what kind of animal the poo comes from. And we can also identify what kinds of things those animals have been eating. So you can actually yeah. use poo for science. So this is what's called a magpie pellet. This mm. magpie has eaten a bunch of insects. Mm -hmm. It's got mealworms in its beak there, but I can see from this magpie pellet that it's mm. actually eaten a Christmas beetle. Mm. I found this in December around Christmas time when there's lots of Christmas beetles out and about, and so lots of animals will be eating them. Mm. You can see those shiny green pieces in the magpie pellet, which are bits of hard insect from the outside that couldn't be turned into food and energy. And so they've come back out the other end. Interesting. Interesting. This is an owl pellet. Owls oh, are quite wow. a big bird. Mm. And so they are able to take great big gulps of food. There's actually two skulls, two bones, yeah. two head bones from little mice here. So owls need lots of energy and they eat a lot of meat to get that energy. But wow. you can't digest bone and so the whole bone has to come back out again. And can you see the big shiny insect casing that mm. is in this owl pellet? What is it? Do we know? It's a type of beetle. Beetles mm. have hard shell wings on the outside. Mm -hmm. and I could identify this beetle uh, from this owl pellet, although I don't know off the top of my head. But if this mm. beetle was only found in one particular place, this is why I work in the geography department, I would then know where this owl went to feed and mm. where it found that beetle. Interesting, interesting. This is another Tasmanian species. This is an animal called a quoll, and quolls eat meat and vegetables. 
just like we do. And I can see that from this qual poo. It's got some tiny little bones from a very small animal that it must have eaten. It's also got some seeds, so it's eaten some fruit and it's got a seed inside of its poo, too hard to digest. Mm. And you can see, you might not recognize it, but I know a lot about insects. And so mm. I recognize that piece of insect shell, shiny and black mm. and plated. And that's the thing that makes my brain go, oh, this quoll has eaten some insects. Ooh. Is it a slater? No, I think it is the underside part mm. of an insect. So if you Ooh. flipped a beetle over, mm. it gets shiny plates on the underside oh. as well. Interesting. And there is a type of Australian animal that only eats insects, and that is the echidna. Right. Echidnas have very tiny mouths just at the very end of what we call their beak, and so they can only fit tiny things in their mouth. Just mm. like that. Just like that. And be like eating all of your food through a drinking straw. And so echidnas only eat ants. Mm. And scientists were able to identify five different species of ants mm. from the body parts in this echidna poo. Oh, wow. And so with information like that, we can look at the environment and we can say, are all of those types of ants here? Maybe we want echidnas to come and live in a particular place. Mm. We can look around, we can measure the ants, and we can say, is this a good place for echidnas to come and live? And mm. so those are some of the ways that we can use insects mm. in poo to mm. do study science on other larger kinds of animals. And so the organisers of National Science mm. Week have got an experiment that you'll be able to do at home or in your classroom. Mm. And it is about taking food and turning it into fake poo in your classroom. So we've got some video instructions that we're going to play for you now. And after that, Sam and I are going to answer some of your questions about insects and food and poo. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. And you took the words right out of my mouth. Take a minute to watch the video at home everyone or at school and make sure you get some questions ready for us about anything that you've heard so far we look forward to answering them so what do you think let's jump into the video let's go let's do it let's see what poo's made of we're going to show you what happens to our food from the moment we put it in our mouths until it comes out our bottom actually the correct word is anus. It comes out through our anus as poo. Yucky, right? We're going to do this right here on this table using this equipment. Each piece of equipment represents a part of our body. The bowl is my mouth. The scissors are my front teeth for biting the food. And the potato masher represents my back teeth for chewing and grinding the food. Now, let's eat the food. First, I'm going to take a bite of my food. Then I will chew it up in my mouth. While I'm chewing and rolling the food in my mouth, the food is actually mixing with saliva. Not only is saliva helping me moisten the food, it actually contains special chemicals that help break down the food. I might have a glass of water to make it easy for me to swallow. I don't want to choke up my food, so a lot of chewing going on. I think I'm ready to swallow now. From my mouth, where does the chewed up food go? That's right, into my stomach, through the esophagus. That's the tube connecting my mouth to my stomach. This plastic tube represents the esophagus and the Ziploc bag here is my stomach. Swallowing is hard, I should have chewed my food a lot. Of course, my esophagus is not as stiff as the plastic tube. To help it go down, I will push it through with the back of the spoon. Now it is in my stomach. What happens here? The food is broken down some more. Our stomachs contain more food breaking down chemicals. What are they called again? Enzymes. That's right. The food breaking down chemicals here work best with a bit of acid. So, let's make my tummy acid by adding some vinegar. Yes, vinegar is an acid. Food is broken down here some more. The walls of my stomach squeeze the food. Sometimes it even makes a noise, like when your tummy is rumbling. I 
I think the broken down food is ready to travel to the intestines. Do you know that the intestines are as long as this classroom? What? Even longer? Now look what's happening here. The liquid is slipping through these intestines. Our intestines have tiny little holes that let the nutrients out into our blood. Nutrients are carried to the rest of our body to give us energy and build muscles. Nutrients are the good parts of the food that our bodies need. The nutrients are now going into the bloodstream. Yes, more nutrients in the bloodstream. Once all the nutrients are gone, finally, what comes out our anus? Poo. That's some serious poo right there. I should have drunk more water. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed learning about how food travels through our bodies. Hey, hey, how was that? How delicious was that looking? Or maybe not very delicious looking at all. Did you learn something? Maybe you've got some questions to ask. And if you do, I'm glad. Because we're going to go to a very short interval and you can all chat amongst yourselves and your teacher can help you out as well and come up with some questions that you'd like to ask. Don't forget, include your name and school so that we can give you a shout out and uh, let everyone know who's asking the big brain questions. So, a five minute interval and uh, we're gonna get back to enjoying our insects in the meantime. See you soon. Now. We have so, so many fantastic so questions. I know, this is the best part of the whole thing. So, thank you all, of course, for sending in your questions. We're going to have a look at all of them, and we're going to answer all of them. Maybe not live here today, but don't worry. If you send in your questions, we will answer them, and we'll send them back to your teacher, and you'll be able to have a look at all the answers, which is pretty exciting. So, what do you think, Shasta? Should we get stuck in? I am so ready. I'm so full of answers. Okay, so full of ansies, more so like. So full of ant. Sirs. <laughs> hey Sam. Yes. Why do echidnas never get sick? Why do echidnas never get sick? Because they're full of little antibodies. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we will be here all week, everybody, so you can tune on in. Come on back. There you go. Alrighty. So <laughs> one of the first questions we have off the ranks here is uh, from Mrs. Singleton and Max are uh, from Catholic Education Tasmania, who ask, is a spider, which is an arachnid, also an insect? So spiders are not insects. Mm. All organisms, all animals have a shopping list of body parts mm -hmm. that make them what they are. Mm. So you might know part of these answers already. Okay. We know that insects have six legs. Six. And you might know how many legs a spider has. It is eight. So to be an insect, something has to have six legs. Mm -hmm. And so a spider can't be an insect. Mm -hmm. It is, like you said, an arachnid. Mm -hmm. But they are all from that no bones side of the table. They are all invertebrates. Mm -hmm. Where their bones are on the outside. Yep. Fascinating. There you go. I mean, spiders are just land crabs, really, when you think about it. And yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Richards asks, and this is a very interesting one, mm -hmm. do insects sleep and is there an app uh, that you can get, like an app on your phone or mm -hmm. a tablet, uh, that you can use to ID an insect? So that was a bit of a double barrel question. So do insects sleep? Do they take little insect naps? Insects do sleep. Mm. Uh, insects will often have a active time of day and a resting time of day, just like we do. Lots of them come out during the day, like mm. butterflies and beetles. But then to reduce competition so that there's not a big insect traffic jam mm. and everyone's trying to live at the same time, 
Uh, we also often have like moths, mm -hmm. like butterflies, but they come out at night. Mm -hmm. They rest and sleep during the day. Fascinating. Uh, and apps. I don't know any off the top of my head. I know that there are lots of good books that you can buy uh, from places like the CSIRO. You'll probably get them at the museum, mm. which have lots of pictures. They're called field guides for helping mm. you identify insects in the field. And there are apps a lot like that that are being developed. One of the problems is mm. that there are so many different types of insects. You would need a book this big to have all of the photographs. So often you'll find an insect that you cannot see a picture of. Mm. And in places like Tasmania, there's actually lots and lots of insects that don't have names and don't have pictures yet. Oh, so no. there's a bit of a knowledge gap there. But yes, there are lots of resources that will help you start learning to identify the insects around you. That's pretty exciting. So we can expect a Tasmanian insect Pokédex soon. Absolutely. And if anyone wants to send me questions, mm. and especially pictures, at my Bug Girl Facebook page, I love getting your questions throughout the year. So don't be afraid to drop me a line. Fantastic. And we'll, we'll be putting that up, don't worry, in the emails and later on, so you'll be able to send your pictures directly to Shasta. Another one comes from uh, John Paul, which is, uh, is animal poo called scat? Yes. Mm. All poo is called scat, and often when we're out in the field as scientists, we don't say that we study poo, not all the time. Yes, we often call it scat, mm. and so a type of animal identification in the landscape that we use is called scats and tracks. We look for the things that animals leave behind. So mm. uh, Tasmanian devils have different kinds of tracks and scats, different kinds of poo than quolls do, mm. than echidnas do. So you can actually count, um, count animals and study them when they're not even there using these different kinds of signs. Yes, scat is another word for poo. And it's also a form of music where you go, skip it up, boop, up, do, 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 skiddly, da, da, poop. There you go. But don't get those two mixed up because if you go to the opening night and you know, you just have a bunch of animal scats, I don't think it'll go down too well. It'd be one heck of an instrument though, wouldn't it? So, moving along, we have one from Owen at Linda's Farm North Primary School, which is, and I believe this one's for you, Shasta, what is your favorite insect to eat? My favourite insect mm. to eat is crickets. Ooh. So the ones that we had before, Sam. Mm. I haven't eaten a lot of insects. It's not usual in my culture. Mm. I live in Australia and so it's only very recently that I've been able to find insects that I can buy and mm. try. But I've had mealworms, which mm. are extra crispy and I don't mind, but my favourite are the crickets. And lots of people's favourite are crickets. Mm. In Thailand, actually, this is the type of cricket that is farmed. Even though there are lots of types of native cricket in mm. Thailand, these ones taste the best. And so for places that um, grow crickets on a farm, just mm. like growing sheep on a farm, it is this type of cricket. Now, of course, these ones taste like salt and vinegar, which is fine too. But these crickets have a really nice flavour just mm. on their own. A mm -hmm. little bit like a Rice Krispie and a little bit like a peanut. I could just eat them, eat them all day. Easy peasy, just like snacks. But yeah. you can't eat only snacks. You have to eat vegetables and drink water and stuff like oh, that. Oh, I suppose. I suppose. Okay. But bugs are pretty, insects are pretty nutritious though. Like what are some of, the, some of the nutritional values that you can get out of an insect? Eating crickets, mm. if I was eating little pieces of beef or chicken... Insects actually have more iron in them to make my bones strong mm. uh, and more calcium in them to make my bones strong than those other kinds of meats that we normally eat. Mm. Because you're eating the bones on the outside of the insect, mm. uh, you're eating the whole thing, they have more fiber. So mm. normal meat doesn't have any fiber mm. and that makes your poo work really well. Mm. And they also have more minerals and uh, and things and less fat than mm. eating regular meat. So it's uh, insects are just better than cows. That's that's what I have to say. So we can either shrink cows down until they're really really small and put a suit of armor on them, or maybe we should just expand crickets until they're the size of cows. 
I could get a whole a whole cricket this size and then I wouldn't right. have to eat so many. I could just have one at a time. Much Imagine. more satisfying. Much more satisfying. Yeah, I could see you being a, an insect rancher, walking around <laughs> on the thing, hat, you know, riding the stag beetle into the sunset. Yeah, exactly. Hey, maybe that's what you should do at school, everyone. See if you can get your own little insect, you know, farmstead. That'd be pretty exciting. I can see a a whole new game taking place in uh, the Imagination Corner this afternoon, Sam. It sounds exciting. Insect farmer. Insect farmer. Yep, just here on the farm with the insects. Now, this one comes from Danica at Havenview Primary. And this is a very, I think this is a very important one. Mm -hmm. What types of insects can we eat? Because I would assume that there are some insects that we probably shouldn't eat. Absolutely. There are, let's say, this many types of insects Mm. in the world. The number is actually 2 million. Wow. And we know at the moment, Mm -hmm. of the ones that we've checked, there are about 2,000 types of edible insects. And so just like different people live in different countries, different types of insects live in those different countries too. So we have a different group of insects that live in Australia compared to those insects that live in Thailand or live in India or live in America. And in each of those different countries, they've got uh, different types of insects that are edible and different group of insects that are inedible. So if you remember the difference between those two numbers, more insects shouldn't be eaten. And there are, but there's still a lot, 2,000 is a Mm. lot of insects that we know that we can eat. And also sometimes we don't eat insects in different stages of their life. Like Mm. a butterfly, not very good to eat. The wings are very papery. It'd be like having tissue paper in your mouth. And they have that weird fluffy sort of little filament when you you touch them and you shouldn't touch their wings. But when you do, it gets that little... It's like the outside of a kiwi fruit, which is not as nice to eat. But caterpillars, Mm. which are filling their bodies up with fats and turning lots of um, sort of lettuce leaves Mm. into caterpillar body, just like a uh, a sheep grazing on grass Mm. does, caterpillars are way better Mm -hmm. to eat. So we also have different preferences and um, different ways of preparing insects, just like regular food. So out of those 2,000, say, that we can eat, that we know of just just so far, there are actually different stages within their life that each one of them could potentially be eaten at. You know, sometimes only one stage, sometimes maybe even three stages. Yep, yep. Like a witchetty grub that Mm. you might have heard of, which is a traditional food of Aboriginal Australian people. Mm. Witchetty grubs come out of tree stumps and they're soft and they're very good to eat full of fat and protein mm. but witchetty grubs grow up just like a caterpillar into a butterfly to turn into beetles mm. and then they've got all of those hard parts on the outside like we saw in the animal poo they don't mm. um, soak into our stomach and they all come out as leftovers and so mm. it makes far more sense to eat a witchetty grub than to eat the beetle that it turns into the witchetty beetle <laughs> that's fascinating that's fascinating Um, Now, here's another one, touching Mm -hmm. on can we eat them. So, are snails an insect and can you eat them? This one is from, uh, this is from Jace from Birdport Primary. So, can, are snails an insect? I'm going to say no because they have no legs. Is that correct? Yes, snails Mm. don't have six legs. Six legs. So, they can't be an insect, Mm -hmm. but they do come from that same side of the table. They are an animal with no bones. Mm. They are an invertebrate. They have Mm. no vertebrae. Mm. Uh, And you can eat them. It's not as common in Australia, but in France, Mm. it is really common to eat snails they put garlic butter on them if you've ever had garlic bread Mm. it's that same kind of flavor (laughs) and they take the snails out of their shells and they make sure that they've eaten only yummy lettuce Mm. in their stomachs and then you can prepare them a lot like we do with uh, other kinds of seafood like i said with our prawns and things so yes people do eat snails Mm -hmm. and no they are not insects but they are invertebrates very interesting. I believe that's a, I believe that's the uh, escargot or what have you. I think is what yes. they call it. Very yes. very interesting. And I suppose this opens up a very interesting uh, topic and a, a particular point maybe that we should touch on, which is that sh- it is probably at the moment not a good idea, as delicious as all these things may be, 
for you to go out right now at school and, you know, eat the insects you just find lying around. No. Please don't do that because usually, if I'm correct, Shasta, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's a process by which edible insects, for us, for humans, are usually made. Yes, yes, uh-huh. absolutely. Did you know that chewing gum it comes from the sap of the rubber tree? No. But mm. if I tell you that, hopefully you're not going to go out into the playground and put trees in your mouth. I generally don't chew on tyres. No, no, no. no, because it is different from chewing gum. And that mm. is the same. Even though you're going to see insects in the playground, mm. they are different than the insects which have been prepared, mm. packaged up, cleaned and mm. flavoured. Mm. So, yes, don't eat things that you find in the backyard is the moral of this story. But do study them, do yes. take pictures of them and do send them to Shasta yes. so that we can like analyse them exactly. Just like that. We can be like, hmm, what's this one exactly? See? He loves insects. It's great. Now, let's have a look here. Now, again, we might not be able to get through to all the questions today. Uh, however, let's see if we can get just a couple through here. Now, this is a good one. So, here we go. So, here's one from Harrison at Havenview Primary. So, this ties back into what we were talking about before about the spiders. Mm-hmm. Can we eat any spiders? So they're not an insect because they have eight legs, eight legs. There we go. And can we eat them though? But yes, you can eat spiders mm. in the same way that there are a group of insects that you can eat. There's a group of spiders that you can eat. I have seen in a documentary um, footage from Cambodia, so mm. another country in Southeast Asia, uh, where children get up in the morning and they go spider hunting. Now, you might think that sounds a bit scary, mm. uh, but they are very familiar with what they're doing. So they go out and they dig tarantulas out of the ground and catch them and bring them home. Mum cooks them on the barbecue, kind of like having a, uh, you know, a fry up on the yeah. weekend. And it's actually really good that they have tarantulas to eat because tarantulas mm. are really high in an element called zinc. And zinc is really important for the growing of young bodies. So you're getting zinc from your lots of different types of food, but in Cambodia, Mm. it is a little less available. And so eating a tarantula is actually one of the best things you could do to help your body grow. Wow, that's fascinating. And there'd be so many different kinds of spiders as well. So you'd have to be very careful that it's this tarantula and not this tarantula, and it's not like... A funnel web that just makes its home in your mouth or something horrible like that. <laughs> something horrible like that. There you go. Now, it looks as though, unfortunately, everyone, we're very rapidly drawing to a close, but we'll finish on this very interesting question here, I think. So here we go. So this will be our last question for this live presentation. But don't forget, all will be answered and uh, you'll know about it. I'll trust you. Don't worry. Now, this one comes from Haley at Summerdale Primary School. And she asks, and this is interesting, remember yesterday's talk? Let's have a think about that. Can any insects be turned into fuel for energy to power cars or perhaps anything else? That is a wonderful question, Haley. and mm. the answer is yes. The same fats that we take into our bodies and make us grow and mm. make us strong Fat is a kind of oil and oil can be burned. Mm. So yes, some insects are actually so rich in fat that they're not actually very healthy to eat. And so some people grind them up into powder and extract the protein Mm. as animal food and you've got all of this fat left over which can be turned into biodiesel which is mixing a thing that burns called ethanol with the fat And so fly maggots or maybe fly caterpillars Mm. can be turned into a biodiesel that will Mm. fuel your car to take you to school in the morning. So, yes, some insects even will make fuel for the machines in our world. That is so, so cool. So That's how useful insects are. I they mean, can, they, just, they can, any, they can, I could solve any problem with insects, I, I mean, reckon. I, I look forward to having clothing made exclusively out of insects. Then again, I guess silk is made out of a, out of a silk worm, which then turns into a, a silk 
Butterfly, silk moth. Silk moth, been there, done Think that. Moth. There you go. Problem See, solved. I've had a spider hat before if you've tuned into one of our other shows. <laughs> so you'll know that I've worn a spider hat. There you go. Shasta, thank you so much for coming on today. And it's been a really enlightening and fascinating experience. I think that I'm going to go out and see if I can buy some insects to eat myself because they're just that tasty. And I think that uh, I can feel the nutrition already. I feel stronger. It's superpowers, really. Yes. It's yes. very exciting. And, of course, tune in tomorrow and we will have uh, Shasta is coming back to give a different talk. It'll be very, very fascinating as well. Touching on foods and insects again, but if you're interested, it'll be a little bit more complicated. But most importantly, thank you to all the little witchetty grubs, insects and slaters watching out there in classrooms all across Tasmania. And we look forward to seeing you next time. This has been STEM Alive for Kids for National Science Week 2021. Don't eat the bugs in your backyard, but don't be scared of that spider in your mum's car. Have a good one. It's National Science Week, and that means it's time for STEM Alive for Kids. Hi, how are you doing? You had a great week so far? I hope so, because we've got fantastic episodes coming up for you today. Of course, we'd like to give a shout out and a thanks to the Department of Education and, of course, the Peter Underwood Centre for making this possible. Today, we have a very special guest with us. It's going to be fantastic. But first, I'd just like to give a little quick shout out to some of our attendees, some of our favourite schools. You're all our favourites. There's no one who's better than anyone else. But these people are uh, especially, uh, especially slightly the same favourite. Anyway, point <laughs> is, point being, we'd like to shout out, of course, uh, Mr Parrish and his class from Zian Primary School. Hey, Zian, how you going? I would like to shout out, of course, Ms Trippett from Oos District School. Howdy, Oos. That's always my favourite thing to say. Oos, how good is that? And of course, Miss Holbrook from King Island District High School, who actually sent us in a really cool photo from yesterday's broadcast. Let's have a Enjoying it. And I hope you guys get to enjoy today as well. It's very, very important. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to, of course, the one and only Shasta. Hi Shasta, how are you doing this morning? That's what we like the... what? what? You've, got, you've got a little... I have something in my face? You've got a little... It's on my glasses. Maybe a little breakfast. I think Where? you've got a little bit of breakfast in your hair. I would know because I'm an entomologist mm. and I'm qualified to recognise these kinds of things. You've got a cricket on your head, Sam. I don't play cricket. A, a cricket. Oh, a cricket. Jeez. <laughs> Actually a grasshopper. Yeah. Um, but as I said, I am an entomologist and I would be qualified to know. I study insects. Mm. I am at the University of Tasmania and I love love, love insects. I study how insects fit into the landscape. I am a biogeographer. And one of the things I love about insects is that there are so many of them. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. Mm. So the theme of National Science Week is food. Mm. So if we can get our slides up on the screen. Ooh. So... I'm going to be talking about insects today in the context of food. Hmm. So that might paint a picture in your head. Look at that. And speaking of food, my first slide today is called a pie chart. It <laughs> is a type of graph that scientists use, and it is a picture that is based on numbers. 
So this is a pie chart of all the kingdoms of life. You might have heard of the animal kingdom, there's the plant kingdom, the fungi kingdom. That's which my kingdom. You can see from the picture it means mushrooms. <laughs> but this isn't a correct or an accurate pie chart. No. The segments of the pie are supposed to match up with the numbers of these animals, plants and mushrooms. So I'm going to click over to a corrected pie chart that I made that has the real numbers or the real ratios. Mm. But just having a guess, do you think that there's going to be more or less animals? Are there more plants than mushrooms? Mm. Are there more mushrooms than animals? Well, this is what the actual pie chart of the animal and plant kingdoms looks like. Everything in orange is animals. There are so many more animals on earth than plants and mushrooms. But a big part of this animal section is insects. This whole side <laughs> of the pie chart is insects. So insects are animals and they are the most abundant, the most numerous. There are more insects on earth than all of the other animals, plants and mushrooms put together. And so when I look at insects and when we talk about insects, this is really important piece of information because there are so many of them. They are doing so many jobs in the ecosystem. They pollinate our plants, don't they, which gives us food to eat, fruits and nuts and vegetables. They create soil for those plants to grow in. They decompose dead things so that we're not surrounded by waste all the time. So all of those many, many, many types of insects each have a job to do. And so they are everywhere on the planet doing so many different things. And I'll be showing you a couple of those examples in our talk today about food. Ooh, exciting. So here is some examples. We've got a, mm. uh, a millipede on the mm -hmm. screen. These are the kinds that might come into your house about once a year. They actually belong outside and they eat dead leaves and they turn them into soil so that our plants will grow. I've asked them to leave my house on multiple occasions and they never do. They don't speak English. Oh. <laughs> Witchetty grubs. Uh, which are a type of beetle larvae, like a caterpillar that turns into a beetle, and they live in dead trees. They feed on the dead wood. And if we didn't have insects like this, mm. the forests would all have just filled up with log upon log upon log of dead trees with nothing to turn them back into soil. Jenga forests. Fruit flies. You might have seen fruit flies in your compost bin inside your house and it can seem like they're a little bit of a pest, but they're actually helping the composting process of turning your old food back into soil that you can put in the garden. Hmm. And of course, there are so many insects in the world that they compete with one another. And so that's why they eat all of these weird and wonderful things. And so there's even a whole group of beetles that eat just other animals' poo. And again, they help turn that back into soil. This caterpillar here, which we would call a herbivore, and there are lots of types of insects that eat plants, but they compete with the plants in such a way that they can actually dictate mm. where those plants are able to grow or how much that plant is able to grow. So insect herbivores actually influence where we can find plants and how those plants will grow. This is how important and influential insects are on the environment that we live in. Wow. They even feed a lots of the animals that we love to see. Birds and reptiles. This is a marsupial from Australia. It's called an antichinus. It's kind of like a marsupial mouse and because they are very small they have to eat insects. It's like a tiny tiny tiger eating tiny tiny zebras. <laughs> Echidnas have such small mouths mm. that they can actually only fit ants into their mouths and because there are so many insects they actually have to eat one another. They're one of the most abundant food sources on the planet. And so, of course, insects also feed on one another. But I wanted to remind you, we've come back to the pie chart. Mm. Where do people fit in here? Well, humans are just 
one tiny, tiny piece of data in this animal section of the pie chart. And so are most of the things, most of the meat animals that we eat. If you're vegan or vegetarian, this is simply interesting information and doesn't apply to you directly. But if you eat meat or have eaten meat in your life, it also comes from this other animals section of the pie chart. Wow. Now I want to mix that information up a little bit. Okay. Humans are animals and we eat animals. And echidnas and birds and reptiles are animals and they eat insects mm -hmm. and insects are animals, which means that insects have all of the same building blocks inside of them to give our bodies nutrition, hmm. energy, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, the same building blocks as the animals that we are familiar with eating. Wow. And we are animals with the same needs as those possums and birds and echidnas. And what I'm getting to is that insects are excellent food for humans as well if you wanted to. Mm. So we can look as cute eating uh, like that little numbat Australian creature there as well. You too, Sam, could be an antichinus if, anti you, if you aspire high enough. Antichinus <laughs> gang. In fact, insects aren't just good food for animals like us. They are fantastic food. Mm. So I want you to picture eating some insect, but maybe not just whole insects like that. What if I ground up some crickets and turned them into a hamburger patty, mm. just like ground up beef in a regular hamburger patty? And so what would your body get if you ate this cricket hamburger? Mm. You would get almost the same amount of protein. Protein builds pieces of your body, builds muscles. You would actually get less fat. A hamburger with beef in it has more fat for the same amount of protein and too much fat can be very bad for you. So cricket burger is better for you. Amino acids, or you might have heard of them called omega-3s or fatty acids are good fats and there's lots of them in food like fish and there is also the same amount of them in my cricket burger. Mm. You will also get more calcium than a glass of milk. You will get more iron than eating a spinach salad. And there is more fiber in my cricket burger patty than in those peas in that salad. And in fact, the beef burger has no fiber in it at all. So insects aren't just good food for humans. They are superfood for humans. That's crazy. I look forward to having one of Shasta's homemade cricket burgers, that's for sure. <laughs> wow. And it's not just me who thinks that insects mm. are good food for people. This is another pie chart mm -hmm. and it represents all the people in the world. That whole circle is 7.8 billion people who live on the planet at the moment. Nearly 8 billion people. And... This is the number of people who woke up today and ate insects as part of their everyday food, hmm. breakfast or lunch or dinner. That's one quarter of the world's population. And it's because insects are so abundant. They are present in every country, different kinds of insects in America, different kinds of insects in South America, but there are insects in every country, every continent living in every different ecosystem, deserts and forests and down by the beach and up on mountains. And so people, wherever they live in the world, have access to insects. It's more common these days to eat insects in countries where factories and farming is a little less common. Mm. Countries where people have come from England, like North America and Australia, those cultures don't eat insects. It's not as common. But we know that Aboriginal Australians and lots of other people around the world who still have more traditional food collecting cultures, lots of those places eat insects every day. We've got 23 countries in Central and South America, 36 of the countries in Africa, have common insect eating cultures. We're gonna look into a couple of those. 
So this is a story that my friend Rose told me. She grew up in Zimbabwe, but this is a story that is applicable to children who grew up all across Southern Africa. And so she's staying at her grandmother's house and the rains come through and that sends a signal to a group of insects. They're called Ishwa or flying termites. And the rain has told the termites that it is a good time for all of the new young termites in the termite mound to fly out, to disperse, and they're going to create new termite colonies. And so one termite hits the window at grandma's house and grandma jumps up and she says, get the floodlights, get the floodlights. Lots of households in towns in Southern Africa have these strong lights outside of them. And it's not just to light up the street or to help you park your car, it is to attract insects. The same way that you might find moths in your porch attracted to your lights at home in Tasmania, termites that live underground and in the dark most of the time are attracted to bright lights in Africa. And so people rush outside and they turn their floodlights on and the termites flock to them and they fall into tubs of water that you place underneath. And now you've got a whole harvest of termites to eat. Fry them up, their wings come off, thankfully. Their wings aren't very tasty, but their bodies are. Like tiny little uh, roasted peanuts, tiny, tiny little chicken nuggets. And the children will want to eat them, like the meat from the burrito. But mum might come and tap you on the hand and tell you, no, no, you can't just eat all of the snacks. I'm going to put them in dinner. And sometimes when we go and visit our grandparents, we do do things that they do. Maybe the old fashioned way, because you can actually buy flying termites in a packet from the supermarket these days. And it is a clever and logical way to catch insects. Scientists actually use bright lights to catch insects to study and understand them. So I have used light traps before. It can be as simple as a bright light and a white sheet for the insects to come and land on. This is how some of the insects in the display in the museum might have been caught. So you can see it's a great way to attract moths. Yeah. There's also this other little uh, device, it's also called a light trap, and it's just like grandma's bright light uh, in Africa. There's a bucket placed underneath it, the insects are attracted to the light and they zip, fall into the bucket. And that's how scientists collect some insects. It's clever. It's, it's pretty easy to outsmart insects. And that's one of the reasons why they are so good to eat. They're far easier to catch than a bird or a rabbit. You don't need often a lot of tools. And so they're really accessible to lots of different kinds of people. Before supermarkets, pretty much every one of our ancestors probably included insects in their diet. Now, if you're still thinking that it sounds kind of gross to eat an insect, you might be thinking the wrong thing. You don't just eat a whole live moth. Can you imagine, though, oh, sitting there, <laughs> little wings flapping around outside of your mouth? No, probably, probably not a good idea. The wings on most insects uh, would be like eating paper and be about as nutritious as paper. Mm. It's not very good for you. Uh, and so that's not, that's not the picture that I'm trying to paint for you. Mm. Insects, just like all of the other food that we eat, have to be picked at the right time mm -hmm. and need to be prepared in the right way. So I can't just go outside and just grab a nice little moth off the front veranda and go, oh. You're not going to have the kind of insect eating experience that I'm talking about. Oh. Um, and other people, all those two, those two billion people who mm. eat insects every day, they're going to look at you. It'd be like riding your bicycle upside down. They're going to say, you, you, clearly, you clearly don't know what you're doing. You're doing it wrong, Sam. Stop, for your own safety, sir. I'm like <laughs> shoving moths and snails into my mouth. You know. You're a wild animal. <laughs> That's not how people eat insects. Oh. One of the best times to pick an insect for eating is when they are almost but not quite turned into an adult. Hmm. Juvenile insects like caterpillars or these uh, witchetty grubs build up lots of fat stores and protein stores so that when they metamorphose and they can't eat for a few days or a few weeks, they've got lots of energy built up 
to carry them through that phase. Mm. And so a grown-up widgety grub is a really nutritious time to eat this kind of insect. Mm. Widgety grubs also live in the roots of the widgety bush. And so, like I said, they're really easy to find and to trap. They can't run away and they can't fly away. So if you know the plant, you can mm -hmm. dig them up, snap them out of the roots and then cook them. Of course mm. we cook them in hot coals. And after that, they taste a bit like cashew nuts or almonds, I've been told. I haven't had the chance to eat them myself, but I'm looking forward to the time when I can. And this is a, another type of caterpillar. They're mm. called Mopane worms, and they are also common in Southern Africa. They live in Mopane forests. And so if you know where those plants are, you will know what time of year and where to go and look for these caterpillars. Now, eating insects can also be quite good for the environment. Insects create lots of babies all in one go, whereas animals, a bit more like us, only make one or two at a time. So you can get lots of insects in a year uh, without having a negative impact on their population numbers. Also, if you are taking insects from the wild the way some people do, kind of like when fishermen catch fish from mm. the wild, but insects eat plants, and so you're actually saving some of those plants from being eaten by insects. And if you collect them off crops, you might even be saving farmers from having to use pesticide. Hmm. So there are a lot of ecological benefits from using insects where we might otherwise grow cows or pigs or make a fish farm. And again, you don't eat the adult moth. You would cook these mopane worms up in a tomatoey sauce, mm. maybe like spaghetti with meatballs and tomato sauce. Have you ever eaten something like that? Maybe you'd be ready to eat mopane worms in tomato sauce. Spaghetti and mopane. Yes. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> or if you're a fan of chips, you might just get the ones off the shelf at the supermarket, which are salted and ready to eat, mm -hmm. just like a tin of Pringles. And that is the way that lots of Western cultures like mine here in Australia or in North America are relearning to eat insects. We stopped eating insects somewhere along the way, but now that we care about our health and the health of the environment, Western countries are relearning how to eat insects. And so we are integrating them into some familiar foods. So this is a company called Chirps. It's like a mixture between chips and the noise that crickets make because these corn chips have cricket powder mm. in them. And so not only does it replace some of the cornmeal, but of course it brings in all of that iron and that fiber and that calcium. So it actually makes these chips healthier and they taste exactly like barbecue corn chips. Ooh. It does sound good. But we don't have anything like that in Australia. Oh, wait. We absolutely do. So you mm. might have seen this in the supermarket. <clears throat> this is um, the Woolworths brand Macro, mm. and they have made cricket powder available. Sometimes it's called cricket flour. Sometimes it's called protein powder. Mm. But it is dried and milled up crickets. And so one of these groups of chocolate chip cookies has all the same butter and sugar and chocolate chips in it, but some of the flour has been replaced with cricket flour, mm. and so now it also has vitamins, minerals, and protein. So these cookies are just as delicious, but they are healthier for you. And to absolutely prove without a shadow of a doubt that insects that have been properly prepared and properly packaged and properly cooked are good for you to eat, mm. Sam and I are going to eat a insect here live in the studio. Let's do it. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> so what have we got? What have we got up today, Chef Shasta? So I was able to purchase some of these in America. These mm. are what were on the, uh, the slide before. Or these are called larvettes because oh. they are larvae. Mm. They are sometimes called mealworms. They're good for feeding to animals and some kinds of pets. I'm an animal. You are an animal and I I'm going to feed animal. you a mealworm. Um, but these are actually like those caterpillars that turns into beetles. Mm. 
Ooh, and these ones are barbecue flavoured. All right. In just the same way that chips don't exactly taste much like potato, these aren't going to taste much like insect. They taste like barbecue flavouring. All right, let's get get some. Here we go. I might take a. Mind if I take two? You could definitely afford gonna, to have two, Sam. I can definitely afford to have two. You look undernourished. I know. I feel. I feel my body weakening, but I'm sure this will be. <laughs> I'm sure this will be it. Look at that. That's, that is pretty That is pretty cool. So we're, gonna do, we're just going to dig into them there. Mm. So just have a, have a nagander. That's all. That's all as big as they are. Yep. All right, let's give that a go. Here we go. Oh. So this is a very small snack pack. Mm. That's why one can't eat more. Mm, mm, mm. But they taste like barbecue. They do. A little bit cheesy. That's the yeah. flavor of the mealworms. I've had them before. Mm. They're extremely light. It's mm. like, it's like just, it's almost like a crispy, the crispy skin you might get on something. You know, like the thinnest part of that, that potato chip bubble, you know, that you mm. get. You mm -hmm. have a potato chip with a bubble yep. on it. It's like, it's like that. Yep. That particular thin, part. Mm. Thin and crispy. So yeah, I find them Pretty to good. be a bit like um, puffed rice. And so unless you really like rice bubbles or if you put chocolate on them like mm. Cocoa Pops, puffed rice doesn't taste of much, but it's light mm. and crispy and we like to put it in things like mm. um, chocolate or, uh, you know, tasty tasty treats mm. to, for that crispy feeling. So mm. these mealworms are a lot like that. And but again, emphasizing that you don't just go outside and push a cow over and eat it. You don't... Pull a fish out of the river and eat it raw, and you shouldn't just be eating insects out of the backyard. You want to have them farmed and picked and prepared properly. Also, mm. I remembered we were looking at the back of the packets before, Ooh. and people who are allergic to shellfish mm. have the warning the shell on an insect is quite similar. Like I was saying, mm. the same building blocks that go into our bodies, and so people who are allergic to shellfish might find that they are also allergic to insect shell. So oh, wow. just like being sensible and experienced and cautious with all mm. the other foods that we eat, eating insects falls under exactly the same. That sounds like a good government ad. You wouldn't bite a cow and just keep running it out. <laughs> you wouldn't eat an insect. And so just back to our slides, finishing up. Ooh. Because insects are just like any other kind of food that you can eat when it's been packaged and prepared, you take it into your body and you absorb all of those minerals and nutrients and some of the leftover comes out as waste and that waste product is poo. But poo isn't just all used up Food. In fact, there is a lot of the goodness of the food that we eat that cannot get absorbed into our bodies, or if we eat too much, our body has everything that it needs and it doesn't take everything from the food that we put in our mouths. Mm. And this is why I said that insects are everywhere, doing everything all the time, and there is a whole group of insects that eat poo, mm because of all of the goodness that is left over in it. So this is a video that I took of oh, some yeah. wallaby poo down at um, Port Arthur. And it's got at least three different kinds of flying insects feeding off it. Oh look, so it does. In fact, this poo is possibly even better food for mm. these flies than it was when the wallaby ate it the first time. Mm. Flies can't eat grass, can they Sam? I've never seen a fly just chewing grass, no. No, flies don't have chewing mouth parts, so they can't chew up the grass. But after the wallaby has chewed it and broken it up and freed up some of the nutrients, those are now available for the flies to eat. Mm. Just like these flies, this is horse manure, so it is mostly grass. And these flies could never have eaten that grass. But now it is available, all the nutrients and mm. things that plant took out of the soil is now available for other animals to eat. In fact, they might even be getting some horse cells. Mm. Have you ever scratched your arm and a few skin cells have come off? 
I have. The same thing is actually happening on the inside of you as well. And so there might be a few extra protein pieces from the horse mm. in the horse poo. And so there are so many insects that they have to eat everything that is available so that they're not all competing to drink nectar from flowers or eat other insects. And so poo is a really useful resource. Mm. There's in fact an entire group of beetles that eat only poo. Those are dung beetles. You might not have known, but we actually have native Tasmanian dung beetles. But they're very small. They evolved to eat native Tasmanian poo. Things like wallaby and possum. And so when Australia was colonised and colonisers brought cows from Europe, our native dung beetles were completely overwhelmed. And in fact, one of the things that insect scientists have done in Australia is to introduce dung beetles from Europe that were familiar with cows and bison and dung beetles from Africa that were familiar with elephant and giraffe poos. Ah, uh, yes, so the Australian elephant. Take some of that cow poo and pull it back down into the soil mm. where dung beetles lay their eggs and feed their babies, but also that poo breaks up, goes back into the soil, actually makes the grass grow better. Wow. More grass for cows means mm. more beef for beef farmers. Mm. So insects are everywhere doing everything. They're involved in our food chain all over the place. That's so. Mm. I am done for the day, except for answering all of your wonderful questions. You've got some time to send some questions in to us now. We are going to play you the National Science Week poo making experiment. Ask yourselves while you're watching this or while you're doing this in your classroom, where might insects be involved? And we'll be back after the video has played for answering some of your questions. <music> We're going to show you what happens to our food from the moment we put it in our mouths until it comes out our bottom. Actually, the correct word is anus. It comes out through our anus as poo. Yucky, right? We're going to do this right here on this table using this equipment. Each piece of equipment represents a part of our body. The bowl is my mouth. The scissors are my front teeth for biting the food. And the potato masher represents my back teeth for chewing and grinding the food. Now, let's eat the food. First, I'm going to take a bite of my food. Then I will chew it up in my mouth. While I'm chewing and rolling the food in my mouth, the food is actually mixing with saliva. Not only is saliva helping me moisten the food, it actually contains special chemicals that help break down the food. I might have a glass of water to make it easy for me to swallow. I don't want to choke up my food, so a lot of chewing going on. I think I'm ready to swallow now. From my mouth, where does the chewed up food go? That's right, into my stomach, through the esophagus. That's the tube connecting my mouth to my stomach. This plastic tube represents the esophagus, and the Ziploc bag here is my stomach. Swallowing is hard, I should have chewed my food a lot. Of course, my esophagus is not as stiff as the plastic tube. To help it go down, I will push it through with the back of the spoon. Now it is in my stomach. What happens here? The food is broken down some more. Our stomachs contain more food breaking down chemicals. What are they called again? Enzymes. That's right. The food breaking down chemicals here work best with a bit of acid. So let's make my tummy acid by adding some vinegar. Yes, vinegar is an acid. Food is broken down here some more. The walls of my stomach squeeze the food. Sometimes it even makes a noise like when your tummy is rumbling. I think the broken down food is ready to travel to the intestines. Do you know that the intestines are as long as this classroom? What? Even longer? Now look what's happening here. The liquid is slipping through these intestines. Our intestines have tiny little holes that let the nutrients out into our blood. 
Nutrients are carried to the rest of our body to give us energy and build muscles. Nutrients are the good parts of the food that our bodies need. The nutrients are now going into the bloodstream. Yes, more nutrients in the bloodstream. Once all the nutrients are gone, Finally, what comes out our anus? Poo. That's some serious poo right there. I should have drunk more water. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed learning about how food travels through our bodies. That looked incredibly nutritious. <laughs> I've got to say, it's always it's always a feast to the eyes watching the process happen in real time in front of you. Thank you all so much for your questions so far. And don't forget, if you want any more questions or you want any more answers, rather, feel free to send them through to us. We will answer them and we will give, send them back to you and we'll send them to your teachers. So if you ask a question, make sure you include your name and the school that you're at. And if we don't get around to your question today, live on the show, we'll definitely answer it later on and send it to you and your teacher. So, what do you think? Should we dive into some of the questions, Shasta? Do I have any questions to answer, Sam? I'm full of answers. All right, here we go. So we have quite a few questions. So we better get a we better get a crack on. So let's have a look at it. Now, first off the ranks, we have Jorel or Jorel, uh, who's homeschool. Cool. And he asks, or they ask, why are insects better for you? So before we were talking about all the nutritional value of them, is there is it just a nutritional thing or it's like so many different facets as well? Well, they might also mean how is it that insects, because they're also an animal, mm. are better than, say, eating a cow? Mm. And it's because insects are small enough that you can eat the whole insect. Scientists who study food have also found the same effect from people who eat very, very small fish, mm. which also have all of their bones and all of their other um, pieces of their body included. So mm. when we eat a cow, we only eat the soft part. We don't eat the skin. We don't eat the bones. And there's different pieces of uh, ingredients, different amounts of protein, different kinds of amino acids in those different body parts. Mm. So when we only eat muscles from a cow or a chicken, we only get concentrated uh, ingredients that are in those parts. But when we eat a insect, we are eating the exoskeleton, the mm. shell on the outside, all of the important parts that made up their nervous system, as well as their muscles. And so that is where we get all the added things like the extra iron, uh, the fiber that beef has none of. So that is one of the ways uh, that insects are better for us because we're actually eating more of the animal and we're getting mm. more of those important ingredients into our digestive system. So it's a lot of bang for your buck rather than eating a cow slowly a piece at a time and the yep. cow getting annoyed at you. Instead, <laughs> you can just sort of eat the eat the delicious deep fried cricket in one go and it's like tasty, peanutty, and you get all that nutritional value and it takes up less space as well. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Insects also eat less valuable food. You can't feed a cow on leftover lettuces, but you can feed a whole cricket farm on leftover lettuces. And cows drink a lot of water, but crickets don't. They get their water from the lettuce. Mm. So there is less waste that goes into cricket farming and less waste that comes out of cricket farming. That is how it is also better for the environment to eat insects. Fantastic. Well, we're going to have to start up our, our station soon, won't we? The, the, Shasta, the Shasta Cricket <laughs> Station. That's going to be exciting. All right, barreling ahead, we have, uh, we have a great uh, question here from uh, Teresa at mm -hmm. uh, St. Finn's Bars. Uh, asks, are insects vegan? Insects mm. aren't vegan. Vegans are people who do not eat any animals, as in meat, mm. and who also do not use any animal products. So things like leather shoes or honey, which comes from farmed honeybees, vegans also wouldn't eat any of those. Whereas vegetarians are people who just don't eat meat. So insects are not vegetarian, they are animals, and they are not vegan, they are animals and animal product. Mm. 
Mm. But some people stop eating meat for different reasons. And I have met a few vegans who were interested in trying an insect snack after I talked to them about some of the ways that they're better for the environment. Some people don't want to engage in any cruelty to animals and killing them to eat them mm. could be considered cruel. But also because cows take up so much land, cows use up so much water and they use up so much food, some people don't want to eat meat because it isn't very sustainable for the environment. But because insects are a lot better for the environment, some vegans are interested in trying an insect snack mm. uh, because it solves some of the problems that they stopped eating meat for in the first place. That's a very, that is a very interesting idea, isn't it? Saying where, where do we distinguish, you know, where's the line between one thing or another? Because yeah. you have a fertilized egg from a chicken and then an unfertilized egg from a chicken, you know, <laughs> they're slightly different things. And I'd imagine, so what would someone who eats exclusively insects be called? An in insectitarian? Uh, so eating things is called phagy in mm. science. So you might be a, um, a, a fruit ophage for those insects that eat fruits mm -hmm. and if you eat insects you are an entomophage. Entomophage. entomophage entomology is the study of insects and entomophagy is eating insects That's but it. if you eat fruits and vegetables and bread and insects then mm. you are an omnivore oh there you go well I mean, I, the omnivore one we, we know, but I You're guess an omnivore, Sam. I I'm turned you into one today. That's true. That's true. I can, feel, I can feel my power returning to me. It's beautiful. Now, let's have a look here. Next off the ranks we have... Now, this is an interesting one. So, this one comes from Levi, Year 6, at St. Paul's Catholic School. Mm -hmm. And Levi asks, What type of insect eats things that humans wouldn't eat? Example, a table. Well, ah. termites could eat a table. A widgety grub, yes. in theory, could eat a table, I suppose. You're right, Sam. You've been listening to the presentation. I'm, I'm learning. very impressed. You did a gold star. Yay. Yes, lots of kinds of insects eat things that people don't. Mm. Sam's given some great examples. Lots of kinds of insects eat wood. Mm. Some kinds of termites eat dry wood, which actually makes them problematic further north in northern Australia mm. because they will eat the beams that hold up your house. And there are oh. other kinds of insects that get inside of our house and mm. they eat natural fibres like wool or cotton. Some insects will eat paper. Mm. So museums and homes have to be careful to keep clean so that beetles don't eat all of their books and so that moths and beetles don't eat the wool in your carpet or mm. your jumpers in your cupboard. That's fascinating. I guess I've never tried eating a t-shirt, so maybe the moths are onto something and it is actually quite tasty. You wouldn't, yes, but the insects, there's an insect for over. everything. <laughs> now, here's an interesting one. So this one uh, comes from Declan, again, from St. Paul's uh, Catholic School. Mm -hmm. And Declan asks, can humans eat spiders? Declan, they yes, they can. Spiders aren't insects. We mm. know that because insects have six legs mm -hmm. and spiders have eight legs. Eight legs. So they can't be insects. They are arachnids, but mm. they are all invertebrates, which have their bones on the outside, unlike us, which are vertebrates that have our bones on the inside. Mm. But other than those differences, yes, lots of spiders can be eaten as well. The venom usually only hurts us if it is injected into our bodies, but your stomach is such a strong, acidic environment that often if we consume something that might irritate our skin, our stomach can neutralize it. But again, do not go outside, do not catch spiders, do not eat them. But people who know what they're doing, yes, can prepare spiders and we can eat them when they are cooked and ready for us. I think considering spiders in Australia tend to be about three feet big, uh, it's probably a good idea that we don't just go out and just grab them and put them in your mouth. Don't do it. No, but the meaty parts of spiders mm. are just the same as the meaty parts of insects and cows. Oh, yes. I can't wait. Kentucky Fry Spider, here we go. Mm -mm. <laughs> um, 
We have another great question here, of course, from uh, Jack at St. Joseph's in Queenstown. Hi, Jack. And this is a good one. How would you rate the taste of bugs out of 10? Shasta, how was the mealworm? Mealworms aren't my favourite kind of mm. insects to eat. I much prefer crickets. Crickets are a little bit softer, a little less crispy all over, and they've got a nutty kind of flavour. Mm. So I like crickets better than mealworms. Um, and just like any other kind of food or food group, people have their preferences. Mm. Maybe you like plain potato chips, but you don't like salt and vinegar ones. Maybe you like that kind of nuts and bolts mix that you get on the table at Christmas. I don't like that stuff very much, but I really love salted peanuts. So out of 10, oh, I'd say crickets are like, I guess kind of like a 10. I wish I could actually yeah. get my hands on them and eat them more often, but they're not available. I'll, I'll give you one. There you go. Got my hands on, got my hands on a grasshopper. Dreams do come Thanks, true. Sam. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, I wish that I could eat them more often. I absolutely would, but until we have them in the supermarkets more, I, it's, it's not possible. Dang. Well, it sounds like that cattle station or that cricket station is going to have to become a real thing. That's his cricket farm. Let's make it happen. Come on. And don't forget, everyone, of course, if you'd like a shout-out or your school would like a shout-out, make sure you share photos uh, of you watching STEM Alive, as you saw earlier in the presentation, and be sure to tag us on Facebook and the Peter Underwood Centre, so tag the Peter Underwood Centre, uh, and we will give you a shout-out and we'll show your whole class Maybe you could dress up in some bug costumes. Maybe you can just sit there capturing some bugs. And those little bug hatches. Yeah, you can just juggle some bugs, juggle some insects. That's a good question. Is there a difference between bugs and insects? Bugs is a word that we use to describe all insects. Mm. But some of the students might already know that bug is also a specific classification of one subgroup of insects in the same way that Beetle refers mm. to beetles. Grasshoppers are different from beetles. So mm. there is a group of insects that are bugs. Aphids mm. and cicadas are bugs. That's pretty cool. There you go. All right, Shasta, I think we have 60 seconds on the clock left. So what do you say? A rapid fire question round. Come at me. All right, let's do it. Here we go. So we're going to be fast as a grasshopper ourselves. Now, let's have a look here. So... First off, the ranks comes from uh, Indiana from St. Uh, Paul's Catholic School. How many types of insects are there that eat poo? Oh, um, a, a lot. Uh, next question. A lot. All right, here we go. Lillian from St. Joseph's asks, which country eats the most bugs in a year? Um, I would say, oh, I don't know which country. Which continent is definitely Africa. 36 of the countries in Africa. So added together, I'd say they would be the winners. There you go. All right, hang on. Okay, Mackenzie from St. Jay's yes. asks, how do you get the bugs flavoured like barbecue? So where did you get them from? Oh, you 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 flavour the bugs with a barbecue powder, mm. the same kind that is on the powder on the outside of your chips. And I got these in America. Mm. You can actually buy them at little corner stores uh, like you would buy some of those novelty candies. You can only find them in some small towns. Uh, that's where I found these. Fantastic. And we'll just quickly do these last two here. One is from Belle. You ready? <laughs> Bella uh, from uh, Year 6 at St. Paul's asks, how many different insects can you actually eat? There are about um, 2 million known species of insects. Wow. And of those, 2,000 are currently known to be edible or eaten by some people somewhere in the world. There you go. 2,000. If, if you're brave enough, I suppose you can eat anything, can't you? Now... Here we go. This is the last one. So okay. this is from uh, this is from Teresa and Sid Finn Bars. Awesome. And here we go. This is a good one. Can you eat water insects? So we've seen a lot of land insects, but we haven't seen any water insects. Yes. There are lots of insects that live in the water, and other than breathing differently, they are the same as the insects from the land, and they are edible in the same kind of way. In Thailand, it is common to eat giant water beetles you can have a look at some pictures wow. of that on google very impressive delicious and i suppose you know it's just it almost seems cyclic it goes from the water to the land and then back to the water at some point there's an insect for everything sam i, I can't say it enough they're everywhere doing everything all the time and they're watching you 
<laughs> in your class right now. In fact, Shasta, thank you so much for coming on today. And thank you, of course, to our assistant presenter, Grasshopper. Thank you, Grasshopper, for making an appearance today. But most importantly, thank you. Thank you at home and everyone in your schools as well for tuning in to STEM Alive for Kids. Don't forget, tomorrow we've got another wonderful episode coming up, so maybe tune in for that. And, of course, don't forget, tag us on Facebook, the Peter Underwood Centre, and we will give you a shout-out, your school a shout-out. So, until next time, make sure you sleep with your mouth closed unless you want to be eating insects. And we'll see you again. Hello, hello everybody and welcome to National Science Week 2021. You're here watching STEM Alive for Kids with help from, of course, the Department of Education and the Peter Underwood Centre. Thank you, everyone. But most importantly, thanks to you. Thanks for tuning in again. We are now halfway through the exciting adventure of STEM Alive for Kids this week and I hope you're ready for today because we have got a big one for you. Remember... Throughout the episode, you can send in your questions and we'll answer them at the end of the episode. Don't forget, when you send in your questions, make sure you put in your name and your school throughout the episode. And when we get to the end, we'll answer them. And of course, if you'd like, feel free and want a shout out, take a photo of yourselves watching STEM Alive for Kids and post it on Facebook and then tag the Department of Education and the Peter Underwood Centre. We'd love to see you watching us and then we can watch you and then give you a shout out in the next episode. It'll be fantastic. Everyone's watching everyone. Speaking of watching, I'm watching the time so we should probably get stuck in. So I'd like to present to you a very, very fantastic, phenomenal guest today. One amazing, majestic Shasta Henry. Hello, Shasta. Sam, I am hypnotized by that helmet. You look Thank fantastic. You. I am impressed. I am impressed. I brought along my special educational equipment today Ooh. too. Look at this incredible wow. t-shirt that I found. I was going to wear my NASA t-shirt mm. today, uh, but I found this incredible piece at the secondhand shop instead. I am taking it to mean mm. that, um, you know, I, I can't force feed you uh, and I, I can't force you uh, to learn. Mm. But of course I am here, I'm a scientist, I'm an entomologist, and so I've mm. come to talk to the students on the broadcast today about my speciality, insects. If we bring up my first slide, I think you will find a, uh, a, good, hey, hey. a good coordination between your helmet uh, and <laughs> I my... blend in, check that out, you, you can't do. even see Straight me. Straight into the background, you get insect that. camouflage on, mate. <laughs> Uh, so people can send me questions uh, via my uh, public Facebook page. But bye, Sam. <laughs> Camouflage. You can follow me on Instagram where I put up tidbits of insect information as I research my way through um, Tasmania's invertebrate community. But the theme of National Science Week is food, different by design. And so today I'm tying together my subject and your subject and mm. we're talking about insects as food. Mm -hmm. So, at this point in your life, you might have heard about insects as edible human food already. And that is very true. Here is the world map and the count of countries where people eat insects every day. Just like bananas, just like rice, insects as well. And so, to demystify that a little bit, I just want to describe what that might be like in some of those different countries. So in South America or in, in, in Central America, rather, in Mexico, you might have chapulines, which are a type of seasonal grasshopper. The rains come, the grasshoppers all uh, come up out of the ground, and there are so many that it's really easy for people to gather them up. They are tasty and they are nutritious, but also they get fried up in chili and garlic and cilantro and salt. Mm. That sounds 
delicious as far as I'm concerned. I'm really looking forward to being able to travel and eat different foods again. Those go on top of tacos, or you might get them in a little cellophane bag like roasted peanuts at a sports game. In Europe, where eating insects is a little less common, a, uh, a modern food Michelin star restaurant has been integrating insects coated in edible gold into their delicious European chocolate. In Asia, there is a hundred and one different ways of eating insects, but this is a wasp mochi from the Wasp Festival in Japan. Savory, smoky, fresh off the barbecue. That sounds pretty tempting as well. I'd love to hear more about that soon. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. Of course, in Australia, we understand that Aboriginal Australian people have integrated insects into their diet thousands of years ago and still benefiting from eating insects today. Delicious things like honeypot ants or uh, very, very nutritious witchetty grubs. Mm. In Africa, one of just many dishes are these Mopane worms. They're called worms, but they're actually caterpillars. And you can go out into the Mopane forest and uh, collect these caterpillars from the plants that they feed off. And these are cooked up here in tomato sauce. Uh, maybe a bit like spaghetti and meatballs. Mm, Mopane balls in tomato sauce. Now you can see from this map that it's a bit more common to eat insects in food cultures where factories and uh, farms and supermarkets are a little less common, where there's a bit more of a traditional uh, food culture still taking place side by side with modern life. But insects are so good for you and so readily available that even uh, Western food cultures like North America and Australia are mm. starting to package and make insect protein available on the shelves in the supermarkets. So are lots of these other traditional food cultures as mm. well. Everyone's living a busy life these days and insects are an integral part of the um, food that should be available to us. This is the global population, nearly 8 billion people and nearly one quarter of those people every day integrate insects into their diet. Mm. And I have a secret to share with you because you might have already been one of those people. What? How? How's You've that probably possible? already eaten insects. You might not have even noticed. It's because insects are the most abundant animals on the planet. There are more insects than all of the other vertebrates, birds, fish, reptiles, even more insects than all of the other plants and mushrooms added together. That's wow. how many insects there are in the world. And they need things to eat. Often they like to eat the same things that we like to eat. Hmm. So there's quite a lot of insects that have to be brushed off of our foods before they make it to the supermarket. Too many insects, in fact. This is a tomato. This is a perfect tomato, the tomato you dream about. <laughs> in fact, I think it might have been photoshopped a little bit, so this might not even be a very real tomato. We don't tomato shame here, though, so it's all right. Excellent, because this is what a lot of the real tomatoes in our world look like. It's mm. got a little bit of insect damage. There might still be a caterpillar inside of that hole. Ooh. And no one's got time to invite that caterpillar to please depart from the tomato before it gets made into tomato sauce. Uh -oh. Anyone had pizza this week with tomato sauce base? Mm -hmm. It probably had an acceptable level of insect contamination or insect inclusion inside that processed food. Because insects are healthy, normal inclusions in your diet, and so what does it matter if there's a little bit of insect added to your processed foods? Add some flavor. And some protein. Mm. They turn up in things like processed pasta, oh. in peanut butter, they come in on the peanuts, they come in on the cacao beans before the chocolate gets made. In fact, there are so many insect fragments in the world that you've probably eaten about 500 grams of insect inclusions every year of your whole life. So 
congratulations, you've already <laughs> done it. You have eaten insects you didn't even notice. Can't be gross because mm. you didn't even know it was happening. And in fact, to prove that Ooh. eating insects, to prove without a shadow of a doubt that eating insects that have been responsibly sourced, mm. have been packaged and prepared, especially for human consumption, Sam and I are going to eat an insect for you here in the studio. Oh I've got some treats here on the down camera. So I was able to pick these up in a, uh, in a petrol station, in a gas station in mm. America. Uh, they're sold as a bit of a novelty item, but they are the real deal. It's like a tiny packet of potato chips. These are salt and vinegar crickets. <laughs> uh, what else do I have here? Larvets. These are mealworms, which are actually like caterpillars, but mm. for beetles. So these would turn into beetles, but beetles have got a very hard crunchy outside and not so good to eat. Okay. This is cricket powder, uh, mm. sometimes called cricket flour. It's like a protein powder, so it takes all the goodness of crickets and you can put it into baked products that you might make at home. You can get this in the supermarket in Australia. Wow. So Sam, should we put our, our money where our mouths are? I agree. I think we can do we can put our bugs where our mouths are. Yeah. Let's make it happen. Yeah. So what's uh, what's the flavor today? These are barbecue flavored Ooh. larvettes. Oh, very nice. And just in the same way that potato mm. chips don't actually taste a whole lot like potato anymore. Why, thank you. Can some into my hand here. These have a little bit of their original insect flavor, which is kind of nutty. Mm. Uh, mealworms are a little bit cheesy, uh, mm -hmm. but they also largely taste like the flavoring that we put on the outside oh. of them. There they go. I've been roasted, they're very dry and crispy. Mm. Almost like a barbecue rice crispy. Look at that. Can you see that, gang? Check that out. <laughs> now, I mean, they, they, they taste kind of like barbecue rice puffs. Yeah. Really? Yeah. A bit. Actually, in all honesty, mm. these aren't very good. Mm. It's mm. worth keeping in mind that these have been on my shelf in my office as a novelty for a couple of years. Mm. And uh, who only knows how long they were actually in the service station before I bought them. Mm. Mm. But if so, you get fresh ones... If you get fresh ones, absolutely. I've eaten a few different kinds mm. of insects and freshly cooked, properly prepared insects do taste genuinely really good. That's why so many people around the world eat them. Mm. First and foremost, because they taste good. They do. So if you do get the opportunity to taste an insect, it might taste a little different, but ask yourself, has it been prepared properly? Is it fresh? Mm -hmm. Or does it taste like cupboard? Um, not because the insects are bad, uh, but because the packaging isn't so good. So keep that in mind when you have your opportunity to eat insects. But not the ones in your backyard, only the ones that are sourced, grown, and produced Absolutely. reasonably. Just like you wouldn't bite a cow. No, you wouldn't just go out into, your, uh, into a field and, and eat an unprepared cow. No, you would wait for it to come in a beef patty in a hamburger. And you do the same thing with insects. We're going to compare what would happen in your digestive mm. system if you ate some insects and you're not going to shove a whole beetle in your mouth. That sounds a bit spiky and... Uh, and, and gross. No, I'm going to make you a 100 gram juicy mm. cricket patty in a burger, just the same as your beef burger. So you eat uh, either of these, what are you going to get on the inside? Mm. Well, you get about the same amount of protein. Crickets are animals, just like beef. Mm. They have muscles inside of them and it's built out of protein. So you're going to onboard about the same amount of protein but you're actually going to consume a lot less fat. Mm. Fat is delicious, but it's also not very good for us. So insects are healthier on balance. If you've heard of amino acids or maybe omega-3, mm. 6 fatty acids, they come in foods like fish and they are healthy fats that are good to have in our bodies. And insects have a very similar balance as eating fish. And now we get into the really good stuff. Mm. So you eat your cricket burger, you're going to have more calcium than the same amount of milk. Wow. 
you're going to get more iron than the same amount of spinach and more fiber than the same amount of sweet peas. And in fact, the beef burger doesn't have any fiber in it at all. Mm. Fiber is very good for your digestion. Now, these are a lot of facts. These same facts get stated over and over and over again when people are talking about the benefits of eating insects uh, in place of classic farmed animals. And I wanted to let you in on a little secret. This uh, pictogram here, mm. uh, this infographic, is a great way of displaying information. This would have been a very boring sentence without these uh, images here to illustrate the differences between insects and cows. But these don't actually explain to you any of the reasons why uh, insects are so healthful and so ecologically friendly to farm. So you, mm. my incredibly intelligent and astute audience, I'm going to let you into the behind the scenes of Ooh. why these statistics get quoted over and over and over oh. again. And we're going to look into some of the actual science as to why these things are true. So, starting with water, you can mm. see in the little water droplet graphic the difference between how much water it takes to make a 100 grams beef patty compared to a 100 gram cricket patty. And, wow. and the difference is really, really remarkable. 10 mils compared to 2,000 litres. Wow. And there's a few things at play here. The food that we feed crickets when we're farming them is wet. It's mm. already got all of its water content left in it. You can uh, feed crickets on vegetable scraps, the things that had too many worms in them and you didn't want to send them to the tomato factory. You can feed that into your cricket farm. So we're taking up waste, uh, but it also has all of the water already in it. Whereas cows, when we're feeding them, especially on things like Rain, that has to be dehydrated so that it won't rot in storage. So we have to add water back into the cow's diet uh, so that they don't dehydrate while they are feeding. Mm. But there's another slightly more complex thing in play and that is the way that these different groups of animals excrete nitrogen from their bodies. You see the word urea and it might think of urine and that's mm. what we're talking about. Oh. All bodies, all cellular metabolism creates nitrogenous waste and you have to excrete that nitrogen out of your bodies. Mm. Fish do it with a chemical called ammonia. Mm. Ammonia is very, very strong, very reactive. It's the opposite of an acid. It's intensely basic and just like an acid, it could burn your skin, oh, wow. irritate your eyes. But fish can excrete, excrete nitrogen like this because it goes straight out into the water around them and gets dissolved and diluted. Mm. So mammals make a slightly more complicated molecule called urea. It's a bit more stable, but it does need to be diluted. That's mm. why we add water in our bladders. We make urine. It is safe and pretty benign. But that's what a lot of the water that we are feeding to these cows is turning into, more waste product. Mm. Whereas crickets, all insects, birds, lizards, make an even more complicated molecule called uric acid. Wow. It's very, very stable, it's unreactive, and it doesn't need to be diluted in water. It comes out as a dry crystal, mm. and so insects aren't using any extra water to create waste. Step one. You following? You following? You ready for another round? All right, let's hit it. Let's hit it. That's fascinating. There you go. Excellent. Now we've got the little feed bags. Mm. Insects use significantly less food to produce 100 grams of edible cricket patty mm. compared to cows, which use a massive amount of food to make wow. a 100 gram beef patty. And it comes down to this phenomenon called the feed conversion ratio. A perfect feed conversion ratio would be one to one. And that simply means one kilogram mm. of food will turn into one kilogram of edible animal product mm. on the other side. And crickets are very close to one to one, 0 0.9 to one. Almost all of the food that we feed them turns into edible cricket. It's only 10% waste, but mm. cows, and all mammals are pretty energy inefficient. Mm. 
feed conversion ratio of 4.5 to 1, and that is when we're feeding cows something really, really nutrient-rich like corn. Mm. Keep in mind, people could have just eaten that corn. When they're feeding on things like grass, it turns even lower, 7.5 to 1. That's 7.5 kilograms of grass to make 1 kilogram of beef. And this is because of things like waste. Mm. A lot of the food ferments in the cow's stomach and gets burped out as CO2 and as methane. Mm. Not only are they wasting food, they're turning it into greenhouse gas, which is imperiling all life on the planet. I trusted cows. It's rude. It's just a rude. Um, a lot of mammal food gets turned into heat energy as mm. well. So we're going to do a little... Maybe not oh. an experiment, a demonstration in no. the classroom. So you're going to take your hands. Mm -hmm. Sam, I think you could run on the spot for oh, us. I, Do you think you I, could? I, I think I can. I need, I need the exercise. Of, Here we go. I'll take, right. take the helmet off. Here we go. This is All going to right. be exciting. Here we, we are go. going to right. rub our hands together. All right. Keep rubbing. Keep running, Sam. Keep running. Rubbing, rubbing, rubbing into running your hands. Rap. Get running. warm. Are you warm? I'm getting warmer by the second, Chester. <laughs> I'm warm too. My hands are warmer now. You look warm. I feel warm. I feel warm. My hands are warmer because of the friction, but the muscles that were driving my hands are also warmer. I just burned off a bit of food energy to increase my body temperature. That's what happens when we shiver, if we start to get cold, and all mammals are using up food energy to create body temperature, and crickets don't have to do that. Mm. Insects get their energy from the sun, from the air temperature. So if you tried to farm crickets in a cold place like Tasmania, you would have to heat them with electricity and pay the bills. But in warm places like Thailand and this insect farm, this cricket farm in Madagascar, your crickets will grow all year round without having to pay any power bills. They also make a lot of sense for farming because you get hundreds of cricket babies from every cricket mama. And so you get massive generational turnover all throughout the year where you might have only got one calf per cow. And it takes several years for that calf to grow into a meat animal. So farming insects uh, is incredibly energy efficient, size efficient in the area of about a bathtub. You can fit 10,000 crickets, which is about 7,000 Big Macs worth of protein wow. a year. So they use less water, can stay in rivers, can stay in dams, ducks can keep floating in it, or maybe you can drink some yourself. They use less food, so we've got more food left over for people to eat. At the same time as taking up less space, that is space for people to live. Hmm. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> now, you um, may have enough money to buy a cow. You might be wealthy in resources, but a lot of people who have plenty of money do not have plenty of space. So there are different ways of being poor and different kinds of poverty that affect different communities in the world. A person who owns a cricket farm in Vietnam might not have enough money to have had an entire beef ranch, but you could fit a cricket farm under your bed and lots of people in Vietnam, Thailand are investing in cricket farms to get the same amount of protein out of much smaller um, pieces and investments in infrastructure. So insects are also, you know, they're a level playing field. Mm. They're available to lots of people worldwide. So you could have a farm under your bed. You can have your own cricket farm under your bed. Oh boy. You uh, free yourself from the supermarket. You go back into lockdown and you can just, you've got your protein growing right there with you. Your little balcony garden and a little cricket farm to boot. Beautiful. It's freedom. That's the, it's the dream. It's the dream. It's my dream. Isn't it? yeah. Is it your dream? Do you have different I dreams? Freak, I mean, I dream frequently about filling my bathtub with mealworms. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, and so there is some other waste streams mm. involved in beef versus crickets. We can't quite see it's behind me, but just basically that bar says that 100% of a cricket is edible. That's true. You pick mm. it up, you stick the whole thing in your mouth, whereas the cow has lots of inedible parts. We can't eat the bones, we don't eat the hooves, can't eat the skin or the hair or feathers in the case of 
edible birds and a lot of the time we don't eat the organs mm. so some of that food that they've turned into body mass just gets thrown away or turned into other non-edible things also some of the reason that insects are so nutritious is because we're eating the whole thing you get the fiber because we eat the exoskeleton we got all that extra calcium and iron and zinc because we're eating the brain and the nervous system and the organs. Scientists have found really similar statistics for cultures and communities who eat whole small fish. Mm. Areas around the Mediterranean, that's really common, white bait or sardines. And so eating the bones and uh, eating the organs puts lots of essential building blocks into your body rather than just eating muscle protein mm. and the building blocks of those. So... Just a couple more illustrations wow. of how eating insects is great. And another infographic here. This is the groups of insects that are eaten most around the world. Mm. So we've got 31% of what people eat are beetles, mm. coleoptera. 18% of what people eat are lepidoptera, that is butterflies and moths. But insects have their wasteful stages as well. Mm. You don't just indiscriminately grab an insect, you know, out of your backyard, like we've said, and stuff it into your mouth. Eating a moth would be very unpleasant. They're, they're hairy, uh, their wings would be a lot like eating paper. That is, that's not the time yeah. that you want to eat a moth. No, 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 no. You want to get mm. it in its caterpillar phase. That's what mm. witchetty grubs are. Ooh. They're full of fats, they're full of nutrients, and they haven't wasted any of it growing wings yet. Mm. But of course, you don't just grab a potato out of the ground and stuff it raw into your mouth. If you think eating insects sounds weird or gross, it might be because you're not applying the logic that you've learned from other foods in your life to insects. They can seem alien, but they don't have to seem that way. Just apply a bit of standard food logic. You don't mm. stuff a raw potato into your mouth, you animal. You dig it into the, out of the garden, you put it in a basket, mm. you take it to the water, you wash what? it off so it's nice and clean, and then you roast it in the mm. coals of your campfire. Now, of course, this is what Indigenous Australian people do with their witchetty grubs, and they have a delicious and nutritious uh, meal. Witchetty mm. grubs are so nutrient-rich that 10 of them is enough food for an adult human for one whole day. Wow. Apparently, they taste like roasted cashews. So mm. that all sounds good to me. So when's our trip to the witchetty grub, Shasta? <laughs> After we've been to the wasp festival, Ooh. Sam. Now, of course, you don't just go out into the world and stuff a handful of wasps into your mouth. No, 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 no. Far too spicy. Spicy. Far too spicy. Spicy insect. See, the way you eat wasps is you go out into the forest in mm -hmm. Japan with a little piece of fish to attract just one wasp. Mm -hmm. Just want one wasp at a time. It is spring and the wasp nests are small. Tie a little tag, a little ribbon hmm. to a piece of fish so that you can follow this wasp back to its young nest because hmm. you're going to dig it up and take oh. it home. Okay. You're going to put it in your special wasp nest house. This hmm. one is a hollow log because you're going to feed and cultivate this wasp nest, help it to grow large and strong all through the year. When autumn comes mm -hmm. and the adults are naturally starting to die off before winter, oh. You harvest your wasp nest and you are going to take it to the Hibo Matsuri, Ooh. the Hibo, the wasp festival. All of your neighbors are there, all of the other wasp hunters from the prefecture. And a judge is going to weigh all of the wasp nests and crown a victor. <gasps> Once that has happened, mm. we can all finally take all of our hachinoko, our wasp larvae, mm. soft and nutritious out of the wasp combs, and then you mix them with sticky rice and soy sauce, and you have hot, delicious hibo mochi, fresh off the barbecue at the Hibo Matsuri, the wasp festival. Wow. That is how you eat wasps. Mix them into a recipe, just like all other kinds of foods that we're familiar with. And there are consequences for not being uh, discretionary about the way you eat insects. Lots of animals don't have options about mm. uh, chewing their food or eliminating beetles. And so you can see from some of these in animal mm. scats, this quoll has pooed out whole bones 
um, indigestible seeds and mm. you can see a shiny piece of insect exoskeleton mm. in there. And uh, on, the, on my right hand side is a, not a karawong, I keep saying karawong, a magpie mm. pellet. And you can see it's full of green shiny pieces of invertebrate exoskeleton and we're talking about poo because at the end of every conversation about food of course we come to the logical conclusion mm. where that food goes afterwards national science week and its theme of food has created a food experiment for you to do in the classroom using acids and enzymes you're going to make some poo I have a suggestion which isn't in the instructions that you're about to watch, but if you have access to some dead insects, maybe in a dusty corner of your classroom somewhere, you could add them to your experiment and see which body parts dissolve and get absorbed into the body and which insect body parts are indigestible. We saw like that shiny beetle carapace. And if you might be able to identify some insect parts at the end of your experiment. So we're going to watch that now. Don't forget to send in some questions and Sam and I will answer them at the end of the presentation. Today I am doing a digestion experiment. So firstly, you need to um, bite your food. So with some bread here, you use your front teeth to bite off a piece of bread and you use your back teeth to chew the piece of bread. So we're gonna use these scissors as your front teeth and a banana. A few prawns for protein, and a bit of cheese for protein, and fat. And now, this is going to act as one of our back teeth or our molars. This is like our back teeth chewing our food. You might also have a glass of water. So now I have finished mashing up the food, and so I'm going to use this pipe to represent the esophagus and a plastic bag as the stomach. And so I don't think this is going to be acidic enough, so we're just going to test it. This is a pH meter and it is used to test how acidic a substance is. So put it in. It says that it's 7.6, which isn't that acidic. And to, for the stomach to help break down our food, it needs to be acidic. So we need to add some more acid. I've just put in hydrochloric acid. Now we can test the pH again. It says 5.1, which is more acidic than before. So this is pepsin, which helps to break down our protein. This is starch enzymes, amylase, which is used to help break down the starch in our stomach. Now we're going to mix it around. Mm -hmm. Digestion continues overnight, so we're going to leave this overnight and continue the process tomorrow. So it's the next day and we've left it overnight and it looks like this. It's really not smelling nice, it smells really gross. The next part of the digestion system, we are using a stocking to act as our intestines. And so we're going to pour the mixture into the stock. So the stocking is acting as the small intestine. And so if we drip some um, of the liquid into this container. So now the food is in the small intestine. And you can see that there is liquid coming out. And if we squeeze some of that into a container, we can actually measure from the liquid how far the digestion is in the body. The food is continuing into the large intestine. And so the, most of the liquid has been absorbed into the bloodstream and so that's leaving the, mix, the food to be more dry now because there's no liquid in it. 
Now because there are healthy bacteria to help break down our food, we're going to use Yakult, which people drink when they don't have enough bacteria. Here comes the finished product, the poo coming out the anus. Here is the poo. That's very important. You did. Hello, hello, welcome back. Did you come up with some interesting questions? We certainly have quite a few. I was just busy admiring my bug helmet. I was busy admiring I know, I, I was very fancy, isn't it? We better put it off to the side for the moment so we don't get distracted. There we go. I'd just quickly like to give a few shout outs to uh, Miss uh, McNamie's Moona Primary. Thank you. Thank you, Miss uh, McNamie, oh, for this cool. wonderful picture. Look at that. Look at everyone there together watching and enjoying. And of course, they picked the best slide, the slide with the chocolate in chocolate it. Chocolate slide. That's a pretty good chocolate slide. Uh, secondly, we'd like to give a quick shout out to Miss Reynolds from St. Joseph in Queenstown. There they are, also watching, of course, STEM Alive for Kids in their wonderful, wonderful, very snazzy looking classroom. That's pretty cool. And look, they're so small, the chess pieces are so big. They must have <laughs> shrunk the classroom down. And we want to give a little, sp oh, and look at that. They even have insects in their own room. Some snacks, maybe. Maybe you can get your local canteen to start stocking them. I think that would be a very cool idea. But, of course, we'd also like to give a special mention up to Charlie. Yes, to you, Charlie, for all your fantastic questions that you've been sending in. So we've been very, very interested in all of those. So thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Miss uh, McNamee and, of course, Miss Reynolds' classes. So, Chester. Do we questions. have any questions? Oh, I think I've we do. Answers. Let's do it. Well, let's get cracking, shall we? So, the first question off the bat here is, uh, I believe this is from uh, Maribel in Moona, mm -hmm. Moona Primary, which is, uh, why are ants different colours? Why are some insects different colours? What, what's the reason? Is it because of their food? Is it because they get adapted? Is it because they have different flavours, like jelly beans? <laughs> yeah. Black ants taste like aniseed, uh, mm, and mm. green ants taste like apple. Hey, honey uh, ants taste like honey, honey so, ants do taste you know, like honey, they're they gold are, colour. And they are honey coloured. Mm. Um, ants do have a bunch of different flavours, mm. um, but ants do also have a bunch of different colours. Oftentimes, insects will be different colours because they live in different ways. A lot of the ants that live underground are very dark, very mm. black, because if you're living in the darkness, uh, oh, or if you only come out at night, like mm. cockroaches and crickets, then nothing can see you. And so communicating with colour is a bit of a waste of energy. And as things are evolving, things that waste energy are less competitive. They're not likely to make it um, into the ecosystem. So uh, insects are different colours because they live in different ways. Mm. Green ants that live in trees in northern Australia are brightly green. Mm. They are moving around during the day when animals can see them and can see in colour. And so they are using their colour to camouflage with their environment. Hopefully, that is part of the answer to your question. There you go. So the insects are adaptive to not only their environment, but also how they actually live. Mm -hmm. If they come out at night, they don't need to do anything, and they might taste like aniseed or blackcurrant <laughs> or something like that. It really That's... captured the essence of the question and the oh, answer. It's, it's very important. It's very important. Now, we have a great one from a Ben here, which is, are there any ethical concerns with having 10,000 crickets <laughs> in a bathtub, specifically 10,000. Very important. Well, no, he's been listening to the talk. Mm. Absolutely. I didn't go into it, but yes, there are ethical concerns with the way that we interact with the other living things on the planet, especially the things that we, uh, that we take in and are farming in those intense conditions. It's not how crickets would normally live. There's a few things at play. Insects do not appear to have 
the, um, the, the neurology, the, the brain or the nervous system to experience pain or distress in the same way that humans or cows or pigs could. So they can live in what sounds like a very intense environment, uh, but even 10,000 crickets in one of those large tubs mm. are less crowded than you might imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, insects in plague conditions will live in massive numbers in, in small areas. And so for the farm to be viable, uh, they are provided with plenty of food and plenty of water. So the insects are reasonably, you know, are, are, are pretty well taken care of uh, in terms of farming. And we also, as far as we know at the moment, cannot mm, suffer the kind of distress that 10,000 cows in a bathtub would <laughs> suffer from but the best minds looking into insects and farming and mm. ethics definitely have advised that we keep some space in our heads to learn more mm. about insects in future and to maybe discover that we've been wrong about how insects experience the world and so to always act with best practice with most kindness with the highest level of consideration for what these insects need while we are giving them a life mm. before uh, they become food like all of the other animals that we farm mm. but insects in farms are better off than a lot of our larger bodied animals in mm. farms at the moment i suppose i've never seen a cow hive or you know, a pig nest where they've all just been stacked one on top of the other, like a termite mound. They are they are living mandible by thorax, crammed all together, crawling they over are. one another. So yes, of course, they should absolutely have some space. But to my mode of thinking, I guess is it's a different thing. They're used to living quite naturally in a certain particular way. Not, of course, that we want to keep cramming as many in. You know, we'd no. love to have free range no. crickets. It's very important, but. Uh, it's definitely something interesting to think about. Maybe we just need to scale them like cows down and crickets up and then we can like <laughs> ride around with them. That would be, that would be pretty spectacular. Uh, we have another interesting question here cool. from uh, Max, uh, who's in grade 10. Uh, we don't understand. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Could you explain? <laughs> I'll, I'll have a crack at it. I'll have a crack. What it means is it's about knowledge. And so it's about staying hungry for knowledge, always being enthusiastic and going after new things like you know the knowledge of these insects is now something that you can consume and absorb the nutrients of that knowledge and staying foolish means staying positive and staying always curious mm. because if you knew everything all the time then you wouldn't stay hungry you wouldn't be looking for new things to learn you just sit there grumbling all the time basically because you already know anything anyway so that's what I think it means. That I... is a great take, Sam, and a totally different one to what I thought it meant. I was thinking, like I said at the start, you know, I can't force you to eat. Mm. I can't force you to learn. If you are willing to, to stay hungry, if you're not willing to eat either food, yes, mm. or information, then you are also going to stay foolish. You're going to be, you're going to be less smart than if you were willing to eat all of this information. Another thing, a realistic thing that I also think is that it might have been um, made in a, uh, a language where English is a second language mm. and so it's got a little bit of that Google Translate <laughs> energy. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, who knows what the makers intended, but mm. I, think, I think Sam and I, uh, our takes, both of our takes are, are different, but yeah, the, 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 the core of the meaning, yes, mm. stay curious. Um, stuff your brain with um, good quality knowledge. Mm. Don't be hungry. Be smart. There you go. And with our foolishness combined, we can come up with anything, I'm sure. <laughs> so we have, I think we have time. Uh, by the way, if you do send in more questions, and please do, of yes. course, not forgetting to add your name and your school, uh, we will get around to answering them. If we don't answer them live, we'll absolutely answer them after the fact. So I think we have time for one more question, maybe one more or two more. So let's have a look. So this Drum is uh, one from uh, Lily Dale, uh, who would love to know how many bugs in a day you can eat. And she gives some examples, such as, can we eat bull ants and jack jumpers? Uh, could we put the bugs on the pizza? And uh, which is the healthiest insect to eat? So there's a, there's a few layers to that one. Absolutely. So. 
I think the limit of how many insects you could eat in a day would be just like the limit to, to any other thing. Like how many how, Doritos can how, you eat? Yeah, like I'm often surprised by how many Doritos I can eat. I always tell myself it's only going to be half a packet um, and it never is. It's always the whole packet. So the, the, the limit to the number of insects you can eat in a day would be very similar to any other kind of food. Mm. When do you get full? Uh, how many can you stuff into yourself? And the actual number of insects would be more because mm. they're quite small. Mm. If you mm. ate only peanuts for a day, you'd eat a lot of peanuts. Mm. Um, and so what was the other part of the question? Yes, you should, absolutely. You could and you should put um, your, your delicious uh, crispy insect pieces on your meat lover's pizza mm. in there with the meatballs, the bacon and the crispy crickets. That would be excellent. And the final part... Which was, I believe, can we eat things like bull ants and jack jumpers and those sort of venomous creatures? Now, I have eaten some ants. I had mm. an opportunity at a special dinner to eat some ants that were native to Australia. And they were zesty kind of lemony because Ooh. some ants have stingers and some ants use an acid as a deterrent from mm. being eaten. And so those ants are actually flavoured just like lemons and salt and vinegar chips are with that acid, and it's quite um, tasty and palatable. So I think you probably can eat stinging ants as well. Once mm. they've been cooked, the protein, which is their venom, would break down. Mm. I haven't seen it done. I don't know for certain, but that is my scientific mind thinking of the things that I do know and turning it into part of your answer. Basically tangy ant chips at some point, potentially. Yes. Just being like, there's going to be like people who eat really spicy chili. There's going to be someone out there who's like, and it stings on the way down. That means it's, that means it's spicy. fantastic. It's very spicy, huh? Spicy. And of course, I think we have one last question. So this is of course from the, from Charlie again. Hello, Charlie. Always good to see Charlie in the <laughs> chat. So, uh, Charlie asks, uh, I want to know what culture eats ants? Well, remember earlier in the presentation where we went all around the world and we saw that all kinds of countries eat different insects. Each one of those countries, everything from places in Africa to Southeast Asia to South America, everyone would probably have their own kind of insect combination and most likely they'd have an ant variant. Would that be right, Shasta? Are there different ants? From different parts of the world yeah absolutely absolutely the reason why insects are eaten in so many places in the world is because insects are present all over the world but there are different groups of insects that live in australia we have a different collection of insects than they have say in north america or south america mm. even in tasmania we've got different insects than they get in tropical far north queensland but some of the ants specifically that i know that people eat for instance, in Central Australia, where honeypot ants um, store honey, mm. kind of like in a beehive, only they store the honey inside other ants. Mm. Honeypot ants can be dug up and they are a traditional bush tucker of Australian Aboriginal culture. Mm. I know of a kind of ant from Mexico. They're called Chicatana ants. Chicatana. And they're actually being used by a Mexican Michelin star chef mm. who's integrating traditional Mexican food into the highest level of the more kind of westernized cuisine. Mm. So Chicatana ants, Alex Atala has uh, told me in a documentary, they're incredibly delicious. And like I said, I have had some ants from Australia myself, sort of zesty, lemony flavoured from the acid in mm. the ants. So that's just three that I happen to know of. And I am far from an expert in um, experiencing eating insects. So there would be many, many more to discover. And, you know, I think maybe that's what we need to get on with doing right now, Shasta, and having some discovery because, unfortunately... That's it. It is time. It is time for us to part ways. And unfortunately, this is the last uh, talk that I believe we have with you this week, unfortunately. This is it. This is, this is my Very last sad. broadcast. And so I leave you only with the wise-ish words of mm. stay hungry, stay foolish. Shasta, thank you so much. Thank you for making sure we all stay hungry and foolish. And of course, thank you all as well. Thank you all for joining us as well. 
on National Science Week 2021 for STEM Alive for Kids, of course, brought to you by the Department of Education and the Peter Underwood Centre. Don't forget to tag both of them on Facebook when you have your photo. And you'll be happy to know that tomorrow we have a very cool and interesting guest again, Evan Franklin, where we will be talking about energy. If you haven't had enough energy this week between Shasta and I, then buckle up because Friday is going to be ecstatic. So thank you once again, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Hi everyone and welcome to UCTV Alive for Kids. It's great to have your company again today. I'm Dr Louise Grimmer from the University of Tasmania and I'm really excited today because we've got a special guest in. His name is Dave McNamara. He's from Mount Carmel College. Welcome to Alive for Kids, Dave. Thanks, Louise. It's wonderful to have you in today because you're going to be talking to us about something that I love, which is music. And the title of your presentation today is Drop the Beat and you're going to be teaching us how to make a pop music beat using technology. That's the plan. It yep. sounds really, really exciting. Just a reminder, everybody, that Dave's going to give his presentation and then we will have a break for five minutes and you can think about some questions that you would like to ask Dave and you put those questions, as you know, up on the chat function. And if you could put your first name and your school, that would be absolutely wonderful. So, Dave, before we start with your presentation, I'm going to ask you a few things about yourself. Okay. So you're a music teacher at Mount Carmel. I am. How did you become interested in music? Uh, I started learning the piano when I was five, and then uh, just as I as I kind of grew up, I started getting in, interested in different instruments, different styles of music. So I started playing the trumpet in a town brass band. Oh wow! And then when I hit year ten, I started playing guitar in a rock band. Cool. And uh, it, the uh, the rest just went from there. And you also play an interesting, well, you play a lot of instruments, but there's one that I think is fantastic, which is the... The piano accordion. Piano accordion. Yeah, that's what I play in a few bands in Hobart. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, I learnt that instrument because I was a piano student in Melbourne at the conservatorium there. And I, um, I had a girlfriend, who's now my wife, who said to me she wanted to go travelling and busking around oh. Europe, and she plays violin. So that's a great accompanying well, instrument. Well, she said to me, if you want to come, you need to learn a smaller <laughs> instrument other than piano. And so I picked the accordion. And... That's a great, it's like a sort of portable piano. That's right. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm. Well, Dave, I think we should get underway with your presentation. Okay. All right, take it away. Sounds good. So we'll go to the first slide there. So uh, today we're going to look at making music out of, out of randomness, essentially, adding some order to, uh, to the choices that we have in the, in the program I'm going to show you. Uh, so, basically, um, with this program, which is called Learning Music by Ableton, uh, you, can, you can enter random notes in, and it's going to sound okay, but it's never going to sound like organised pop music unless we kind of learn a few little rules and formulas. So we might switch across to the Ableton, and I'm just going to put some random notes in here to demonstrate what I mean by that. Um, with the program, you'll see the line goes constantly, and then it loops back when it gets to the end. There we go. So if I just put some random sounds in here, put a couple in a row there. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it keeps going constantly, but it doesn't sound like any particular type of music at this point. So I'm going to just clear that and stop it. And we'll go back to the slides there. Um, back to the Google slide. <laughs> in a sec, there we go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, to, organ to organize our sounds here in pop music, you've got four layers of sound, Louise. We've got at the bottom level, we've got the drums or the, that's the beat. Yeah. Uh, and then you can add a bass line on top of that. Some Essential. <laughs> Essential, right. Uh, some chords after that. And then uh, if, you, if you have time, if we have time today, we'll put a little melody over the top of that as well. When you listen to pop music, I've got their zoom in with your ears. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting idea when you look at a piece of art or you look out a window. Let's say you're looking out the window and you can see a tree with a bird in it. 
you can zoom in kind of with your eyes and focus on the bird. And with music, you could do the same thing. You can zoom in on the bass mm. with your ears and mm. you can zoom in on the melody. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to do a bit of that today. Okay, so we're going to go to the drums first and we've got three ideas there that I'm going to show you that, that starts to get, get our drum beats organised. So four on the floor oh, is What the does that mean? Thing. What does that mean, Dave, four, four on the floor? Four on the floor is the term that we use for um, having a kick drum, which is the lowest sounding drum, on each of the main beats in the bar. Ah, okay. And in most pop music, there's four beats in the bar. And you can see I've got a darker shaded bar here and then a lighter shaded bar here. Yeah. This is called grid notation, when you've got a grid like this. Uh, and now if I press play, so I've deliberately chosen the first little box next to the darker line. Yeah. And now we've got a steady beat. So that's called four on the floor. We call it four on and the floor. And you'd be doing that if you were playing, <clears throat> pardon me, drums, that's the one that you're um, hitting with your foot. Yeah, with Is your that right, right foot. That's yep. correct. Nice work there. Yep. <laughs> uh, and now, and so uh, the next thing, we can add is the backbeat and the backbeat often happens on the snare, snare which is the drum that sits right in right in between the drummer's legs right, right yeah and that happens on every second beat at the same time oh, as the kick okay. so we'll skip the first one yep do the second skip one skip another one oh cool we've got a pretty familiar starting sounding. to sound yeah that's right yep. that's four on the floor and the backbeat and then the next thing we can do is add a hi-hat now we've got two options in this program, the closed hat and the open hat. Now we could just select every single cell and it's gonna be pretty high energy. I'll just do that now. Okay, so we start to get a little bit more in the texture there. I'm gonna just put it on every second hi-hat and we'll see what that changes to. Oh, yep. A bit more like a standard drum beat and some of our viewers may may play the drum kit and might know a straight eight drum beat. And this is very similar to this one. And Dave, on the drum, is that the, is that the symbols? Right, the hi-hat is the- The hi-hat? It's the, 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 right, the symbols that close together. The symbols together. that close together, yeah. That's and right. so you, you do something that make, that make them open and close, yeah, is that right? Yeah, there's a little pedal with yeah, your left foot. So that's with your left foot, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So hey, in a nutshell, that's how we can create a really stock standard pop drum beat. Yeah. Which is our first layer of sound. In, in our beat. So we're gonna go back now to the, uh, back to the slide, if that's okay. And we're gonna come and adjust that drum beat a bit later, but we'll move on to chords. Now with pop music, you know, you've got all the options for chords that, that there are thousands of different <laughs> chords you can choose. So we wanna just reduce our options down to four main ones. And these four numbers are important. One, four, five, and six. Okay. And okay. Basically, every, uh, uh, how I, actually I think what we might do is skip over to Ableton again now and I'll demonstrate that with the grid. One, four, five and six, you've got to remember that Louise, because okay. you're going to help me to uh, I'm writing to it down. This. <laughs> I'm going to go to the chord section and Louise, we've got here the alphabet starting from C, D, yes. E, F, G, A, B and then we get back to C. You'll notice C is in purple each time. Yes. And we're going to think of C as number one. Okay. That's our number one chord. Yep. Now, four would be C, D, E, F, because it's the fourth one up. Yes. One, two, three, four. Five is G. Yes. And six is going to be A. A. And okay. technically, the six is a, is a minor chord, but that's not so essential for today. So can you do me a favour and just pick one of those four numbers? Four is my favourite number. I'm going to start with four, <laughs> and I'm going to make it a long note that goes for two beats Two main beats, okay? And now pick another one for me. Um, five. Five, good choice. <laughs> okay, another one? Six. Okay. And then back to one, maybe? And then back to one. Okay, yeah. we'll put it down the bottom here. All right, so now, just a single note. We're not yet with chords. This is gonna be our chord progression. It sounded good. It's going to sound fine, okay. What I, yeah, let's leave it like that. Or you can change it, Dave. Well, I think this will be fine. Yeah, well, you're the composer here, so we're <laughs> going to stick with that. Okay. <laughs> now, if we just go back to, the, back to the slide for a second. The next step on there, it says start with root notes. Now, what I've just done is start with the root notes, which means if it's a four chord, you put the four note in there. Yeah. Now we have to build the triads. And a triad, 
like a tricycle is a bike that has three wheels, uh, a triangle is a shape that has three sides, a triad is a, a chord that has three notes. Oh, okay. And we're going to do that using this system. We can think of it either as traffic lights or the Monday, Wednesday, Friday system. And okay. I'll show you what that means if we go back to Ableton. It's as simple as this. We've got the root note, we skip the next one, and we put the, the next note in. Then we skip another one. Oh, okay. And all of a sudden we've got, they don't really look like traffic lights because they're kind of squashed <laughs> flat, but I think of them as traffic lights. So that's a chord. This is a, this is a chord, oh. a type of chord called a triad. And then we could do that for each of the, uh, each of the notes that you've chosen. Four, five, six, and then one. And now let's see what we've got. I think that sounds wonderful. You, you've composed well. <laughs> we'll put our drum beat with it just to see how it sounds. And all of a sudden, we're starting to get a little pop beat happening. Dave, we could have a hit record. We might have. <laughs> <laughs> the UCTV Alive for Kids hit single. All right. We could have a theme tune for the show. <laughs> this could be it, OK. Um, all right, so we're not quite there yet because we've just got the chords and we've got the drum beat. So we'll go back to the slide. And moving on to oh, bass lines. Bass. Bass line. Now you see that word root notes there again. That's we already did that with the chords. So now we're going to do it with the uh, with the bass. So we'll go back to Ableton. And you chose the fourth mm. chord first. Now it's important with the bass line yes. that we do the same chords in the same place. Okay. Okay. So if you forget, you could look back here, and I can see the bottom one's an F. Yes. Now this time I'm just going to put just a single note in there. Oh, I love that sound. You like that one? Yes, I I do like the bass. So you went F, <laughs> and then you went to G, which was yeah. five. One, two, three, four, five. Then you went to six and then you chose one at the end. I see you doing it every second, yeah. Yeah, just yep. at the beginning of each of the, yep. of the beats, you can see they, they line up when the chord changes. Yes. Okay, now we'll oh. go back to the slide. Um, back over to Google there. Connect with passing notes and interesting rhythms. rhythms. And also in bass lines, silence is golden. <gasps> So it's important that we don't just fill it all up with notes. No. Bass players, if you watch your favourite songs played live, they often are going to have lots of times when they're not playing. I have noticed that. You've noticed it? Yep. Okay. And you can hear that there's no bass if, yeah. you, if you're listening for it too. Yeah. Because when it comes in, it's amazing. And that's part of the title of this presentation, Drop the Beat, because where beat. all the big ah. low sounds come in after a bit of silence. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll go back to Ableton and we're going to fill in the, uh, the bass line with those passing notes and interesting rhythms that I mentioned before. Now a passing note is just basically some, something that connects the, the dots between here and here. You can think of it like that. Yep. Uh, and it, it creates a bit of a, yeah, join the dots essentially. So we've got this one here. Yeah. We could just do a couple of notes. We could even do that. And you can see it goes from A and then G, F, E, D, C down to the bottom. That's These are all passing notes. Yeah. Okay, they're not part of the chord, they just create Oh, a, a bit, bit of, of interest. A bit of interest, yeah. that's right. So we might want to maybe do a couple of repeated notes at the start yes. just for fun and then maybe we might do a little up above it then come down. Yeah. And I actually like, I like the idea of that so I'm <laughs> going to repeat it. I think this could be a, a real hit single. I think it will be, <laughs> and definitely. Then, <laughs> and so now patterns are always good in music so I've got just, just a little pattern there. Yes. But still the first notes remain where they were on the fourth yes the fifth and the sixth like you composed yep and we could change these other notes anywhere we like this is random and then yep. join the dots down here now somehow we've got to get back to the four so there's four yeah i might even just do another little line like that we'll see what it sounds like by itself okay sounds really cool sounds all right i don't like this note I'm going to actually make that one there. We'll see what happens. Let's see what it sounds like. Okay. Might have been being a bit picky there. <laughs> and now I'll put the drum beat in with it. So it's in time. And now this is the real litmus test if the chords match it as well. Oh. So okay. I'm going to press play, it'll cue up. Here we go.
That is so cool. Isn't that cool? <gasps> That's really good. You're so, so clever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's the point is it's it's one thing it's it's not that clever really when you know the the little rules and formulas that go with it that's one great. four five and six for the chords the four on the floor on the backbeat yeah plus a, just some hi-hats there uh, and then the idea of passing notes and silence in the bass the bass is really interesting to me because you can really hear that when when you're playing that back yeah but it just looks very random what you what you did there it i looks mean pretty random. you are a musician but oh yeah well just following <laughs> it sounds so good thank you it's well, you helped to, to compose it. So we'll go back over to the, the slides now and we'll see what we've got next. Um, so silence is golden. Now adjust to taste. Mm. And this is where we start to be able to personalise the music a little bit. Personalise the music. So this, this drum beat is pretty standard. What if we just adjust some of the things just by a cell or two? Yeah, I might, we'll get that. Yeah, there we go. It's up oh, on the screen. Oh, there it is up oh, on the screen. So, uh, what we could do... Yeah, it does what, sound pretty standard, doesn't it? It's pretty standard. Yeah. So, what about we just pick um, pick a couple of these at random and move them slightly. Oh. Oh. Okay. And maybe, okay. maybe we can just add... This is actually really totally random what I'm doing here. <laughs> I might... I'll put that one there and I'll put this <gasps> one there. I might even add a couple more oh. there just for fun. <gasps> okay. And what about... You know I mentioned patterns before, I yes. might go with the pattern idea. So I've got, these are where they originally were, then I move the yep. third one by a bit. Yes. That's where it originally was. Same pattern here. Okay, and we'll okay. just see what happens. Oh. It's a, it's a bit funkier. Just a little, maybe a bit, a bit funkier. funkier, yeah. <laughs> now we can add some other things in here. Oh, we can, what about the clap? You want to clap? Oh, yeah. So actually, why don't we turn these two into claps? Oh, yeah, that'd be great. A little clap cool. at the end. And yeah, we can put good. it here as well, just for fun. Yeah, I like it. You're liking that? I do. And then, <laughs> and then we can also, we've got toms here. Oh, now what are toms? Toms are the drums that are kind of in between the lowest kick drum sound yep. and the snare. Oh, that they're, sounds They're still okay. pretty low. Yep. So we might want to go, for example, there we go. Let's see. Oh, I like the tom. Oh, yes, I like the tom. And let's do the pattern and put them there again. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. <laughs> it's a mishmash. Let's it's a just bit say. of a mishmash. <laughs> and you can, you can adjust for hours, but we don't have hours. Uh, <laughs> and you might even want to just add a few extra of these just as even a bit more variety. There we go. There's our oh, beat for today. It's very complicated. UC TV <laughs> beat. But it all, the key is it all started from following those rules. Yes. Four on the floor. Yes. Back beat and then adjust. Yeah, that's okay. great. And we could do similar, th well, we've already got our bass line here. Yep. Um, we're going to leave that how it is. Yeah. We can adjust the rhythm of these so we don't just have our our chords playing on the beat could each they time. Play, could, could they be a bit faster, like... They're quite lo like, mm, they could, could they be shorter is we what I mean, some, sorry. We could put shorter. some rhythm in. A good idea is to follow something something here oh, as well. Okay. Yep. So look at this, we've delayed the kick beat here by two. So why don't we try delaying the chords, this one here, yep. by the same amount. Yep. So I'm just going to make them shorter by two. And then I'm going to move them all along too. Ah. Okay. Yes. And then I think we did the same here, so let's do the same thing. Yep. It looks like a pretty easy program it's to, use. Easy to use. Yeah. Once you, you know, have the basics. Yeah, it is. Okay, so now we've got get our beat with it. <laughs> and it's missing a bit of low end, isn't it? Yeah, missing the bass. Let's get the bass in. Let's Here we go. Do it. It's really good. Okay. And if I'm if I'm really adjusting to taste, this is the last thing I'll do. Let's have a listen. No, I like it just how just like that. Okay. So we've all of a sudden made made a beat. And let's go oh. let's assume we've adjusted to taste and we'll go back to the slide. 
Oh, of course we've got to add something else in. Well, we don't have to. You could then, you could have that and you could compose, you could get some lyrics and compose a melody over the top of that. I won't ask you to do that right now. No, I, I will not be singing. We'll go to, um, <laughs> we'll go, <laughs> we could add a, a little riff. So we were Oh, yes, we earlier. were talking earlier. Now, Dave, tell us, what's a riff? A riff is just a short little melody that often can be the hook in a, in a tune. Uh, so you've got the main melody, which is what the singer sings. Yes. And a riff is something that's often without words, that's played by an instrument. Um, yeah, that often repeats throughout a song. So give us some examples. So uh, a famous bass riff is um, Another One Bites the Dust. That's it. Are you going to hum it? Would you like to do the honours? <laughs> okay. Don't laugh, everyone. I'm going to do the... I'm going to mime it as well. Dum, dum, dum. Dum, 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 dum. That's it. That's it. Yeah, there's yep. the bass riff. As soon as you play that, everyone knows that's another one bites the dust. Uh, or they should do. <laughs> they should. That's right, they should do. Uh, there, are, there are others, and you just have to listen to most pop songs and you'll be able to and identify a riff. a little riff somewhere. Ah, yeah. It's really interesting. Uh, if, yeah. Yep. But the hook is something sometimes a bit different. If you say the word hook, did you say that sometimes the chorus? Is that right? The hook in a pop song can be the chorus. Could be the chorus. Yeah. Yep. For example, uh, what's a what's a pop song that everyone would know? What about "We Will Rock You"? Okay, "We Will On Rock You" on a Queen you. theme. Yeah, "We Will." So "We Will we Rock will You" rock has, you. has probably two hooks. It's got that hook that you just sang. Yep. Um, and then it's got the drum the drum hook as well. The stomp, stomp, clap. Yep. Stomp, stomp, clap. Yeah. So you could almost describe that as a riff, a drum mm, riff. Right. That also is the hook. So the hook's the catchy bit that's kind of memorable about a song. Yep. Sometimes you might hear um, some songs become described as earworms, uh -huh. where they get in your yep. head and you can't stop humming them. That's right. And that's probably because they've got a really memorable riff and or hook. And because they've followed these rules. Yep. They, they, these rules often create earworms. Yes, right. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> and so let's try and create an earworm. Out, let's do out, it. Out of the melodies. Totally. Okay. For our hit song. <laughs> now, with... One thing that's important here is that in this program, um, we've got options along the top here. Uh, we've got the, the, the root note, which we've chosen as C. C, yeah. Uh, but we could, we could make that higher and make it E. And you can see the letters change along here into what becomes oh, yes. an E. Oh, so that will sound major. totally different. It will Ooh. sound different. And it will sound really bad if I put this chord <laughs> along with the bass that we had before, which is still Oh, because C. they're not matched up. They're is not matched up. Yeah. Let's have a listen and see what happens. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, that sounds terrible. It's kinda... Even to my untrained ear, there you that's go. not right, and is it's, it? It's simply because it's in a different key. Oh, right. So we're going to put that back to C. Yeah, good. <laughs> and we're going to have different moods here with our major or minor. We might get into that later if we have time. Yeah. But as long as the melodies box is selected with the same uh, scale, yes. then we can't really go wrong. Right. It's always good to start on the on the the one, okay. So we'll just put a one in here. Yep. And now, why don't we do this totally at randomly? Okay. Uh, I want you to uh, just tell me to go up or down. Okay. Up. Okay. Up. Up. Down. Uh, okay. I'm or gonna, not? Yeah. No. <laughs> perfect. No. Good choice. I'll go down to this one. Yes. Um, now, am I doing a sort of the next four? Is that, yeah, that is that one. how you do it? Uh, well, we could just see what that sounds like. All right. It's a really short riff right. to start. Um, well, it's a well, start. Well, it sort of matches what we did in the other, yeah. with the chords, what if we it? What if we repeat it so okay. it becomes a real earworm? It sounds a little bit like a computer game at the moment, <laughs> doesn't it? It's important to note that this program <laughs> is limited in its sound sources. So it sounds like a computer program because this has only it's got a, the one choice of sound. It's all right. It could be a really trendy sound for our song. Let's see what happens. Mm. Okay, ready? Technology, after all. Get our bass and our chords. Okay, and here comes our riff. The second time it's not so good. Maybe we want to adjust the second one to taste. I don't like that last one. Just to taste, we, Dave. Yep. <laughs> what about we make it go up? Oh yeah, that's that's happy. You like that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So this would become our riff, and then you'd eventually walk away from hearing that 
over the course of a song, you might hear that maybe do, 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 do. Eight, or tw eight or 10 or 12 times. Yeah. And then you'd be talking to your friends and you'd be saying, have you heard that new song by that artist Louise? And Dave. And Dave, <laughs> Louise and Dave. And, it, and then if you don't remember the words, you'd be able to remember the riff. Oh, that's da, right. Because da, da, da. that's what a lot of people do when they're trying to um, describe a song to you. Yep. Um, you know, I can't remember the song, but it goes like this, and that's what they do. I think isn't there are it? two types of people. I think there's the ones who remember and the ones who no, no, no. <laughs> there's people who remember the words, and there's people yeah, who remember, remember the... The, the music, the yes, tune. Yes, that's right. And I'm definitely a, a riff singer like that. Yep. I'd be like, do 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 do. Yeah. But then someone else might go, uh, you know, remember that song? You know that song that I heard on the radio that goes. We yeah. will, we will rock you for I was going to make something up about UCTV, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. UCTV. There we go, yeah. Um, okay, so there's there's that. And, and if we go back to the, the slide just briefly, you can see that I've got there. It's important to start simple and then adjust with all these things. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and so you notice that, you know, we've, we've only got uh, one, two, three, four, five, five notes. Yeah. And you might want some more notes later on, but you just start simple and then you can adjust from there. Yeah, so you're sort of laying the foundations for it. That's right. And then you can add in sort of extra things if, if you want to. Sometimes exactly. simple is, is good. Simple is good. Mm. And, and with pop music, uh, there, are, there are whole genres that, genres that, uh, that really strip it back to super simple. Yeah. Sometimes they even cut out the, uh, one of those layers. They might not have any chords. Yeah. And they might they just, just have, have the bass and the yeah, drums. Yeah, right. Uh, and then occasional little riffs here and there. <gasps> Look, this is brilliant. So sure, I reckon we'll have a five-minute break for you to think of some questions. And um, and if we haven't got lots of questions, we've got lots more things that we can we have could... a look at. I have many things that we could yeah, that I'd yeah. love you to do. Okay. So let's go for our five-minute break now, everyone. And if you have some questions for Dave, pop them into the chat and we'll see you in five minutes. Welcome back, everyone. We have got some great questions in. Dave and I were just having a look at them. So let's have a look at the first one. This is from Declan. He's in grade six at St Paul's. Hi, Declan. And Declan wants to know, Dave, what is the hardest instrument to play? Oh, That's a good question. Isn't it a good question? Yeah. Thanks, Declan. Uh, probably it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really tricky one to answer. I personally find the flute particularly difficult to make a good sound on. Oh, because so that, of the because of the Yeah, the getting blowing. the lips mm. in the right in the right position. Now there's probably lots of people watching who learn the flute mm. who are like, flute's easy. Yeah. It's the trumpet that I struggle with. Yeah. Or the accordion. Or the accordion, right? <laughs> so I guess, you know, there's arguments about this all through throughout time. Trumpets Tricky because you've got to get the buzzing with your lips. Yes. But then there's only three valves to push, so that's oh, that's kind of that just makes combinations that a of three. A little bit easier. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the flute, you've got to make the sound there. The piano, you've got to play up to ten or twelve notes at a time, and and your foot going as with well. the feet as well. Mm. Accordion, you've got to do that mm. with the buttons and the. So, um, Declan, there's no clear answer, but uh, I would say that flute is my For you, the flute. nemesis when it comes to <laughs> instruments. What about the piccolo? I've never had a go, but I imagine mm. that that's another. A step, step, step higher. Step higher. Yeah. Level um, up. Good question, Declan. Harry, from grade six at St Paul's as well. Hi, Harry. Have you ever played the bagpipes? Oh, Harry, it's it's a bit of a life goal of mine to learn how to <laughs> play the bagpipes. I um I had a toy bagpipe set when I was when I was a young child. My mum went to Scotland and brought back a toy bagpipe. How cool. Yeah, and I was really excited to play it, but it was such a toy that no matter what I did with my fingers, oh. the, the, the sound didn't change, the pitch didn't change. So uh, I have never played them, but I would like to. I would like to learn to play the bagpipes as well, but I'm not sure. Wonder, they look really I hard. I wonder if Harry learns the bagpipes. Yeah. Lots and of younger people start with just the chanter. The, um, the, it's like... It's without the bag. They just oh. kind of learn how to play it, and then yep. the rest of it. And comes. then they put the other mm. bit in. I, to me, I think the bag bagpipes would be one of the most difficult yep. instruments to learn. Um, here's a question from Charlie. Hi, Charlie. One of our regular viewers. Charlie is home educated, and he wants to ask: Can music make people feel a certain emotion? Oh, oh what a good question. Charlie, well, you just had to see Louise's face when we were composing our music <laughs> before. She was feeling pretty chirpy, uh, was. as was I. Mm. Uh, yeah, it can definitely make us feel different emotions, and there's a number of ways to do that. 
the main ways are, um, remember I spoke about major and minor yes. and all the other options along there. So look, a really basic way is that uh, there are always exceptions to this rule, but happier songs mm. tend to be in a major, major key chord. and yep. minor yep. songs tend to have a bit more of a, 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 a sad or somber sort of feel. Yes. And also the tempo can impact that. If you've got tempos that are um, at about 100, 110, 120 beats per minute, yep. so every second is a beat per minute, so seconds are at 60 beats per minute. Yes. And so double that is 120 beats per minute. Yeah. When they get up in those numbers, they're a bit more upbeat and they tend to make us want to dance. And yeah, things like, like disco that. and things like For that. For example, yep. whereas slower ballads can be a bit more emotional. Would you like me to demonstrate just a bit of moving to the sad? Yes. We could just take our thing that we've done. Yes. If we just flip to Ableton, um, I'll just put my earpiece in here. So we'll press play on the drums and we'll slow the whole thing down. Maybe just, well, let's go to 70. So 70 beats per minute. 70 beats per minute. Yep. So just a bit more than a second, a bit quicker than a second. And then we'll turn it into a minor key. The only thing that changed were that the notes here, the E's, A's and B's became flats. I'll just keep yep. your eyes here and I'll show you. Yep. No flats for major. Yeah. Flats for oh, minor. Yep. So the actual notes are going to change. I'll do the same because we saw what happened when we did yeah. do that last <laughs> time. You have to keep it. So now we're all in minor. So it's going to sound very different, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, let's see what happens. Here's our bass. Let's get our chords. And maybe our riff. Do you know I like that better? You like it better, right? I think that sounds really good. Isn't it amazing just changing the tempo and from a major to a minor key. Makes a huge difference. Doesn't it? I wonder what happens if we change the tempo up to double what it is now. Bring it up to 120. We've got a disco hit there. <laughs> or a techno hit. A techno hit, maybe. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, was it Charlie that asked Yeah, that Charlie. Yep. That was a great, great, great question. Great question, Charlie. I also think with emotion and music, if you hear some songs at a certain time in your life or some music at a certain time or you're looking back mm -hmm. um, to when you were younger perhaps and you liked a certain song, yep. it can evoke a lot of memories of that time as well. Yeah. Music's really powerful like that too, It really isn't it? is and there's a lot of, a lot of research into brains that connect those, those, those memories and mm. make the brain light up in, in the areas that, that show that we're feeling good oh, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Even some of the sad associations yes. with songs still it, when it's in the future, yep. um, makes our brains feel, makes good. our bodies feel good. Wow! So it's but very, very powerful. Our viewers might have favourite songs that their their parents sang to them when they were really small, or maybe yep. some nursery rhymes or things like that that they might look back on now and they're just really familiar. And, yeah, and, and evokes yeah, yeah evokes lovely feelings. Mm. That's great. Thanks, Charlie. Um, oh, St Paul's, you have been very busy. Kobe from Grade 6 at St Paul's, Good what Kobe. is the most expensive instrument you have ever purchased? Oh, oh that's a good question. Kobe. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I have, actually I have an accordion that cost me, do you want to, the question didn't ask for details, but I'll share anyway. <laughs> I, I spent three and a half thousand dollars on my accordion. Wow. But that, that for some musicians is still pretty cheap. Yeah. I saw an accordion on sale for fifty-seven thousand dollars. <gasps> was it an antique or something? No, it was just a very super fancy wow. accordion with lots of features. You would want to be getting a lot of busking money to pay That's back right. the fifty-seven thousand dollars. This is this is true. Yep. Um Oh, gee, there's some really good questions here. Sorry, I'm just skipping forward. Oh, Charlie said, thanks for answering my question. You are welcome, no Charlie. Worries. Here's a question from Tom. What is your favourite music program to use? Oh, good question, Tom. Mm. Uh, look, this might be a, a question I can answer with one of the slides as well, if that's okay. I've got one final slide that is just their oh, programs. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, so there are different levels of programs Tom, that you can you can use. You sound like you might even know a few of these already. M many of you will be familiar with GarageBand, which is free. Yeah. GarageBand's a really a really fun one to get involved just at a really beginner level. Yep. Uh, and now online uh, in the cloud, there's these other ones, BandLab and Soundtrap. 
as well as Soundation is another one that I didn't put there. Yeah. Uh, they're both fun. As a teacher, I use BandLab a lot yeah. uh, with my students. But as a professional musician, when I'm not a teacher, yeah. uh, I use a combination of uh, Ableton yes. and, and Pro Tools as well. Pro Tools. For, for different, different purposes. So, Tom, when I'm, making, when I'm making beats like this, I'll use Ableton, which is good. It's got some interesting features, which I won't go into now. And for recording music, uh, Pro Tools is, is the one Pro that I tools. use. But there's lots of really good ones. That um, That's a great answer, Dave, because Amani from St Paul's has sort of asked a related question, is this program available as an app? Ah. And if so, is it free? Well, it's not free because Ableton's paid, but is it an app? or It's a computer so, program, isn't it? Is that what right? What was the name of the... Amani. Amani. Amani, the program that I use to show you everything today uh, is free. That's a website. Oh, that's free. That, that's okay. called, uh, the website address is learningmusic.ableton.com. And I went to a specific part called the playground. Uh, and so that's free. And there's lots of other music making apps that look like what I showed you today with grid notation that are free. Yep. Uh, and then to go further with it, um, you can, like, uh, yeah, like I said, so BandLab and Soundtrap both have apps. That you can that you can download for free. You set up an account. Yep. GarageBand's free with iPads, uh, but the other more professional ones you have to pay for them. Right. Um, okay. So Ableton, it's free for part of it, but then you have to pay for. So the actual program is paid. Right. But the program okay. doesn't yep. look very much like what I showed you today. That this is just the education. Oh. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, oh, that was a good question, Amani. Yeah. Um, Harry from Grade Six at St Paul's. Have you ever recorded a song using this program? Uh, so, I've recorded uh, I've recorded songs using a bunch of different programs. Uh, Ableton is one that I've used a lot. Sound uh, both Soundtrap and BandLab. I've recorded things in. As a teacher last year, I recorded the whole school. We weren't allowed to sing during lockdown as a as a whole group, oh, yes. but I recorded small groups singing and then with BandLab, which I've actually got. If we skip to the the other screen there. I opened up BandLab before, and uh, this is what this is what the next level up looks like. It looks like it might be ah. cut off the screen there a little bit, but essentially you can uh, you can create different tracks. You know, you might want to put your voice over the top, and then you hook up a microphone. We won't do it today, but uh, whoops, okay. And then you can add loops. Maybe I can add a quick loop in there. Oh, no, we probably don't have time now. So that one looks a little bit more complicated. It's complicated, but with with, with BandLab, it's still, yeah. yeah. You can still find things just, just by clicking around and yeah. experimenting. Yeah. And there are good tutorial videos. Oh. And, you know, I really recommend to everyone to just get in get in there and, and play around. And there are, there are drum machines like what we use today, the grid notation, yeah. that can get you started. We have only got about five minutes left, Dave, which is very sad. Um, but I thought, just before I sort of wind everything up, mm. if we go back to our song, mm. is there any anything we could do to it fairly quickly to make it sound, I don't know, like a disco track perhaps? Disco? Or, or some, some other sort of we definitely, genre of yeah. music? I did say reggae to you, but you said you thought that might be a bit tricky. Well, we could, we could, try, <laughs> we could try both. Okay, we've got five minutes. So disco... A disco beat, so we think yeah. about a classic like um, uh, 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 staying alive, staying alive. So we're at about 110 beats per minute there, I reckon. I'll see how accurate I am. Let me make a earpiece. <laughs> uh, uh, staying alive, staying alive. So there we go, we're at the right tempo. Uh, now, a classic, we're going to just change our beat altogether, so I'll clear that. And many people will know if you've ever done any beatboxing, You'd know the boots and cats. Have you ever heard? I of love boots? all these sayings. Have you heard of boots and cats no. before? Okay, I'll show you boots and cats. So this is like a classic sort of classic beat. disco beat. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. It looks something like I may have missed a couple of these. We'll just see. Okay, so you can beatbox it by going boots and cats and boots oh, and that's cats so and it cool. works. Okay. <laughs> So we got that. That's a pretty classic disco beat. We might even put two of these just to make it really disco-like. Okay. Okay. And then just with that different drum beat. We've got one minute. Okay. Get our disco. 
Hey, that sounds great. All of a sudden we've got disco. Yeah, this is our new song. Okay. And then of course, to make it reggae, we just slow it down. Maybe just get rid of that. Mm, I like disco. You like disco better? I think so. Let's finish with disco. Yeah, finish with disco. There we go. That is really cool. So it's amazing the, the difference you can make just by changing some of those things, but I think keeping those rules in place. The rules are really important yeah. to, to start with and then that adjust to taste idea where you just get to play around with it after you've followed the rules. That's fantastic. I think I might go and have a, um, well, we need to have a play with it and make got, our hit single. We've I got think. a recording session to go we to. Have. Yeah. No singing from me. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for coming on the program today. It's absolutely fantastic. And I hope you've all been inspired to perhaps have a look at some of those programs that Dave mentioned and download them and, and start experimenting. And you're the next sort of crop of musicians and hope to hear from some of you. Now, we're going to take a break for about three weeks because school holidays are coming up. When we return on the 20th of October, we're going to have Marie Backer back on the program. Some of you might have uh, might have seen a couple of shows that we've done with Marie. We haven't got our topic yet, but it will be something to do with sustainability and it will be something very interesting and practical that Marie will be doing with us. And that's all for now, everybody. Thanks so much for your company. See you next time. Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of UCTV Alive for Kids. It's really good to have your company. I'm Dr Louise Grimmer from the University of Tasmania and this week's topic is really topical and really important and it's about climate change. And I'm really, really pleased to welcome Dr Chloe Lucas and Dr Gabby McCatter to the program. Hi Chloe, hi Gabby. Hi Louise. Hi. Hi Louise. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, Chloe and Gabby are both from the University of Tasmania and they're going to be presenting today about the project which is called Curious Climate Schools. Now before we get into this wonderful project that you've both been running which is all about questions and answers about climate change, I want to find out what got you so interested in the topic of climate change. So Chloe, we might go to you first. How did you become interested in climate change? When I first came to Australia, I went diving on the Great Barrier Reef and I absolutely fell in love with the fish and the corals and just the most magical world. And I was uh, living there and working as a dive master when I, when I really sort of started to witness coral bleaching and find out about the, the threat that climate change poses to the Great Barrier Reef. And that got me started on finding out about climate change and, and really wanting to work on that and work on communication around climate change particularly and to try to get action happening. And Chloe, what do you do in your role at the University of Tasmania? I'm a research fellow at the University of Tasmania in Geography um, and uh, I particularly am interested in climate change communication. So oh. I talk to people about what, you know, why they're interested in climate change or not um, and also around bushfire. So I look at bushfire adaptation and climate adaptation, so how we can live with the new kinds of threats that we have because of climate change. Oh, so you're a perfect person to be running this project then. <laughs> and Gabby, what about you? How did you become interested in climate change? Well, Louise, um, I'm a journalist by profession um, and now an academic that studies the media and journalism and the way we communicate about these kinds of big issues like climate change. Um, I became really interested about how the conversations that we have about climate change in our media really broadly um, really strongly dictate people's understanding of, of an issue so important as this. So that was my entry into interest and concern um, about climate change and wanting to be part of the solution. Um, so my role now at UTAS is uh, working with a climate science group and um, I'm their climate change communication research person and we research the best ways to uh, communicate climate change, what's what the media is doing, what they're doing right, what they're doing <laughs> not so well um, and, and how we can get these really important messages across as to how we can solve this, this issue by getting everyone to work together and to understand what the, what the issue is. So we, we look at what's called climate literacy making oh, people yes. aware of um, the problems with climate change and the solutions that, that we have to, 
to deal with it. So this project is, is right up your alley as well. It's fantastic. Now this of course is really topical this week, isn't it? Because climate change is really in the media at the moment with what's going on overseas. So you've, you've prepared a, a video about the project. Before we play the video for everyone, Chloe, can you just tell us how did this uh, project start? Well, a couple of years ago, um, there was a project called Curious Climate Tasmania. And oh, yes. uh, it was run uh, by Greta Petzl, who I think you've had on, yes, on this yeah. show. Um, and uh, they, what they did was they went and asked adults all around Tasmania what the questions they wanted to ask about climate change. And they did a road oh. trip around Tasmania. And we thought this was a fantastic idea to actually, you know, go to people and say, well, what, do you, what is it you want to know and have experts answer directly? But we thought, well, there's a lot of kids with questions about climate change. Yes. And so we wanted to get that into schools. So, so um, last year we did a little pilot and this year we've gone big. Yep. And we asked uh, schools all over Tasmania what questions they wanted to ask. And we got teachers to brainstorm with their classes about the questions they really want to ask about climate change. And in classes, the, the students voted on their top oh. 10 favorite, you know, their most wanted questions. Yep. And then those, those classes sent in their questions to us. Some of them sent in great videos, some of them sent artwork, uh, and some of them just sent text questions, which was also great. And we compiled all those questions and sent them out to 57 experts, wow. mostly from UTAS, from University of Tasmania, but also from CSIRO. We had people from um, University of Adelaide and Massey University, and even we had to we had a question about pangolins. We didn't have any pangolin <laughs> experts, so we managed. We went out on Twitter and we managed to find a pangolin expert uh, from the uh, Academy of Sciences in China. Wow! Oh, it's wonderful. Well, look, should we watch the video? So what we've got for you today, everyone, and some of you who are watching, you may well have sent in some of the questions to this project. So we're going to play you a video that shows some of the the questions that have come in. From from students and some of the answers from some of the experts and then we'll come back here and we'll have a five minute break for you to think about your climate change questions for Gabby and Chloe today so we'll go to the video now young people have a lot of questions about our changing climate we think they deserve answers for curious climate schools more than a thousand school students from around Tasmania worked with their classes to send in their top 273 questions about climate change. Students had some great questions like these. I was wondering if um, more natural disasters are going to occur due to climate change. Is farming in Tasmania sustainable and how has climate change impacted agriculture? Is it too late to stop climate change? Is it possible to reverse the damage caused by climate change? How will climate change affect our lives? How will climate change impact the wildlife? What will the earth be like when I'm an adult? Wow, these are some big questions here. Thank you for this question. It's one that's really close to my heart. Great question. I love questions like this. The answer to that question is unequivocally yes. We got together 57 experts to answer them, from climate scientists to conservation scientists, pyrogeographers, chemists, law experts, social scientists, engineers, psychologists, oceanographers and paleoclimatologists even Indigenous knowledge experts and health scientists. Some of the questions asked about whether climate change is real or how much the climate is changing. And some asked about the impacts that we're seeing in the natural world. Here's what some of our experts had to say. Well, guys, I'm afraid it is happening and it's our fault. In the last 10 years, most of the warming that we've seen over the entire historical period has happened over this last little period and that's what we always expected to happen a real ramping up as we go into the future climate change and sea level rise are already affecting our wetlands it's happening now in a wetland near you and it's been happening for years well we know that actually some of the colder places on earth are warming faster than other places on the earth so the arctic for instance in the north pole is warming at about three times faster than the rest of the planet on average. Climate change will bring on more extreme circumstances in all kinds of different forms. This can mean heat waves, bushfires, cold snaps, snowstorms, typhoons, hurricanes, huge rainfalls, and many other things. We also got some questions that really got our experts thinking, like these. The question is, are electric cars good if they get charged by coal-powered electricity? And this is an excellent question because an electric car, which I've got one of in my screen behind me, 
um, they're really good. They produce no carbon dioxide emissions and no um, global warming effect when they're being driven if the electricity that was put into them came from zero emissions or renewable electricity. If that electricity came from a coal-fired power plant, like the ones that are in Victoria, for example, that send electricity across the cable to Tasmania sometimes, then actually the emissions are quite high. And I've calculated that for a average electric vehicle that's being charged up from coal-powered electricity in Victoria, for example, the emissions, the carbon dioxide emissions, are about 25% less than an average petrol vehicle that you might drive around. So yes, they are better, but only by a small amount. And so the key message from that is electric vehicles are great if you produce new renewable electricity. And so you've got to do that at the same time as you replace petrol vehicles with electric vehicles. Uh, thanks, Margate Primary. That was excellent question. Um, go the polar bears. Do you like to travel or have friends or family who fly regularly? If so, you probably have a strong sense that travel changed significantly due to the pandemic and has had some kind of impact on climate change. Mm -hmm. Through a combination of lockdowns, border closures, and people not wanting to risk catching COVID-19, commercial flights experienced more than 8 million less flights in 2020. You can even see the difference in air traffic before and during the pandemic. More than a year later, commercial flights are still down significantly compared to beforehand, meaning COVID-19 continues to re reduce people's likelihood to travel. Now, to determine how fewer flights relates to climate change, let's look at global CO2 emissions. Added CO2 in the atmosphere is the main source driving climate change. The more we add, the more the climate will change. In 2020, we added 2.4 gigatons of CO2 less than in 2019, the largest ever recorded drop in a single year. But what's a gigaton of CO2? One gigaton is 1 billion tons, which is roughly 200 million elephants. So that's roughly 480 million fewer elephants worth of CO2 in the atmosphere. However, in the beginning of 2021, we have already seen a huge spike in CO2 emissions, even compared to pre-pandemic levels. That's not good. Some researchers have estimated the pandemic will only have decreased the estimated rise in temperatures by 0.01 degrees, which, while well, really positive, is tiny compared to the possible 1.5, 2, or even 3 degree increases in global temperatures that we're predicting. Tasmania. I've had an excellent question from Peregrine School, grades 7 to 10. Essentially, the question is, I'm 13, in what way is the world going to change around me as I grow up into the future uh, due to climate change? And what actions can I take? Now that's an excellent question. To answer this question, let's do a little bit of a thought experiment. Imagine yourself in 60 years time. Will you have a family? What sort of housing will you live in? Will you still live in Tasmania? What will the world be like then? That's a long way to look forwards. And sometimes it's really hard to imagine the future. This is me when I was 12, roughly the same age that you are now. Can you pick me out? Yep, that's me with the groovy glasses. So if you'd asked my 12 year old self to imagine the future, to even imagine the job that I have now, I would have struggled a little bit, but it would be good to get some clues or some tips from my future self to understand what lies ahead. So let's have a go at doing that now. We know that there are going to be some fairly severe impacts from climate change, including in Tasmania. And many of us are already seeing these impacts in our daily lives now. This includes water shortages, increased bushfires, uh, severe weather events like thunderstorms and dust storms, new diseases showing up in Australia, uh, for example, malaria uh, is expected to potentially affect the northern part of Australia, uh, severe flooding and even infrastructure like railway lines being buckled in uh, severe heat events. So when I was your age, when I was 12, people still smoked on aircraft. Can you believe that? Smoking on aircraft? And importantly, we had major environmental problems when I was growing up that really worried me. Acid rain was a big problem and there was a huge hole in the ozone layer. Both of those environmental issues are now being managed very well. So my point is, 
as we begin to think about what the future is that lies ahead of us and ahead of you, uh, it has enormous opportunities as well as some issues that will have to be very clever with how we manage them. Our cities are more likely to be greener. Uh, we might be using resource recovery, for example, taking sewerage and converting that into power, electricity, but also gas for cooking. And ultimately, we may be able to have our cities give back to the environment what we call net positive development in planning. So thank you, Peregrine School, grades 7 to 10, for this excellent question. There are some challenges that lie ahead of us, and especially that lie ahead of you, as you go from 13 to, say, 63. You'll see some big changes in your lifetimes, but also there are incredible opportunities. All the experts felt that it was really important to answer young people's questions about climate change. Why? Lots of reasons, but mainly because climate change is something that younger generations will have to deal with for their whole lives. Dr. Philippa McCormack, who's an expert in climate adaptation law, told us why she wanted to answer students' questions. I'm Philippa, and I have my own kid who has questions that are big and complicated and important. And I know from her that when kids get to ask the questions that are rattling around in their brains, and if grown-ups take those questions seriously and give them a proper, thoughtful answer, then young people and kids get the chance to apply their clever, creative brains to the issues that they care about the most. I'm really excited to see where our young people take this curious climate project. And I want to be part of the world that they make as they grow and learn. So why are we thinking about this right now? Well, as we speak, the world's leaders are meeting in Glasgow for the United Nations COP26 Climate Summit. This is a meeting where all the countries of the world discuss targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions with the aim of trying to limit climate change to less than two degrees Celsius of warming. They've also pledged to do everything possible to keep climate change to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, considered a safer level of warming. We'll find out what they managed to agree in the next two weeks. But there's really no other issue that our politicians deal with that poses real existential threat to the future of our planet. Think about that for a moment. This is the one issue more than species extinction, more than other forms of pollution, more than pretty much any other environmental issue. This is the thing that could actually end life on earth. And that is a, a mind-bogglingly profound burden to place on decision makers today to take action. The other reason why I think it should be a political priority is because it has such significant justice and equity dimensions for future generations. This is a situation where only if we take action and take a little bit of pain now will we spare future generations the pain that we're inflicting as a consequence of climate change. That makes it a very difficult political question, but it highlights just how important it is. Learning about climate change can make you feel all kinds of emotions. And these are something that climate change experts also struggle with sometimes. Feelings can be a signal that something's wrong or needs our attention. And they can also be really motivating. They can help us find out what we're passionate about. Our feelings can help us learn how to take care of ourselves, others and our planet. You might find it useful to talk to other people who have similar thoughts and feelings about climate change. And you can even find ways to help each other work for a safer climate. Ultimately, climate change is a global issue that we need governments, businesses and industries all over the world to work together to address. But each one of us can make a difference too. We can help by taking individual action working together to take collective action and by calling for larger scale systemic change, for example, by governments and world leaders. Small actions can add up to big changes and positive impacts. And it actually feels good when we're doing something constructive, working together with others that care about the same things as we do and actively being part of the solution. By working together, we can combine our efforts and influence to achieve change and progress faster. Find your tribe and use your voices. Get together with friends and other students who care about climate action. And use your talents. Are you a great artist? Then draw or paint about climate action. Are you good with social media? 
Well, then you can use your influence to get climate action happening. Do you like to cook? Well, then perhaps offer to make a delicious vegetarian meal for your family. Lastly, we probably can't all do all the possible actions against climate change all the time. Just remember that that's okay, because what we really need is lots of people doing lots of things lots of the time to try to help together. Remind yourself and other people to feel really good about whatever changes and actions that you're taking. Go you! My name is Kim Beasy and I work at the School of Education in the University of Tasmania and I've been a part of the Curious Climate Schools project uh, and I must say I'm so excited that uh, this resource has been put together and will be available for um, our Tasmanian teachers uh, to share with their students in classrooms. So you'll find um, authentic questions that have been submitted by young people from grade five all the way through to grade 10, uh, asking their questions about climate change, which um, behind the scenes, uh, we've been organising and have organised experts to respond to these questions, uh, which are now available in video or written form. Uh, it's just such a great resource to integrate into classrooms. Um, and I hope you enjoy it as much as we do. Head over to curiousclimate.org.au forward slash schools to find out lots, lots more about climate change and what we can all do about it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that very special video and that it's inspired you to think of some questions for Chloe and Gabby. So what we're going to do now is have our usual five minute break and we'd love you to come up with some questions that we can pose to Chloe and Gabby today. When you're putting your questions in the chat function, don't forget to put your first name and the grade and the school that you're from. That would be wonderful. So we'll see you back here in five minutes. Welcome back everyone. Well, I can see that you've all been extremely busy and you've come up with some wonderful questions. We've just been having a look at the chat screen while you've been on the five minute break and we've got questions that are ranging through a lot of topics, haven't we? Uh, from uh, volcanoes to tsunamis to all sorts of things. So let's, should we make a start? Let's and we'll, we'll see how, how best we can, we can answer them. Let's start with um, Max from Mount Nelson Primary School. He's in grade six. Are humans likely to die out before the sun? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question to start off with, isn't it? It's is a big question. <laughs> so the sun uh, is, is very stable at the moment and it is likely to go on for billions and billions of years. And uh, this is not my expertise, I'm a social scientist, but I'm pretty sure that the sun will outlast all, all of the, the life that's currently on Earth um, and, uh, and that, that will be billions of years in the future. So, yeah, humans have been around for a few million years um, and we're likely to be around for a few more million years, but probably not quite as long as the sun. Michael from Year 4 at St Joseph's in Rosebury. Why don't we make more solar wind and hydropower? Michael, thank you. That's a great question. Well, we can and we should and we are <laughs> in, in answer to that. Um, so we're particularly lucky here in Tasmania that we have a lot of hydropower that produces the great bulk of our energy um, in a, an almost emissions free way. Uh, at the moment, we are really ramping up in Australia and internationally our, our use of renewable energy like uh, solar and like wind, as you mentioned. Um, solar panels, one in four houses in Australia now have solar panels and that's increasing uh, year on year. Um, and wind power onshore as well as offshore built in the ocean um, are, are all forms of power that are really increasing in uptake and they will become the kinds of solutions that we need uh, to increasingly see in order to what's called decarbonise our economy, that is to get rid of using fossil fuels and to power our economies on and our, and our lives on green emissions free fuels. So fuels that don't contribute to climate change, uh, sources of energy that don't contribute to climate change. So yes, more wind, <laughs> more solar and the hydro that we have where we have it, that we can use it in the best possible way and also save energy. Don't, uh, don't yes. use too much of it. That, that's always... Yeah, uh, turn the solution. lights off. That's right. You're not yes. in the room, <laughs> for example. <laughs> As we all remind our kids. Um, there's also a great answer on Curious Climate Schools from Evan Franklin about what would happen if we stopped using fossil fuels tomorrow. If we turn them all off, how much, would we have enough electricity? And uh, he's got some, some great answers about that if you go and look on, on the website. 
Here's another question from Mount Nelson Primary School, Grade 6. If the climate keeps changing, do you know how long before the North and South Pole will evaporate? And that's from Sam. Now, we had some answers about good question. this. Good <laughs> question. Very good question, Sam. We had some answers about this from Professor Matt King on, mm. the, on the website. And, uh, and I know that it's... Um, no, there was a, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember what he said, but uh, what he, I do remember what he said was that there are 2.5 billion um, uh, gallons, litres of water. No, hang on, 2.5 million. Oh, now I can't oh. remember. Um, anyway, a, a, a massive amount of water in the, the um, north and south poles, which, which could melt and go into the ocean. And if that did all melt, then it would raise the sea level by something like 60 metres, <gasps> which would be like up to the top of rest point mm -hmm. if that happened. But that's not going to happen. Um, and uh, it would take a long, long time. It would take more than uh, any of our lifetimes. Uh, and really what, what he says in his answers is what we need to do is to, to stop... Um, uh, emitting uh, so much uh, carbon dioxide so that we can really limit the amount of sea level rise that's happening. We can limit the amount that the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet are melting so that we can keep that, that sea level rise to, to a manageable amount, something that we can actually deal with without all of our, our cities on coasts going underwater. Gabby, maybe one for you here. This is from Ollie, Year 5 at Rosebury. Why do some scientists think climate change isn't real? That's a good question, Ollie. Thank you for that. Uh, well, the truth is, actually, all scientists who are credible, peer-reviewed, that means publishing in, in uh, reputable uh, science journals, um, so all credible scientists now actually do agree that climate, uh, climate change is real. Uh, there was a piece of work that came out, a piece of research that came out just about a week ago that showed that 99.9 .9 plus percent of scientists uh, believe that uh, climate change is happening now and that it's caused by humans. So I think that the case is closed on whether climate change is anthropogenic, which means made by humans or not. And, and the answer is yes, that it is. And climate change is real and it's here and it's happening now. So hopefully that answers your question, Ollie. Before we go on with our questions, I thought we might just share the web address for Curious Climate Schools. Do you have that off the top of your head? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are uh, curiousclimateschools.org. No, 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 we're not. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Curious, Thank Curious. you. Curiousclimate.org.au forward slash schools. Schools. Oh, so go and have great. a look at that when, when we finish this uh, session and there are plenty of answers to all sorts lots of Lots and lots of answers to some of the, the, the out there questions that we might get. Um, here is another question. This one is from grade f oh, from Harry and Nathan at grade five at Howrah Primary School. How much do you think the sea level could rise in Tasmania in say the next 50 years if we remain on the rate we are going? Uh, yeah, we had, we had a, an answer for, about that kind of thing from Karen Palmer, mm. if you would like to have a look at uh, her answer on the uh, Curious Climate Schools website. I actually visited Harrow Primary last year to talk about climate change, so great to hear from you, Nathan and Harry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the next 50 years, it, it's really the crunch time at the moment. We, it depends on what we do. So if we have a really high emissions uh, of, climate, of, of carbon dioxide like we have at the moment, we, we, could be, we could be looking at, at a lot of, of, of rise, and I don't want to give a, a number because mm. I can't quite remember, um, but we have the opportunity now to limit the amount of melting ice and the amount of sea level rise. And so it really depends on the kinds of things that our politicians decide uh, when they go to, things, to the meetings like the um, COP26 meeting that's happening at the moment in Glasgow. So at the moment, all the world leaders are there and this is the kind of thing that they are talking about. So there are also governments like uh, Palau and um, uh, all of the Pacific Island nations there who are saying, well, if we don't limit these things now, then our nations are going to go underwater. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing will happen to parts of Tasmania, low level parts of Tasmania, places like Cremorne, some mm -hmm. parts of Kingston, South Arm. There are places that, you know, that we could, that could go underwater. We could have a few more islands where we've got peninsulas <laughs> at the moment. Um, so, you know, that is a, a risk, um, but it's something that we can address now and stop happening. Okay, here is one mm, from Lada at Mount Nelson Primary. Are nuclear power plants good for the environment? Lada is in grade six. 
Nanda, I can answer that question for you, and it's a really good one. And actually, we've been seeing quite a lot of conversation in the media recently, just in the last couple of weeks, about uh, nuclear power. Well, here are a couple of answers for you. Um, currently in Australia, nuclear power is prohibited by law, so the development of nuclear power plants, um, enrichment, enrichment of uranium, which is the fuel that's needed for, for nuclear power, that's all against the law in, Tas in Australia. Um, we have really huge reserves of, of uranium, that mineral that's needed to, to develop nuclear power here in this country. In fact, we supply a third of the world's uh, uh, total supply of uranium. So people are asking questions about whether this is something that could be developed for Australia. Um, now, in those countries that already are using uh, some degree of nuclear power, yes, that, that can help uh, limit emissions of uh, carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. So potentially that um, does mitigate climate change, change somewhat. But if we were to think about developing nuclear power for Australia, what might the problems be right now? And would that be a feasible way to decarbonise our energy system? Well, apart from the fact that we'd have to change the law to do that, um, there are a few things to consider. So it actually takes a very long time to develop a nuclear industry. Even if uh, we decided to do it today, it could take from 10 to 12 or even a few years longer than that to develop and have nuclear power running. So that would take us to 2030 something, uh, mid 2030s perhaps. So that's a pretty slow way of decarbonising to, or, you know, providing an alternative source of energy to fossil fuels. The second thing is by that date, so by mid 2030s, uh, the cost of renewables will be so much cheaper. So when I say renewables, I'm, I mean mainly wind and solar, will be so much cheaper than the cost of nuclear. So for Australia, it's not, it doesn't currently make sense mm. to get into nuclear. Um, it's against the law. It'll be too expensive by the time it comes online. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's not really um, a feasible alternative. But in those countries that already have it, um, that, that may be something that they turn to increasingly so. Now, here's a big question for both of you. This is from Michael, year four in Rosebury. What can we do to stop climate change? So, so many, many things. things. So many things. <laughs> we said at the same time, so many things. What are some of the things we can do? Well, I think we need to remember that this is, this is a really big issue that we need governments to be dealing with. It's not, we can't just expect individuals to be able to make a difference, but we, to make enough of a difference. Mm. But we can all make a bit of a difference, mm. and the more that we work together on this, the more of a difference we can make. Mm. So that's the first thing. Um, there are lots of things that everyone can do in their own lives. So things like... Um, riding your bike to school or walking to school or taking the bus, that, that can help, particularly if all of you do it together. Have you got another one? I have. Well, uh, let's talk about some things you can do in your own lives and then some of the, the larger changes mm. we need to see. So some, one of the things we can do in our own lives, and that's, it's a big thing, is eating less meat and dairy products because they, uh, that combined, the, the meat and dairy industry, uh, contributes a huge amount of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere and methane from the burping cows um, and, and so on. So, so if we reduce our consumption of those um, foodstuffs, we can certainly make a difference towards climate change. But I think, as you were saying, Chloe, it's not just uh, um, individuals that need to make change. It is uh, communities, governments and global um, systems that need to change as well. So we can also have an impact on that. So with it, if you think about your school, for example, maybe you could work together and your school could come up with a plan for how you could reduce your carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. It might be about you need more insulation. It might be about the settings that you have the air conditioners on or whether you can open windows or close windows to save uh, energy, if, depending on whether you've got your air conditioners on or off. Um, things like that. So if you, if you um, would like to do something about climate change, maybe you need a school composting system. Mm. Uh, so th there are things that you can talk to your teachers about and maybe get together a, you know, a, a kind of a student representative council on climate change that you can make a school plan. And at a, at a slightly bigger level, we need to do that with our, our local government. So you could uh, talk to your local government representatives your, if you're living in a, a, um, a town or a city in, in uh, Tasmania. Uh, go and see your local politicians and ask them what they're doing and how you can be involved. That's a big question, isn't it? There are lots <laughs> of different and, things and we can do. Yes. <laughs> Turn off the lights. Um, <laughs> okay, now here is um, so a question that I wanted to ask you about the project because we were talking about it earlier. What were some of the most asked questions that 
young people had for you? Well, uh, there, there's a huge range of questions. One of the key ones was um, whether it's reversible, so whether climate change, whether the issues that we're seeing now, the impacts from climate change can be reversed. Um, and whether it's too late mm. to do that. So it was like one, that was a really popular question. That was the most asked. The, yeah. Those two questions were the most yeah. asked questions. Mm. Yeah. And what's the answer? <laughs> it's not too late to make the changes that we need to see, and that's why world leaders are meeting right mm. now in, in uh, uh, at the COP26 conference in Glasgow. Um, they know that this is a last minute. Um, effort that we need to put in. Um, we know that really to, to make the changes that will stop climate change um, uh, getting away with us um, and stop humans being able to pull, pull back the, the, um, the most extreme impacts of climate change and to be able to reduce it, that, that we need to make that effort to do that this decade, this decade. Um, and so that's why we, we're seeing this huge push now um, for that to happen. So it's not too late. Um, some impacts will be irreversible. Even, for example, even if we stopped burning all fossil fuels um, and stopped all greenhouse gases entering the atmosphere right now, today, sea level rise will continue into the future, um, even for centuries. Mm -hmm. Sea level rise will continue because so much of the heat uh, that's been trapped in the atmosphere due to increased greenhouse gases is absorbed into the ocean and the ocean will slowly release that heat. So um, some impacts will be irreversible. We will see change no, no matter what we do mm. um, on climate change in this decade. Mm. Chloe, did you have a, another question that, that came up time and time again that you'd like to share? Well, the other big question was, was what is climate change and what causes climate change? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I mean, that's a very important um, question to ask and, and something that really increases your climate literacy, uh, if, if you mm. understand the answer to that. So we, we do have quite a few answers uh, from uh, climate scientists on our, on our website and also some answers around how, how climate scientists uh, actually find out about this kind of thing. So the answer to that question is that uh, climate change is caused by greenhouse gases. And what happens in the, uh, if, you, if you just had the earth without an atmosphere, it would be like a rock. We wouldn't be able to have any kind of life on earth. But what the atmosphere does is it creates a blanket around the earth. And the sun's rays can get in and then attract inside the blanket between the earth and the top of the atmosphere. And so we, we have greenhouse gases that, that help uh, to create that. But what we're doing is we're putting too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. By burning fossil fuels, ah. we're, we're changing the balance there. So we're, we're getting too much carbon dioxide that the Earth can't cope with. And so we stop, we, the sun's rays can come in, but they can't get out again. And that means that the whole of the, the Earth system is warming up. And the heat is going in, not just into the atmosphere, but into the oceans and onto land uh, and be, being soaked up. And that's creating a whole load of extra energy in the system, which creates then extreme weather events and lots of other knock-on effects. Oh, so I didn't mean to interrupt you then, Chloe. Sorry, it was just that as you were mm -hmm. talking about that, Ewan from Year 5 at Howard Primary actually asked, how do fossil fuels actually cause climate change? So that was a, a very timely um, question and answer that just came in from Ewan. Um, and I guess just to, to close off with one of the things that, or two things that I've been very interested in um, are packaging and what we can do to try to reduce packaging or to get uh, food manufacturers, for example, to try to come up with different ways to package up all the products that we buy um, in supermarkets. And if you live in Hobart or in the Hobart City Council area and you get takeaway food now, you'll see that the council has uh, banned plastic takeaway containers and everyone has to use recycled containers now, which is fantastic. So we don't see those little uh, soy sauce mm. fish mm. containers so much anymore. Um, and the other thing that, that I'm also interested in is the impact of um, the clothing industry, clothing and textiles and fast fashion, because of course that has had uh, a, that has a really detrimental impact on the planet as well. So I think if we think about the clothes that we wear um, and all of the products that mm. we buy as well, we can make some um, small steps there too, can't we? If we try and cut down on plastic packaging and those sorts That's of right. things. That's right. Was, was that was that some questions that came in from young people about? how they personally can sort of reduce that sort of impact? Definitely. There were questions about that and there were questions about plastic specifically. Mm. And I think just to, to finish off is that you know, everything is interconnected. 
our consumption, the way we live on the planet and the way our economies are set up to encourage us to consume and to want more all the time. Um, all those things are interconnected with the problems that we're seeing with the climate. Mm. Um, but we can all be the solution, you start to be some of the solution at least um, by by you know re reducing what we consume and our impact on, on the planet mm. um, and thinking about, you know, treading more lightly yes um, yes and and this sort of project is really so important because it's about being aware of the problem and then thinking and learning about ways that we can help and that we can get uh, governments and policymakers to help as well well Gabby and Chloe that's all we've got time for today thank you so much for coming on UCTV Alive for Kids it was wonderful thank you thank you so much and thank you to everyone who asked questions Yes, thanks. Well, everybody, I hope you really enjoyed today's episode. Certainly a lot to think about and so many things that you can do and that you and your school can do as well. Now, don't forget to visit our UCTV page on the Underwood Centre website where you can catch up on past episodes of Alive for Kids and you can also register for new episodes. That's all we've got time for this time. So we'll see you soon. Bye. Hello and welcome to UCTV Alive for Kids. I'm Louise Grimmer from the University of Tasmania and it's wonderful to have your company. I'm really excited about today's episode because it's all about gaming. Today on UCTV Alive for Kids, I'm really excited to welcome Associate Professor Christy DeSalis from the University of Tasmania. Hi, Hello. Christy. Hi, Lou. Thanks so much for coming on the program today. This is a really exciting topic because, of course, we're talking about gaming, which is your area of expertise. Absolutely it is. Now, you're an Associate Professor in, and I'm going to get this right, in ICT in the School of ICT, which stands for Information, Communication and Technology. Absolutely perfect, yes. Christy, how did you first become interested in gaming? That's such a, a long-winded story, but in short, um, I really am interested in people, strangely, um, and I'm interested in how people play, ah. and I'm interested in how play allows people to learn and how it allows them to improve their lives and make really, really positive changes. And so because I'm interested in those kinds of things, I found some, um, some great people to work with who actually do the development, so technical side of gaming as well. So we formed a team and uh, we started to create some games that are both entertaining and playful, but also make some really important changes to the world. This is a great topic and um, when my 10 year old son watches this episode, he is going to use this as a good reason why he should be allowed to gain even more at home. Absolutely. So let's, you've got a presentation for us. I do, let's take a look at that. Let's do the presentation and then once um, Christy's finished the presentation, we'll have our usual five minute break where you can think of some questions for Christy. So take it away, Christy. Wonderful, well thank you so much, Lou. And hi everybody, I'm so pleased to be here today. It's really lovely to spend some time with you. Um, so who am I? Um, as Lou said, I work at the university, but I also do a whole range of different kinds of things in the area of gaming. So um, I run a research group at the university and we do lots and lots of investigation and creation of games for a whole range of different kinds of purposes. Um, I also uh, am producer for a Hobart-based um, Tasmanian games development company and we're called Giant Margarita and we create lots of different games with Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo. Um, I'm also a member of what we call Enterprise Tasmania and in Enterprise Tasmania we get a whole lot of really fun and creative and exciting people together to create a whole range of different kinds of technologies and some of those are games as well. Um, and I'm on a whole range of different kinds of organisations where we all try to develop games together and build a, an exciting industry in Tasmania. So some of the pictures you see here, the top one here is me in Boston in the United States. Um, I get to travel all over the world and wear very strange and funny wigs and clothes <laughs> um, and meet thousands and thousands of other game developers. We showcase the things that we do right here from Hobart. 
um, and we get to play with some of the biggest organizations in the world who are really, really interested. And one of the most coolest thing about being in the area of games development is you don't actually have to live or work anywhere else than just in Hobart. You get to do all of these amazing things right here, but I get to travel a lot, which is really fun as well. The picture in the middle is one of me with uh, some of my research colleagues and as you can see they like to uh, strap me into wires and electrocute me and do <laughs> lots of strange poking and prodding to see how people's brains actually um, re respond to different parts of games. So we're not just interested in just the creation of it but we're interested in what it actually does and to and for people. So we do lots of really fun kind of science experiments along the way as well. And at the one at the, the bottom is um, some members of my team. Uh, and this is where we've actually created some games and actually put them out into the world. Um, people actually play them. There's something like 200,000 people in the world that are currently playing the games that we've created here in, in Tasmania. So there's so many cool and fun things to do in games. So. Let's have a look at who plays games. Lou, who do you think plays games? Everybody. Oh, what an amazing, amazing <laughs> answer. You're absolutely right. Um, this infographic here I think is a really fun thing to take a look at because some people think that gaming is just for uh, young boys um, and that girls aren't allowed to be included, old people aren't allowed to be included, parents aren't allowed to be included and that's actually not the case at all. We've got some amazing different kinds of games in different genres of games uh, that allow people to play together or play by themselves or play with their friends over the internet. There's many, many different ways to play games. So if we take a look at some of this picture, there's some really interesting and important information in here for us. So what we can see is that um, games can actually help people learn things as well. So a lot of games are actually uh, have some kind of education and many of you have probably played these as well. Whether it's a game to maybe help you read or maybe it's a game to help you learn some maths or maybe it's a game to kind of improve your mood when you might be feeling a little bit sad. So there's lots of different kinds of games that people play as well. Parents really love playing games because it gives them a space to kind of play with their kids. Um, and so lots of parents are really interested in gameplay as well. Uh, two out of three people actually play games in a, in, in a regular kind of way. Wow, that's, yeah. that's a pretty big statistic. It really it? is, isn't it? And it's not one we would expect. No. But if you think about the way we play games, we can play games on our phone, we can play mm. games on our home computer, we can play ca games on our tablet, we can play games in the console in our lounge room, we can play sports games, we can play racing games, we can play arcade games. Games are really everywhere nowadays and you don't just have to be sitting in a room by yourself to engage in those and that's how so many people are now starting to play games. So the really important thing to understand here is games aren't just what they used to be thought of as just kind of sitting by yourself in a dark room playing a game. They're really social. They're really good for you in many, many ways. They develop some really great brain skills and physical skills and strategy skills and figuring or figuring out problem skills. So there's heaps and heaps of things you can actually do in gaming. So I just wanted to, to put this out there to keep you in mind about what gaming could mean for you. It doesn't have to mean the same for everybody, but there's definitely a place for you in terms of gaming. As we can see, as I just said, it's for old people and we see lots and lots of gaming in aged care facilities because it allows people to, to maintain physical movement. Uh, and that's really good for muscles and strength and memory and those kinds of things. We also see games being played by families. It's really great for, for building connection and support and, and trust and care between members of a family group. And similarly, we also see it in schools. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the games that uh, we have created and how they can actually do more than just allow you to have a little bit of fun. Of course they do that, that's what they're designed to do, but they can do a little bit more than that as well. So, can they be for more than just fun or play? Of course they can. Um, this is just a, a bit of a, a bit of a table that kind of shows the different kinds of areas that games can play a part in. You don't have to worry too much about that. I'm just gonna show you a bit more of a fun example. So, Lou, <laughs> Here's our first quiz for you. 
Can you take a look at this and tell me what you think this game is actually trying to teach people or help people with? So what we can oh. see is a lovely little female character and she's wandering around this environment. She's following a path. Uh, she started in a really open, sunny environment. Now the, the, uh, the weather has changed and things are getting a little bit more difficult. And she's wandering around. She's collecting items. She seems to be on a bit of a, uh, of a quest. What do you think this is about, Lou? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, is it about trying to, well, she's trying to collect things, yep. um, moving through different environments. Um, is it about spatial aware? I, I'm not, I don't know. That's perfectly fine <laughs> not to know. Now, the reason you don't know is because this is designed to do something that you don't have to think too much about. And it's what we would call a game for change or a serious game. Now, what we've got here is this just looks like a game. It just looks like something that might be familiar to, to many of you. You have some quests, you have some things to achieve, you have some things to collect. But the question is, why are you doing that? Now, what you can't see at the moment is this is connected to houses. People's oh. energy use feeds into this game. So you know that when you go home, you have a fridge, you have lights, you have an air conditioner, you have a dishwasher, and we wander around our houses and sometimes we leave those kinds of things on. And all of those things are using power or energy. Now, which takes a lot of energy, a lot of time and a lot of cost and obviously, in the environment that we find ourselves in the world today, we want to reserve those kinds of resources and use them as the best we can. So there's a really big global push across the whole world for people to reduce their energy. Now, what we've found is just telling people that they should doesn't actually make them do anything at all. So what we've done is we've created a game that allows them to be benefited or to have some kind of advantage from turning lights off. So what happens in this game is you get a set of resources, things you can do, quests you can go on, but you can only achieve those quests by reducing the amount of energy that is being fed from your house. Wow. <laughs> it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yes. So you're all probably familiar with your energy boxes um, outside your houses. Those are connected and we can get information from those through the internet and we can find out if they're going up or they're going down. If while somebody's playing this game, their household energy is going down, they get better resources. They can do things funner and faster and they get more of things. And so this is just an interesting way for kids in a house who don't necessarily have a lot of opportunity to decide, should we buy this fridge or should we buy this dishwasher? Mm -hmm. But they can go, you know what, let's turn off that light. And that allows them to play, but it also does amazing things for the world. That is brilliant. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I reckon my son's gonna get right onto that. Pretty cool. <laughs> so this is an example of what I was calling a game for change or a serious game. It's fun, it's playful, it looks fun. You could just spend time in it, just like you would with any other game. But what it also does is does some really cool things for the world. Let's have a look at another one. That's my explanation of it, which I just talked through. Let's move on. <laughs> Here's another one. Now what we see here, this is an underwater scene and somebody is going up to that underwater scene and actually interacting with it. They're influencing it. The fish are moving, the water bubbles are exploding. Lou, what do you think's going on here? What's this for? Um, <laughs> gee, I'm really on the spot today, aren't I? Um, again, I'm not sure. Um, it would be fun to be able to touch that screen and have what your finger is doing make some bubbles and things yep. but aside from that I really don't know well it's meant to be fun that's exactly what it's designed to do it's meant to be fun it's meant to to um, engage people in coming up to it to moving around and to interact now who might benefit from that well if you've ever broken something or you've ever hurt yourself and you need to do some exercise or rehabilitation, that's actually mm. what's happening here. Ah. 
So this was designed with some amazing colleagues we have in hospitals oh. who help people who have had some stroke issues, so some, some problems with their brain that makes their arms and legs and body move a lot more slowly or make it a little bit more difficult to move. And what those people need is lots and lots of exercise and repetition and movement. So if you've hurt yourself and you have to do exercise or you have to stretch, sometimes that's a little boring and it's a little painful and it's not really something that you're super interested in doing. However, if we have this really, really big fun wall that has fish in it, that you can go up to and actually feed the fish, you can clean the tank, you can watch the the animals have tiny little sea fish babies um, and you can play around with them. What that actually means is you're physically getting up, so you're standing up, you're standing in front of something and to physically move, you're moving your arms and you're moving mm. your hands and you're moving your body in different ways because that's what you need to do to interact with the game. So what we found this to be really great for is people who need to do those kind of repetitive, ongoing, not very interesting movements. But what they're doing is if you're cleaning a tank, you're actually doing physical movement. And if you're feeding the fish, you're doing a physical movement and you're standing at the same time. So once again, this just looks like a nice thing to stand in front of and have some playfulness with. Mm. But what it does is it physically helps people recover. And that's a really, really cool thing to do as that well. That is brilliant. Isn't it fun? Yes, that's Isn't it fun? really great. Yeah. yeah. The ones at the bottom are similar kinds of things. So these are for people who have had much more physical damage and can only do basic things with maybe just one high hand. And so what we've got is things for them to do with those hands that aren't just move to the left, move to the right, move to the left, move to the right. But what they are is let's uncover an interesting kind of picture here. Or maybe I'll click on something and in the left and then I can color something in on the right. So I'm actually having some playfulness, but I'm still doing those kind of movements as well. So once again, games can be really, really useful for helping people get better. It's really fun. It's great. Let's take a look at another one. This is another one. Now, many of you have seen these kinds of games, kind of simulation or sim games, um, where you travel around the world and you build kind of things and you get coins and you can build new buildings or new communities and create them however you want them to be. Any ideas, Lou, what this one could be for? Okay, so I've just remembered that a game that I used to be addicted to was Heyday. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar, I think it's a similar sort of game as this. Okay. I did spend quite a lot of time and um, effort on that game. Um, and it, so this one is, well, I think it's about um, building, building up cities or, um, and you get points when you do it. And it's fun. Um, and addictive, yep. but I'm guessing you're going to share with us that it's got a higher purpose than oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah, it sure does. Yep. It is. It is one of those games that yep. does those things. You're allowed to collect things, and when you get more resources, you're allowed to build things, and yep. you can create a, a, a world yep. of, your, of your very own. That's really similar to, to many games, but the secret here <laughs> is this helps you stop smoking. Seriously? Seriously. Kids, do not smoke. <laughs> really important message there. But if... Anybody that you know does, <laughs> or any of your parents do, uh, this might help them. So um, the governments all over the world, also the Australian government, spend so much money trying mm. to stop people smoking because mm. we know it's really, really bad for you. It's bad for you, it's bad for the people around you, um, and it's really great if we can stop people doing that. And they've spent so many years just, again, telling people you should stop smoking. Uh, but if people have an addiction or have a reason that they're smoking, it's really hard just to stop. And so what we're trying to do is encourage them to do that. So similarly, the government has a whole range of information about if you did these things that would help you not smoke. But people don't want to read that. People don't just want to go onto a website. So what this does, this is linked to working through all of that really important medical information. So if people can work through the information that the government is presenting and do some of the activities, they get more resources in that game. They can play, they can build bigger cities, they can take over different areas. They get more points, they get more 
people within their community. So once again, this is just an extension of something that already exists, but it's a playful part to that. If you want to do better in this game, you want to spend longer in it, you want to create a better environment bigger than somebody else's, you actually have to do some of the smoking cessation tasks as well. So uh, learning about you know, maybe some of the health benefits or how you could actually save some money mm. uh, by not smoking. This actually allows you to be a little bit playful in exploring those kind of really important issues as well. Doesn't wow. look like no, it. No, it doesn't. There you go. <laughs> it looks like your sort of standard, um, yeah. Absolutely. Points building game. Yeah, wow, that's but great. it's important what's behind these kind yes. of stuff that makes it make these really cool. Just got a couple of different pictures here of different kinds of things we've also created. So uh, a lot of people go to the gym uh, and a lot of people love going to the gym. It's really exciting and important for them. But sometimes, like me, if you go to the gym, it's not very interesting. It's something you kind of think, oh, I have to do or it's too cold or I don't really want to. Um, and so what we're trying to do is make the gym a little bit more fun as well. So in these pictures, what you can see is rather than just going to a gym and working on a rowing machine like this kind of thing, what we've done is actually put a gamified paddle on it. So uh, it's one of those Wii remotes for anybody oh, who's seen to. a Wii. There's a paddle there. Exactly. I didn't see it's that. A real yeah. paddle. So yeah. rather than just doing this, yeah. what you do is you have a real paddle. It's gamified, so it picks up all of your strokes and it connects to what they can see in front of them, which is a video projection of an actual game. So rather than just paddling, you're actually playing a game while oh, you're doing it. And sure. similarly, the other picture is where we're doing the same kind of thing, but in a bicycle setting. So rather than just, you know, pedaling away on a bike in a gym or at home even, mm. you can actually just put this screen in front of you with a game. And so what we've found from our research is just putting the playfulness into this process means that people work out harder mm. and work out for longer because mm. they're not thinking about, gosh, this is boring or gosh, this hurts or I don't like it. They're going, oh, I need to get to the next <laughs> level or, oh, I missed something. I have to go back for it. So again, lots of fun ways that you can use games and build games that help people improve something that they want to improve about themselves. That's great. It's very cool. Um, lots of other ones here. So we have game-based quizzes. So this is one we have at the University of Tasmania where um, we're helping people learn about parts of the body. So this is great for people who need to learn about nursing or medicine and where all, all our inside bits are and what we should call them and, and when we should and shouldn't poke them. Um, <laughs> this actually just allows them to be a little bit more playful about that kind of learning. And the ones at the bottom are some great work done by at the university in the area of pharmacy. Um, they have identified that rather than putting people in pharmacies to learn about how to do that, you know, a safe and comfortable place is actually in a game. Mm -hmm. And so we can simulate lots of different kinds of working environments and the kinds of interactions people might have. And it allows them to practice and learn without having to do it in a potentially, you know, unsafe mm. um environment. So lots of really cool, fun things here, Lou. I wanted yes. to just show you because most people think games are just the things that you sit in front of by yourself, which they are, and they are fun and they do really great things for you, but they can be so much more. Yes, um, I had no idea. It's pretty cool. And this is the area that myself and my team get to work in every day. We get to do the fun stuff with, you know, Nintendo and, and Microsoft and, and lots of people do play with their friends. But in addition to just being playful, they can be really helpful. And that's a really cool thing that we do. That's amazing. Um, I think we should go for our five minute break, everybody. <gasps> um, now that you've seen some of these brilliant things that, um, that Christy and her team are working on, have a think about some questions that you've got for Christy and we will see you in five minutes. Oh, and before we do that, I should just say, don't forget to put your uh, name and your grade and your school, if you can, on your um, chat and then I can read it out and that's always fun. See you in five minutes. Hi everyone, welcome back. We've got a few questions here for Christy. I'm going to start off with the first one. Um, Christy. Yes. Can you play, this is a big question, can you play too many games? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Of course, everything in life you need balance. So we don't want you to just do nothing but play games. You've got friends, you've got family, you've got the world out there you should be exploring and doing really cool things. But a lot of people think games are bad for you and they're actually not. 
Mm. Um, it's really important to understand that games can do some really good things for you. But of course, if you spend too much time on anything, mm. uh, that's kind of a bad thing. So balance with games and anything else is, uh, is, is okay. I think, as you said, everything in moderation. Yeah. Here's another one. Um, what are some, are there some online tools that young people can access on the internet to start thinking about coding or what goes on behind yeah. games? Because when we see the games, they look so fantastic, don't they? But that's not actually, you know, what you work on when you're coding a game, is it? It's, it's, it, the screens don't look like that yeah. when you're putting that all together. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some things online that... Heaps and heaps mm. of different resources. And it's so amazing the opportunities that anybody at any place at any age can actually use. So all you need to do is basically do a Google search for uh, game development tools. There's some really, really good ones. So Scratch is a really great example. Yeah. Um, Scratch is a really easy to learn kind of process where you just drag and drop parts of what you'd like a game to be about and it kind of creates it for you. Mm -hmm. But you're right Lou, it takes a little bit of time to go from starting to the actual process of there's the game and doesn't look, look amazing. There's many, many, many steps but um, it's just a process. It's just one step in, in after another and then you can create some amazing things over a bit of time. That leads me on to a question from me. Yes. Um, my son watches a lot of people playing games. Yes. So he's not, he plays games himself, but he spends an inordinate amount of time watching other people play games. Why do we derive such pleasure from watching other people play games? There's a, a site. Is, there's a, an app. Is it twi Twitch? Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us about. Yeah. Tell us about that and why people like watching other people play games. We get excited by watching people achieve things or having some experiences that we don't necessarily have the capacity to have or the time to have ourselves. So just think about it. If you go and watch um, somebody play sport and you're really excited when somebody wins or you watch the Olympics on TV and an amazing person has just won some swimming, you're really excited for those people because they're achieving something they're having a good time and it's kind of infectious. And in our brain, we have these little things called mirror neurons, which basically means we can mirror or reflect what somebody else is experiencing. And that's exactly the same kind of things we see on streaming services like Twitch, where somebody could be playing a game and actually experiencing something, but somebody else watching is getting some um, reflected enjoyment from that process as well. And so lots of these streaming platforms are simply available for, for anybody, you, me, anybody, to play our game and for somebody to be able to relate to the experience that we're having. They may not be able to have that same game or be able to play at that same level or have the time to even play themselves. And what they can do is kind of get their own level of enjoyment just by watching other people play. It's a very, very common human kind of interaction we have. And we're just seeing now in gaming, it becoming more prominent, prominent because we have those kind of new interesting streaming services that we haven't really had. But if you think about it, it's not really any different than watching, you know, a sporting match. I didn't even equate the two, but now I yeah, do. Of course, we watch people play tennis. We watch people yeah. play football. Same thing. We're not playing it at the time. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Is there a world series of gaming? There is eSports. Ah. Um, and eSports is uh, a really, really fantastic competitive approach to gaming. Um, it's really important to understand that not everybody likes competition, though. I'm not really a very competitive person, so I love playing cooperative games with my friends. We all get together. We all achieve uh. something. We all um, win in the end. But some people really like to be competitive, again, just like sports. Um, and so sometimes we actually have some competitions for people who want to compete against each other in some really, really fun and interesting kinds of game ways. So eSports is a massive industry that's uh, really starting to get developed across the world and you can actually be a competitive gamer. Oh, don't tell my son that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't mind if he was a competitive gamer. Here's a question uh, and from an anonymous um, poster. What kinds of games do you guys make? So perhaps thinking about Giant Margarita, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. so we um, make games that are called um, ca uh, party couch games. It's a particular kind of genre, but what it means is if you can imagine you have four friends 
and you all go over to one of their houses and you're all sitting there on the couch and there is one screen in front of you but you all have four controllers and you're all sort of playing against each other and you're doing fun sort of competitive kinds of things so that's what the the kind of games we create one of the biggest ones we have out there is called party golf and it's a party game in so much as you're kind of having a bit of a yelling and screaming match at each other but it's a really fun playful um way with just lots of silliness and strange bananas shapes and explosions and things happening um, so our the, the kinds of games we like to create bring people together with just some silliness and lots of playfulness and lots of color and lots of movement um, and so there's lots of kind of games so one is party golf another one is party poppers that we're about to release another one's party crashes we can sort of crash but it, again the same kind of thing is it's about getting people together in the same room. You can do this, these kinds of games online, but we really want people to spend a little bit of time socially together because we think that's a really important part of gaming as well. The comment that's just come in from the poster is, wow, that sounds so fun. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, they're fun. How, how, do you, how do you access those games? Lots of different ways. Um, so for anybody who's interested in gaming and where you can get them, we have them available in most places. So you can actually download copies of them through Steam for oh, your PC. Yep. You can actually get them for your console. So we have them on the Nintendo Switch. Um, the Xbox from Microsoft and wow. we also have them on the Sony PlayStation 4 and 5. So most places where you can get games, you can actually get copies of the games made right here in Hobart. And there's heaps of studios in Hobart, That's which is really cool, and Launceston. So we're developing this industry in Tasmania, so it's not just us, there's lots of companies um, across the state who are creating cool games that are actually available on the real live big consoles. And you can go and buy them and just play them. That's why I wanted to ask you, you must have been so excited when your game is available on Nintendo it or on... It blew our minds. We were the first team in Tasmania to oh. produce anything on any of those consoles ever. Um, and it was a little team of, you know, three to five people wow. in Hobart. And that had never been done before. And we just did it to see whether we could. And you can. So you can just live here work with your friends, play with your friends and create stuff that goes all over the world. It's and, pretty cool. And how did you how did you get the big companies to find out about your game? So that first picture I showed you of me going to different oh. kinds of expos over the world, oh. that's where they go. Right. Uh, and they're always on the lookout. So we did a whole lot of pre-work to kind of get them to notice us. So when we were able to go to those big expos, they already heard about the work that we'd done. We'd, we'd created a small demo or a prototype and, and provided it to them. And then they just sat around for three days and kind of watched how people played our prototype game and went, oh yeah, I think people seem to be really liking that. It's bringing people in, it's doing what you want. Now let's see how we can help you go further. That's really exciting. So I, I forgot about that. You know, back when we could fly, there were all those sort of trade shows yeah. or, or whatever they're, they're called in your yeah. field yeah. Um, where um, developers are walking around looking at you would have had a, a stall. We sure did. Or a stall, whatever yeah. it's called. Yeah. yeah. And you would have set up and had people playing the games and then talking to the, the big companies exactly about what your what game happened. was. Exactly How what super exciting. And it was, it was really cool because uh, they came in secret. Oh, so they you didn't to... know. Of we were course. hoping they would be there, but of course we would never know. And this this lovely gentleman from Sony, <laughs> uh, hi Spencer, if you're out there in the world, um, just came and watched and just saw people, and then kind of went, oh. "How can we help you?" And we nearly that had a, is we had a bit of a cry. We were very excited. I, I would have had a big cry. That's sort of like a mystery shopper. I guess you wouldn't really want to was. if you're from Sony. You wouldn't want to walk around in a suit and tie advertising yeah, that you're from Sony. You'd want to just look like a yeah. a gamer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really it's, that's it was great a story. fun experience. Um, now I have got a question that's come up here that says, is there any benefit in playing shooters? Now, I'm assuming yeah. that they're yeah. talking about shooting games. Yeah, 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 3D shooting games. Um, absolutely there are. Um, any kind of game allows your brain to engage in particular activities. So for example, in a shooting game, what you're trying to do is build a strategy about how to survive. Uh, and so it's not just sort of mindless blowing everything up, it's you need to survive, you have a, have a quest or a task to complete, you have to be very clear in your brain about how to do that. And you're often not doing it just by yourself. You have a crew with you. Mm. So you have to collaborate and you have to work as a team and you have to figure things out together. And so there's a social aspect 
there's a cognitive or brain thinking kind of aspect and there's a motor or physical movement kind of aspect because you actually have to be really physically moving um, mm. while you're doing kinds of things and you have to have really good response times as well. So I know we always hear that there are different kinds of games that you probably shouldn't be playing. Let me put this straight for you right now. There is absolutely no evidence that playing games is bad for you or makes you behave in any negative way whatsoever. It is not games that do that. Mm. But there are many positive things physically, mentally, socially that come when you play shooter games or any other kind of game. Mm. Thank you for for sharing that with us. <laughs> that was a wonderful question. That was Thank a good you. question. Um, Christy, if yes. um, people who are watching today, young people watching, um, if they're thinking about that they might want to get into gaming or to doing what you're doing, what sort of subjects do you need to be thinking about when, as you move through school? What, what are the sort of things? I mean, maths is, I guess, one, but surely there are other things oh, too. Oh, so many others. I think the really important message here is gaming is not just about programming. It's just not a coding thing. If you look at a game, even ones that you play or some of we've looked at today, they obviously have some coding to get things to move in a particular way, yep. but they have a massive amount of art. So if you oh, are a graphical kind of, of person who loves art, there is a place for gaming for you because we need people to create the art. Um, most games have a soundtrack or they have audio or they have um, sound throughout the game, which means we need people who love music. Uh, we need people who know how to manage the process of a game. So people who are interested in management or processes have a role to play in gaming as well. We have people who um, we need to make sure that things work. So we need to make sure this works the same. So people who are really interested in things like testing, there's a place for you in gaming as well. Um, and of course, the technical development that underpins most of that as well. So of course, we need programmers as well. So there is no one set mm. of skills that we need. We need everybody. Um, we can only ever be one part of this game making puzzle. That's why our team have developers and designers and musicians and producers None of us do the same thing at all. Oh. So a, ga a great game development company is really diverse, really inclusive, understands that many people have many, many different ideas and it's only when you put those together do you get an amazing kind of output. So there is no subject. It's about <laughs> following your passion, doing the best you can in that and no doubt there will be a place in gaming for you. That's a really good answer because I think a lot of people just do tend to think, oh, well, you've got to be really good at maths. Nope. And then you go to university and you do computing. Nope. And you've just talked about all yeah, of the you can other be anything. skills. You can be anything. Yes, I was just thinking of project managers. You need, As you mentioned, yeah. you need someone to actually keep the team together and keep them on task. And, Absolutely. And, all and then those. you need people like you to market our games That's as well. That's it. You need marketers. That's it. Exactly. I, I could be involved as well. You sure can, Lou. Um, and my last question just before we end for today um, I guess this is sort of a two-part question do you know of any sort of groups of, of uh, kids who've put together some games or, or what sort of age can you start to oh think about gosh. you don't have to wait till you're our age not do at you? All, not at all there's this amazing thing that's um, called the Australian uh, video game I can't remember exactly the name but it's something like video game competition just oh have a look for it it's those kinds of words um, but it's really amazing because, oh, STEM video game competition. I'm getting closer. I think that's what it is. Um, lots and lots of schools actually support these kinds of activities. And so what they do is lots of schools get groups of people who are interested in this kind of thing to create a game and they submit those games as part of a competition that happen across the whole of Australia. Um, and so any kind of school can enter, any kind of class can enter. You just need a couple of people who are interested and that ranges from small, uh, groups of quite young people to larger groups of, of more sort of older level students but anywhere uh, and anyone in those kind of age wow. groups can start just by having a bit of a play um, and there are really great support services out there oh. not support services but support kind of resources to, to get you started just ask your teacher um, ask people like me 
Uh, in Tasmania, we have the Tasmanian Game Makers. Um, there's buckets of us around who are interested in different parts of gaming as well. So you can always come and ask. Oh, that's awesome. That's that. I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> We've had one question coming really quickly. We've got about 30 seconds. Do you have any upcoming game jams? Yes, we do. Um, we are just <laughs> at the question. moment organising one um, for the Tasmanian Game Makers. So you can actually get access to us through Facebook or Discord. Just look up Tasmanian Game Makers. And we're just about to announce a Taz Jam um, in early uh, December. And that's a place that you can come and actually just play or meet people mm -hmm. or create your own things or figure out how your skills, what you're amazed by can actually be part of a game so oh. absolutely keep an eye out for those oh good that was a great question perfect well christy thank you so much for coming in today You're I, most welcome. i've learned a lot as usual on good. this program and i hope you've all learned a lot too what a wonderful presentation thank you christy uh, it'd Thanks. be great if you could come back again i yeah. think um now we have got our next episode is coming up in two weeks time but it's going to be on a tuesday instead of on a wednesday um so you can keep an eye on our underwood website where you can also catch up on all of our past episodes but we're going to um welcome to the program vishnu pralad from he's from geography at the university of tasmania and his area is um, around waterways and rivers so he's going to give us a presentation on that topic um, so we'll look forward to seeing you in just under two weeks time but that's all we've got time for today Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Hello and welcome to UCTV Alive for Kids. It's great to have your company. I'm Dr. Louise Grimmer from the University of Tasmania and today on the show I'm joined by Dr. Vishnu Pralad from the University of Tasmania. Vishnu is a lecturer in physical geography. Vishnu, welcome to the show. It's great to have you today. Wonderful to be here, Louise. Really looking forward to your presentation. Today, Vishnu, you're going to tell us all about wetlands. What makes a wetland a wetland? what lives in them, what do they get up to, why does any of this matter, and importantly, to what question is wetland the answer? Now before I hand over to Vishnu for his presentation, just a reminder that we'll have our usual five minute break at the end of the presentation for you to post your questions onto the chat function. And if you can put your first name, your grade and your school, that would be wonderful. We always love to uh, find out where you are coming in, tuning in from. And we'll finish today's program at 10 o'clock. So Vishnu, I'm going to hand over to you for your presentation on wetlands. Thank you, Louise. Wonderful to be here. I'll start off uh, by um, pointing to the duck there, and uh, that is the shell duck, or sometimes called as the mountain duck. It is the largest duck we have in Tasmania. I love ducks, and I don't know about you guys, but ducks are so wonderful. They are the most adorable creatures, and that's part of the reason why I got interested in wetlands. Uh, because I love ducks, and when I got more involved in wetlands, I found out lots of other wonderful things. Uh, that I grew passionate about, and I'll, I'll talk more about them as we go. Um, so today I wanted, wanted to frame my talk on um, the question of to what question is wetland the answer? I'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, so I want to structure it by looking at what makes a wetland a wetland, what lives in them, what do they get up to, and why does any of this matter? Uh, so first up, a simple principle is that wetlands have hydric soils. Uh, so a lot of this is determined by what we cannot see, which is under the ground. If you've done any gardening, you know there's lots of things in the soil that we need to look after. Uh, in the context of wetlands, hydric soils are what make wetlands wetlands. Uh, why are they hydric? Because there's a lot of water in there and because you have water, it pushes out the air so in non-wetland environments you have a lot of air in the soil so it's called aerobic soils but in wetlands because you have water that displaces the air you have anaerobic soils which is otherwise called as hydric soils because you have this special soil in wetlands 
um, you have also special plants which is the wetland plants there so two things to note uh, you have wet soils and wetland plants and that is your definition of a wetland um, so I've spoken to a lot of wetland ecologists and their key key point to note in terms of wetlands is that you just have to keep at, keep adding water right so uh, water falls everywhere on your house on, on in forests and so on uh, but probably it sort of rolls off and then it's dry for a long period but in a wetland environment you just keep adding water enough water to make the soil hydric and then to attract wetland plants to uh, develop there uh, so what kind of water we can add fresh water or you can add seawater and there's a lot of seawater wetlands which I'll which I'll talk about or you can have a bit of a bit of a mix and when you have a bit of a mix which is fresh and seawater then we call it brackish water uh, and that's uh, that's an interesting type of water which is not entirely fresh but also not entirely salty all right um, so where are the wetlands in Tasmania? So if you've got a map like this in your school or, or your house, you look at it and, um, and you see a lot of mountains, you see a lot of forests, and you ask the question, where exactly are the wetlands? Um, and to that, I can say that they are all over the place. And uh, this, is a, this is a map we put together uh, only of the, of the mapped wetlands. And there's a lot of wetlands which we haven't mapped because we haven't been there or if we've been there we hadn't been collecting data to bring back and then put it back into the system okay um, so why are these wetlands just to remind you uh, because they've got hydric soils and wetland plants right uh, because we can't see soils all the time when we go out to do the mapping we are only looking for plants uh, when we observe the plants, the right type of plants, we know that there are hydric soils sitting beneath the plants. So using pl plants as proxies or cues, we are able to identify all of these areas as wetlands as opposed to forests or grasslands or other environments. The bottom line here is that in the context of Tasmania, we do have a lot of wetlands, more wetlands per capita, than any other state or territory in Australia. So we're spoiled for it. Um, so to put a number on it, the bottom line is that we've got five to 10% of Tasmania as wetlands. This is also roughly the global average uh, in terms of the global land mass, about 5% of them are wetlands. Right, as is another way of imagining where exactly wetlands are uh, around our environment, so this is where we are around the Devon Estuary. if you are in Hobart and surrounds. Um, so you can see the Devon Estuary is itself a large wetland um, right in the middle there. Uh, but also you have all sorts of rivers and, and creeks flowing into the estuary and they are, they are wetlands too. Uh, but also you have seagrasses that are the green, green uh, patches around, around the environment there. So all of these are wetlands, right? As so the water is not captured here, and you will notice this when you go out uh, walking around the coast in summer is that we've got a lot of micro wetlands uh, so if you go you know looking for rock pools or walking along shoreline uh, that's an example of a micro wetland there near Calvert's Beach uh, it's just a you know like a size of a small bucket uh, but just enough soil there uh, so the plants are able to survive and just enough sea spray coming in uh, to keep adding water. Remember adding water? In this case, seawater. So you have a micro wetland. So look out for them when you go out and keep in mind that some of these micro wetlands you see have never been mapped. Right? So maybe we can start a citizen science initiative um, that you can contribute to to map all these micro wetlands and the plants and the critters that live in them. Right? Um, so just on this, uh, there's another example of wetlands uh, that we need to remember that are not really mapped but are still wonderful and these are backyard wetlands. So we'll come back to this uh, later in question time as another thing for you guys to do over summer uh, to see if you can make yourself a nice backyard wetland. Uh, I've got a couple at home and I can talk to you more about how can you, you, can, you can make your own backyard wetland. Then there's a lot of these around the place and they're not necessarily mapped. Um, so what I wanted to do today was to start off by defining wetlands and give you a sense of where you can find them in the environment. Okay. 
So now I want to give you some examples of uh, the wetlands that we find in Tasmania. So here is an example of what you call a freshwater wetland. Uh, this is right behind Wineglass Bay Beach and most of you pro probably have likely been to Wineglass Bay Beach. Um, I, I've been there a few times and uh, you go there, it's, it's, nice, it's a nice enough beach, you look at it for five minutes, it's rather pretty and then you get a bit bored. What are you going to do? Um, and and uh, what I tend to do is to go and look for the wetlands behind the beach. And here it is, Hazards Lagoon, which is a wonderful, remarkable environment. Mm -hmm. And you don't have all the crowds and, and, and so on. It's just, you're just by yourself and the beautiful plants uh, and the lovely environment there. So just remember I mentioned adding water. So where does the water come from here, uh, come, come into the Hazards Lagoon here? Uh, is um, the neighboring um, upland environment. So the water is falling there and it's all pooling into the Hazards Lagoon, right? And as it does that, you have the hydric soil and you have the wetland plants. So what are the wetland plants here? I'm, not, I'm, got, I'm going to make a few references to plants. Uh, you can make a note of them and some of these you can actually put in your, in your backyard wetlands if you do um, take that project up. Um, so water ribbons and they are a classic wetland plant. You'll see them all across the place and they're a good indicator that the water is fresh. If you see water ribbons, it's invariably a freshwater wetland, right? Uh, you can also see rushes like Baumia and China plectus and some wonderful little birds like the swallow uh, sitting on the water ribbon. Um, we have marsupial lawns in Tasmania if you go camping, like for instance in Narontapu National Park, uh, up near Launceston, um, you see this wonderful grassland, right? Um, so there are some lovely wetland uh, plants here, uh, prickfoot. If you do walk around this lawn barefoot, um, you will know why it's called prickfoot. <laughs> uh, it's actually a really nice environment. You know, I, I really love interacting with nature barefoot. Um, and uh, and you, you, know, you get pricked and then you look down and there's this prickly plant which is called prickfoot. Um, and then you've got these other wonderful little plants, ciliara, isolepis. Think of these as bonsai, right? And, and um, you know, stop, kneel down, you know, lie down if you like and look at them close and there's these wonderful bonsai environments um, around, around these, these um, what, what are called as marsupial lawns. Why are they called marsupial lawns? Uh, because there's a lot of marsupials there and hundreds of them and they're chewing at the grass all the time and, and they're maintaining that lawn uh, by the process of grazing and, and chewing on them. Uh, you have uh, wallabies, kangaroos and then the wonderful wombats, right? So the first time I went to Narwantapu National Park, you know, there were hundreds of them. And, and right now they're suffering from a disease, unfortunately, so hopefully they'll bounce back uh, to their glorious uh, populations that were there uh, not, not so long ago. Um, there's also plants uh, in the water, uh, not just above the water. So in the water, you'll see pondweed and milfoil, and these are some really good plants to put in your backyard wetlands too. And they like it wet, they want to be submerged, uh, and they provide really good structure um, and habitat uh, if you like for tadpoles and, and, and insects and so on. Right, uh, so the third example of the wetlands that we have widespread around Tasmania is what is called as tidal freshwater wetland. Um, these are freshwater wetlands, they're really fresh, but what's happening here is that the tides come in and out twice a day, right? So the tides coming in and the seawater is really heavy and it's pushing this, the freshwater up twice a day and as the fresh water is being pushed up it floods these areas and creates what is called as tidal freshwater wetlands. Interesting isn't it? So what are some of the plants here? Um, there's Phragmites, Typha uh, and these are all what is called emergent. Emergent because we can see them they're above uh, the surface. Uh, there's also floating wetland plants. Um, uh, again these are some good plants to have in our backyard um, wetlands. Uh, there's Ondufia, um, which is a very common wetland plant. It's a beautiful uh, yellow flower as well. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, below the water, you have these submerged aquatic beds. And if you've driven past the Bridgewater Bridge and you've seen those hundreds of water birds floating around 
and often they've got their head in the water and that's what they're doing they're feeding off on the grass and the insects around around the grasses as well so the next time you see um, a, a swan or a duck with its head under the water you know what they're up to right and I've had the privilege of walking around this environment. It's it's a, it's it's wonderful in there, and uh, and I had the one of the greatest surprises of my life when I was walking around uh, wetlands this high, and I opened, uh, and then what what did I see? I saw a swan nest. Look at that! And I looked at that, and I thought. Surely dinosaurs are exist, extinct, <laughs> but you know that that's what it looks like, right? Like a dinosaur uh, nest and egg. How but, big was the egg, Vishnu? Uh, it was quite big. big. Yeah, it was um, this big. Oh wow! Um, and uh, I've, I've been told that the Aboriginal people harvest them as protein, uh, and they still do around some parts of um, Australia and Tasmania. And how big was the nest? Oh, the nest was uh, really, <laughs> really large wow. and, and uh, um, at least a meter and a half tall. Oh, so, that would have been quite an amazing yeah. thing to see. And you can, you can sort of understand why they're doing it, because they want to keep it above the water level. Of course. Uh, yes. and, uh, and away from the predators and, and so on. Uh, it's, it's a marvel at engineering. And uh, I've, <laughs> I've, I've got a lot, lot more respect for swans after I've, I've seen that. Uh, just remarkable birds. And this is a close-up. Um, off the nest with one egg. I respectfully took those photos and, and left and the left. nest. <laughs> um, and um, just to keep on the theme of the different types of wetlands, here's another one. I mentioned brackish and here's an example of that. Uh, again, the plants are a giveaway, right? So this is why it's, it's nice to know your plants. Then you can see the plants and it tells you what's happening in the soil, what's happening with rainfall and, and the tides and so on. Um, so what, what, what are the main um, uh, characters here? There's junkers, or also called as sea rush, because it's a sort of salty environment and it's a rush. Uh, you, you have other small pretty plants like uh, monkey flower. Again, if you're making note of backyard pond plants, monkey flower is a good one, also available in nurseries. There's cochula, uh, water buttons, uh, another pretty one. Um, and then as you come further along the coast, to our really coastal environments, heavily influenced by the sea, then you get into salt marsh, right? So this is a, a, a typical salt marsh around uh, Lauderdale in the Devon Estuary, uh, where you have these lawns. An interesting thing to note here is that a lot of these plants are edible, right? Um, when Abel Tasman came across and looked around Tasmania, uh, a part of his notes uh, was saying as you as he went into this environment uh, he saw all these edible plants so he recognized all those years ago that this was an edible landscape and he harvested these herbs which uh, they ate as part of their diet you can still eat them but you've got to be aware of the contaminants that might be uh, so you want to harvest them from areas that are sustainable but also pollution free um, and the interesting thing about some of these plants is I mentioned bonsai, and that's a, that's a, that's an interesting thing about wetlands is that all yeah yes they're not as big and magnificent as forests, but you've got to recognize them for their own sort of um, characteristics. So in this case um, we've got the shrub. Um, that shrub can be six meters wide up to you know a meter and a half, two meters tall, and you go in them, go into them, and they are. A, a remarkable bonsai tree and sometimes we get them as bonsai shrubland or, or forests uh, that are old growth. A lot of these shrubs are about 150-200 years old and we're working out how old they might be, potentially 400 years. So here, here we are, you know, we talk about old growth forests but we have old growth wetlands, right? And uh, that's another interesting story of our wetlands. And I mentioned uh, uh, that in, in terms of the salt marsh, it's not just these classic expanses, but also you get nooks and crannies all around the coast where you have salt marsh plants. This, this is a miniature salt marsh, if you like. Okay, um, so finally, as you get further into the sea, if you've been kayaking or snorkeling, uh, you'd probably recognize this type of wetland, which is a seagrass wetland. Uh, we have intertidal seagrass, which is zostra, and you've got subtidal seagrass, and you've got a few species. Posidonia is perhaps the most dominant and important one. 
and it's a remarkable habitat, right? So uh, in northern Australia, you get dugongs and so on, uh, but in Tasmania, you still get some remarkable species like uh, these rays and, and such. Um, so if you combine all of these wetlands and put them one next to the other, in terms of hydrology, the type of plants, uh, you get something like this, right? So uh, you get on one end, you get seagrass, which is all, almost always underwater, to uh, seagrass that's sometimes open, sometimes underwater, uh, and then salt marsh, and then your um, swamp forest, which is uh, Melaleuca. We do have a lot of swamp forests in Tasmania, not in southern Tasmania, uh, but in northern Tasmania. If you do get to Launceston, uh, do check out the Tamar Wetlands Walk. And there's a great example of swamp forest there. Uh, so my own research, although I like all wetlands, are <laughs> focused primarily on salt marsh. I'll, I'll touch more on that uh, in terms of the critters that live in there and what they get up to. Uh, this is another way I, I think about that landscape, apart from just looking at that across a spectrum. Um, so if you want to look at this uh, when you go traveling around the place, you know, where are they? What do they look like? Um, so I, I, I think of these as riches behind the beaches. Remember the example I gave you of Wineglass Bay Beach? So the next time you go to a beach, you probably end up in a beach in the, su in the summer most of the time. Um, and you get bored on the beach, like I do, uh, then go for a wander, right? Go for a wander behind the beach. And, uh, uh, you know, you invariably would find a wetland of some description behind the beach. Okay, so here's one example. Uh, around um, the east coast of Tasmania and there's a lot of these are around the east coast of Tasmania where you have the beach uh, and behind that sand barrier where all the waves are crashing in uh, you have these secluded environments and around these secluded environments you have these wonderful wetlands uh, that are so rich in wildlife and what wildlife specifically I'll get to that next all right so before I get get to talking about wildlife I want to tell you a bit about my favorite wetland and I'd like to hear mm -hmm. about your favorite wetlands at some stage. Um, so where is my favorite wetland? Uh, it is the biggest and most significant wetland in Tasmania and it is hiding in plain sight. You can actually see it in a map that scale. Where is it? Do you see a halo in that map? And, and that halo is right there. So if you follow the halo, uh, you'll get to the Bollinger Bay Robins Passage wetlands, okay? And they are absolutely <laughs> remarkable. So that's that's uh, a couple. I've got a couple of photos. That's one photo of it. Uh, here's a fun fact. Uh, the fun fact is that the length of the open tidal flats. And remember, the tide comes in twice a day. As the tide comes in, the whole area is covered in water, uh, up to two meters deep. When the tide goes out this is what you get bare um, sand so the length of the sand is four to five kilometers so you need to walk four to five kilometers just to get to the edge of the water put that in context of Hobart Airport runway uh, is three kilometers so you can actually land a couple of jumbo jets here and and you'll be fine right so quite remarkable in terms of that scale uh, but also uh, in terms of the habitats there and I've asked some of my students to guess where this photo was taken from, and some of them said Kakadu, right? So this is, uh, you know, looking remarkable. Couldn't possibly be in good old Tassie, but it is. It is in the northwest of Tasmania, uh, where we've got, you know, a quarter of all of our salt marsh uh, over there. Um, so uh, what? So now I want to get into, okay, so, you know, we've talked about all of these wetland types, and hopefully you'll keep an eye out for them. So what, 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 what actually happens there? What lives in those environments, which is what I want to get to next. So we put this diagram together to answer that question, what lives in these wetland environments? And you can see there's, there's the plants, there's microorganisms, there's crabs, snails, insects, water bird, uh, other sorts of birds, uh, and fish, okay? Uh, and there's a lot of things that happen there in terms of um, you know, how these wetlands function, which I'll get to a bit later as well. Okay, so I've walked a, a lot around these wetlands, and this is this is an example um, in in high tide, and uh, it's an interesting one because as I was walking here, there were hundreds of fish, and sometimes I was I was worried if I, I might actually step on a few and and uh, do them an injury, so I had to sort of shoo them away before I put my foot down, 
Uh, and this is what I mean. So this is an example of a photo taken just in that 10, 20 centimeter water column. Uh, and there's just one fish. There's hundreds of these little fish there. I've, I've got a few samples here, which I'll, which I'll show you uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so what are the fish doing there? And the fish are there to eat crab larvae. Again, there's hundreds of crabs there, which is the other trouble when you're walking in these environments. Um, uh, there's crabs everywhere. And sometimes you can't walk without crushing a few crabs and you hear this exoskeletons uh, under your shoes and it's the most horrible feeling, right? Uh, but you know, there are hundreds of them. How do you even get, get from one place to another without, without walking on a few, okay? <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and when the water drains, so you, you get these insects, there are hundreds of in insects again, and what are the insects doing? Uh, they're feeding the birds, right? And there are, again, lots of these wonderful birds. I'll, I'll make a note of, note of that particular bird there, which is a bird that I got on my t-shirt here. <laughs> it is a white-fronted chat. Uh, it is a coastal bird, and um, in Tasmania we have, it's still the, one of the best places in the world to see white-fronted chats. Uh, they also occur across Victoria and New South Wales, but their populations have reduced there uh, and Tasmania is still a stronghold. Um, and I see them as an icon of our wetlands because they're always there and they've got this wonderful sound like a guitar pick, ting, ting, uh, and they're flipping around and sitting there posing magnificently to photos <laughs> and picking on insects. Okay, now we come to fish, okay? Uh, so these wetlands are wonderful fish nurseries, okay? So if you've ever had fish, if you like eating fish, uh, then spare a thought for wetlands. Uh, there's a, the, 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 these are fish nurseries. You can see in that um, photo to the left there, uh, there's hundreds of them. So we're scooping them out to see what kind of fish there are, how many fish there are, and what we're finding is that our wetlands in Tasmania, um, density in terms of fish per square meter, is higher than other parts of Australia. So we should be proud of our wetlands in Tassie. Uh, there's small fish, there's big fish, uh, and some fish you can uh, actually harvest. Uh, they're above legal size for harvest. Uh, and, and also lots of crabs, right? So the crabs try to eat the fish and the fish try to eat the crabs. So it's a wild <laughs> environment if, if you're out there and when the water's coming in. Um, so I've got a few more uh, photos of the fish um, and uh, photos are, you know, not as good. I've got real samples here. Uh, <laughs> so probably now is a good time to change our focus and uh, look at some real samples. Oh, wow. Okay, You've so, got lots of samples there, Vishnu. Yeah, I do. And um, so we'll, we'll start with the, the biggest one here. Uh, so we caught this um, in, a, in a wetland um, right in the middle of it. It was really large when we caught it, and uh, since then, as I put them in ethanol, they've shrunk a fair bit. Oh! <laughs> so we've we've all heard of uh, the Atlantic salmon. Uh, we do have native salmon. Uh, we have two species of native salmon, uh, and this is an example of native salmon. Uh, it's a Western Australian salmon, and a v very vigorous swimmer. So how big was it when you? Oh, caught it? it was uh, 20 centimeters. Then. And it's shrunk right down. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it's shrunk to about maybe 10 oh. centimeters now. And uh, in, in the wild, they can up, get up to a, a meter long. Wow, that's yeah. a big fish. It, it is a big fish. Mm -hmm. And, and so this, that's the thing that, that these, these habitats are nurseries. So they're shallow environments, lots of food to eat. Uh, so the, the younger members of the fish, the juveniles, come into these shallow environments feed up and then and then go back with the water is it also that it's a sort of more calm environment for for little fish it is precisely yeah. Yeah. but but also in these environments they're not at risk of eaten by being eaten by the bigger fish yep. because the bigger fish they st tend to stay in deeper water right oh, so it's a perfect environment it is for them it's then. absolutely perfect tailor-made for them uh, in fact uh, people who have worked this out in victoria um, have started a program called Sponsor a Fish Hotel. <laughs> Sponsor a Fish Hotel, that's that, great. So a wetland. Yeah, wetland, yeah. that's right. So, oh, that's so, um, so they're collecting, um, uh, you know, contributions yeah. and uh, protecting wetlands because they are fish hotels. That's great. Right. So what are they eating? That's a, that's a good question. Some tiny little things. Yeah, there. so these, these are uh, free floating um, little critters and hopefully you can see that. Um, so there's, there's one example there. There's another one. 
and there's another one. <laughs> these and, are and very tiny. <laughs> these are very <laughs> tiny, and and the fish love eating them. Uh, and I mentioned crabs. I'll I'll um, give you a couple of examples of them. So here's a crab, and uh, this this is much smaller than some of the larger crabs. The larger crabs are probably that that big, and the smaller ones. I, I do have an example <laughs> here. Uh, that that's my little that finger. That is so small. Yeah, that's it. So that that is that. Is, <laughs> it, it's yeah. yeah. Were they bigger when you caught them and they've shrunk as well? No, or the, is crabs, that, the crabs. The crabs. The crabs are the same. They're the same because they've got the exoskeleton, oh, right? Which uh, doesn't. So that is really tiny. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So the other big fish that that you saw um, in my slides um, are these. Uh, these are yellow eye mullets. Uh, people, I mean, you, people catch um, salmon mullets commercially and recreationally um, so the, the mullets uh, they they come in all sizes so these are um, really small ones these are a bit bigger and we did catch ones that are 25 centimeters wide as well and these are again bigger swimmers um, and they love salt marsh we, we catch a lot of these um, so um, the other um, you know large numbers of fish that we catch are these hardy heads um, and they've, they've got this stripe and they're semi-transparent in the water and there's sc large schools of them. So if, if you are around these environments and you see really large schools of fish, it's, it's you know, re likely uh, to be hardy heads. Um, and then um, you have gobies and uh, again, there's a lot of gobies in the water. It's one of the most common um, fish species you'll find in these environments. And what you see here is that they've got these little suckers and they are bottom dwelling species so they use those suckers to hang on to the bottom uh, yeah. uh, against the current okay, yes yeah so they they're good at doing that and and the last one i'll probably show you is uh um this flounder <laughs> and uh um and these again you know lay on the bottom of the ocean uh, sea floor and, and wetlands and they're like a mini ufo floating around in wetlands and they go around like this like a disc um, yeah, and again, that's a juvenile. They're amazing. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Vishnu, we might mm -hmm. have our five minute break. Yep. So, everyone, we're going to go to our break, and in that time, if you've got some questions for Vishnu, you can post them onto the chat and don't forget your name and your grade and your school, and we'll see you in five minutes. Oh, great. We're back. <laughs> we love technical difficulties on UCTV Alive for Kids. Vishnu, what do you wear when you're exploring wetlands? Um, that's a good question. Um, safety is uh, first and foremost, and uh, I uh, make sure that I have waders or gaiters with me. Big uh, top, big, the big pants. <laughs> big, big pants when, when you're walking out in deep water. Yep. Um, if you're if you're just camping, you know, you're probably not likely to be carrying them with you. Mm. Gumboots are great. Mm. Gumboots are wonderful. They're, they're cheap, accessible. Um, and uh, my, my five-year-old has a little one, um, blue color, really pretty. And uh, I, that's what he wears when he comes exploring with me. And it's perfect. Sounds good. So remember, yeah. m remember your gumboots in the back of the car yeah. is a good tip. Here's a question for you. Now, this is from Luke. He's in grade six and he's homeschooled. Hi, Luke. Do the extra tannins in the water after a big rain event affect the fish in a wetland? Oh, what a good question. Yeah, good question. Um, the fish would have, have adapted to that environment uh, to be able to deal with the tannin. The question is uh, if the tannin uh, concentrates over time. If it concentrates over time, mm -hmm. Uh, it can reduce light infiltration into the wetland environment and that would affect the plants in the, in the wetland environment. And this is something that we are seeing, for instance, in Macquarie Harbour, uh, where um, uh, the, the tannin and the, the lack of flushing into the Macquarie Harbour has resulted in a, in a re really difficult environment for fish. And so we're seeing um, a different set of fish that have adapted to that environment um, that are suited to that environment. Vishnu, as we're coming towards the end of the episode, we have to ask the question, to what question is wetland the answer? Well, I'm hoping that uh, having listened to me talk, um, students would be able to ask the question and provide the answers themselves. But I'll, I'm going to try with a couple of questions. All right. Uh, so what am I going to have for dinner? 
That's the question. And how is wetland an answer for that? I probably think you know the answer too. Uh, well, you could say, I'm going to have fish and chips. Okay, so if you're having fish and chips, where do all the fish come from? All the fish need wetland environments as nurseries as they're little before they go into the open ocean and uh, before they're caught and then transported to supermarkets and be buy them and cook them, right? So, uh, so that's one question. Uh, and then you could say, well, I'm a vegetarian. Um, so what, what, you know, what, what am I going to have for dinner in that case? And how is that linked to wetlands? And I could say, well, you might be eating rice and rice <laughs> is a wetland grass and rice paddocks are a great example of wetlands. In fact, some of the rice paddocks in Asia have been listed under the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands as internationally significant wetlands. Rice paddocks, where <laughs> rice is being produced, also is a remarkable habitat for birds, some of the most majestic birds in the world, like the, cr the, like the Saras crane. They depend on rice paddocks, right? So that's another question. That, um, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Oh. <laughs> Well, listen, Vishnu, that's all we have time for okay. for this episode. Thank you so much for coming on to UCTV Alive for Kids. It was absolutely wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Now, as I said, that's all we have time for this week. Now, this is, of course, our last episode for 2021. So I'd like to thank all the presenters we've had on the show this year for coming on, their incredible contribution, just like Vishnu, sharing their knowledge with all of us. A huge thank you to our producers, Stuart and Tess, who make sure that the show goes out every fortnight and find all of the wonderful presenters to come on air. And of course, a big thank you to you and your teachers for watching and tuning in every fortnight. We've got a great year coming up next year. We'll see you next year. Have a wonderful break. See you in 2022.